Columbia Broadcasting System presents a thrilling new adventure series starring Dick Powell. I'm an insurance investigator. My name is Johnny Dollar. What? You heard me, Johnny Dollar, and I can pad an expense account with the best of them. Yep, I'm a freelance insurance investigator, and I live in Hartford, Connecticut. At least that's where I pay rent. My work sees to it that I really live anywhere, except at home. I'm free, white, and 34, and so forth. If you're interested in buying me Christmas presents, I take a size 42 suit. Shirt's 15 and a half collar, sleeve length 33. My hat size is 7 and 8, except when I wind up a successful case. Then it runs about 7 and 3 eighths. At insurance investigation, I'm just an expert. At making out my expense account, I'm an absolute genius. <laughs> expense account. Submitted by investigator Johnny Dollar. To Home Office, East Coast Underwriters, Terminal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention. Austin Farnsworth, General Manager. The following is an accounting of my expenditures in the investigation of Milford Brooks III for your company. Expense account item one. Cab fare to your office in answer to your original call, 75 cents. Tip to driver, one dollar. Expense account item two. Shoe shine, 25 cents. You'll remember I got my shoes scuffed when I unsuspectingly walked into your private office. Milford! No, you must not. Get out of my way, Hansford. Dollar! Get yeah, yeah, away from that window! Don't hey, you, you. jump! Hey, oh, 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 no, 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 you don't. Let go of me. Let go of me, you huh. No, no. There are better ways of making a big splash in life. Get away! Well, nice try, Sonny. Now pay attention to teacher. <sighs> oh, huh. I didn't know I had it in me. Oh. oh, goodness gracious, Dollar. Did you have to hit him so hard? I hope you haven't killed him. He isn't too strong, you know. Uh, don't worry. There. Oh. Now, now, Mr. Farnsworth, would you mind telling me on whose head have I the dubious pleasure to be sitting? Uh, that, sir, is Milford Brooks III. His policy with this company is in the amount of two million dollars. Wow. Yes. And the boy seems bent on committing suicide. Dollar, I want you to stop him. Uh, what do you want me to do? Threaten him with death? Anything, anything. The conditions of his policy are such that we would be forced to meet with a claim in the event of his suicide. Oh, I say, Dollar, sitting on his head that way, aren't you in danger of smothering the boy? Smothering him doesn't worry me, but these crew haircuts don't make very comfortable cushions. I'll move down a little. Ah, now, there. Okay, okay. So far, I know this kid is insured for two million and that his policy pays off on suicide. What else? One half hour ago, Milford Brooks walked into this office and changed the beneficiary in his policy. Uh -huh. Then, sir, he proceeded to demand, not request, mind you, but demand a loan of $500,000. Quite a touch. When I explained to him that there were no provisions for a loan in his policy, he threatened suicide. Which would cost you $2 million. So all we have to do is keep him alive, huh? And he's managed to make that no small problem. His choice of a new beneficiary is downright frightening. One of the most notorious gamblers in the East. His name is Hatcher, uh, Harold Hatcher. Ouch. Oh, do you know him? Sure. That kid's been a post office pinup boy for a lot of years. Well, that's the situation. I'm engaging you to protect Milford Brooks' future. Dollar, I want you to protect the boy. Uh, give him something to live for. You know, an interest in life. An interest in life? Well, then let's, let's, uh, let's see. Um, oh, I know here. This should help. What's that you got there? Well, it's what's commonly referred to in the more successful of bachelor circles as my little black book. Oh. Well, now, let's, uh, let's see. Hmm? Hmm. Ruby? No, no. Her favorite expression is drop dead. Uh, uh Bernadine? Mm, no. She'd be the new beneficiary by midnight. Oh, dear. Now, here, here. Here's the one, Butter. Say, Farnsworth, would you mind passing me that phone? The one with the long cord? Oh, oh no, no, no. Oh. I still, Buster. Uh, My little friend here is showing signs of life. Uh, here, here you are. Uh, maybe you should let him breathe a bit more. Ah, don't worry, don't worry. He'll be all right. Hello. Oh, hello. I want to call New York. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hudson, 24292. Dollar, you're not thinking of taking this boy to New York, are you? Well, I'm going there myself. You want me to keep an eye on him, don't you? 
Now, don't fret, Farnsworth. All is not lost. You do worry me, sitting on his chest that way. Hello? Hello, oh, uh, Butter? Uh, this is Johnny. Yeah, I'll be in town tonight. I want to see you. And look, here's what I want you to do. Yes, yes, it's all right to say over the telephone. Yeah, I want you to reserve a table at the hatchery in my name for 10 o'clock tonight. Will you do that? Okay, I'll see you at your apartment in a few hours. But, honey, I can't make it any earlier. I'm sitting up on a sick friend. Okay, goodbye. I'm not sure that I agree with your methods. Huh? Ow! What's the matter? Uh, did he hit you? Hit me? He bit me. Expense account, item three. Liquor, $18. Keeping Milford Brooks the third peaceful seemed to be the immediate problem. And a bottle of rare old brandy seemed to be the immediate answer. I poured most of it into him, and by the time he started to tick again, he'd gone through the unusual process of going to sleep sober and waking up enchanted. I loaded him into my car, and we headed for New York. As we passed through New Haven, he opened one eye, looked up, saw the Yale Bowl, and gave three cheers for old Eli. Ray, 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 Oh, Ray, old Yale would sure be proud of you. Why anybody would want to insure you for $2 million is more than I can figure. My daddy loved me very much, and my mother loved me very much. Now, that's nice. And not only that, but I love somebody very much. And not only that, but I hate somebody very much. That's interesting. You know something? Next to one other guy, I hate you more than anybody else. Oh, here, lover boy, it's the cocktail hour again. Time for your bottle. Rolling along the Merritt Parkway, I felt very much alone with my thoughts. And believe me, they weren't very pleasant company. The way it stacked up for me, Brooks had built up a fat gambling debt with Harold Hatcher and had been forced into making him his beneficiary. The suicide threat that he was holding over the insurance company was a little tougher to figure. Unless he was trying to finance a trip for himself to get away from the man with a murder motive, Hatcher. Hmm. My hungry little mind nibbled away on those unsavory morsels of food for thought all the way to Butter's apartment. Hey. Hey, where are you taking me? I want to go to New York. If you don't behave, Buster, I'll punch your ticket. Johnny, darling, welcome to New York. Well, that's the fastest trip I ever had. Quiet. Well, where did you find this? In a box of Cracker Jack. Let us in, dear. I don't know about you. Some men bring me flowers, some bring me candy. What do you bring me? A boiled owl in a Brooks Brothers suit. Pleased to meet you. Yeah, let's trot him into the bedroom, honey. He'd look more at home in the bathtub. I need to pull down the cupboard. All right. Now, come on, Buster. Lie down. Charm, charm, charm. Ah, oh, that kid's liquor sure can hold him. How long have you been playing nursemaid to this bottle, baby? Get behind that bar, sweet, and I'll tell you all about it. Sure. Horrible examples don't seem to bother you, do they? If you knew how that guy has been bothering me. What did he do to you? Well, let's just say he put the bite on me. No. Oh. Gosh, the river sure does look pretty tonight. Bourbon and soda? Now, oh, please. Anything but brandy. I've been sniffing that second hand all the way from Hartford. Butter, see that big boat out there? Mm-hmm. Oh, I sure would like to be on it. With you, sailing off to faraway romantic places. Get with it, darling. That's the 125th Street Ferry. Oh. Here's your drink. Come on now. Tell Butter all about it. So, friend Bourbon and I proceeded to tell her all about it. It wasn't easy. Everything about her kept flagging down my train of thought. The longer she looked at me, the less I wanted of Milford Brooks the third, and the more I wanted of beautiful Butter the first, and only. She was a sympathetic listener to my story until I gave her the answer to her first and only question. And where do I fit into all this? Well, baby, I thought you understood. My job is to give this poor, misguided boy something to live for. That's you. Well... Mm. Now, honey, hold everything. Don't go getting your corn all popped. You, you misunderstand. I really mean it. I thought if he'd just got to look at you and realize that things like you exist, 
Why, you'd make any man glad to be alive. Oh, oh, come on now, Butter. Melt a little. I wouldn't let anything happen to you. You know that. Did I hurt you? Oh, no. I'm getting used to it. People have been taking pokes at me all day. I'm sorry. Ah, that's better. You want some more bourbon? Uh Uh-uh. I want some more you. Well, help yourself. Honey, it's getting late. Let's uh, make this the last drink. Mm. What time is it? Oh, it's uh, it's uh, twenty to ten. Oh. My reservation at the hatchery is for ten. Here. Thanks. Cigarette? Oh, empty. Some more out in the other room. I'll get him. I'd love to get you on a slow boat to China. Johnny. Oh, I'm coming. He's gone. What? Well, he can't be. But he is. The window's wide open. Oh, the fire escape. What a smart guy I am. Trading three drinks of bourbon for two million bucks on the hoof. Oh, that's the biggest bar check I ever picked up. That's a big bar check for anyone to pick up. As a matter of fact, it's a bigger bar check than you've ever heard of anyone picking up before. And that should give you an idea of what to expect in the second act as you follow this new CBS series starring Dick Powell in the title role, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Well, nobody could say I wasn't working fast. I'd only been in town for an hour and I'd already succeeded in losing Milton Brooks III. I spent another hour of his all-too-short life expectancy unsuccessfully shaking down the neighborhood for him. And then, feeling very much like a bloodhound that had flunked his sniffing exam, I went back to Butter's apartment. No luck, Johnny. Oh, sure. Plenty of luck. All bad. Is there anything I can do to help? I'll kiss for luck. Mm. What are you going to do? Nothing. Just a little phone call. Headquarters. This is Johnny Dollar. Give me missing persons. Any particular one? Now, don't be a wise guy. Lieutenant Fisher. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Fisher. Fisher, this is Johnny Dollar. Hello, Dollar. Who'd you lose? One man, my mind, and if I'm not careful, my professional reputation. The guy's name is Brooks, Milford III. Got anything on him? Hold on. All right. Don't look at me like that. It wasn't all my fault. Dollar? Yeah? We haven't found him yet, but we think we know where he is. Huh? The Hudson River. At 11.15 tonight, his top coat, complete with identification, was found taking a ride on the 125th Street Ferry. Oh. Anything else? Uh, Nothing much. A package of matches was found under the coat, monogram. Uh, You don't happen to know anybody whose initials are H.H., do you? H.H.? Yeah. There's always Horace Hyde. Thanks, Fisher. I'll check back with you later. Hmm, H.H. Harold Hatcher. Hmm. What are you mumbling about? Bad news? It looks like about two million bucks worth. They uh, found Milford's coat on the 125th Street Ferry. <laughs> you and your faraway romantic places. <laughs> Very funny. I'll see you later, honey. Maybe about 11. Expense account, item four. Nightclubs. $28. Harold Hatcher's hatchery was in a cellar under a hotel, but the prices were high enough to rate a penthouse. The club was draped in too much satin, its lady customers in too little. The decor was French provincial, the music was Brazilian, and the food was from Dixie. The drinks looked weak and the waiters looked strong. All in all, the joint was a sight for sore eyes, for making them sore. The only pretty thing in the place was a blonde. She came strolling up to my table, her hips unconsciously sending subtle little messages back to the rumba band. 
She opened her mouth, slid her tongue over her lower lip, and let a few warm, soft words slide out. Looking for someone? Well, you'll do until the real thing comes along. Come on. Thanks. I won't have a drink. Well, I didn't ask you. My name is Janelle. Janelle? Wow, well, it's a nice name. I understand you were asking about Mr. Hatcher. Well, I asked if he was in. The waiter said he wasn't. Do you know him? More than somewhat. What do you want to see him about? A mutual friend, Milford Brooks. Uh-huh. I know most of the quiet clothes boys around here, so you want a cop. You don't look like the type that would be a society friend of the Brooks family, so what are you? Uh, I'll ignore that. Is Hatcher around? He might be. Then well, come on. Where's his office? The top of those stairs. Can I expect any trouble getting in? You won't have any trouble. How do you know? Because Harold sent me down here to look you over. Oh. I think you're all right. So, I won myself the good housekeeping seal of approval, huh? Keeping a house with you would meet with my approval. I ran for my life at a slow walk up the stairs. When I located the door to Hatcher's office, I knocked once and went in. Come on in. Thanks. Oh, I'm Johnny Dollar. I was hired by East Coast Underwriters to protect the interest of a kid named Milford Brooks III. Now, what's that supposed to mean to me? You know him, don't you? Well, he isn't exactly one of my boozing buddies. How much money does he owe you? Well, we've got him on the books for a few bob. Why? They picked up his top coat tonight on the 125th Street Ferry. He wasn't in it. It might have been suicide. It might have been a knockover. It made it look like a suicide. What's your choice? What do you get off asking me about my choice? Where were you between 11 and 11.30 tonight? What's it to you? I thought you might like to rehearse some answers. The law will be asking some questions real soon now. I don't know why I should tell you, but I was driving around in my car getting some air. Oh, now, you'll have to do better than that. They found one of your match folders under Brooks' coat. You're out of your mind. Let me ask you. The kid owed me a couple of hundred thousand. You think I'm going around knocking off my own assets? Hatcher, I, I, I don't know whether you're stupid or bright. Don't worry about it. I know. What about that insurance policy? What insurance policy? Now, look, Hatcher, we're big boys. We both know that changing a beneficiary in an insurance policy is a legal transaction. That means witnesses. That means it isn't secret. What are you talking about? That you and the East Coast underwriters and I know all, all know that Brooks made you the beneficiary in his policy and that you stand to come into two million bucks when they fish out his body. I don't know anything about it. Motives don't come much bigger. I'm telling you, this is all news to me and you and nobody else is going to make me move off that story. I feel the same about mine. It doesn't take a genius to know that Brooks didn't love you two million dollars worth. There's only one logical reason for his making you the beneficiary. You forced him into it. Who'd believe anything else? Who cares? They'd have to prove it. And, brother, that can't be done. Now, how would you... Yeah. Okay, Rocky, thanks for the news. Take the inspector into the bar and buy him a drink. I'll be right down. Dollar, did you turn me in? They're here, huh? Yeah. No, I didn't turn you in. I'm not a cop. Here, uh, have a cigarette. Thanks. Here's a light. Well, come on. Maybe they just want to sell me some tickets to the policeman's ball. For a guy in a hot spot, Hatcher was certainly a cool customer. I followed him out of the office, down the stairs, and back into the club. Janelle was sitting there right where I'd left her. And I thought to myself, now there's a gal who should never sit down. She looks so pretty standing up. Janelle, buy Mr. Dollar a drink. I have to go play 20 questions with some fellas in the bar. Sure, baby. Anything you say. Anything. I'll see you, Dollar. Yeah. How'd you make on? Well, you can never tell about a guy like that. He's a smart boy. Strong, silent type. Wouldn't talk, huh? A real close mouth act. About what? Oh, just a little doodad. Two million dollar life insurance policy. Wait a minute. A young Brooks kid? That's right. I knew it. Tried to tell him he'd get into trouble, but he wouldn't listen to me. Oh, you knew about it, huh? I suppose you also know what was behind it. Sure, Milford owed him some money. A lot of money. It's in writing. What kind of writing? It's a personal note that Brooks was going to get back if he made Harold beneficiary. Where is this note? Do I look like the kind of girl who'd put the finger on her boy's ring? You look like the kind of girl who'd do anything if she wanted to. Thanks. I'll give you a slight hint. It's in his office. You'll find it in the inside pocket of one of his suits in the wardrobe. What are you waiting for? I'll watch the bar. Nothing, sweetheart. Nothing at all. (laughs) 
Whatever her reasons, Mr. Harold Hatch's little female playmate was trying awful hard to send him up on a murder rap. And I was going to try awful hard not to let her down. Back in Hatcher's office, I found myself alone in a room with a telephone. And being a guy who can never resist a free call, I unleashed the magic wonders of the AT&T. This better be you, Johnny Dollar. Shh, quiet, Butter. I've only got a few seconds. It seems that's all you ever have from me. Now, if you... Oh, look, Angel, I... Angel, just another hour. I'll get you a nice present. I don't care if you're another century. And as for presents, the last one you brought me was a drunk. And you even let him get away from me. Good night. <sighs> Life presents a gloomy picture ever downward toward the tomb. Having wasted those few precious moments of an already misspent youth, I decided I'd better get on my pony before Mr. Hatcher showed up. I found Milford Brooks' personal note in one of Hatcher's suits, all right. As a matter of fact, I found something in all his suits. A great big glimmer of light. <laughs> Expense account, item five. Taxi fare, $10. I left the office in a hurry, Janelle at her table and Hatcher at his bar. I got out of the club and into a taxi parked a half block down the street. There, I waited until my favorite suspect left the hatchery and piled into another cab, and off we went. On a chase that would have made Ben Hur look like a plowing bee. <laughs> We skittered over to Lexington and headed uptown. At 72nd, the cab turned right and pulled to a stop. My driver was on his toes, and his toes were on his brake. We stopped, too, half a block behind. You want us to wait, huh? No, here you are. Keep the change. Hey, thanks. It was a garage that belonged to a residence on the parallel street a block away. The living quarters upstairs were dark enough to look interesting. I indulged in a bit of genteel breaking and entering. Entering that old barn didn't take much breaking. I crept up the stairs. They sounded like they were left over from an old ghost story. And so did the first voice I heard when I stopped halfway up. We've got to be careful, especially about that Johnny Dollar. Are you sure he didn't follow you? That voice sounded awfully dry to be coming from a guy who supposedly had spent most of the night snoozing on the bottom of the Hudson River. It was Milford Brooks III. Get up on your feet, Brooks. Well, now, wait a minute. I... I started this thing slugging you, and I might as well finish it the same way. Leave him alone. Now, pull in, pull in the claws, Angel. And sit on his lap. You hard for it. I'll kill you. Get off of me. I should have known better than to get mixed up with a low-class female like you. Why, you, Tom? Now, hold it. We pushed the lady around enough, Brooks. Tell me to be careful, will you? Why didn't you think of that before you let him here? Wipe your nose, little boy. Now, don't you go getting fat-headed, gorgeous. Neither one of you are exactly what I'd call masterminds. When you planted that match folder on a little boy Blue Blood's top coat in the ferry boat, you both should have been more careful. You think so? You bet I think so. If I were planning a piece of evidence to incriminate Mr. Harold Hatcher, I would have left a cigarette lighter. I found one in the pocket of every suit he owns back there in his closet in the club. It wasn't hard to figure out that that guy never carries a book of matches. What do you want? I'm only interested in one thing. Saving the insurance company $2 million. And, Buster, I think you've done it for me. Dollar, I... Uh... This is insurance fraud. It has been ever since you put on that fake suicide attempt. Trying to extort 500000 bucks out of the company. Dollar, wait a minute. Ah, come on. We're leaving. You heard him, Dollar. Harold. That's your said, wait a minute. He wants to talk. Yeah, everybody wants to get in on the act. How did you get here? When the police in this town think maybe a guy's jumped off a ferry boat and nobody's seen him do it, they check the counters on the turnstiles at each end. In the case of Brooks, as many people got off that boat as got on. Well, that makes sense. They'd hardly hold the guy because somebody lost the top coat. Uh, how did you know we were here? You know me, baby. You never go anyplace I don't know about. Okay, Brooks, you felt like talking. Now I feel like listening. Get it up. Well, I... I don't know what you mean. I know what you mean, Hatcher. One, he gave you a big, fat $2 million motive for murder. And two, he did his best to make it look like you did murder him with that broken-down match cover plant on the ferry boat. It's just that simple. And you, baby? Harold, please. You put him up to it, didn't you, you cheap little muscler? Trying to get rid of me, will you? No, Harold. Now, calm down, Hatcher. You don't need any gun around here. They're tame. Well, maybe I'm not. Since so many people have gone to so much trouble to hand me a nice, easy way to make $2 million... 
Maybe I'll just go ahead and make it. I'll show these amateurs how these things are really done. Come on, Brooks. How'd you like to go for a nice, cool half a ferry boat ride? No, Hatcher. No. Look, it's her fault. I'll give you anything you want. You're wrong, sonny boy. You're going to give me everything. No. No. You can't. Let me out of here. Brooks bolted for the door. Hatcher snapped a shot at him. And I hit Hatcher with a door die tackle from behind. The gun flew out of his hand. No, you don't. I beat him to it and swung it straight into his skull. Half the people in the room are lying there bleeding. Brooks from gunshot, Hatcher from gun butt. Janelle and I stood there panting. But believe me, not for each other. We stood that way until the police arrived. Dollar, it's beyond me. I sent you out to protect the life of a very important policyholder, and now where are we? Standing in a hospital corridor, worrying about whether he's going to live or die. As far as I'm concerned, Mr. Farnsworth, you're only half right. I'm just standing in a hospital corridor. Oh, Dollar, you're heartless. Well, if you'd been bitten where he bit me, you wouldn't care if he lived or died either. I'm getting out of here. Well, where are you going? It'll be explained in my expense account under miscellaneous expense. Oh, don't fall over when you come to an item for three hundred and eighteen dollars. Three hundred and eighteen dollars? For what? Not for what, Farnsworth. For whom? Expense account total. And it all adds up to a little matter of eleven hundred and eighty-two dollars and twenty-three cents. Which you may say, Mr. Farnsworth, is a lot of money for one man to spend in two days. But you must bear in mind that the amount at stake was two million dollars. And you know the price of steak these days. It might comfort you to know that I just returned from the hospital. Brooks was strong enough to make a full statement, which you will find and close. This in itself should prove sufficient to establish evidence of attempted fraud against your company, allowing you to immediately avoid his policy. It uh, boils down to one sentence, to wit. Brooks and Janelle wanted to get rid of Hatcher so that they could live happily ever after. Knowing those two, they never had a chance. And oh, yes, that, uh, <laughs> that miscellaneous item, the one for $318, it, uh, it was a bracelet for a certain party who made this special investigation for me very special. Oh, if you want a receipt for this item, I'll send you a lock of her hair. Yours, uh, mm, truly, Johnny Dollar. with the final signature on his expense account, Dick Powell as Johnny Dollar has just closed the books on his first adventure in this new CBS series. The script for tonight's broadcast was written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd, and the music was created and conducted by Dick Arant. The entire production was under the direction of Tony Leader. <laughs> Be sure to tune in again next week when the expense account covers Special Investigation Singapore, another unusual adventure starring Dick Powell in... Yours, mm, truly, Johnny Dollar. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Broadcasting System presents Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he is just an expert. 
At making out his expense accounts, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by investigator Johnny Dollar. To Home Office, East Coast Underwriters, Terminal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures in the investigation regarding the Paracorp policy for your company. Expense account item one. Plain fare to Benton, Ohio, $40.04. Item two, plain fare Benton back to Hartford, $40.04. Explanation, purchase two one-way tickets. Because of the type of case I'm usually assigned, I never press my luck by buying round trips. This time I was almost right. Expense account item three. Cab fare, airport, the Valley Hotel. $2.20. Tip the driver. Gee, a dollar. Naturally. There'll be steak on the table tonight. Welcome to Warfare City. Hey, Dorman. Yes, sir. Well, what can I do for you, sir? Bring my bag inside, will you? Here. A dollar. Always. All you need is a dollar and a spade. Yeah, but does that mean you have to have a lot of Good evening, sir. Hello. You have a reservation for Johnny Dollar? Uh, oh, yes. Mr. Dollar's in his room. He'll check in about 8 o'clock. Huh? Oh, I guess I ain't the man I used to be. What room is he in? Oh, sorry, sir. I'm not permitted to tell you that. I can phone him. Oh, no, never mind. Uh, let me have one of those envelopes, will you? I'd like to leave my card for this Mr. Dollar. Uh, yes, sir. Here you are. Thanks. Here, just pop this in his box. The clerk popped the envelope into box number 207. And I propped myself into an elevator going up to room 207. I'd come to Benton to investigate a murder, and in just a matter of minutes, I found myself ready to commit one. Yes? Who is it? A uh, bellboy, sir. A package from Hartford. Uh, uh, just a minute. Package for me? Special delivery. Uh -huh. Come on, get up uh, on your feet. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Take it easy. You must be Johnny Dollar. Sometimes strangers in a hotel room can be a lot of fun, but not when they're using my name. What's your angle? Uh, listen, Dollar, I can explain everything. It better be good and it better be fast. I, I didn't want to be seen waiting for you in the lobby, and it's important that I talk with you before anybody else does. That's why I'm here. I'm Eric Barker. Oh, the defense attorney in this Paracorp thing, huh? Well, I hope you're better at defending your client than you are at defending yourself. Uh, whether my client goes to the chair or not, unfortunately, has nothing to do with my being a good lawyer. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. Hmm, well, I suppose this is one time when the attorney won't mind relinquishing the floor. Why don't you get up on your feet? Yeah, thanks. I will. Now, look, I'm, I'm no coward, Dollar. But if either one of us is going to get any place on this case, we'll have to work together. Now, I need your help, and I need it badly. I do a single act, sorry. Now, don't be hasty. I can help you, too. Just how much do you know about the Parakoff murder? All I know is it's one of the screwiest cases I've ever run into. All over the country, beneficiaries are knocking off insured people. But not here in Benton. Oh, no, here they tell me the insured man, uh, Harlan Wolf, knocked off his beneficiary and partner, Parakoff. And now I've got the jolly assignment of trying to keep the state from executing the insured man. My employer, East Coast Underwriters... Isn't anxious to see $100,000 of their money burn up on the electric chair. Well, at least we're both stuck with the same tough job. Now, look, I'll tell you the few things I already know, and you fill it in from there. All I know is that Parakoff was shot to death, and that his business partner, your client, Harlan Wolf, was picked up leaving town and being held for the murder. What have they got against him? Only what they found on him. That's enough. The murder weapon. Any, any witnesses? One. Parakoff's wife, Marsha, an eyewitness. Hmm. A murder weapon and an eyewitness. Well, it seems, at least at first glance, anyway, that the state of Ohio will be receiving a large electric bill one day soon. Hey, is there any chance of my seeing Wolf? No, not before he's indicted. Mm, great. Dollar, Harlan Wolf shot Parakoff in self-defense. There was no premeditation. Well, I'm convinced that I could get him off with a second-degree manslaughter verdict if it weren't for the tactics of the prosecution. Mm, that's right. Well, they not only have intimidated my character witnesses, they've suborned their own to perjury. That's the sort of thing I'm up against. Well, as the insurance companies keep on saying, never say die. So where can I find the widow, Parakoff? Well, if they aren't holding her in protective custody so nobody can question her, she may be at home. That's 1375 96th Street. That's a lot of figures. By the way, how's hers? 
Expense account item four, cab fare to home of murdered man and the girl he left behind him, $2.40. I shivered all the way out to the suburbs, but not from fear or anticipation. A simple case of summer shorts in red flannel weather. The Paracorp place was obviously the product of a good income and a bad architect. It looked like a great big wedding cake, and Mother Nature had mercifully iced the confection. The front walk was white and untrammeled as a driven snow. As a matter of fact, that's what it was. Three inches of it. Which meant that Marcia hadn't had a visitor in the past couple of hours. I was playing detective. And somebody inside was playing the radio. So, I played Peeping Tom. And loved every second of it. I couldn't see her face, but she had a lovely profile. I hastened to the door. Stopped you cold, and then her eyes gave you the ghost signal. Yes? Would you mind saving that yes for later? I beg your pardon? Well, I've come here to ask your help, and I hope you'll say yes. My name is Johnny Dollar. I've been sent to Benton to investigate the death of your husband. Well, why? Has this turned into a federal case? No, no, I'm from the insurance company. Oh, come in. Thanks. Say, uh, where can I put my coat? This snow will melt all over your carpet. Let it melt. Just throw your coat any place. Okay. Hmm. Good shot. Come on in by the fireplace. It's nice and warm. I should have brought some chestnuts. I could have followed her with my eyes closed. She headed for the living room, leaving a pathway of perfumed air behind her, and I didn't waste the breath of it. Yeah, that's nice perfume. Sit down. Thanks. Hey, you have good taste. That chair is a genuine antique. Oh? If you can stand a compliment before we get down to business, you certainly furnish a room. Oh, most of the things are just reproduction. Not the things that I'm talking about. Oh, you mean me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, this is a happy surprise. I expected to find someone fatter and fortier. My husband was. And now, uh, what about his insurance? Oh, you got me wrong. You see, I'm working for the company that insures the man being held for the murder of your husband. All of Wolf. What do you want from me? That's the story of what happened. Oh, that I can't do. The district attorney had a long talk with me about it. I'm not supposed to say anything to anybody about it until the trial. Well, I'm not asking you for any state secrets. I just want to want you to save me a trip down to the morgue. Oh, don't be so brutal. Oh, sorry. I didn't uh, realize you were still in mourning. That negligee confused me. Anyway, I met the newspaper morgue. That's what they call their files. You gave them a story. Why won't you give it to me? I told you I can't. Okay. Sorry I wasted your time. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Don't go. Well, you aren't exactly cooperating. Oh, please sit down. I'm going crazy in this house alone all the time. Can't we find something else to talk about? Sure. Later. First things first. That makes sense. All right. I don't see how it could be wrong to tell you what's already been in the newspapers, Johnny. Yeah, that's right. Go ahead. All right. Well, Holland Wolf and I were here in this room alone. We were discussing business. Business? Business. The Highland Coal Corporation. My husband was its president. Harlan Wolf is the secretary treasurer, and uh, I'm the vice president. <sighs> I can't resist this. But your kind of businesswoman makes this anthracite heart of mine feel very bituminous. What? I don't get it. Let it go. So, you and Wolf were sitting here talking about your coal business. Where were you sitting? Well, I was sitting over there at the desk. How about Wolf? Well, he was sitting where you are right now. And then my husband came home. I no doubt accused you and the secretary treasurer of putting in too much overtime. Is that it? Yes. Oh, it was terrible. They fought, and finally Harlan ran over to the couch over there and pulled his gun out of his overcoat pocket and, and started pulling the trigger. Who called the police? The neighbors? No. I did. Well, that's all there is to it. Well, that's all I wanted to know. That didn't hurt, did it? No. Now, how about using those big shoulders of yours for throwing a log on the fire? Sure. I'll, uh, I'll go outside and get one. No, there are logs in here. Mm -mm. I'd rather go outside and get one that's a little damp. They burn much slower. Oh. Well, then, while you're at it, get a big one. <laughs> I 
left Marsha gazing into the fire, called the cab, and stepped out into the cold night air to wait for it. I went down the front walk with my mind on what was behind me instead of what lay ahead. Hey, Dollar! Out of the white snow loomed two very large blue police uniforms, completely filled. Get out of this Parakoff mess, Dollar. As a matter of fact, get out of this town. Why, officer? I'm just beginning to like it here. Look, this is from the top that makes it official. We've got the guilty man. We don't want any trouble. Well, if you go back to the top and tell them that this is one sure way of getting trouble. They told us how to answer that one, too. I did my best. My best to break every one of the marquis of Queensbury rules. I know I was fighting a losing fight, but I was fighting for a little time. And that's all I got. A fist never stopped and my head seemed to feel like a ping pong ball in a four-handed game. Suddenly, things looked up. Me, flat on my back in the snow, seeing stars. Then a boot came flying toward my head and switched off all the pretty lights. In just a minute, we'll bring you the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, we want to remind you that next Sunday night, CBS once more will bring you ten great shows filled with great stars and complete with comedy, drama, and mystery. Betty Davis will make her first appearance on The Prudential Hour, co-starring with Ray Milland in a gripping story of a woman who has to bridge a lifetime in three short hours. Once more, you'll hear those 90 non-stop minutes of mirth with Spike Jones, Jack Benny, and Amos and Andy in succession. There'll be more comedy, more drama following rapidly. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Lumen Abner, Helen Hayes, Eve Arden, Life with Luigi, It Pays to be Ignorant. Staying tuned to CBS on Sunday night guarantees you the greatest entertainment on the greatest listening night of all. These programs are regular Sunday night features on most of these same CBS stations. And, of course, Jack Benny comes to you over them all. And now, back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Continuing expense account submitted by Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, East Coast Underwriters, Terminal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Expense account item five, medical supplies, bonded, seven dollars. Oh, and uh, here's something I'll give you for free. A handy help for your regularly employed insurance investigators. When I find myself overwhelmed in a brawl with unknown assailants, cops included, I do my best to take away more than just bruises and contusions. During my career, I've picked more pockets than a rack boy in a pool room. And I added one more to the score during the brawl in front of the Tarakoff house just before I went bye-bye in the snow. Hey, mister, wake up. Come on, come on, wake up. You'll catch your death of cold. Did you call a cab? Yeah, I, I think so. Holy smokes, your face. Was you robbed? What's the matter? Isn't it there? Huh? Here, I'll give you a hand. Thanks. Holy smokes. When I first seen you laying there, I thought you was a snowman tipped over. How do you feel, cold? Forevermore, I shall look kindly upon the haddock in the deep freeze. Huh? Hey, hey, what are you looking for? I'm looking for a wallet. Did you lose it? First I found it, then I lost it. Oh, oh yeah, here it is. Come on, let's get out of here. Where to, mister? Police headquarters? Police headquarters? Over my dead body. <laughs> Expense account, item six. Breakfast in bed, $2.40. Expense account, item seven. Photographic work, $6.00. For taking pictures of contents of wallet I lifted from the police uniform the night before. Expense account item eight. 70 cents cab fare to office of Edmund Byron, district attorney. Sorry to have kept you waiting, Bob. Good heavens, Dan, your face. Polonius assault? Yeah. But I got a flash for you. Not by person or persons unknown. Splendid. Uh, You wish to prefer charges? Yeah, half right again. But not for felonious assault and not against the guys who gave me this going over last night. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. There were a couple of your harness bulls. I don't, I don't want you to waste any time denying it, so forget it. I don't have the slightest idea what this is all about, Dollar. I said forget it. I want to talk about something more important. You're holding Harlan Wolf for the Parakoff murder. Now, what I want to know is, 
When are you going to hand down your indictment and what it's going to be? First thing in the morning, first-degree murder. Anything else you want to know before I have you thrown out of here? Yeah. How do I get mixed up in these rhubarbs? Expense account, item 10, five cents. A phone call to my partner in despair, Eric Barker, attorney for the defense, who agreed to lend me a set of police photographs of the scene of the crime and the principals involved. Harakoff looked very dead. Marsha looked very frightened. And the accused, Horn Wolf, looked very fat. The pictures of the scene of the crime indicated that the shooting occurred with Parakoff and Wolf standing face to face and that all of the bullets had gone banging straight into the right side of Parakoff's body. I set up an appointment to meet Parker at three that afternoon and decided to make the most of the time in between by seeing what kind of, of a trade I could make on that wallet I'd picked up during the winter sports of the night before. The name in it was Ben Arnold. And the address was disreputable. I don't want any brushes. <laughs> what a coincidence. I'm not selling any. What do you want? I'm looking for Ben Arnold. Who isn't? He promised me he'd be home by now. By this time, I should know better. Okay, I'll wait. Outside. Inside. Hey, wait a minute. Ben won't like this. Well, that makes it even. I don't like Ben. Look, I don't want any trouble. Okay, then don't make any trouble. Well, what do you want here anyway? Oh, let's just say I drop by for an unfriendly visit. If Ben finds you here, it'll get real unfriendly. I'm warning you, get out of here. Ain't that face of yours marked up enough? Well, that mouse hanging under your eye isn't exactly a beauty mark. Ben really spreads his blessings, doesn't he? Hey. <laughs> Yeah, it really spread one blessing right there, right there close in front of me. It was a small room, about the size of a large closet, with a clothes sprawl high and low, making the whole place look like a collapsed clothesline. And there, hanging on the back of the door, was Ben Arnold's police uniform. My eyes popped out, pushed one of its shiny brass buttons, and rang the bell. There, like little brass love letters on the brass, stood the initials C.P.D. And CPD were never the initials of the Benton Police Department. Thanks for seeing me so quickly, Barker. Dollar, you are a... Good Lord, what happened to your face? A couple of police uniforms with overstuffed shoulders did this to me last night. Oh, there you are. I warned you. We're up against a ruthless bunch. Something should be done about it. Why, using the police force to beat up anybody who stands in their way? No, Barker. They were wearing uniforms, but they weren't police. They what? Well, I'm afraid I don't follow you. Barker, can you give me one good reason for a Benton cop to be wearing an out-of-town uniform? And, and don't tell me they got mixed up at the cleaners. Out-of-town uniform? Yeah. Yeah, and here's another one. If the law enforcement set up here is so rotten, why would they go to all the trouble of dressing up an outsider to do their muscle work? Well, I don't know... What I mean is, did they? Who else would do it? it certainly couldn't have been Marsha. Well, why not? The policy I'm interested in is the one that Parakoff, as president of that uh, coal company, took out on Wolf's life because of his importance to the company. That kind of policy is taken out every day. But Marsha, as vice president of that coal company, is in line to collect on that policy if Wolf goes to the chair. Yeah, but why should Wolf admit to the shooting? He has nothing to gain and his life to lose. Now, look. Marsha told me that the night of the murder, she and Wolf were alone in the house talking about the coal business. And then she didn't know what I meant when I used the words bituminous and anthracite. Uh, whatever Marsha had on the fire that night with Wolf, it wasn't coal. No. Yeah. Well, you're right about that. Marsha and Wolf were having some kind of romance. Okay. So let's say Marsha shot her husband. Let's say Wolf is madly in love with her. Mm -hmm. Let's say she promises Wolf that she will testify he shot her husband in self defense. Marsha gets away with murder. Wolf gets away with a light sentence or none at all. And then Wolf gets away with a girl. That makes sense. Yeah, but what makes you think this is even possible? Barker, somebody had me beat up last night. I say the prosecution wouldn't have bothered sending fake cops. So, the question is, who would? There's one thing I've got to check, and check fast. Well, yeah, so what's that? Those police photos you gave me show that Parakoff was shot by a left-handed shooter. And that's one of the prosecution's strongest points. Wolf was left-handed. Well, that doesn't prove that Marsha isn't. Barker, I'm going out and see Mrs. Parkson. 
Mrs. Tarakoff. And there's only one thing I really hope. That she's left-handed? Uh-uh. That she's wearing that same negligee she had on last night. <laughs> Marsha, can I come in? Why, jo Johnny, what happened to your face? Oh, I didn't get down to the beauty parlor today. You look like you've been fighting. Uh-huh. Not too well, but wisely. Well, come on in the other room. And uh, how about throwing another log on the fire? Hey, you're a real little firebug, aren't you? You should have lived back in old Nero's time. Whose time? Mm, never mind. I'll tell you what, I'll build the fire if you light it. Well, I'd love to. Oh, you're getting a dry one from inside. Last night, you went all the way outside to get one that would burn for a long time. Oh, that was last night. You got some paper? Oh, uh, here's some. Mm, there we are. Okay, hot point. Here's my letter. Touch it off. Okay. There, that'll do it. Come on. Sit down over here. Now, over here will do. This chair is a perfect fit for me. Which makes me think maybe the state of Ohio has a chair that's a perfect fit for you. What are you talking about? Well, if you want to play games, I'll read you the rules. You know, there's a big advantage in being on my side of investigation. Fellas in my racket have the benefit of a lot of experience. But murderers, well, almost everyone is inexperienced at that business. One moment they aren't murderers, the next moment they are. Johnny, please. Now, let's have a look at what's on my side. For instance, from the empty shell thrown off by an automatic pistol, the experts can get a better picture of a murder scene than they can from the witnesses. Your husband was killed by a gun that was held approximately 18 inches away and directly in front of him. And the bullets entered the right half of his body. That means he was killed by someone who shoots left-handed. Harlan Wolf is left-handed. You can ask him. He'll tell you. I know that. And so are you. Anybody who lights a cigarette lighter with your left hand is left-handed, which makes you a good candidate. That doesn't prove anything. No? No, I guess it doesn't. But this chair I'm sitting in does. What do you mean? Last night you told me Wolf was sitting in it when your husband came home. And that statement makes you a liar. Look, I'm trained down to the point where my belt is ready to sue my hips for non-support. And I can just get into this thing. And Wells' Wolf's picture shows that he's got a beam like the Queen Mary. He wasn't in this chair, which makes me think he wasn't even in this room when your husband was killed. All right. So I'm a liar. That doesn't mean I'm a killer. Marsha, investigators can make a lot of mistakes, but a murderer can only make one, and you've made a big one. I tell you, I'm no murderer. You've got to believe me, Johnny. I'll tell you everything. You're right. Harlan Wolf wasn't here. That's enough, Marsha. Shut up. Eric, what are we going to do? He knows. Now keep quiet. Oh, well, Barker... A defense attorney, you're acting mighty offensive. We'll have to get rid of him, Eric. Just as soon as we get rid of something else. Dollar, you've only got one thing on me, Ben Arnold's wallet. And I want that. Now. You're welcome to it, Barker. But it might interest you to know that I've had this picture taken this morning. Your phony policeman's wallet and everything in it. And copies are in the mail right now. The insurance company won't have any trouble connecting you with the comedy cops who beat me up last night. You're bluffing. Yeah, there's something else I've got on you, Barker. This morning... When I was lying in bed, counting the bumps on my head, it suddenly occurred to me that you were the only one who knew where I was going last night. So you must have been the one who had me roughed up. It also does my heart good to see you standing there with that gun in your left hand, which makes you a candidate, too. Shoot him! Shoot him, Eric! You're a lawyer, Barker. What's your legal opinion? Are you just an accessory after the fact or before the fact? Or are you the murderer? What are you waiting for? Shoot him. Kill him, I tell you. Shut up, Marsha. Dollar, stand still. If you won't, I will. Give me that gun. Marsha, look out. When Marsha made a rush to grab the gun from Barker, she got between me and the gun, and I drove in behind her, arms straight out, picked her up, and heaved. <laughs> Marsha went smashing into Barker, and I went in a frantic treasure hunt through that flailing mass of a snorting, angry bodies to find the head that held the gun. Believe me, it was no place for a lady, but Marsha was no lady. I grabbed deep in between them and pushed Barker's gun hand up another go-round and just to make sure the rest was strictly a fist fight, jammed my trigger finger in over his and pumped all the, till all the shots went into the ceiling. The 
way the plaster was falling, it was like another fight in the snow. But this time, Johnny Dollar came up heads instead of tails. Eric! 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 Come on, Barker. Up you come. Uh, 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 and down you go. Uh, oh, Eric. All right, Nancy. All right. When I first met you last night, I asked you please to save a yes for later. I'm going to ask you a few little questions. If I'm right, let's hear it. One... Did you kill your husband? Okay, two. Did Eric Barker shoot your husband? Did you kill Harlan Wolf? Tell him you did it and talk him into taking this this rap for you? It was all Eric's idea. He said we'd get rid of my husband and Wolf and... And collect their insurance. Well, Marcia, there's just one more question. Are you or aren't you going to call the district attorney and invite him over here? Yes. Expense account item 11, $12.40. That was lunch for the district attorney, who also turned out to be left-handed. <laughs> and a very nice guy to boot. We had a lot in common. It was the first case either one of us had ever worked on where the defense had been working harder than the state to bring in a conviction. Also, that it was the first case where everybody on both sides turned out to be guilty. Defense attorney Eric Barker of murder, his girlfriend Marsha Parakoff of being an accessory before and after the fact, and Harlan Wolf of conspiracy to defraud. Ha! <laughs> no wonder the nation's jails are getting overcrowded. Expense account item 12, $700. Uh, side trip to Miami, Florida. Purpose, uh... uh <clears throat> purpose, uh, to recover from catching 40 winks and uh, a miserable cold in Benton, Ohio, snowbank. Hey, Johnny, come on in. The water's fine. Expense account total, $1,230.20. Signed, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now a word about a special CBS broadcast this Sunday. You'll find it a story that grips you for a full 60 minutes on the air. A startling drama of a young reporter who finds that his assignment comes too close to home. A revelation of disturbing facts about our mental hospitals based on actual documented reports and six months of intensive study and preparation. With Eddie Albert starring as the young reporter, this tale of a mind in the shadow comes to you by popular demand in a repeat performance next Sunday over most of these same CBS stations. Be sure to hear Mind in the Shadow next Sunday at 12.30 Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> Again next week when CBS brings you Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar with Charles Russell as Johnny. Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd with music by Mark Warno and is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Broadcasting System presents... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he is just an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Oriental West, Cargo Bonding Company, San Francisco. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of delayed cargo aboard the SS Shanghai Wayfarer, 
or the case of the slow boat from China. Expense account, item one, $181.52. Plane fare from Hartford to San Francisco in answer to your urgent call. Expense account, item two, $3. Lunch on Fisherman's Wharf in answer to my stomach's urgent call. Item three, a dollar twenty. Cab fare to your office. Dollar, my name is Fundy. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you before. Well, may I say it's a pleasure meeting you. It's a rough trip. I'm glad it's over. Over? Oh, it's just begun. Here, Dollar. This is your plane ticket to Singapore. Singapore? Hmm? You know, Fundy, I had a choice. Really? To come to San Francisco to see you or to take a case in Boston. A nice old lady on Beacon Hill clubbed her husband with an early American bed warmer. But no, rather than New England broiled lobster, I'd rather have San Francisco cracked crab. Now, all of a sudden, Singapore. May I ask why? Uh, yes. We've bonded against a delay, a $120,000 cargo of raw tin aboard the Shanghai Wayfarer. The ship was due to sail from Singapore three weeks ago. Still out there, tied up in the Tanjong Pagar dock. What's the delay? Mutinous, mechanical, or just plain mysterious? <laughs> I'm afraid it's little of each. We flew an expediter out there ten days ago to see what he could do. All the satisfaction we've had from this man, Harrison, is a report that since his arrival, the wayfarer's main shaft has burned out, her freshwater pumps have fouled up, and her steering machinery has gone on the fritz. You don't need an insurance investigator. You need a good plumber. <laughs> well, maybe you're right. But anyhow, you'll find our man, Harrison, William Harrison, at the Crown Colony Hotel. He'll fill in the details. Dollar, you have only a matter of hours after you hit Singapore to get the Shanghai wayfarer started on its way. I, uh... I must impress upon you the fact that any delay after that will cost this company $2,500 a day. Well, all I can promise is the old college try. Times like this, I wish I'd gone to college. Well, anyway, I'm in the right town to make my last night in the States a good one. A few drinks with the right gal at the top of the mark. A few rare steaks at Alfred's. A few dances to Freddie Martin's music at the St. Francis. A few moments alone in the arms... A dollar. Huh? That sounds mighty good. But your plane leaves in two hours. Two hours? Well, I guess I'll have to do without the drinks, the dinner, and the dancing. Expense account item four, $120. Lost in the course of teaching fellow passenger how to play poker. My mother warned me not to, never to play cards with strangers on trains or steamships. I wish she'd included airplanes. You'd implied, Fundy, that the situation smelled. Well, you should have caught a whiff of the city, especially the native sections, through which I had to pass on my way to the Crown Colony Hotel. I found it on Anson Road. I found myself a room. I also found William Harrison's room. Harrison? Hey, Harrison! But I didn't find Harrison. All I found was a calling card from my old friend, Trouble. Wherever Harrison was, he didn't want to be. And he left a trail of broken furniture and blood to prove it. I searched the dresser. Shirt size, 14. Socks, 9. That meant Harrison was a small man. I went through the bathroom, shaving brush and toothbrush still wet, indicating that he'd been there not too many hours before I arrived. Then I tried the wastebasket. In addition to one large glob of used chewing gum, an empty cigarette package, and some old Kleenex, I found a swizzle stick with a name on it. The Collier Key Bar. Well, all that meant was that Harrison had a head cold and was trying to cure it with Singapore slings. But at least I knew where he'd been drinking them. The Collier Key Bar looked out on the harbor. It was dark enough inside to give a man a good excuse for drinking nightcaps at noon. Your pleasure, sir. Say, uh, how are you on mixed drinks? Mixed drinks? Governor, if I don't know how to make them, I look them up in the book. If they ain't in the book, I fake them. Now, what'll it be? <laughs> Straight bourbon. Right, yours, sir. Oh, hey, uh, bartender. Yes, sir. Are you by any chance acquainted with an American named Harrison? Harrison, sir? Yeah. He arrived in Singapore about ten days ago. Small man with a cold in his head. Oh, Harrison. Sure, I know him right mm -hmm. enough. He's been coming in every night with a chief engineer from one of the ships in port. Oh, yeah? What ship is that? Well, the Shanghai Wayfarer, I think. Oh, the Shanghai Wayfarer. What's this engineer's name? 
Yeah, you now, hold on. I, I ain't getting him into any trouble, am I? He's a nice chap, he is. A handsome tipper. This handsome? My governor, 20 American dollars. Why? Compared to you, sir, Mr. Frank Moore is downright tight-fisted. Well, now, that's it. I, I done it. I let Mr. Frank Moore's name slip right now. My missus is right. For a little man, I've got a ruddy large mouth. Expense account, item five. Rickshaw fare to the Tanjong Pagar docks, ten cents. Tip to Pony Boy, one dollar. The ships moored fore and aft of the Shanghai Wayfarer were busy stuffing the pungent treasures of the East into their deep steel pockets. And the only sign of life aboard the Shanghai Wayfarer was the right hand of the burly gangway watch. It was holding a knife with a six-inch blade and slicing thin slivers off a plug that looked more like tar than tobacco. As a gangway watch, he might have been fine. But as a reception committee, he was no Elsa Maxwell. That's far enough, mate. There's nobody aboard and there's nobody coming aboard. It's all right with me. All I want is a little information. Where can I find your chief engineer, Frank Moore? You come to the wrong place. Try the icebox over at the Singapore police. They fished him out of the harbor this morning, stabbed to death. Oh? Uh, are there any idea who did it? They're holding some dame he's been playing around with. No, I don't know her name. Have they got anything else? Listen, mate, my job is to guard the ship, not answer questions. Okay, okay, have it your way. Well, watch out for pirates. <laughs> The British chief inspector, Singapore police, gave me everything except an invitation to tea. But unfortunately, he'd never even heard of Harrison. He took me into the morgue, and a look at Frank Moore's body told me nothing I didn't already know. He'd been stabbed, all right, and whoever had killed him had sunk him with a hole in one. As for his personal effects, his maritime union card confirmed the fact that he was indeed the chief engineer of the Shanghai Wayfarer. A stack of crisp American $20 bills in his wallet made me wonder whether he hadn't been picking up a little extra pin money for delaying the departure of his ship. And finally, a photograph that made me admire the late Mr. Moore's taste in women. Whoever it was that said, never the twain shall meet, should have met her. She was half caste and all woman. Her picture was inscribed to Frank Moore, yours forever, Chandra. From the inspector, I learned two more things. One, the fact that the police had already questioned and released her. And two, her business address, the Wardlow Bar on Melee Street. Hello, Mr. Young. You uh, like a midnight sing song girl? No. The only girl I want to hear sing songs is Dinah Shaw. Go on, beat it, will you? Oh, hey, wait a minute. Yes, do I? Uh, where's Chandra? Oh, she go across to Penang tonight. You buy me drink, mister? We sit right over... Remember, Anja, the gunner! Get it. Oh, Zamunda, hello. I pushed you away home to Shanghai one night huh? in your own coffee. Complete with stab wounds, no doubt. Why you say that? Why you ask for Chandra? I'm a stranger in town. I can't find the local chapter of the Lonely Hearts Club. So, shall we find a quiet table? I don't know you. No, but you knew Frank Moore. That gives us something in common. Over there is one. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a very quiet table to me. In Singapore, you will learn whispers stand out in the quiet. They disappear in the noise. I'll bow to the wisdom of the native guide. But uh, who said I had any secrets? You talk about Frank Moore, so I know if you do not have secrets to give, there must be secrets you like to learn. But I tell the police everything I know, which is nothing. Oh, no, you are disappointed in me? No, no, not at all. You make good scenery. And I'll bet there's quite a story that goes with you. Oh, you find me interesting. I'm a man. Why do you come to me? Well, there were two places I could go for what I'm after. And you're much prettier than the SS Shanghai Wayfarer. I'm looking for a lead on a man named Harris. Your murdered friend Frank Moore knew him, so... Figures you know him. You are wrong. I do not know him. 
I do not even know you. Oh, well, that's soon fixed. My name is Johnny Dollar. Your name is nice. Especially the uh, dollar part, huh? You are very droll, but I see when you make this joke, there is no smile on your face. You are worried about your friend, Mr. Harrison? Yeah, that's right. Maybe he was lonely tonight. Maybe he does not want you to find him. Ah, you certainly make me feel much better. How about a drink? I never drink before midnight. All right, then I'll wait. We'll have one then. All right, Johnny. But we don't have it here. We go to my house. There it is cool on the river. And there it is quiet. So we do not have to whisper. Midnight must have been invented for Singapore, and her house must have been invented for midnight. Only one thing looked out of place. Up on the wall was a souvenir of Chandra's war effort, a real American baseball bat, a Louisville slugger. And on it was written, Remember the U.S. Marines. Everything else in the place was soft. The lights, cushions, and Chandra. It is nicer to drink here, no? Yeah, may I say it's uh, a might intoxicating without a drink. I wish the boys back in my high school senior class could see me now. What do you mean? In the graduation annual, they predicted I'd be a bookkeeper. Oh, I do not understand you. And neither did the boys in my senior class. Johnny, please say things I can understand. I want to know you better. Maybe if I stop talking altogether, you'll get to know me better. Johnny... I stopped talking, but I didn't stop thinking. When I'd mentioned Harrison to Chandra earlier, she said maybe he was lonely tonight. If she didn't know him or anything about him, I wondered how she knew that he was missing tonight and not for a couple of days, or maybe even longer. Besides, the boyfriends of women like her don't keep secrets. I still assumed that if Frank Moore had known Harrison, Chandra had known Harrison. I also assumed that she'd spidered me into her parlor for purposes other than social. And that notion was seconded soon after I had it, when somebody kicked the door open. There he is, thank you, Johnny Dollar. The two boys in the door were not from Western Union. And ugly as they were, Chandra left my side to join them, which made me think that maybe my senior class had been right. Looking at that trio six eyes and two guns glaring at me, I wished I was a bookkeeper. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, here it is almost the end of February. All over the country, people are thinking about their new cars. All but one man. And he remains quite content with his old automobile and wearing apparel. An ancient Maxwell and a well-worn toupee. For these reasons, and for several others, named Mary, Dennis, Don, Phil, and Rochester, he now has the number one comedy show in America. All over the country, people think about him, too, every Sunday night. Hear the Jack Benny Show with Claude Rains as Jack's special guest next Sunday on all these same CBS network stations. And now, back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The men with the guns, described from left to right, were a fat man with three chins and a bald dome... And with him, a punk with a sneer and arms that were too long for the rest of them. They gun-muzzled me into a chair and started making anything but sense. Hmm. Well, well, Chandra, my dear. <clears throat> we are at last face to face with the mysterious stranger, Johnny Dollar. Oh, don't kill the suspense and tell me why. He knows why. He came to the Wardlow Bar. He knew about Frank Moore, and he was looking for the other one, Harrison. That is why I phoned you. Well, <clears throat> it would seem then that this unfortunate chain of events is... Needing the final link. Yeah, this guy uses his head better than Harrison did. Well, Della? I'm using my head right now. Splendid, splendid. So doing, you may well prevent Harrison's death as well as your own. Oh, well, that's better than nothing. 
But uh, is that all you can offer? Skip the bargaining, Russ Line. Takes too much time. Quiet, Corgi. There are times when money is cheaper than the results of your kind of blind violence. Well, Dollar, you do have a price. Take a tip from my last name. Start bidding. I tell you, you're nuts, Rosalind. You aren't sure he knows where it is. He must know. He was looking for Harrison. They both know. You'll be quiet, both of you. 500 pounds English dollar. Where is it? At times like this, I keep my mouth shut and my ears open. 750. Surely, dollar, since you've entered the situation at such a late date, that is profit enough. Oh, well, I'm a man of expensive taste. I've always aspired to such things as $200 cigarette lighters. Go ahead. Keep spitting out that wise talk and you'll be spitting out teeth. Well, how'd you like to go swimming with your hands and feet tied? I could bite my tongue. <clears throat> uh, not, not just yet, Corgi, my boy. <laughs> this man is worthless, dead. Uh, perhaps, Dolly, we can induce you to talk in much the same way as we could prepare to pat it by <clears throat> slitting the tongue. You know, Rosalind, your mother must have been scared by Sidney Greenstreet. Hey, you... Either this guy is nuts or he doesn't know anything. What I know would fill a police blotter. Okay. You know nothing of psychology, my boy. What this man is attempting to pass off as a show of bravery is based purely on the knowledge that he is, momentarily at least, of some considerable value to us alive. Now, Dollar, be careful. Before you make your final decision, bear in mind you've heard our final offer. No, sir. What should it be? I was a squirrel. A squirrel said to the little girl when she asked him what he wanted for Christmas, nuts. Very well, Nella. Corgi. Thanks. I finally came to in the dark, trussed up like a turkey, and lay there trying to figure it out. Obviously, the two rude dudes thought I knew something I didn't know. But what I did know was that finding Harrison had turned into a big, fat headache. Also, that I had accomplished exactly nothing towards speeding the SS Shanghai Wayfarer over the bounding main. While I was comforting myself by repeating over and over that old insurance company soother, never say die, I discovered I wasn't alone. Hello. Huh? You, who are you? Well, you were here first. You tell me. Well, my name is Harrison. Harrison? Yes, who are you? I'm Johnny Dollar. I was sent out here by the Oriental West Cargo Bonding Company. Oriental West? Yes, I was supposed to do what you couldn't get done. And look at me now. Getting hit over the head and dumped in here must be par for the course. How long have you been here, and why? Well, I've been driving myself crazy trying to figure that out. Well, this little guest house, wherever we are, must only have one set of proprietors. I can tell you who they are, at least by the names they're using tonight. Rosalind and Corgi. They offered me 750 English pounds to tell them where something called it was. What is it? Well, it's a package. What's in it, I don't know. It belonged to the chief engineer of the Shanghai Wayfarer, Frank Moore. He was helping me try to get the ship on its way, and I, I owed him a favor. He asked me to drop this package at a bar. The, the, the Wardlow bar, yeah, go ahead. That's right. I was supposed to give it to a girl named Chandra. She wasn't there, so I got her address and went out to her place. You mean that package is at Chandra's house? Yes. When I got out there, the Chinese maid let me in. I, I waited as long as I could, and then rather than leave what might be a valuable package just lying around loose, I, I put it into the bottom drawer of a dresser and left. Oh, great. For such things, I go around laying down my life. Well, it's obvious that these men will stop at nothing to get their hands on that package. Well, when they asked you where it was, why didn't you tell them? Then neither one of us would be here. What's more, I'm beginning to think the sooner they get the package, the sooner our ship sails. Frank Moore had been a good friend to me. He wanted Chandra to have it, and I, I couldn't just turn it over to those two. Well, I've got some news for you. And this should make you really unhappy. Those two happen to be in business with Chandra. Huh? They're all on the same team. She's one of them. What an idiot I've been. Yeah, well, here we are, all roped up. You know, for a pair of guys who came out here to speed a shipload of raw tin on its way, we're doing just dandy. We're lucky if we get out of this thing alive. Offhand, I'd say our host probably murdered Frank Moore trying to get that package. Maybe we're next. Uh-oh. Maybe right now. A beam from a powerful flashlight stabbed us in the eyes. The sudden change from too much dark to too much light kept us blinded. Well, look who's here. At least the voice behind the glare wasn't Rosalind's and it wasn't Corgi's. But it was a familiar voice, one I'd heard and heard lately. He walked in on us, the flash in one hand and in the other, a knife with a six-inch blade. At first I wondered whether it was the one that had been buried in Frank Moore's back. And then I remembered where I'd seen it before. 
The man bending over us was the burly gangway watch from the Shanghai Wayfarer. And you told me to watch out for pirates. Well, this situation is getting a little overcrowded. I didn't think there was room for any more. What do you want? You know what I want, Dollar. The same thing Rosalind and Corgi are ripping your hotel room apart for right now. Now, don't tell me you're looking for it, too. Two things I know about that package, mister. The name is Rourke. Okay, Rourke. One thing I know is that it's dangerous company. The other is I want no part of it. The only thing I'm interested in is getting the Shanghai Wayfarer out of port. That won't be hard once I get that package. Where is it, Dollar? Uh, I'll trade the answer to that question for a little freedom. Okay, hold still. Oh, okay. Nice. Harrison's next. I want him with us in case he's lying. All right. Okay, Harrison, roll over. Hey, you! When Rourke bent over Harrison, I drop kicked the flashlight out of his hand, ran across the darkened room, through the open door, and kept on running. Sometimes the long way around is the shortest way home, so I headed for Chandra's house. I not only had some getting even to do, but I had some curiosity to satisfy. Somehow, the Shanghai Wayfarer's failure to sail on schedule was tied up with a mysterious package. But how? Why? I decided I'd earned the right to see what was in that package. Johnny! I didn't want you to be lonely. I heard your playmates are over making themselves at home in my room. So I thought you and I could have a little chat. Maybe I've got a surprise for you. What, Johnny? I think I know where that package is. Johnny, you gave that package. We both don't worry for the rest of our lives. But we must hurry before Rosalind and Corgi come back. We go now. Okay, where's your bedroom? Johnny, what do you mean? Now, come on, where is it? Come, I'll show you. No, it cannot be. It's not the one, no. It's been here all the time. And now while I open this thing, you can go and have yourself a nervous breakdown. (laughs) Say, this is more fun than unwrapping Christmas presents. And now I take off the cover. Wow. Now I know how the winner feels on Hit the Jackpot. The package was paper all the way through. Brown wrapping on the outside and green spending on the inside. Big bundles of fresh, clean American 20s. Thousands of the same kind of bills that the Singapore police had found in the late Frank Moore's wallet. It would have taken half a day to count it, and I'd wasted too much time already. They'll be no good to you without me, Johnny. You have to know how to get rid of them. Oh, counterfeit, huh? Yes. They are made in China. Frank Moore brought them from Shanghai to Rosalind to take to the States, but Rosalind was not here in Singapore. He was late, so Frank had to make some accidents happen to his ship to keep it from sailing. But then he changed his mind. He decided he would give the money himself. But Rosalind caught up with him. Oh, I see. He was sending them to you by way of Harrison, just before he was knifed by Rosalind, huh? Who talked him into that? You, by any chance? You and I could be very rich, Johnny. You never give up, do you? There's $500,000 there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that should buy about 50 years in jail. I'm taking this down to customs and you with it. No, I do not think you do. Uh huh. Time to play another visiting team. Come on, beautiful. I don't want you in the way. Let go of me, Harrison! I grabbed her, lashed her wrist with a cord from the package, and since she liked money so much, I stuffed her mouth with a fistful of those troublesome twenty dollar bills. I locked her and the rest of the loot into a closet, and dashed into the other room looking for a weapon. And then I remembered that Louisville slugger from the U.S. Marines. I was glad they'd landed. I grabbed it off the wall, got a toehold in the carpet on the left side of that door, wrapped my fingers around the bat, swung it on the back of my shoulder, and waited. Sandra. Sandra, my dear, we just came to... Two outs and one to go. Three outs and the side is retired. What a ball game. First, I take your guns. And now we sit and wait for you to wake up. I'll take over from here on in, Dollar. Huh? Oh, I don't know about that, Rourke. I happen to be the guy who has the gun. Oh? Well, here. Take a look at this. What's in your wallet that I want to look at? More hot 20s? 
I'm not taking my eyes off you, Rourke. Okay, I'll turn around with my hands up, and then you can look at it. Okay, fair enough. But if you so much as move, I'll start shooting. That's the deal. Oh, it's a fine time to learn this. Are you satisfied? John Joseph Rourke, U.S. Treasury Department. Come on in. I'm sorry I couldn't come out into the open before, Dollar, but I was too close to the payoff of this case to take any chances. Well, you know, I'm beginning to think that just being in this town is taking chances. That counterfeit's been funneling through this port on its way from China for months. We had more staked out for a long time, but this is the first shot we had at the top. That's him lying there on the floor, Rosalind. Now I've got him. Oh, your pal Harrison told me where I can find the only other thing I need, that package of hot money in the dresser drawer. Oh, it's now moved into the bedroom closet along with a package of hot woman. Well, then, Dollar, it looks like my job out here is just about done. Yeah, I guess so. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? You're from the Treasury Department. Yes? Well, then, after you get all these birds into their cages, how about helping me make out my income tax? <laughs> Expense account, item six. Hotel bill, one night in Singapore, $5. Item seven... One new outfit, replacing mine, which was ruined in course of taking midnight dip in Singapore River, $200. Item eight, $20. Bar checks for cheering up one William Harrison, your expediter, whose innocence had him running errands for the man who was holding up the departure of your ship. Item nine, $375. Spent while killing time until the departure of my plane back to the States. After the Shanghai Wayfarer finally sailed. You see, this time, I had four hours on my hands instead of the two you allowed me in San Francisco. Expense account total, $1,407. Signed, yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's Johnny Dollar Adventure. But first, for more exciting drama in the mystery and adventure line, remember CBS 2 thrill-packed Saturday night shows, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe and Gangbusters. Be sure to hear Philip Marlowe and Gangbusters tomorrow night on most of these same CBS network stations. Next week, CBS will take you adventuring with Johnny Dollar, hitting the hot spots in Palm Beach and New Orleans with the star of Hades, Diamond, on a trip all points south. Charles Russell plays the role of Johnny. Our music is composed and conducted by Mark Warno. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd and is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Broadcasting System presents Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he is just an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, American Continental Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures fulfilling your assignment as a, uh, a bodyguard, the body being that of your late policyholder, Robert W. Perry. Expense account item one, fare on night train, Hartford to New York, $3.80. Expense account item two... A dollar eighty taxi to Lower Manhattan the following morning. Two officers, Perry and Van Bruten, importers, arriving as promised at exactly nine a.m. Good morning. May I help you? Yeah, my name is Johnny Dollar. I have an appointment with Mr. Perry for nine o'clock. Oh yes, from the insurance company. Well, you're right on time. Well, he told me I'd better be. Mr. Perry just came in. He's alone and waiting for you. I'll buzz him that you're here. Thanks. <laughs> 
What was left of your policyholder, Mr. Perry, was just sliding out of his swivel chair as I hit the room. The top of his desk had erupted, and splinters of mahogany pointed their sharp fingers upward through lazy circles of smoke swirling toward the ceiling. The buzzer from his secretary's desk had been rigged to a booby trap. Oh, oh no, Mr. Perry. Stay away from him. There's nothing you can do for him. He's dead. Oh, what happened? What happened? Whatever happened? Come on, we, let's, let's get back out of here. Here you are. Now. Sit down. I'll get you a drink of water. Uh, just drink this. What happened? We, we have an explosion. I turned in an alarm. Is anybody hurt? There's a doctor on the third floor. Should I call him? Never mind the doctor. Call the police. And nobody gets in here until they arrive. And the rest of you, go on, beat it. Run along. And turn off that alarm. Okay, miss. Now, just take it easy. But it was all so sudden. What happened? Well, that's not too hard to figure out. Somebody wanted to give your boss, Mr. Perry, a shortcut through life. So whoever it was figured out that a secretary would never buzz her boss unless he was at his desk. They rigged up a bomb somewhere in his desk that would go off when you buzzed him. Oh, but, but I killed him. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't get hysterical on me. There's excitement enough around here, and there'll be plenty more when the police get here. Keep cool. But I did it. You saw me do it. Look, the way you put it, I killed him by coming in here and giving you my name so you'd buzz him. Drop it, will you? I'm sorry. Uh, now, uh, what about yesterday? Was he here? Yes, all day. What time was it when you last used the buzzer? Wait, right up to the last minute, about 5.30. Uh, who left the office first, you or Perry? Mr. Perry, he always leaves first, and I lock up. Uh, looks of things, you should have used more locks last night. Somebody got in here to do some wiring. Uh-oh, I forgot that fire alarm. All that equipment and no fire. Look, before the police arrive, do you know why I was sent here? Yes. Mr. Perry recently felt that his life was in danger. He thought that, well, with a $100,000 policy, the insurance company would do everything they could to help keep him alive. Well, we didn't have much of a chance, did we? What was he afraid of? I don't know. Okay. What were his other appointments for today? He only had two. His partner, Mr. Van Bruten, at 11. And then... One at a time now. Van Bruten. Anything special about their meeting? Yes. Mr. Van Bruten arrived just yesterday from Holland. You mean there was a branch of this firm in Holland? Yes, and Mr. Perry was buying out Van Bruten's interest. They had their final meeting at Van Bruten's hotel last night. Oh? And Van Bruten was coming by this morning to pick up his money. Uh, cash? No, a cashier's check. The bank is to deliver here at 10.30. Now, quick, Perry's other appointment. Who was that? Christine, his wife. Oh, yeah. Now Christine, the beneficiary. Yes, but she wouldn't have been the beneficiary in another two weeks. They were getting a divorce. Thanks for the motive. You don't like her? I didn't mean it that way. How about Perry? Did you like him? Okay, well, here's an easy one. What's your name? Susan. Susan Gates. Now, isn't that about enough? Okay, Susan. You'd better save your voice. During the next few hours, you're going to have a lot of talking to do. Oh, here come the firemen, and we haven't even got a child to ask them to save. Where's the fire? I'm looking for a fire. Just stick around. When the cops get here, somebody will get burned. The firemen should have stuck around because the cops arrived in a blaze of glory. It was a very high-class investigation. Two lieutenants. Finally, after about an hour, the police photographer ran out of flashbulbs, the office of the deceased ran out of fingerprints, and the lieutenants ran out of questions. So the on-the-scene phase of the investigation was closed. At about five minutes of 11, I left the police to pack up their notebooks, their clues, and the body, and went into the outer office. Susan looked like she could use a big, broad shoulder to weep on, but unfortunately, I was wearing my light gray suit. About then, a dark blue suit and a deep green voice entered the room from the corridor. Say, hey, there's some fellow out here who says he belongs here. His name is Van Bruten. Shall I let him in? Oh, what do you think? His name is on the door you just opened. Oh, indeed, now. Well, my name happens to be Murphy, and it's on beds all over the country. But that don't mean I'm stuffed with feathers, does it? <laughs> This'll teach you, Johnny Dollar, never to cross tongues with an Irishman. <laughs> okay, send him in, officer. Yeah. All right, you can come in. The policeman out there. Is there trouble here? 
Oh, uh, I'm Bremer Van Bruten. Where's Mr. Parry? What? He's waiting for me, no? No. But my appointment... He's not keeping any. He's dead. Dead? It's impossible. Last night I saw him. He was well. What happened? He was hit by a buzz bomb. A buzz bomb? Please. Oh, sorry. I forgot other people aren't used to these things. You mean that was foul play? Very foul. Please, may I sit down? My first visit in all these years since before the war. It was to be so happy. Now, tragedy like this. He was a good man, a good partner. I understand that as of last night, you were no longer partners. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I realize, of course, that it is indelicate to speak of such things as money at a time like this. But that is why I'm here, to receive my payment. Oh, just because Perry got his, there's no reason for you not getting yours, huh? But you misunderstand me. I am deeply grieved. Since the transaction was consummated, what is there to do? A delay would be a needless waste of money. I have already paid for passage back to Amsterdam tomorrow. Your check is here, Mr. Van Bruten. Here you are. Thank you. In all my years of business, this is indeed the saddest moment. Yeah. Yeah, those are very kind words, Van Bruten. And I'd believe them if your eyes would stop counting all the zeros on that check. <laughs> Expense account, item three, 90 cents. Phone call to your company. American Continental Life Insurance Company, good morning. Oh, uh, well, that's a matter of opinion. This is Johnny Dollar. Put me through to Mr. Gordon, will you? Yes, sir. Mr. Gordon's office. Look, honey, this is Johnny Dollar. I want to speak to Gordon. Oh, and uh, while I'm telling him what I've got to tell him, maybe you'd better sit in his lap with some smelling salts. I'm not that type of a secretary. And besides, he doesn't have a lap. Hello, Dollar. How are you making out? I owe about $100,000. What's that? Yeah, somebody turned Mr. Perry into a firecracker. He's dead. Oh, that's bad news. It's a big policy, you know. Yeah. Look, what I want to know is, shall I stay on the case? Oh, certainly, Dollar. Certainly, by all means. Uh, by the way, is there, is there a chance of uh, proving suicide? There's a non-payment clause. To make this one a suicide, there'd have to be a Santa clause. Nobody could hate himself enough to do it this way. Well, what are the fraud possibilities? Uh, only fair. There's an estranged wife. She's the beneficiary, but uh, she wouldn't have been in a couple of weeks. Divorce coming up. I'll start with her. Uh, all right, Tyler. Good luck. But watch those expenses. Why, Gordon, I'm surprised. I think an insurance man would be the first to want to see a fellow live a little. <laughs> Expense account, item three. Cab fare, $2.80. Tip to driver, $1.00. Christine Perry's apartment was on Sutton Place, overlooking the river. And from what the doorman told me, all of the proprieties. I took the elevator up to the 24th floor, and there I discovered that our garden fresh widow was living high in more ways than one. Everything about the place was French. The maid that led me into the living room, the decor, and the perfume, which reminds you that breathing can be fun. I looked up from enjoying my nose to see Mrs. Perry looking down hers. Mr. Dollar? Oh, Mrs. Perry. I believe we can dispense with any getting acquainted. You're an insurance investigator, interested in the death of my husband. So naturally, you're here because you've jumped to the conclusion that I killed him. Oh? Well, you're the one that's jumping to conclusions, lady. Then what do you want? The policy's in order, the premiums are fully paid. I'm not quite sure. I know that you've got a great motive. So far, the only motive I've found. You haven't had much time to look, have you? Check. This is my first stop. Maybe you can help me. Do you know anyone who would be happier with your husband out of the way? I know very little about my husband's friends. Or for that matter, his activities for the past six months. That's when I left him. Uh-huh. Well, that's not much help for either of us. You know, without someone else to suspect, I may just have to concentrate on you. Mr. Dollar, I picked the men I want to concentrate on me. Well, I hope you're as long on alibis as you are short on your temper. Where were you last night? With a friend, Al Donovan. For a while, the same place my husband was. And I have witnesses to prove it was with him. Anybody at the Club Caprice can tell you. Well, save me a trip. I can't afford the prices they get there. Certainly, pleasure. 
My husband was with his beautiful little secretary, Susan Gates. Well, I wouldn't be more surprised if your late husband walked through the door and said that... All right, mister, that's enough. Oh. Yeah. Uh, how much did you I'm hear? a big guy, baby, six foot four, and I've got big ears to... Oh, please. Would this be Mr. Donovan, your companion of last evening? I'm getting you out of here, Christine. I don't know what you're saying. You lie to me. How can I help you if you lie to me? You call me stupid. The way you're playing this, you'll alibi yourself right into a cell. I'm getting you out of here. What are you doing to me? Are you crazy? Come on. She's right. You are stupid, Donovan. She was doing just fine till you dropped in. Mister, you've been asking a lot of questions. Now I'll give you one answer. No. Yes, you come All right, Christine. So much for the wise guy. Now about you and your alibi. You wasn't with me at the Club Caprice last night. And if it's so easy to prove your husband was there with his secretary, who were you there with? You told me you were going with your husband, talking divorce, remember? When Al measured me for that swing, I measured my chances with him. To me, he looked like one of the corporate assets of Murder Incorporated. So I rolled with a punch, hit the floor, and stayed there, with my eyes closed and my ears open. What I heard was Christine's alibi flying out the window, Mr. Donovan giving her a few loving cuffs, and finally the pair of them flying out the door. I allowed myself the luxury of a 20-second massage on the new lump on my jaw, and then I got up, and started out after them. This case was becoming interesting. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, this important message. $60 million is what the Red Cross needs to carry on its great work in 1949. If this seems like a lot, just try to review briefly the various activities of the Red Cross. It can't be done briefly. Red Cross services extend into every area of our lives, bringing care, comfort, and recreation to the men in the armed forces, bringing first aid training, nutritional programs, nursing services, blood banks to our own communities. And all the time, as these activities go on uninterrupted, the Red Cross is holding itself ready to spring into instant action in case of disaster. Fire, flood, explosion, any sort of catastrophe finds the Red Cross on the scene with food, clothing, and medical care. Sixty million isn't so much in the light of such activity. We can make it with each of us contributing. We're giving to our own safety, security, and peace of mind, and to our neighbors, too. So let's give generously to our own Red Cross. And now back to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I hit the street just in time to see Donovan pushing Christine Perry into a cream-colored convertible. When they got rolling, I piled into a cab and followed them, and the chase was on. <laughs> At 57th and Broadway, things got complicated. My cab was three cars behind theirs when a red light flashed them to a stop. Then the door of their convertible flew open. Christine jumped out, dashed across the street, and down into the subway. Since Donovan didn't follow her, I followed him. When he finally pulled to a stop, he took two chances. He parked in a no-parking zone and walked straight into the building beside it. A police station. This is Mr. Dollar, Lieutenant. He's been waiting for you for some time. Huh? Well, you can wait outside, Sergeant. Okay, sir. Well, my name is Johnny Dollar, Lieutenant. Here are my credentials. Hmm. Insurance, huh? Yeah, the uh, Perry murder in particular. Hey, you've come to the right place, Dollar. A man named Donovan just walked in here and made a full confession. He what? That's right. My clerk's just typing it up. In the meantime, the gentleman is down in the tank having a bite of lunch on the city. He confessed. Does his story add up? As far as I know. I haven't heard too much about the case myself. It's not in my precinct. What did he use for a motive? Jealousy. Says he's in love. Wanted to marry Perry's wife. Uh, did he say how he managed it? Yeah. He stole a key to the office from the wife's apartment, entered the building last night, and wired a bomb to the buzzer system. Uh-huh. Well, guys do a lot of strange things in the name of love. <laughs> yeah, it looks like Donovan did. Yeah, he either killed a man or he's trying to cover up for someone who did. Now, listen, don't uh, execute him for a couple of days. How, Lieutenant? I 
spent the rest of the afternoon downtown in the offices of Perry and Van Bruten, importers. The partner's correspondence told me two things. They had been extremely friendly, and uh, Van Bruten was extremely bald. Perry had been sending him toupees from a famous Hollywood makeup firm. At 4.30, I opened the drawer marked Employment Files. They rocked me with two minor explosions of their own. The folder marked Donovan, Albert J., told me that he'd been employed as Perry's bodyguard over a period of years and that he was canned the day before the murder. Before I received blast number two from the folder of Perry's secretary, Susan Gates, the office door opened behind me. Well, Mr. Dollar, you're supplied with a search warrant, I hope? Just the one I was born with, Mrs. Perry. The kind they say kills cats. You know, curiosity. What are you looking for? I found it. How about you? What are you doing here? Oh, I... I'm tired of dueling with you. I'm here because I want to... Well, I've got to talk to someone. I called your hotel. You weren't there. I tried to locate Susan, but I couldn't, so... I thought maybe you'd be down here. What's the basis of our sudden friendship? You should know. Al Donovan's confession. The newspapers have it already? Yes, but there's not a word of truth in it. He didn't kill my husband. How do you know that? Because... What? It's impossible, that's all. Yeah, it was a little hard for me to swallow, too, when the police told me about it. But since then, it's become a little more digestible. What do you mean? I just learned that he was your husband's bodyguard. He was fired yesterday. That same day, your husband calls his insurance company screaming for another bodyguard. Now, how would that add up for you? A beef, maybe? Al Donovan's a fool. Never thinks. He just rushes in and says it does whatever's on his mind. He told my husband if he didn't divorce me that... Well, he threatened him. You know, you came in here saying that Donovan's confession was no good. And you spend your time making it sound better and better. What do you want, anyway? I can't help it. I, I've got to tell you the truth. I know it doesn't sound like I'm trying to help Al, but what can I do? You really want me to answer that? Here. If you want to help Al, phone the police. Tell them Donovan made that phony confession to cover up for you. It's simple. Not as simple as that. You don't need the gun, Christine. Hang up the phone. Sure. I hope you don't mind my aversion to being held for murder myself. Oh, well, that's a common aversion. I'm in no hurry to see you behind bars. But don't forget, when the cops want to pick you up, they'll do it. Now, don't spoil the rest of the afternoon. Take that gun someplace else. I've got things to do. The first I imagine will be the call that I wouldn't make. Well, not necessarily. If it'll make you feel any better, we'll just put this phone out of order. Satisfied? Of course not. But don't get me wrong, Mr. Dollar. I wish you nothing but success in your investigation. I puzzled over that exit line for a few seconds after she'd gone. And then I went back to the company's employment file. Namely, the application for employment as secretary of Susan Gates. It informed me that during the war, she had worked in a munitions plant. Her specialty, wiring bomb fuses. When Miss Susan Gates reached home at 8.30 that evening, she found a visitor, me. Oh, how did you get in here? A professional secret. Oh, you scared me. What do you want? Why did you come here? I wanted to bring you the good news. I uh, heard on the radio that Al Donovan confessed to Perry's murder. Al? I can't believe it. Why not? Who do you like for the spot? Why, Christine. Al is covering up for us. I'd like to agree with you. If it turns out that Christine wound up her husband's life with a bang, the company that hired me saves a hundred thousand dollars. But I don't know. She claims she has all kinds of alibis. One of them is you. Me? Yeah. Did you see her at the Club Caprice last night? Why, yes. I know who you were with. Your boss. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, I'm not preaching a sermon. I want to know who she was with. I don't know. A man I'd never seen before. Mr. Perry knew him, but he wouldn't tell me who he was. Why not? I don't know. He said I might get the wrong idea. About what? I don't know. We didn't sit there and talk about it all night. Why should we sit here and talk about it all night? All right, all right. When a census taker shows up and asks a lot of questions, people answer them. When an investigator tries to do his job, they make the proverbial clam look like a blabbermouth. Look, Mr. Dell, believe me, 
This has been a greater shock to me than to anyone else. Excepting, of course, your late employer, Mr. Perry. How long did you work for him? Four years. Now, where'd you work before then? Why, I... I... Let me help you. Bombs, wiring fuses, remember? All right, I remember. Good. Then maybe you'll remember a little bit more. Let's go back to last night. The guy with Christine Perry... Who was he? I tell you, I don't know. Was it Van Bruten? I don't know. You don't know? No, I mean... I'll get that. No, I'll go. You make sure you just don't keep going. <laughs> Susan! When Susan snapped the spring lock to open the door, the gun outside opened up. The first slug caught her in the left shoulder, spinning her out of the way of the rest of them. It was getting monotonous. Every time a buzzer went off, things started booming. Susan was sprawled out on the floor in front of the door... And to open it, I had to move her. By the time I did, the hallway outside was empty. Okay. Come on, take it easy. It won't start hurting for a couple of minutes. I will have a doctor here by then. He'll give you something. Now just try and keep calm. Here, I'll throw my coat over you. Now try not to move. Oh. I'm trying to ruin this rug. Never mind the rug. What we want to worry about is who tried to ruin you. What'll they do to me? What will who do to you? They'll arrest me. No, they don't arrest people for getting shot. You have any idea who it was? That man in the office this morning. The one who picked up the check. Van Bruton? No, no, he wasn't Van Bruton. He was a phony. Yes. And you still gave him that check? Yes. Well, I won't ask you why. But apparently you gave him the money and then tried to blackmail him. Is that right? They'll arrest me. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Who is this guy? Where can I find him? Oh. <gasps> Come on, now, don't pass out on me now. His name, quick. Van Sant. Where's he live? Elson Hotel. Under his own name? No, oh, I don't. I don't blame you. I could use a few moments of unconsciousness myself. <laughs> Nelson Hotel didn't have a Dutch name on the register, so I got a hold of the housekeeper and found out how many rooms his staff hadn't been able to make up all day because of do not disturb signs on their doors. I went a-calling at these particular rooms. On the ninth floor, I awakened one old maid. On the seventh, I startled a bunch of poker players who thought they were being raided. On the fifth, I blushed my way out of the bridal suite. And on the fourth, I struck the door of 427 and the jackpot. Who's there? Don't you see the sign? I do not wish to be disturbed. Oh, uh, sorry. I must have the wrong room. I started up the hall after the fire axe, but when I got to it, I changed my mind. One of the few things I'd learned about this guy Van Sant was that he loved to murder people through doors, so I decided against trying to chop his down. Then I remembered the way those people came pouring out of those offices earlier in the day when they heard that fire alarm. So I picked up the little red hammer next to the big red fire axe, broke the little glass window, pulled the little brass hook, and set off a big brassy noise. Then I rushed back to 427. Fire! Fire! Where, where's the fire? Right here in my eyes, sweetheart. You, why you come here? You wish you hadn't. Never mind the dresser. You're, sh you're through shooting guns for the day. What do you think, Van Sant? You want to try some more? You cannot make me stay here. The fire, we will all die. You look good barbecued, but I'll make a deal with you. You talk. And if I like what I hear, I'll show you how to get out of here alive. How do I know this? Well, you don't think I'm going to stay here and fry, do you? And if you don't start flapping that tongue in a hurry, I'll probably just tie you to a chair and run. First, where's Van Bruton? You will find him in the bedroom. He better be alive. He's out cold. What's the matter with him? He will be all right. He is on the sedatives. Where did this identity switch start? You better hurry up. I smell smoke. I knew Van Bruten in Amsterdam. I knew about the sale of his interest. And I knew that the girl in the office here had never seen Van Bruten. Well, let's go now. now. Don't get up. I can feel it getting warm in here. The firefighters. We will be saved. Now, don't be too sure. They always start at the top floor and work their way down. Come on, I can hear those flames crackling. You know the rest. Last night, when the transaction was all finished with Perry, I gave to Van Bruten some sedative and his cocoa. You set up that bomb so Perry'd get it before you showed up to pick up the check. Yeah, I told you that. Then it happened that girl didn't know I was an imposter. I, I don't know how. Well, let me tell you. She's been sending old Van Bruten in there two pays for the last four years. 
gray ones, my red-headed friend. Oh, yeah. Let us get out of here, no? Yeah, out cold. Expense account item four, a dollar forty. Night letter informing you that American Continental would have to meet payment of claim to Mrs. Christine Perry, innocent widow of the insured. The only thing she was guilty of was trying to stay on the right side of a hot-tempered boyfriend. <laughs> she lied about who she was with at the Club Caprice, not to fix herself an alibi, but to keep Al Donovan from learning that she'd been out with another guy, that guy being the real Mr. Van Bruten who had only taken her out to try to talk her into reconciling with his friend, her husband. Item five, $60, silver chafing dish. Wedding present for Christine and her new husband, Al Donovan. Well, that was the least she could do for the guy who had confessed to a murder he thought she had committed. Item six, $8, flowers for Susan Gates, prison hospital. Item seven, fine for turn false alarm, $1,000 and no cents. And that's what I think I'm beginning to get for getting into this racket. No sense. Expense account total, $1,263. Yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's Johnny Dollar Adventure. But first, this reminder. Just a little earlier tonight on CBS, Jack Benny turned dramatic actor on the Ford Theater. But this Sunday, he'll be back again on his own show with a special treat for the Jack Benny fans. After the last broadcast on which the Ronald Coleman's appeared, thousands of letters came in from fans asking that Jack invite Ronnie and Benita back again soon. The Waukegan Wit did, and Ronnie and Benita, by popular demand, Return to the Jack Benny program this Sunday in what should result in one of the most hilarious broadcasts of the year. So be sure to listen to Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman on the Jack Benny Show, which is heard on all CBS stations this Sunday. <laughs> Listen in again next week when CBS brings you Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, with Charles Russell as Johnny. Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd, with music by Mark Warno, and is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Columbia Broadcasting System presents Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he is just an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Nutmeg State Casualty and Bonding Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of series of accidents affecting your policyholder, the Funfair and Weatherly Carnival shows, or how I went for a spin on a case we might refer to as murder is a merry-go-round. <laughs> Expense account item one, 25 cents. Purchase of billboard, theatrical magazine to check the route of funfair and weatherly carnival shows. Expense account item two, $68. Air and train fares to Talladega, Alabama. Item three, $1.10. Cab fare and what was only a fare imitation of a cab from Talladega Depot to the dusty vacant lot which had overnight found itself wearing theatrical makeup. Brightly as the hot sun beat down on the midway, it couldn't help the layout of canvas and slats from looking beat up. 
A perspiring mechanic shot sparks of profanity back at an obstinate motor as he tried to get it to roll the giant hoop of a Ferris wheel. I asked him what he knew about the accident of a week before when a car dropped off the same Ferris wheel, badly injuring three. He was charming. Listen, pretty boy. Don't go getting nosy around here. The Joe in charge of the electric scooter concession was just as sweet. On the subject of how come one of his scooters blew up a few nights back, sending a citizen to the hospital, he just didn't feel like talking. If you ain't a cop, start moving. If you are, where's your warrant? I was just asking the pilot of the giant airplane spin who he thought might have cut the cables the night one of his wallboard gliders took off across the carnival crowd, crashing and busting up a few more customers, when I got a canvasman's version of a sharp answer. A tent stake... Right behind my ear. Oh. Well, those sleeping beauties waking up, huh? Who are you? I thought maybe you'd be sick of asking questions. First, maybe you better answer a few. Uh-uh. Before you get up. Number one, who are you? A pilgrim from Hartford. Never mind the double talk, wise guy. What's your name? My name is Johnny Dollar, but right now I feel like two cents. What's your big interest in those accidents you were asking questions about? Strictly academic. I'm only representing the insurance company that's paying off on those accidents. Now maybe you'll tell me who you are and where I am. Ah, oh, I thought you guys were smarter. Dollar, I'll let you in on a little secret. Next time you want to find something out on a traveling show, get to the boss first. Asking a lot of questions around a circus, a carnival lot is unhealthy. Where is the boss, Miss Pepper? Uh, Louise is in the other end of this trailer. She'll be right out. Uh, okay, you can get up on your feet. Oh, thanks. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I don't stay up on him. I feel more like sitting down. Uh, go ahead. You still haven't told me who you are. My name's Brennan. Oh, yeah, Shanty Brennan. Yeah, you're the general manager of the show. They told me all about you. Louisa Pepper's right arm. And strong arm. How long will she be? Yeah, she's getting dressed. Just finished taking a nap. We drove all night to get here. How about having a blast with me while you're waiting? No, thanks. I haven't enjoyed a noon bottle since I was two. But don't let me stop you. Thanks. <sighs> oh. You sure you won't have one? I'm sure. Brennan, the insurance company's been checking up on your show. The police chiefs in the last ten towns you've played say it's a clean one. Uh, we haven't got a pickpocket or a grifter on the lot. But plenty of trouble, huh, during those past ten stops? At least once a night somebody's got hurt, but never any of us. It's always one or two of the townies, the citizens. Last night a car on the whip cut loose. That sent four to the hospital. Uh-huh. Four more insurance claims for nutmeg state casualty and bonding, huh? Yeah, and one more town we won't be able to play again for a couple of years. It's a wonder we didn't travel out of that town last night by rail, tarred and feathered. For ten straight nights now, you've had at least one big accident every night. What's your guess, Brennan? Has fate taken a steady job on your show, or is somebody out to get you? Somebody's out to get us. Okay, well, do you have any idea? Oh. Oh. Why didn't you tell me we were entertaining a gentleman, Shanty? Had to put on some more clothes. <laughs> It would have taken a lot more clothes to cover all there was of Louisa Pepper. She looked like an aging Cupid doll, but even in a carnival, she was no prize. I didn't like the look in her eye. It looked much too friendly. So right away, I decided to change the unspoken subject. Uh, Miss Pepper, I'm here on business insurance. Sorry, we're not buying any. And I'm not selling any. The way things have been going, the insurance company I represent would probably like to buy some of yours back. Oh? Huh? Yeah. I'm going to not make state casualty. Investigating the accidents. Huh. Hope you find out more than we've been able to, and fast, before we go broke. The word's traveling one town ahead of us. They got us pegged for a dangerous midway. Have you been using police protection? <laughs> Twenty extra cops a night at ten dollars a cop. So, night before last, a guy winds up with a hammer to try and ring the bell and win a cigar. The top of the hammer flies off and almost brains a cop. Around this show, the police need protection. I see what you mean. How are you fixed for people who don't like you? We got money to choose from? Dollar, we treat our help fair and square. We know them all and trust them all. Fire anybody lately? Nobody. The only ones who left were floaters. But none of them had a beef. 
Okay, Miss Pepper. Now, think back. In all your life, who do you know who'd most like to see you have a real bad time? Only one guy. And he's not around. Dead? As good as. He's in jail. Has been for the last eight and a half years. That's a long time. How long did he go up for? Ten years. Hmm. What are you thinking, Dollar? I'm thinking that with time off for good behavior, maybe he's not in jail. Not in jail? Candy, he's got to be in jail. He's got to be, I tell you. You told me you were... All right, right. break it up, Louisa. If Carter Lacey had a voice as sharp as yours, he could saw his way out of jail. Okay, Dollar, you made a guess. How about seeing how good it is? Sure. I'll find out if your bogeyman is still in jail, uh, but I didn't catch that name. Lacey. Carter Lacey. And where has he been in the pokey? Massachusetts State Prison. Charleston. Well, what did he go up for? What's that to you? Cut it, Louisa. Dollar, we sent Carter Lacey to jail for attempted murder. He tried to kill Louisa's niece, Myrtle. Is she around? She's run on the snake show on the midway. Dollar, how soon can you check whether Carter got out? As soon as I can make a telephone call. But, Shanny, before I do, I'd like to elaborate on that guess I made. Now I'd not only guess that Carter Lacey is out of jail, but I'd also guess that he's been out a little over ten days. Expense account, item four, three dollars. Telephone call to Massachusetts State Prison, confirming both of my guesses. Carter Lacey had checked out of the Bay State's Hotel Greystone for bad boys two weeks previously. Item five, thirty-two dollars. Telephone calls to various hotels in the last ten towns the Fun Fair and Weatherly Carnival shows have played. Item six, ten cents. Two nickels spent calling two hotels right here in Talladega. Then I dropped one more nickel in the telephone. Got the lucky number? Yes, sir. We do have a Mr. Carter Lacey registered. Room three twelve. Shall I stop? And hit the jackpot. Friends account item seven, sixty-five cents. Cab fare to Sunshine Hotel. Tip the driver, one dollar. From the lobby, I call room 312. He invited me up. I invited him down. I knew I'd feel better talking to Carter Lacey with a lot of people around. They'd make nice witnesses if he suddenly got homesick for prison life and uh, used me as his ticket back. I waited in the coffee shop. The waitress brought me a cup of coffee, and uh, my palate went to work refereeing a one-sided bout between the strong java and the weak cream. Hello. Dollar? All right. Sit down. Thanks. Uh, you're Carter Lacey, huh? Have some coffee? No, thanks. It keeps me awake nights. How about your conscience? Having the same trouble with that? My conscience deserves an eight-and-a-half-year rest. But it can't start its vacation until I even up a few scores. Busting up carnivals. <laughs> Child's play. Look, Dollar, over the phone, you told me you're an insurance investigator. You can save your company a lot of money. How? Oh. Call them up and tell them not to insure the lives of three people. Because any minute now, two of them are going to be dead. Uh, Louisa Pepper, Anise Myrtle, and uh, Shanty Brennan. Yeah, Dollar. I'm going to kill two of those people. The other one's still my friend is going to help me do it. In case you don't know your law, Dollar, don't bother calling the cops. I can't be held for making a threat unless I put it in writing. Well, Lacey, I don't know what your beef is against the people running that carnival, but those accidents have been hurting a lot of innocent bystanders. Dollar... You're talking to a guy who really knows what it means. Getting hurt as an innocent bystander. Expense account, item eight. $25. Retainer to local detective agency hiring shadow for Mr. Carter Lacey. Explanation? An ounce of crime prevention is worth a ton of trials. Item nine, $1.20. Cab fare back for the evening's festivities at the Fun Fair and Weatherly Carnival, which was rapidly becoming more and more of a thrill show. <laughs> Expense account item 10, 30 cents. Down payment on ulcer, eating supper at what the carny people call a grease joint. I made my way among the trailers that were lined up behind the midway, and as I looked for the one housing Louisa Pepper's snake charming niece Myrtle, the burning sensation around my heart wasn't all caused by the hot dogs I'd just eaten. Who is it? I've got a message from Carter Lacey. What did he say? I said I've got a message from Carter Lacey. For 
you and uh, your Aunt Louisa, Shanty Brennan. You're the only one I haven't met yet, so I thought I'd deliver it to you first. Where is he? In town. Got any snakes in the trailer? No, of course not. All right, then. How about inviting me? You're the insurance guy they told me about. Yeah, that's right. Okay, come in. What did Lacey say? He said that he's going to kill two of the three of you. Which two? Didn't he say? No, he didn't. He just said that two of you are going to get it. And that his one friend among you, the remaining one, is going to help him do it. He'll do it. He hates us. I know he'll kill us. You say Louisa and Shani don't know yet? No, they don't. You're the first to know. Well, then wait here. I'll run and tell them. I'll stop back here before I go into the tent to do my next show. Grab yourself a drink. I'll be right back. But she wasn't right back, and it's just as well she wasn't. She might have interrupted me while taking a sightseeing trip through the drawers in the trailer's built-in bureau. And the piles of silky nothings that give gals that certain something didn't tell me anything I hadn't known about women before. But a little black book stashed among them did. I needn't have rushed my search, though, because Myrtle Pepper was still gone after ten minutes. That's about the time I headed back to her Aunt Louisa's trailer, pulled open the door, and walked in. <laughs> Scared me, Della, barging in like that. Mr. Della, I told you I'd be right back. Did Myrtle here deliver Mr. Lacey's little love letters? Yes, the fool. He, he always was a fool. He can't kill us. You mean it's against the law? I mean, I mean, I mean, it's impossible, that's all. Look, Miss Pepper, you and your niece here are both plenty scared. While you're out shaking those cooch stances you got working over on the midway. Myrtle, have you told Shanny about Lacey's threat? Yeah, I, I met him on the way over here. Asked him if he'd feed my snakes before showtime. They're dangerous to work with if they're hungry. Yeah, I told him. He said he'd join us here. Well, what did he say when you told him? He said if Lacey had one of us helping him, then the three of us had better stick together so we could at least watch each other. Smart man. He had a good idea. I see the three of you had better stick close to each other, beginning right now. Come on. Where are we going? Over to the snake tent. And when we get there, Myrtle, you'll be the only one of us who'll be among friends. The three of us left Louise's trailer. We walked past the back of the shooting gallery concession right in the front of it. And along the back of the line of canvas shanties, we stopped at one. Myrtle pulled back the canvas flap, and I stepped in ready for anything. With the ladies not far behind me, I edged slowly over to the square red board fence set up in the center of the tent. There were danger signs splashed in white paint along the outside walls of the pit. I clenched my teeth and looked down to the wire mesh top at a slithering tangle of writhing, angry reptiles. <laughs> And there, lying among them with a vicious red welt splashing his forehead, was Shanty Brennan. He was feeding his snakes all right. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, here is some news. 30 minutes of new thrills will be added to CBS 10 great Sunday night entertainments this coming Sunday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where you formerly heard Spike Jones, CBS will bring you screen star John Lund in an adventure-packed tale of a ship filled with terror and horror. This story, A Shipment of Mute Fate, starring John Lund, is the first of three special broadcasts from CBS' famous Escape series. It will be heard over most of these stations immediately preceding a familiar show which brings you a different kind of escape, the Jack Benny Show. And now, back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. I'd just seen a murder mystery where the actors had been hissing instead of the audience. The lead character in that snake pit wasn't going to win any Academy Award. The scene of the crime was no place for a man, let alone a woman, so I herded Annie Louisa and her niece Myrtle out of the tent and back into the trailer. Oh, poor Daddy. How horrible. Yes, I was wrong, Dollar, when I said Carter Lacey couldn't do it. Oh, it's going to happen to us. Well, according to what uh, Lacey told me, Myrtle, what's supposed to happen is only going to happen to one of you. Uh, what do you mean? Well, he claims that one of you is in this with him, and that one knows she's safe. This may turn out to be an acting contest between you two. What's that crap supposed to mean? Well, the one who's safe wouldn't want anybody to know she feels safe, huh? Oh. I wish I had learned to cry. Louisa, you don't think it's me. Well, I know it ain't me. Oh, ladies, ladies, how about observing a moment of silence in memory of the deceased while I give you a few instructions? Okay. 
Have you got a gun in here, Louisa? Yes. And a license to carry it. Good. Where is it? The gun, not license. I won't give it to you. Well, if you don't, people might get to thinking that uh, you're Carter Lacey's girlfriend and accomplice. Anyway, I don't want the gun to take with me. I want to leave it here. Where is it? In that drawer right over there. Which end of the drawer? What's the matter with you, blind? We'll see it. Uh, I'm not turning my back on you. Which end? You'd make a lousy trapeze out of Dallas. You don't take any chances. This end, toward me. Thanks. Now, where are the keys to the car hitched to the front of this land yacht? What are they for, Dollar? Just another chance I'm not taking. With those keys in my pocket, this trailer won't be joyriding anybody off into the night. Where are they? I'll get them for you. Wait a minute, Myrtle. How come you know where Louisa's keys were? Yeah, Myrtle. How come? Well, they're laying right there in plain sight. Oh. Thanks. Now I'm going out and call the police. Louisa, I want you to get into that chair down at the other end of the trailer. Okay, General. You've got the gun. And you, Myrtle, get on that bunk down at the other end. I don't understand all this. And now, ladies, while I'm gone, I don't want one of you gals to be knocking off the other. But on the other hand, I can't leave you here without protection. So I'm leaving the gun right here on this table in the middle of the trailer. And if uh, Carter Lacey comes knocking at your door, you can have yourselves a race for the gun. Expense account item 11, five cents. Telephone call to the local police. Plus another nickel spent calling a taxi. The cops arrived in four minutes, the cab in 15. Its driver had no siren to take him through the traffic lights. Item 12, a dollar 10. Cab fare on an exceedingly slow and torturous trip to the Sunshine Hotel. Tip to his kind of a driver, a nickel. I went up to the third floor and headed down the hall to Carter Lacey's room, 312. I rapped for an entrance, but all that came back was an echo. The lock on the door was the soft touch type known to the trade as the burglar's friend. So I went in. Stars fell in Alabama? Stiffs fell in Alabama tonight. Oh, operator... Operator, this is an emergency call. Let me have the telegraph police, will you? <sighs> Hello? Police department? This is the same guy who just called you from the carnival to report a murder. Yeah. Well, you can send in the second team. I've got another one for you over here at the Sunshine Hotel. Room 312. A party's just been strangled. Yes, I'm sure. Lots of bruises and deep-set fingernail marks on the throat. Sure, I know who it is. The name of the deceased is Myrtle Pepper. Myrtle Pepper certainly has been a fast worker. She not only had beat me down to the hotel, she'd managed to get herself killed in the bargain. I dusted the room for information, which was obviously more than the floor mate had done for dirt, and came up with a kind of an eye-opener you don't drink. A pint-sized surprise in the form of some old newspaper clippings and Carter Lacey's prison release form. And what let him out let me in on something. I got out of the room into the elevator, and when I hit the lobby wondering where to start looking for him, I found him sitting there looking at me. Hi. Why well, do you want to talk, Lacey? I don't want to. But if you want to try and make me, what's the matter with right here? Okay. I supplied you with an alibi today. I don't see him in the lobby. As detective? He had stomach trouble. He got kicked in it. You can reach him at the city hospital. You know, in prison, I was a trustee. I get out, nobody trusts me. Oh, with that forecast you gave me this morning, what else? The forecast? Yeah. You predicted that you'll kill two people. Well, tonight the two people are dead. Shanty out at the carnival, and now Myrtle up in your room. What does that make you? A good forecaster. Or the killer, maybe? <laughs> Thanks for the maybe. Look, Dollar, I came to this town to take care of something. I took care of it. You want to yell, cop? Go ahead. From now on, nothing bothers me. Well, then stop chewing your nails. You told me this morning that one of those three people was working with you. There's only one left. 
And suddenly, Lacey, I don't believe your story. Suddenly, I don't care. Shanty Brennan lied to me this morning. He said that you went to prison on a charge of attempted murder. Your prison release papers say you went up for grand larceny. You see what happens to bad little boys that tell lies? I'm not through yet. I fished a bank book out of Myrtle Pepper's trailer, a three-way joint account. Myrtle, Shanty, and Louisa. The first deposit, $60,000. The date, the same year you were thrown into the can for stealing $60,000. To me, that spells a three-way split for them and a frame for you. Also to you, it spells a motive for hating all three of them. So I lied to you. What are you going to do, wash my mouth out with soap? From now on, I don't need any answers from you, including smart ones. But look, you'd better stick around. If the cops don't pick you up for murder, maybe the hotel will want to press charges against you for having an extra unregistered person occupying your room. Johnny Dollar. Oh, wait a minute. Miss Carter, they arrested him? Tell me, did he escape? He's at the hotel, and the cops are on their way down there right now. I hope he's more talkative with them than he was with me. You talked to him? Yeah, I had a long, one-sided conversation with him. There's one thing I still can't quite figure out. Whether he really intended to kill Shanty and Myrtle or not. Myrtle? Yeah, strangled. Myrtle. Poor little angel. Of course he meant to kill him. He hated him. He hated us all. Well, you can hardly blame a fellow for being annoyed, framed on a grand larceny trap by three old chums. But you've got the wrong idea, Louisa. What I meant was, did he ever really intend to kill him himself? Or did he just intend to set off the greatest chain reaction since the atom bomb and just sit back and watch the three of you try to beat each other to it? Well, that's crazy talk. Yeah, like a fox, maybe. He made his threat to me, knowing I'd carry it back to you. I say you, because you're the only one left. You see, he set himself up as a patsy. He'd been framed by you once before. To me, it looks like Carter Lacey learned a few things about wrong people during that eight-year stretch. Namely, that they never trust each other. You're absolutely nuts, Dollar. I think you'd better get out of here. Go peddle your insurance. The cops will take care of Mr. Lacey. I don't think they will, Louisa. Why not? Myrtle was strangled. That's the kind of murder a man would commit. Well? But there was a set of deep fingernail marks on her throat. And Carter Lacey bites his nails. So maybe you'd better get yourself a manicure before the police arrive. Thanks for the advice. Stand right there, Dollar. This time I got the gun. Hold everything, Louisa. Carter! This is a standoff, Louisa. Point that thing someplace else before I... Point mine up your snoot. Okay, Dollar, get out. What's the matter with you, Lacey? Are you cracking up? Well, your plan was going along fine. First, Myrtle tossed Shanty to her snakes. Then Louisa took care of Myrtle. There's only one left, and the state will take care of her for you. That's not enough. There's one satisfaction I haven't enjoyed so far. That's hearing one of these pigs squeal. Carter, we can still split the money in the show and, and get out of here? The only one that's going to get out of here is Dollar. Beat it. I beat it, all right. I was the only one in the trailer without a gun. I plunged into the darkness looking for something and came up with a tent rope, dashed back to the trailer door and lashed the knob to the guide rail. I didn't want those gun-happy birds flying the coop. Just then, the season opened. I didn't know who was going to come out the worst in there, the hunter or the hunted. The only key I had to the situation was the key to the car, the one I'd picked up earlier in the day. The car churned the trailer to the carnival bank lot and out to the highway. When I hit the cement, I started spinning the rubber. Just as we hit the streets of the sleeping city, things woke up. Whoever was left back there snapped a shot at me through the trailer's front window. The second shot was my cue to try to ruin their aim by playing rock by trailer, swinging the car from one side of the street to the other. This is a not-so-sharp shooter made another try. I picked up just what I was looking for. A game of tag with a police patrol car.
Expense account, item 13, 15 cents, bicarbonate of soda. Those midway hot dogs I'd had for supper were no thoroughbreds. Item 14, $35, cigars for night shift. Talladega police, for whom I had started things smoking. Item 15, $3, hotel bill. But uh, never let it be said that I ever turned in a measly $3 hotel bill for myself. This was to check out of the Sunshine Hotel, the man who had checked out in the trailer at the hands of Louisa Pepper. Louisa Pepper, the only one who was a good bet to catch up with Brennan, who had been murdered by Myrtle. And Myrtle, who had been loused up by Louisa. And Carter, whom she had also carted out of this world, proving that when you start any kind of chain reaction, you should be careful, because you're never going to be sure where it's going to stop. Express account total... What? Only $692.18. I must be slipping. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The Madman of Music is moving. Yes, Spike Jones, formerly heard on CBS on Sunday, is already unpacking his famous collection of flit guns, dish fans, and other instruments, ready for tomorrow night's premiere broadcast as a CBS Saturday star. Hear the Spike Jones show on most of these same stations tomorrow night at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time when it joins Vaughn Monroe, Gene Autry, Gangbusters, and Sing It Again as a regular Saturday night CBS feature. <laughs> Listen in again next week when CBS brings you Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, with Charles Russell as Johnny. Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd, with music by Mark Warno, and is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Columbia Broadcasting System presents Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he is just an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Honesty Life Insurance Underwriters, Terminal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Austin Farnsworth, General Manager. The following is an accounting of my expenditures in the investigation of policyholder Milfred Brooks III for your company. Expense account item one, 75 cents. Cab fare to your office in answer to your original hurry call. Tip to driver, one dollar. Expense account item two, 25 cents, shoe shine. You remember, I got my shoes scuffed when I unsuspectingly walked through the private door to your office. Tell her. Hey, grab him. He's trying to jump out that window. Let me go. go. Get off. I'll show you. Oh, no, you don't. Hey, let go, you fool. Get away. Oh. Had a nice try, sonny boy. Now pay attention to teacher. No. Class dismissed. Well, Mr. Farnsworth, why didn't you tell me what you had waiting for me? I'd have worn my boxing gloves. Dollar, this was all a complete surprise to me. Well, just in case your little chum on the floor there wakes up in a hurry, I think I'll close the window. Now. My goodness, Dollar, what are you doing? I'm sitting on his head. I don't care if this guy tries killing himself again. I just don't want him to try and kill me. After all, we haven't even been introduced. Dollar, 
That happens to be one of our largest policyholders. His life is insured with this company in the amount of $2 million. Oh, now I can see why you're so anxious to keep him from putting a dent in the sidewalk. Precisely. He'd also put quite a dent in your company's bank account. By the way, Dollar, aren't you in danger of smothering the boy sitting on his head that way? Maybe. Now, tell me, what's this guy's name and what's his story? That, sir, is Milford Brooks the third. As I said, we have him insured for $2 million. His mother and father left him with a paid-up policy for the sole purpose of enabling his heirs to pay the inheritance taxes on his estate when he dies. Unfortunately, due to the kind of life he's been leading, Brooks not only hasn't any heirs, he hasn't any money. He blew all his cash? That's right. Now he's trying to get some out of us by threatening to kill himself. And that policy pays off on suicide. In a mortuary, he'd uh, be a millionaire, huh? Please, Dollar. Sorry, go on. One half hour ago... Milford walked into this office and changed the beneficiary in his policy. When that was done, he proceeded to demand, not request, mind you, $500,000 in cash. Oh, I'll say that's quite a touch. When I explained to him that there was no loan provision in his insurance policy, he threatened suicide. He said I could either give him the half million cash or pay off the two million on his policy. So all you have to do is to keep him alive. And he's managed to make that no small problem. The man he named as his new beneficiary, just before he made his demand for the cash, is... Well... It's downright frightening. Why? Who is it? One of the most notorious gamblers in the East. His name is Hatcher. Harold Hatcher. Oh. <laughs> you know him? Yeah. Say, that kid's been a post office pinup boy for a lot of years. Well, there's the situation, Dollar. I'm engaging you to protect Milford Brooks' future. Yeah, what there is of it. The way this lad operates, you think he had but two lives to give for his country. He's not only set himself up to get knocked off by somebody else, he's just dying to do the job himself. Well, it just means that you'll have to work twice as hard. Oh, it also means something else. What's that? That you'll have to pay me twice as much money. Oh, you'll get your money. The situation demands sacrifice, I'm afraid. But protect the boy, Dollar. Give him something to live for, an interest in life. An interest in life, huh? Let's see. I know. Here, this should help. What's that you've got there? It's what's commonly referred to in the more successful bachelor circles as my little black book. Now, let's see. Um, Ruby? No, her favorite expression is drop dead. Um, uh, Bernadine? No, she'd be the new beneficiary by midnight. Oh, here's one. Here. Butter. Butter? Hey, Farnsworth, would you mind passing me that phone, the one with the long cord? Oh, no, oh. no, not at all. <sighs> My little friend here is showing signs of life. Here, here you are. Maybe you should let him breathe a bit more. Ah, uh, don't worry. He'll be all right. Hello? Hello, I want to call New York. Person to person. Miss Theodora Butts. Yeah, that's right. And you'll get her at Hudson 2 4292. Dollar, you're not thinking of taking this boy to New York, are you? Well, I'm going there myself, and you want me to keep an eye on him, don't you? Don't fret, Farnsworth. All is not lost. Well, you do worry me sitting on his head that way. Hello? Hello, Butter? Butter, this is Johnny Dollar. I'll be in town tonight. I don't want to see you. Uh, look, here's what I want you to do. Yes, yes, this is all right to say over the telephone. I want you to reserve a table at the hatchery in my name for 10 o'clock tonight. Will you do that? Okay, I'll see you in a few hours. Huh? But I can't make it any earlier. I'm, I'm sitting up on a sick friend. Okay, goodbye. I'm not sure that I agree with your methods. Oh! What's the matter, Dollar? Did he hit you? Hit me? No, he bit me. Expense account, item three. Liquor, $18. Keeping Milford Brooks III peaceful seemed to be the immediate problem, and a bottle of rare old brandy seemed to be the immediate answer. I poured most of it into him, loaded him into my car, and we headed for New York. As we passed through New Haven, he opened one eye, looked up, saw the Yale Bowl, and gave three cheers for old Eli. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> old Yale would sure be proud of you. Why anybody would want to insure you for $2 million is more than I can figure. Yeah, well, my daddy loved me very much, and my mother loved me very much. Not only that, but I love somebody very much. And not only that, but I hate somebody very much. Hey, you want to know something? Huh. Like some one other guy, I hate you most of anybody... <laughs> Else. Here, yeah, lover boy, it's cocktail hour again. Time for your bottle. <laughs> Rolling along the Merritt Parkway, I felt very much alone with my own thoughts. And believe me, they weren't very pleasant company. The way it stacked up for me, Brooks had built up a fat gambling debt to Harold Hatcher. 
and had been forced to make him his beneficiary. The suicide threat that he was holding over Honesty Insurance Company was a little tougher to figure, unless he was trying to finance a trip for himself to get away from the man with a custom-tailored murder motive, Hatcher. My hungry little mind nibbled away on those unsavory morsels of food for thought all the way to Butter's apartment. Hey, where are you taking me? I want to go to New York. If you don't behave, Buster, I'll punch your ticket. Johnny, darling, welcome to New York. Fastest trip I ever made. Uh, quiet. Well, where did you find this? In a box of Cracker Jacks. Come on, let me in. Oh, I don't know about you, Johnny. Some men bring me flowers and some bring me candy. What do you bring me, a boiled owl in a Brooks Brothers suit? Oh, I'm pleased to meet you. My name is Brooks, but I haven't got any brothers. Lucky them. Fix the pillows on the couch, will you? I'd look more at home in the bathtub. Oh, come on, Buster. Lie down. Oh, I'm charmed. Thank you. Hey, this kid's liquor sure can hold him. He's passed out. How long have you been playing nursemaid to this bottle, baby? Leave me into the bar, sweet. Let's get away from this buzzsaw, and I'll tell you all about it. Sure, come along. Horrible examples don't seem to bother you, do they? If you knew how that guy's been bothering me. What did he do to you? Oh, let's just say he put the bite on me. Oh, the river sure does look pretty tonight. Like a brandy? Well, anything but... I've been sniffing that second hand all the way from Hartford. Oh, make it a brow root beer. Hey, Butter. See that big boat out there? Mm-hmm. Oh, I sure would like to be on it with you. Sailing off to faraway romantic places. <laughs> Get with it, darling. That's the 125th Street Ferry. <laughs> Here's your root beer. Come on now. Tell Butter all about it. First things first. Now that I've got a dad's old-fashioned root beer, how about giving me one of Mom's new-fashioned kisses? And then I'll tell you all about it. Uh... A few seconds later, I proceeded to tell her all about it. And it wasn't easy. Everything about her kept flagging down my train of thought. She was a sympathetic listener to my story until I gave her the answer to her first and only question. Where do I fit into all this? Well, baby, I thought you understood. My job is to give the poor, misguided boy something to live for. That's you. Well, <coughs> he should live butter. so long. Now, Butter, wait a minute. Well, don't Butter me. Now, don't, don't, don't get excited now. You misunderstand. I really mean it. I thought if he, he just got a look at you, realized that things like you exist, you'd make any man glad to be alive. Well, if you can't stand it, I'll take him away. But I sure need you, Butter. Come on, baby. Melt a little. I wouldn't let you get hurt. You know that. Did I hurt you? No, I'm getting used to it. People have been taking pokes at me all day. I'm sorry. Oh, that's better. Want some more root beer? Uh-uh. I want some more of you. How about another kiss? Well, help yourself. Oh, darn. I'll get it, Johnny. Okay, and if a man, man, man answers, hang up, will you? Oh, don't worry. Hello? Yes, this is Hudson 24292. Well, that depends. Who's calling? Oh, just a moment. Uh, it's for you, Johnny. Uh, Mr. Farnsworth. Huh? Oh, okay. I'll take it. Thanks. Say, uh, while I'm talking, be a good girl, will you? And take a look at Milford in the other room. And while you're at it, get me in the root beer, huh? Oh, sure. The service is good around here. Hello, Farnsworth? Yes, Dollar. I'm glad I got you. How'd you get this number? It's the one you called from my office. I remembered it. I have a photographic mind. I hope you haven't got a picture of what I'm thinking. What do you want? I want to know how Milford is. I mean, is he still alive? Of course he's alive. Good, good. Do you suppose I could talk to him? I mean, do you think he'll talk to me? Well, the last time I saw him, he was sound asleep. I'll take a look. Hold the phone. A butter. Oh, butter! Hey, butter! Hello, Farnsworth? Yes, yes. Do you have any aspirin there at your house? Why, of course, Dollar. Why? Well, you better take a handful. Milford Brooks III just took a powder. I'll call you back. You let anything happen to him and you'll need the aspirin. I've already got a headache. When Milford left, he took my girl with him. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. 
But first, we want to remind you that it was 437 years ago next Sunday, the famed Spanish explorer Ponce de Leon began his search for the Fountain of Youth. By sheer coincidence, the man who's still looking for it, Jack Benny, will be heard on CBS next Sunday at 7 o'clock Eastern Time. And now, back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Well, nobody could say I wasn't working fast. I had only been in town for an hour, and I had already succeeded in not only losing your $2 million baby, Milford Brooks III, Mr. Farnsworth, but in losing my million dollar baby, Theodora Butts. I tried to put myself in Milford Brooks' $40 shoes, but they wouldn't fit. You can't outthink a maniac. The best I could do was figure either that he was on his way to commit suicide, or that Harold Hatcher, the man who now stood to collect two million bucks in the event of Milford's death, had snatched him out of Butter's apartment. With birds of that type flocking together, Butter stood a good chance of being a dead duck. I spent an hour unsuccessfully shaking down the neighborhood for them. I questioned cab drivers, harness bulls, bartenders. Then I decided to ask for help from higher up. And I don't mean that I said a prayer. Expense account, item four. Five cents. Phone call. Police headquarters. Give me missing persons. Any particular one? Don't be a wise guy. Lieutenant Fisher. Oh, yes, sir. Well, hello, Dollar. What did you lose? Uh, practically everybody. Let's start with a girl. Theodora Butts. You mean you lost your girl? <laughs> Why don't you call Dorothy Dix? Don't waste time being clever. Just check your reports, will you? Hold on. Buddington. Bumpus. Byers. Nope. Nothing on her, Dollar. Okay, well, uh, try this one. Brooks, Milford III. Bullseye. Brooks, Milford III. He hasn't been reported missing, and we haven't found him yet. But, uh, we think we know where he is. Oh, this kind of a question I always hate to ask. Where? The Hudson River. At 11.15 tonight, his top coat, complete with identification, was found taking a ride on the 125th Street Ferry. Anything else? Mm, nothing much. Package of matches was found under the coat, monogram. Uh, you don't happen to know anybody whose initials are H.H., do you? H.H.? Well, as always Horace Height. Thanks, Fisher. I'll check back with you later. I'll be here. Expense account, item five. Nightclubs, $28. Harold Hatcher's hatchery was in a cellar under a hotel, but the prices were high enough to raid a penthouse. The club was draped in too much satin, its lady customers in too little. The decor was French provincial, music, Brazilian, and the food was nowhere. The drinks looked weak and the waiters looked strong. All in all, the joint was a sight for sore eyes, for making them sore. The only pretty thing in the place was a blonde. She came strolling up to my table, her hips unconsciously sending subtle little messages back to the rumba band. She opened her mouth, slid her tongue over her lower lip, and let a few warm, soft words slide out. Looking for someone? Oh, well, you'll do until the real thing comes along. Sit down. Thanks. Uh, no, I won't have a drink. My name is Janelle. I understand you were asking about... Mr. Hatcher. Yeah. You know him? More than somewhat. Are you uh, Mrs. Hatcher by any chance? I might be. Does that mean you might admit it or that you might talk him into it someday? I'll ignore that. What do you want to see him about? Uh, mutual friends. Milford Brooks. I know most of the quiet clothes boys around here, so you aren't a cop. You don't look like the type to be a society friend of the Brooks family. So what are you? I'll ignore that. Is uh, Hatcher around? He might be. Oh, come on now. Where is this office? At the top of the stairs in the back. Can I expect any trouble getting in? <laughs> you act like you just saw a B picture. Harold is doing his best to act like an honest businessman these nights. You won't have any trouble. How do you know? Because Harold sent me down here to look you over. I think you're all right. Oh, so I've won myself the good housekeeping seal of approval, huh? Keeping house with you would meet with my approval. I ran for my life. I had a slow walk across the dance floor edged my way through a cluster of tables and went up the back stairs. When I located the door to Hatcher's office, I knocked once and went in. Come on in. Thanks. I'm Johnny Dollar. I've been hired by Honesty Life Insurance Underwriters to protect the interest of a guy named Milford Brooks III. 
What's that supposed to mean to me? You know him, don't you? Well, he isn't exactly one of my boozing buddies. How much money does he owe you? We've got him on the books for a few grand. Why? They picked up his top coat tonight on the 125th Street Ferry. He wasn't in it. It might have been a suicide, or it might have been a knockover made to look like a suicide. What's your choice? Where do you get off asking me to make a choice? Where were you around 11.30 tonight? What's it to you? I don't know. I just thought you might like to rehearse a few answers. The law will be asking you some questions real soon now. I don't know why I should tell you, but I was driving around in my car getting some air. Uh, You better do better than that. They found a match folder under Brooks' coat. It had your initials on it. You're out of your mind. The guy owed me a couple hundred thousand. You think I'm going around knocking off my own assets? I don't know whether you're stupid or bright, Hatcher. Don't worry about it. I know. What about that insurance policy? What insurance policy? Now, look, Hatcher, we're big boys now. We both know that changing the beneficiary of an insurance policy is a legal transaction. That means witnesses. That means it isn't secret. You mind telling me what you're trying to say? That you and the Honesty Insurance Company and I all know that Brooks made you the beneficiary in his policy and that you stand to come into two million bucks when they fish out his body. I don't know anything about it. Motives don't come much bigger. I'm telling you, this is all news to me. You or nobody else is going to move me off that story. I feel the same about mine. It doesn't take a genius to know that Brooks didn't love you two million dollars worth. There's only one logical reason for his making you the beneficiary that I can see. You forced him into it. Who'd believe anything else? Who cares? They'd have to prove it. And, brother, that can't be done. Now, how would you like... Wait a minute. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, okay, Rocky. Thanks for the news. Dollar, did you turn me in? Oh, they're here, huh? Yeah. No, I didn't turn you in. What's the matter? You got a good story, Hatcher? You're not worried, are you? Here, have a cigarette. Thanks. Oh, I got like. Oh, worked the first time. Yeah. No, I'm not worried. I'll be out in 48 hours. You'll be lucky if you're out in 48 years. Okay, boys, come on in. The homicide boys invited Hatcher down to headquarters. He accepted and invited them down to the bar for a no-hard-feelings drink. They accepted. I walked back down the stairs into the club. The place hadn't changed. Same stale customers, the same stale music, same stale air. And the same lovely Janelle sitting at the same unlovely table. Hello. How'd you make out? Oh, I left before they started playing 20 questions. But I wouldn't worry. You've got a smart boy in the bar there. In some ways, maybe. What'd he hand you? A big round zero. Wouldn't talk, huh? About what? Oh, just a little doodad. A $2 million life insurance policy. Wait a minute. That young Brooks kid? Yeah, that's right. Oh, I knew it. I tried to tell him, but he wouldn't listen to me. Tried to tell who what? Hatcher. Did he get into trouble about that policy? It just looks funny, him being made the beneficiary. You knew about it, huh? I suppose you also know what was behind it. Sure, Milford owed him some money. A lot of money. It's in writing. What kind of writing? It's a personal note that Brooks was going to get back if he made Harold beneficiary. It's up in his office. Hey, you must be awful close to Hatcher. I'm the close, friendly type. I'll have that drink now. You've earned it, beautiful. She had earned it, and I had a hunch as to why. If ever I saw a gal busy putting the skids under her boyfriend, she was. Even if she helped send him up on a murder rap, I would have bet a quick 50 that she'd tipped him to the police. It's happened before if the boyfriend is the murdering type, and it's a nice, neat, legal method of disposal. Janelle led me back up the stairs and into Hatcher's office. I sent her back down to watch the bar to divert Hatcher in case he decided he'd forgotten something. Brooks's personal note made out to the gambler was easy to find, lying neatly in the middle of the top desk drawer. But I found something even more interesting when I went through his wardrobe closet. I began to see a glimmer of light. And then, encouraged by not too much thinking on my part, it turned into a veritable bonfire, which I hoped wouldn't be too hot for me to handle. Did you find everything? Honey, if I were a judge, I'd be ready to sentence a guilty party. Good. Oh, uh, waiter, the check. Where are you going, to the police? Bright girl. I'll see you later. Expense account, item six. Cab fare, one dollar. Tip to driver, one dollar. Once out of the hatchery, I walked to the corner, got into a taxi, and waited. In just a few minutes, my favorite suspect came out of the club, jumped into a taxi, and the chase was on. 
We nuzzled our way through the traffic over to 2nd Avenue and headed downtown. Then he took a right turn on 45th Street over to Lexington and headed uptown. But they didn't lose us. At 72nd, the cab ahead turned right and pulled to a stop. My driver was on his toes, and his toes were on his brake. We stopped, too, half a block behind. You want I should wait? No, oh, here you are. Keep the change. It was a garage that belonged to a residence on a parallel street a block away. I made out a for sale sign on one of the big doors. The living quarters upstairs were dark enough to look interesting, so I indulged in a bit of genteel breaking and entering. Entering that old barn didn't take much breaking. I crept up the stairs. It sounded like they were left over from an old ghost story. And so did the first voice I heard when I stopped, halfway up. So we've got to be careful, especially about that Johnny Dollar. Are you sure he didn't follow you? <laughs> That voice sounded awful dry to be coming from a guy who supposedly had spent most of the night snoozing on the bottom of the Hudson River. It was Milford Brooks III. Get up on your feet, Brooks. Now, wait a minute. No! I started this thing slugging you. I might as well finish it the same way. Leave him alone. He's mine. Pull in the claws, Angel, and sit on his lap. Oh, oh you... You Connecticut hick, I'll... I'll kill you. Look, I'm the last guy in the world who enjoys physical violence. Give or take. But believe me, you two are coming mighty close to changing my whole character. Now settle down before I really lose my head. Get off of me. Uh, I should have known better than to get mixed up with a low-class nobody like you. Cut. We've pushed the lady around enough, Brooks. Tell me to be careful. Why didn't you think of that before you let him here? Wipe your nose, big boy. Now, uh, don't you get go getting fat-headed gorgeous. Neither one of you is exactly what I'd call a mastermind. When you planted that match folder underneath the top coat on the ferry boat, you both should have been more careful. Huh. You think so? You bet I think so. If I were planning a piece of evidence to incriminate Mr. Harold Hatcher, I would have left a cigarette lighter. I found one in the pocket of every suit he owned back there in his closet in the club. It wasn't hard to figure out that that guy never carries a book of matches. What do you want? I'm only interested in one thing, saving the insurance company $2 million. And Buster... I think you've done it for me. Wait, look, Dollar. This is insurance fraud. It has been ever since you put on that fake suicide attempt, trying to extort 500,000 bucks out of the company for you and Janelle. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Dollar. So much for the company. Now, something a little more personal and a little more serious. Where is my girl? Well, she's, she's all right, Dollar. I, I couldn't help it. I had to get out of that apartment. She caught me leaving. I had to take her with me. Where is she? She... Well, I, I didn't mean to hurt her. I was afraid she'd yell. Oh, you miserable... Well, I'll tell you where she is, Dollar. I put her in a cab and sent her to the emergency hospital. Get up. Oh, no. No, Dollar, please, please. I'll let me give you the beating Wait a yell. Minute, uh... Harold. Hatcher. You had your fun, Dollar. Now I want mine. How did you get here? New York City, world's most efficient police force, remember? When they think maybe a guy's jumped off a ferry boat and nobody's seen him do it, they check the turnstile counters at each end. In the case of Brooks here, as many people got off that boat as got on. Yeah, that yeah, makes sense. They'd hardly hold a guy for murder just because somebody else lost a top coat. How'd you know we were here? <laughs> you know me, Janelle. You never go any place that I don't know about. Okay, Brooks, you felt like explaining. Now I feel like listening. Get it up. I, I don't know what you mean. I know what you mean, Hatcher. One, he gave you a big, fat $2 million motive for murder. And two, he did his best to make it look like you did murder him with that broken-down match cover plant on the ferry boat. Why? Well, they wanted to get rid of you and live happily ever after. The big mistake they made was in trying to shake the insurance company down for some ready cash. And you, baby. Harold, You please. put him up to it, didn't you, you cheap little muscler? No, Harold! Calm down, Hatcher. You don't need a gun around here. They're tame. You don't know me very well, Dollar. I'm going to teach all of you amateurs a lesson. How these things are really done. Come on, Brooks. No, 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 Hatcher. You can have everything I've got. For a second, it looked like Hatcher was going to take everything. But I hadn't gone that far to see Brooks knocked off with me as a witness. Hey, maybe I wasn't going to be a witness. Maybe I was going to be a victim, too. When that thought hit me, that's when I flew across the room and hit Hatcher in a do-or-die flying tackle from behind. Oh. Ah! Hatcher went down shooting. I went down kicking, and a lucky boot knocked the gun out of his hand. I beat him to it and swung it straight into his skull. Oh. Half the people in the room were lying there bleeding. 
Brooks from a gunshot, Hatcher from the gun butt. Janelle and I both stood there panning. But believe me, not for each other. We stood that way until the police arrived. Johnny, I hate being in the hospital. But I look awful. Butter, honey, you look lovely in white. This patch on my head? Johnny, they had to cut a big hunk of my hair off to put in the stitches. Oh, that awful man. Well, if it'll make you feel any better, baby, that awful man got taken care of. He's upstairs in the same hospital. Oh, Johnny, you didn't show No, Butter, I didn't have to. Harold Hatcher saved me the trouble. They don't know yet whether Mr. Brooks is going to live or die, but it doesn't make much difference to me or to the insurance company. He signed a statement admitting attempted fraud. Serves him right hitting a lady on the head. Johnny, what am I going to do? My hair will look awful. It'll take months for it to grow out. Now, don't worry, Butter. I'll buy you something to cover it up. I know a guy over on Fifth Avenue who claims he makes something that looks prettier on a woman's head than her hair. Expense account, item seven. Six hundred and forty dollars. Ladies' hats. To cover the lump on ladies' head. Expense account, item eight. Twenty dollars. Tip to nurse for reminding Butter on the hour, every hour, that accidents will happen. Expense account, item nine. Seven dollars. Mileage, driving back to Hartford. Expense account total, $1,182.23. Which you may say, Mr. Farnsworth, is a lot of money for one man to spend in a day and a half. But you must bear in mind that the amount at stake was $2 million. And you know the price of stake these days. Signed, yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Listen in again next week when CBS brings you yours truly, Johnny Dollar, with Charles Russell as Johnny. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd, with music by Mark Warno, and is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Time now for yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he's just an expert. At making out his expense accounts, he's an absolute genius. Expense accounts submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Frederick Kimball, General Manager of Fine Arts Insurers Incorporated, New York, New York. The following is an accounting of my expenditures in the investigation of the stolen portrait of the Duke of Masson. Or, who opened the season on canvas back Duke? Expense account, item one. $350, plane fare, New York to London. Item two. $125, replacement, brand new light tan top coat, borrowed and not returned by fellow passenger during flight. We had cleared Gander, Newfoundland, and were four hours out, flying at 20,000 feet over the Atlantic, with a knife in the weather, fighting it out to see which could darken the sky first. Most of the passengers were asleep, but the rough weather was giving the man in the seat beside me a rough time. Although the plane had leveled off, his dinner was still trying to gain altitude. Among other things, he complained of chills. So I slipped out of my top coat and threw it around his shoulders. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry to be such a bother. Oh, oh, I, I think I'll try a drink of water. Okay, I'll bust the steward. No, don't bother. She's up forward. Maybe the walk back will do me some good. I'll be right back. I'll be here. Seatmate had carried his constitutional too far. He stepped out for a breath of fresh air. I didn't think anybody could get sick enough to do that. By the time I got to the back of the ship, the rear seat passengers were milling around the aisle, all of them claiming not to know anything about what had happened. I didn't either. 
But if my ex-friend hadn't got out of the plane, he'd been pushed. And that posed this tantalizing question. If he'd been pushed, and since he'd been wearing my light tan top coat, was I the one who was supposed to be taking that 20,000-foot swan dive into the Atlantic? I looked over the passengers, and to me, they all looked guilty. But I knew they couldn't be. I also knew I had no chance of finding out which one was. When things settled down, everybody started asking the stewardess for sedatives to help them get back to sleep. I asked her for some black coffee to keep awake. By four o'clock the next afternoon, I was in good health in London and in the office of your policyholder, Dexter Morley. Yes, I've been expecting you, Dollar. Your company cabled that you were coming. They're very generous of them to send you all the way over here to help. The way I have to pay at my expense account to make an honest living. Don't ever accuse my clients of generosity. Oh? No? Oh, no. They aren't being soft-hearted benefactors. They're being hard-headed businessmen. If that painting stays lost, it'll cost them $250,000. Well, I'd better brief you from the beginning. Oh, if I yawn during your story, Morley, don't mind. I'm just sleeping. I see. Very well, I'll make a brief, Dollar. Well, during my lifetime, I have developed an overwhelming appreciation for fine painting. Unfortunately, I have not been able to develop the fortune that should go with it. As a result, I haven't only not been able to any great paintings, I've not been able to afford to travel to the museums around the world where the great masterpieces hang. Well, I guess there must be a lot of people stuck in the same fix. Exactly, and that's what gave birth to my plan. I have organized what you might call the Masterpiece of the Month Club. Its members are 12 of the top museums and galleries in the world. This plan calls for them to rotate their most famous paintings. In other words, if the people can't afford to come to the pictures, my scheme brings the pictures to the people. A new one, every month. Well, that's very interesting, Mr. Morley. But uh, let's talk about the one that got away. Oh, yes, of course. I was merely outlining the background of this case to delineate my responsibility in the matter. Well, so now we know that you feel personally responsible for the loss of the painting, even though it's well insured. Mr. Dollar, no amount of money can get that picture repainted by the man who originally painted it. The artist Bonnet has been dead for more than 300 years. Oh, a real gone guy. Well, if we fail to recover Bonnet's masterpiece, the Duke of Masson, it would not only be a tremendous shock, but also a tremendous loss to the world of art. Further, it would ruin my reputation. The very first painting to be loaned arrives here in London from Paris four days ago. And the first night after I deliver it to the museum, it is stolen off their wall. Okay, Mr. Morley. So much for the story. Where's the museum? It's the new art gallery at Coventry. Uh, here's the address. I won't be able to accompany you myself as I'm flying across the channel immediately to try to calm the officials in Paris. The ones who loan the stolen painting. Uh, they've been calling incessantly. I'll phone my assistant, Miss Harding, to meet you at the main entrance in the museum. It's, let's say, uh, 45 minutes. Okay. Tell her I'll be the man asleep on the step. Fence account, item three. Sixpence halfpenny. London papers. To read while waiting for Miss Harding at museum entrance. No matter what I told Mr. Morley, I was afraid to go to sleep. Page one of each newspaper referred to my reason. The misadventure which had occurred on a plane the night before. A possible attempt on my life. Then along came another good reason for my lids not drooping. This Harding was an eye-opener. Speaking in artistic terms, no painter could completely capture her dimension. A sculptor could come closer. As far as I was concerned, so could she. And she did. Would it be Mr. Dollar? It would indeed. I'm Miss Harding. Mr. Morley indicated that I might find you asleep. I say that must have been a shocking experience on the way over. Oh, not only shocking, but frustrating. Oh? Yes, there was nothing much that could be done. We circled long enough to drop a few life rafts, some flares, and a big blob of yellow oil to help mark the spot. Then all the pilot could do was call for the air sea rescue boys and hope. Yes, it's been in all the papers the whole day. Poor chap. Yeah, it could be that there, but for the grace of a light tan top coat, go I. What was that? Oh, nothing. Well, uh, shall we go museum prowling? Yes, of course. Uh, well, there isn't much to see. Just a blank space on the wall. Well, let's take a look anyway. Hey, did you see a blank space on the wall? Why, oh, yes. You mean they stole the painting frame and all? Indeed they did. Oh. Our thieves are doing things the hard way these days. Usually they just cut the painting out of the frame, stick it under the coat, and make a getaway. Yes, Mr. Dollar, I know. But perhaps this job was done by a beginner, or perhaps the burglar was interrupted and had to make a run for it, frame and all. 
There are infinite possibilities. Yes, infinite. Thanks. Mr. Dollar, frankly, I think this trip here to the museum is an utter waste of time. I've gone over the whole situation with a gentleman from Scotland Yard. It wasn't so much as a single fingerprint. Miss Harding, I have yet to solve a case with a fingerprint. I'm sorry, I forgot. Men just can't stand to see any show of efficiency in a woman. Oh, I wouldn't say that. It's according to what the time you're I'm speaking of business. Mr. Dollar, I'm sure that I can save you a great deal of trouble. I've already done an extraordinary amount of research on this case. Well, be careful what you tell me, Miss Harding. At this point, I confuse easily. Mr. Dollar, a child could understand what I have to tell you. Sometimes a wide awake child is better than a sleepy man. But go ahead. Well, now, this is the case right here. No. There. You see? A blank wall. Now, Mr. Dollar, of the 12 foremost art teams in London, I have discovered that nine are currently in prison. One is in hospital after falling four stories off a roof, and the other two are at large and may be found residing at the addresses I have here. Hey, you sound more like a patron of the criminal courts than you do of the arts. The entire subject of criminology fascinates me. Now, have you seen enough of your blank wall? Yep, things are blank enough. Give me those addresses. And while you're at it, maybe you'd better give me yours. Mr. Dollar, you don't think I look suspicious? Oh, no. Delicious. Expense account, item four. Five shillings. Cab fare to Scotland Yard. Tip to driver, two bob. When it comes to money, I speak all languages. Scotland Yard from the outside looks like a big public school. Well, it has taught a lot of lessons to a lot of people. Inside, it was tea time. When I inquired for the officer in charge of the robbery with which I was concerned, I was led to an Inspector Carew. First, he gave me a cup of tea, then he gave me my lunch. Mr. Dollar, you sit here and ask me why we haven't done something. Believe me, sir, the yard is not as archaic as its architecture. There's a simple legal procedure which must occur before we can make either an investigation or an arrest. Well? First, a complaint must be lodged by the legal owners of any stolen property. At that point, and at that point only, are we allowed to act? You mean nobody called for help? Well, naturally, when the museum discovered the painting gun, they immediately rang us up. We went to court to gather primary evidence. Unfortunately, there was none. Well, what about the owners of the painting, the museum in Paris? As yet, we've heard nothing. We expect to momentarily. Uh, Inspector, just out of curiosity, what about this girl, Miss Harding? I'd say she's, uh, well, uh, a jolly fine type. I mean, do you know anything about her? Hey, didn't you Yanks carry off enough of our girls after the war? I'm not in the importing business. I mean, is she known to you professionally? What? You suspect her? Well, not particularly, but uh, she did give me this list. In her opinion, this is the who's who and where they are of your city's light-fingered art lovers. Hmm. Let me see it. <sighs> well, quite complete and quite accurate. Hardly the work of an amateur. Where in the world would a young lady like Miss Harding come into such information? That, Inspector Carew, is exactly what I'm driving at. Back in a taxi headed from Scotland Yard on my way to check into the Mount Royal Hotel, I gave my eyes a rest at the risk of missing the sightseeing, but my mind refused to follow suit. It now had three blank walls to stare into. The one in the museum, the one at Scotland Yard... And the most provocative of the three to look at, the girl who knew too much, Miss Muriel Harding. My mind also kept ruffling my nerve ends with a question. Was I supposed to be the guy who got dumped out of that plane the night before? We arrived at the Mount Royal Hotel, and I got my answer. Here we are, sir. That's the Mount Royal, right. Dead on, of course, who are you? Can't miss it. Okay. What's the bill? Uh, to you, sir. <laughs> That'll be off the crowd. How much? Two and six, sir. Oh, here. You, you figure it out. <laughs> God, ever so, Governor. Look out, Governor, mind that car! Ah, that was a close one. Right. You all right, Governor? Yeah. Blimey, since the cars are back on the street, it's more dangerous to walk around now than it was when them ruddy buzz bombs were dropping. Yeah, a couple of good things about the buzz bombs, though. Nobody aimed them at you personally, and nobody was at the wheel to steer them. That made it official. I had been set up for a pigeon, and it was me somebody had tried to turn into a seagull during that flight across the Atlantic. Expense account item five, three pounds ten to bellboy for services rendered. 
How about that? 14 bucks for a bottle of scotch. I knocked off 40 winks. It felt like only 20. Then I grabbed a shower, a shave, and a cab down Oxford Street and over to Soho. Expense account item six. Five shillings. The legal limit on the price of dinner in England these days. I ate in a nice place called Tetanus. Dinner being a bit of chicken, three choices of vegetables. Brussels sprouts boiled, Brussels sprouts creamed, and Brussels sprouts roasted. For dessert, I looked at the names and addresses of Miss Harding's two candidates for the boys most likely to have succeeded in swiping the missing portrait of the Duke of Masson. I was in the right district for one of them. I found myself on a dark and lonely mews. That may sound good to you, but in Soho, a mews is still only a place fit for ash cans and cats. I groped my way up the stairs with the address of the number one boy on Miss Harding's list. On the top step, I was breathing hard. I wasn't all from the climb. Thanks, my teeth. My knuckles and knocked on the door. Then I broke roll two, the basic instructions for the working snoop. I opened the door. That lock never went to Yale. The door of a wood-burning stove across the room was open. The flames erratically painting the walls with orange light, then erasing them back into black darkness. I finally dared to breathe. Then I saw what I was looking for, lying on a table, its edges curled upward. An oil painting of a guy with short breeches and a long face. I started forward, but something barred my foot. I stared down at the floor in front of me. First it was pitch black. Then the light from the stove flared up, and I saw that the object was what it, I thought it was and hoped it wasn't. A man wearing his head, and I don't mean his hair, parted in the middle. I rushed across the room, flipped the door off the top of the stove, and gave me more light, and looked for a telephone. There was none in the room with a corpse, so I tried the door of the next room. And the door I was trying started erupting. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, we want to remind you that those delightful, charming neighbors, Ozzie and Harriet, are coming back home next Sunday night, coming back to CBS. You'll be able to join them on most of these same stations at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time, just before the Jack Benny Show. Ozzie and Harriet now have their own sons, Ricky and David, playing themselves in place of the young actors who formerly portrayed them. So make it a party for your whole family when Ozzie and Harriet, Ricky and David, come home with their fun and laughter to CBS next Sunday night. And now, back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. When those bullets came crashing through the door at me, I dropped to the floor. I still don't know whether my knees buckled or I meant to go down. I stayed where I was. But whoever it was on the other side of that door decided to take off. Out the window. I got to my feet, but by the time I kicked the door open and got to the window, I had that old Mother Hubbard feeling. The cupboard was bare. And that's what I'm doing here in your flat, Miss Harding. After my little adventure, the first thing I did was to call the police. And the second was to come here to call on you, the girl who steered me into that shooting gallery. Well, you needn't sound so annoyed at me. Of course, I advise you to go there, but after all, it was your duty. And you did recover the picture. And almost lost my health doing it for the third time. Really? Yes, really. First, somebody tried to make a seagoing paratrooper out of me. Then they tried to make me part of the pavement by running me down with an auto. And now tonight, somebody on the other side of the door tries to turn it into my personal copy of the Pearly Gate. That's really enough for me. Mr. Dollar, where is the painting now? At Scotland Yard. And now let's change the subject back. What's bothering me is bothering me plenty. I want to know who didn't want me to find that picture and why. Why, it seems elementary. Thank you, Dr. Watt. The thief naturally didn't want you to find it. Miss Harding, please. When I got shot at, the apparent thief was dead. Well, they do have henchmen, you know. If he was killed by an accomplice, why did the killer leave the painting? Oh, I'd have no way of knowing. Of that, I'm still not sure. Oh, really, Mr. Dollar, come off it. You hardly suspect me. I suspect you less if you'd stop saying that. At this point, I suspect everyone. Even Dexter Morley, from dreaming up this whole painting of the month scheme to bring those paintings within stealing distance. Oh, but that's utterly yes, ridiculous. I know, I know. If that was the plan, he'd wait until he had more than one picture on the road to steal. That's why I don't suspect him. Well, frankly, I don't see why you continue to worry. After all, your part of the job is done, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose you're right. 
But I still have a yearning burning deep down inside of me to break somebody's neck. Mind if I use your phone? Of course not. Help yourself. Thanks. Hello, I, I want to talk to New York. Oh. Now, don't worry, I'll call collect. My name is Johnny Dollar. I want to place a collect call to New York. Number is Plaza 69184. Texas, please, sir. Your name is John Dollar. New York number you're calling is Plaza 69184. And the call is uh, collect, correct? Correct, collect. Right you are, sir. We shall ring up immediately if there's a clear circuit. Thank you. They'll call me. Well, while you're waiting, you should probably do with a bracelet. Did you care for a drink? Mm, what have you got? Oh, gin and orange, gin and lemon, gin and Italian, or gin and French. No whiskey. No, thanks. Well, come and sit down over here. Very restful. Much more restful on the eyes where I am. Here, I can have a better look at you. However. Why, well, Mr. Dolly, you can be charming. Do you mind if I change the mix with this Johnny? Sounds much more fun. I'll swap you one, Johnny, for every Muriel you let me use. It's a bargain. Now, tell me about yourself. Your line of work fascinates me. I'm an absolute bugger on criminologist. At the moment, Muriel, that happens to be my unfavorite subject. Let's talk about you. Mm, where shall I begin? Mm, just after the age of 21? Mm, you're a saucy type. At the age of 21, I was serving in the West. Huh? The Women's Air Force. Oh, you must have had a lot of exciting adventures. Rather. What was the most exciting? Oh, I think perhaps the night the young U.S. Air Force Captain Fitz. Oh, one of the boys of the wild blue yonder. Maybe it was the blue of your eyes that made him wild. Johnny. I know how he must have felt. Gee, Johnny. I'll be right back. All right, darling. Hello? Are you there? Are you there? Of course I'm here. Mr. Dollar? That's right. We're ready with your call to New York. The signal at the end of three minutes. Are you ready to talk? The minute you stop. Right you are, sir. Carry on. Hello? Hello? Is this the fine art insurers? I want to talk to Mr. Kimball. Yes, 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 Dollar. I'm on the line. Go ahead. Well, you can stop worrying, Kimball. I got the painting back. You say you did get it back? That's right. It's safe. All you'll have to pay is the price of a new frame. But that you say? What happened to the frame? Well, the guy who swiped it took the painting out of the frame. I don't know where it is. Well, ask the culprit what he did with it. I can't. He's dead. Well, then look for it. That frame itself is worth $10,000. It was insured along with the painting. Okay, Fred. Don't blow out any bridge work. I'll look around for it. Give it everything you've got, Dollar. You're too near doing that already. What do you say? Okay, Fred, I'll cable you what happened. Goodbye. Well, Muriel, vacation's over. I just got put back to work. I gather from your conversation you want to send you chasing off into the night to look for the picture frame. Yeah, that's it. Oh, it's ridiculous. You could probably already found it somewhere in that fellow's flat. I'll check that. But my work is personal service. Mm, but I must have go, Johnny. It's only half past ten. Couldn't you put it off till morning? Well, there's nothing I'd like better, but... Couldn't you stay even for a little while? Well, just long enough to calm my nerves. Big Ben was ringing up midnight on Time's greedy cash register when I finally cleared with a bobby guarding the back alley flat that had not so long before given up one unprecious life and one very precious painting... The place was darker than it had been on my previous visit, and when I groped for the electric switch, I realized why. There had been a brisk fire blazing before. In the bottom grate of the stove, I found enough unburned portions of the hot picture frame to justify my conclusion. And I found something else that came under the category of hot rocks. Friends account, item seven. Cab fare to the office of Dexter Morley. The front door was not only locked, it was barred. However, at the back of the building, I had better luck. A loose window down to the basement. I had broken a law, but I didn't want to break my neck, so I sat on a light. The basement was loaded with cabinet-making equipment. But for my dough, they weren't making any cabinets. There was a bench with a power drill, and on the floor below it, a pile of sawdust and wood shavings. 
That was normal enough, but the sawdust pile was glinting with tiny specks of crystallized glue. With what I had now, all I had to find was Dexter Morley. He made that easy. He found me. Stay down there, Dollar. Right where you are. Well, welcome home from that trip to Paris you didn't take. That gun in your hand suggests that I'm right about one thing, anyway. Yes, and what would that be? That whoever took those shots at me earlier tonight was probably not an Englishman. The Bobbies over here don't carry guns, which makes most English mugs afraid to. You're an American. That's interesting, but hardly valuable. I've got some more. How valuable is this? I think you're in on or at the head of a very high-class smuggling racket. And I think you set up that painting of the month scheme of yours to establish just about the neatest method of smuggling that I've ever heard of. You're very generous, but I know how I operate, so what you could tell me about it could do nothing more than bore me. What I want from you are the diamonds. Maybe I can trade you. Some diamonds for some answers. You're in no position to bargain. Give me the diamonds or I'll shoot you and take them off you. No, wait a minute. I'd better explain my bargaining position. And I think you'll admit it's not the worst. Since you must have followed me here, you know I took a cab from the murder flat. One without a taillight, so you don't have the number. But, brother, I do. And the diamonds are jammed down behind its back seat. Now, let's bargain. Why, you... All right. What do you want to know? Just let me do the guessing. And check me if I'm wrong. You set up a chain of famous paintings which would move around the world through your branch offices. As each one passed through your hands here, the frame was to be dismantled and holes bored in it at the joints for the purpose of smuggling diamonds. Right so far? Yes, Stella, right. But remember, the more you are right about, the worse it is for me. So naturally, the worse it is for you. We'll take care of that later. This scheme of you is fascinating. The stuff moves around the world in the picture frames, under official armed guard, and enjoying virtual diplomatic immunity through customs. It's great. Yeah, it would have been great if it hadn't been for that heavy-handed oak. Oh, that fills in a missing link. From out of the night comes a burglar, steals your first loaded picture, shoves the frame into his stove to get rid of it, you arrive, cream him with your gun, then I arrive, interrupting you before you get what you want out of the burning frame, and then... You saw what happened to him when he resisted me, Dollar. But now you must realize that I won't hesitate a moment. It works the other way, doesn't it? You kill me, who tells you the number of that taxi? And without it, you'll never get your diamonds. There are ways. Keep your hands behind you. Painful. I thought so. Your head will wear out before this gun barrel does... Now, feel more like talking? Just enough to tell you one more thing. You can tell that blonde accomplice of yours I was on to her from the start. Tony, what do you mean? What? Ow! Don't shoot back! I can't repay you for those three tries you made or had made on my life, Morley. But here's what it feels like being hit on the head with a gun. Yeah, rock a booby. Muriel, look out, you'll fall. Oh. I told you, that's a very undignified way for a lady to enter a room through a basement oh, window. Johnny, I was only trying to help, and there you were accusing me of being his accomplice. After all those nice things you said to me before. Whoa, wait a minute. Oh, I followed you. I, I wanted to see how you were. Oh, great, you and your criminology. At least you might have stepped in before you hit me those two licks. Look at my head. Oh, I'm sorry, Johnny. It's it's just that I love crime. Now, come on, get up. Oh. It would be a crime if Mr. Worley there woke up and I had to put him back to sleep again before the police got here. Well, what was it all about? It was about these little black things. I've got a pocket full of them. Here, scrape one of them with your fingernail. Oh, glass. Honey, that's the kind of glass a fellow hands his girl when he wants to be engaged to marry her. Johnny, darling, you mean... Uh, yes, I mean only that they're diamonds. Expense account, item eight, $350. Plane fare out of attempted matrimony by the party of the second part. Item nine, $25. Gift to Muriel Harding. Two books, one on the art of crime, the other on the art of cookery in the hopes that the latter might attract her to the pursuit of a more womanly hobby. Item 10, 10 cents. Roma Seltzer. Purchased upon landing at Gander, Newfoundland. The only thing still fighting me on this case were those ruffled sprouts I had at dinner in London the night before. Expense account total, $1,563.40. Uh, if you find any slight discrepancy in this amount, in my favor, 
blame it on my confusion and lack of understanding of the international rate of exchange. The only thing I'd like to exchange at this point is my head with its two new lumps. Wishing you the same. Yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> In just a moment, more about Johnny Dollar. But first, Academy Award winner Jane Wyman comes as guest to the Family Hour of Stars. And Ozzie and Harriet return in triumph to CBS. These are two headline-making events for next Sunday night. Add these two shows to the top comedy of Jack Benny, the feminine charm and dramatic talent of Helen Hayes and Eve Arden, the ace comedy teams of Amos and Andy and Lemon Abner, and CBS Sunday night makes great news. On top of this, there are the notable mystery capers with Sam Spade and the laughter with Life with Luigi and It Pays to be Ignorant. So don't miss a single one of CBS 10 great entertainment next Sunday night when they're heard over most of these same stations. Jack Benny, of course, comes to you over them all. Listen in again next week when CBS brings you yours truly, Johnny Dollar, with Charles Russell as Johnny. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dow, with music by Mark Warno, and is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Time now for Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he's just an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Highworthy Insurance Underwriters Association, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, General Manager Harvey Anthony. <clears throat> uh, dear Mr. Anthony, here is your problem. The following is an accounting of my expenditures in the case of the $100,000 legs. Or who put your company out on the limbs? Expense account, item one. $60. $20 across the board on a losing horse I was rushed into betting on when you had me paged on a public address system at the racetrack. This is Harvey Anthony, Dollar. Thanks for calling back so soon. Now, when they paged me, they said it was an emergency. It better be. Why? What's the matter, Dollar? This is my day off. And if I know you, this call is going to make it an off day. <laughs> if I know you, my friend, you won't mind this assignment. I want you to go out to Hollywood. Act as a bodyguard for a big movie star, Marilyn Major. Oh, not a bad body to guard. What's the deal? We've issued one of those publicity policies. Insured her legs for 100000 Policy will only be in effect for 48 hours. We want you to stick with her. Just to uh, see that she doesn't get mixed up in any hockey games. <laughs> I get it. She's been notified, so she expects you. Now, when do the 48 hours start? Tomorrow noon. Can you make it? Now, with the help of American Airlines. Got enough cash with you to buy your tickets? Uh, about that, I'll know right after the next race. I'll call you from Hollywood. Expense account, item two. Ten dollars. Borrowed from a friend. Taxi fare from the racetrack to town, where I cash check to pay item three. One hundred and eighty-six dollars and thirteen cents. Plane fare, Hartford to Hollywood. Item four, 350. Cab fare, Los Angeles Municipal Airport to the home of the insured. 
Miss Marilyn Major at the Horizon View Apartments on the Sunset Strip. Tip to driver, one dollar. Miss Major's apartment had the best view of the horizon, it being the penthouse. But her outlook was anything but rosy. I found the apartment door open. First I looked in, then I went in. I want to place a person-to-person call, please, to Mr. Harvey Anthony in Hartford, Connecticut. Volunteer uh, 3 6000. My name is Dollar, as in blood money. While I was waiting to get Mr. Anthony, I wondered who had got Miss Major. In the movies, I'd always thought she looked right at home anywhere. And now, right there in front of me, she was passing her toughest test. Lying there, nice and relaxed. She looked right at home in the role of a beautiful gal who had just been murdered. Her face was calm. Her legs were neatly placed in the best of cheesecake tradition. The only thing not quite as it should have been was a very real bullet hole, which she was wearing where an earring should have been. But the next cameras that would be taking her picture would be police cameras. B pictures. B for bloody. Mr. Dollar? Oh, yeah? Here's your party. Go ahead. Hello. Hello. Hello, Dollar? Yeah, yeah, this is Dollar, all right. Anthony, first I want to tell you, those legs you insured are still in beautiful shape. Good, good, fine. I only hope you didn't also insure Miss Major's life. She's dead. What? Marilyn Major dead? That's right. Oh, we certainly do insure her life. We only issued that publicity policy on her legs as a courtesy. Dollar, get to work on it right away. I'll get to work on it, but don't waste too much hope. To me, it looks like your only out is if the policy does not pay off on murder. Murder? Good heavens. Well, there may be something about the case that will save us from paying double indemnity for death by violence. Oh, this is death by violence, brother, any way you look at it. Okay, Anthony, I'll get to work on it right after I call the cops and make a report. Do your best. Goodbye. Okay, goodbye. Hang up that telephone, mister. The dame standing in the kitchen doorway had 32 caliber steel in her hand to back up the brass in her voice. She was a youngster, but obviously an old-timer at a lot of things. Her hair was the same color as the murdered woman's, smoke blonde, and her dress was tobacco brown and round and firm and fully packed. I said put down that phone. Yeah, sure, sure, okay. Now, uh, you, you do me a favor, will you? If you feel you want your finger near that trigger... How about moving it up to the front end of the trigger guard, huh? Mister, I only heard part of what you said, but you're not calling no police. What makes you think so? That Damon there's done me enough harm. I came here to kill her, but somebody beat me to it, and I'm not taking the rap. Okay, so beat it. Who cares? Then I'll call the police. Somebody's going to eventually. Before I go, I'm finding a few things and taking them with me. Now, come on, get up on your feet, mister. You're coming with me in the bedroom. Okay, okay, don't get excited. Okay, mister, over against that wall. With your face in close and your hands straight up. Come on, move. All right. Did you learn this at the movies or by watching your friends work? Don't be a wise guy. I'm not as dumb as I look. Now, hold still. Look, uh, sister, by this time I shouldn't still like you well enough to warn you, but what you're doing right now will get you in plenty of trouble, even if you didn't commit this murder. I'll take that chance. If you don't get picked up for larceny, they'll still get you for tampering with evidence. As far as the police are concerned, at the scene of a murder, nothing gets touched. They like it that way. What I'm taking won't even be missed. There are plenty more here just like him. That's all she's gotten here. Love letters from men. Who are you covering up for? Your boyfriend? It's none of your business, mister, but it's my husband I'm covering up for. Uh, Well, then you're just plain nuts. If he knew her, they'll find that out. Then if they want him, they'll find him. Yeah, and they'll find him dead. Huh? My husband committed suicide over that. No good dame this morning. Oh. Now, I've I've had enough out of you. Back up. Two steps. Okay. Now, get over there and into that closet. Come on. Too bad. What's the matter? I always feel sorry for a sucker. I felt around in the dark. It was a small closet. That meant not much air. That meant doing something about it. I took my fingernail file, stood it on edge and slipped it under the door, pressing down the nap of the rug. I did the same with my fountain pen. That would at least allow a small supply of air to sneak into my stuffy little cell. 
And then I glued my ear to the thin wooden panel that separated me from the bedroom. It wasn't long before my captor apparently completed her search. I heard her pass the closet door and head for the front room. I didn't hear her dial the phone, but it didn't take me long to realize that's what she was doing and who she was calling. Give me the police. This is an emergency. Hello? Hello, police? I want to report a murder. All right. Hello? There's been a murder. The movie star Marilyn Major in the penthouse. The Horizon View apartment on the Sunset Strip. Never mind who I am. I've caught the murderer. You'll find him locked up in the closet. From the moment she hung up, I could only guess what was happening. I heard a man's footsteps rush in and then his voice. Blackmail me, will you, you cheap little son? That's what I'm paying you for these letters. Now I'm taking them with me. I didn't think I had the time to spend picking the lock on the closet door, so I started kicking. The girl who had just tried to turn me into the cops was lying on her face in front of the telephone stand. And a covey of bullets had turned the brown silk on her back into wet red lace. She'd been shot in the back. And if she'd succeeded in finding her letters, her killer had taken them with him. I made a quick search myself and took a look through the remaining sets of letters. One from a guy who signed himself Baron, and the other one from a guy whose autograph read, With all my love, Lawrence. My instincts were trying to pull me out of that apartment, but one look down the street threw them into reverse. Black and white prowl cars were arriving, and it was less than another minute when their passengers started pouring out of the elevator and through the front door. Closet, boys, make sure you don't stand in front of that door. Okay, Lieutenant. Never mind the closet, Lieutenant. It's empty. I kicked my way out. All right, let's see your hands. Get them up. I swear I'm going to buy some stock in a gun company. Everybody's got them. Miller, get around behind him. Check him for weapons. Yes, sir. He's clean, Lieutenant. Okay. Who are you? Johnny Dollar. And if you lend me back my right hand, I'll give you my ID. It's in my wallet. Keep him up. Miller, get his wallet. Yes, sir. Here it is. Insurance, Dick, huh? Please, I'm a freelance special insurance investigator. It sounds better. Keeps my price up. Hartford, huh? Well, what's your story? Well, first, I'd like to go on record as saying I didn't commit either one of the murders. Either one? What are you talking about? Well, this one here is the girl who phoned in the report that brought you here. The one she was talking about, Marilyn Major, is lying just as dead on the floor in the bedroom. Miller, get in there and take a look. Yes, sir. While he's looking... You keep on talking. Okay. I'll start from the beginning. I was sent out here by Highworthy Insurance. They just issued a policy on the legs of that dame in the other room. A hundred thousand dollars. Publicity stunt. I was supposed to protect their interests. What do you mean by that? Well, what do you think? I was supposed to see that she didn't attempt any Hindu fire dances or try walking any tight ropes during the next 48 hours. Well, your worries are over in that department at least. What else? When I got here, the door was open. I walked in and found her. Dead. Any way to prove that? Any witnesses? Uh, just one. She's lying there behind her. Uh-huh. Over the phone, she accused you of the murder. That's the wrong kind of a witness. No, Lieutenant. The wrong kind of dame. She knew I didn't do it. She was somewhere in this apartment when I arrived. Then why did she say it? I can hardly ask her. Listen, Lieutenant. She did tell me that she came here to get some letters. Her husband had written them to the major dame. She said she was trying to protect him. From what? Who knows? Maybe she just wanted him to rest in peace. The guy committed suicide this morning. Uh, we can't check your story with him, can we? You've got a lot of dead friends. How did this one here get that way? I'm not sure. While I was in the closet, I heard her call you. And then a man came in and yelled something about blackmail at her and shot her. And naturally, he had disappeared by the time you kicked your way out of the closet. That's right. This story of yours may win some kind of a prize dollar, but not for me. I'm not a judge. That's one thing in my favor. Hey, Lieutenant, I got something. The dame is dead, all right. And look what I found in that closet. A fingernail file, a fountain pen with a name on it, Johnny Dollar, and a 32 caliber revolver jammed in a shoe. Well, Dollar, that combination puts you in a kind of jam, too. Look, Lieutenant, I think I can make you see things my way if you let me go through my story once more... I was sent out here by a high worthy insurance underwriter. Right 
expense account, item four, three dollars. Candy, gum, cigarettes, and magazines to make cell number 36, Los Angeles City Jail, less like a no place and more like a home. There's something about a jail door closing on you that sounds very final. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, we want you to know that the biggest jackpot in the history of radio, $50,000, goes in the works tomorrow night when CBS' great Saturday night quiz show, Sing It Again, comes to you again over most of these same stations. $50,000, $25,000 in marvelous prizes, plus $25,000 in cold, hard cash. And that's only the beginning. Because the longer the phantom voice questions elude the listeners, the higher the rewards go. Be sure you're around tomorrow night when Sing It Again sets telephones ringing across the nation and $50,000 goes riding on each call. And now, back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. When I accepted this Hollywood assignment, I visualized spending much of my time gazing upon bars, but not the kind offered by cell number 36. The guy who said stone walls do not a prison mate had never been a guest in the Los Angeles City Jail. He had a better chance of getting out of Bartlett's quotations than I had of getting out of there. But as we keep saying in the insurance racket, never say die. Lieutenant Roach, what are you in for? I've heard tell the boys around headquarters have a very funny joke about roaches in jails. But that's not why I'm here. Sit down. Make yourself uncomfortable. Thanks. I can't Uh, offer you a mint julep. The closest I can come is a spearmint lifesaver. Oh, thanks. This kind of zero is a pleasure after facing the kind we're up against. Huh? So for a dollar, all we've got to go on is you or a mess of evidence we haven't as yet been able to trace down to its rightful owners. Oh, incidentally, about that gun we thought might be yours. Oh, don't tell me you're going to give it to me. It was a birthday present. It was the weapon used to kill Marilyn Major, all right. The paraffin test we took on your hands let you out. You haven't been firing any guns lately. Does that mean you've come here to escort me to the front door? No, not so fast. We do want to know what your fingerprints were doing all over those two bundles of love letters we found. I'm going to have to learn to pick things up with my knuckles. Lieutenant, I just had a natural curiosity as to who killed the cat. The only difference between us, Roach, is that your curiosity is official. How far did you get? Uh, Not far enough. Didn't take much figuring to know that Miss Major has been playing a high-class badger game. All the perfume in the joint couldn't cover up the smell of blackmail. On top of that, we found the two batches of letters that you'd been messing around with. One signed Baron, the other signed Lawrence. Those the fire department should be handling. Oh, yeah. Oh, and remember, there's probably a third set floating around. Why do you say that? Well, I'm not an eyewitness to this, only an ear witness. But uh, from what I could hear inside that closet, the dame who came there looking for her husband's letters found them, and she called you to turn me in. Mm-hmm. On our way out of the apartment, some guy came in, mistook her for Marilyn Major, and shot her in the back. When I kicked my way out of the closet, those letters of hers were gone. So, figures the murderer grabbed the letters out of her hand, thinking there was some he'd written. Uh-huh. Then in your file, the killer was either that Baron fellow or the, the other one, uh, Lawrence. Lieutenant, in my file, they're both murderers. It's just a question of who killed whom. The guy who killed Marilyn Major certainly wouldn't have come back to kill her again, would he? In this town, you never know. Look, Lieutenant, I got a two-way stake in this thing. One to get my name cleared, the other to get my job done. And I'm in a hurry. I imagine you are, too. Well, Marilyn Major was a big name. That means we'll soon have newspapers burning under our seats. We're in a hurry, all right. Okay, then listen. If I were either one of those murderers, and I know that the police probably had a handful of letters that could send me to the gas chamber, I'd head for the border. Yeah? But... If I thought an outsider had them, somebody they might be able to buy off or scare off or beat off, 
Then I'd go find that guy. Well? Let's bring this thing to a head in a hurry. Run a story in the papers. Tell him, tell him you released me. Uh, tell him I escaped. Tell him anything. Just so long as you tell him that you suspect that I have those letters hidden someplace. Well, if you don't mind taking the chance of having two murderers gunning after you, we certainly don't. Oh, I mind. Believe me, I'm not doing you any favors. It's just that I'll feel safer in my own hands. <sighs> okay, Mr. Pigeon, you've got yourself elected. We'll publish that story. Then we'll let you fly the coop. Good enough. Just make sure that you give me plenty of fighter cover. Expense account, item six, seven cents. Purchase of newspaper, an extra edition that hit the street about a half an hour before I did. Item seven, five dollars. A big square meal to make up for the ones I'd missed, ignoring the little round beans while a guest of the city. Seeing the lieutenant's fiction in black print on the front page of a newspaper almost had me believing it. There was my picture, big as life. And when those birds set up a pigeon, they made sure everybody would know the location of his roost. Firmly planted high in the story was the name of the hotel into which they had registered me and to which I was under orders to proceed immediately. As I walked down the hotel corridor to my room, I felt an icy chill and a flight of goose flesh headed south down my spine. I expected company, but not your kind. At first, I thought I'd gotten into the wrong room. This kid looked right at home. And she used some, some of the clothes from a half-packed overnight bag to make her look it. Oh, you're Johnny Dollar. Yeah. Thanks for saving me a calling card. Who are you? Alice Hill. Oh, that doesn't mean anything. Otherwise known as Mrs. Lawrence Hill. Oh, Lawrence. Oh, the last time I saw that name, it said, with love. But not to you. That's why I'm here. I want those letters. Why aren't you carrying a gun? It'll be here if we need it. We? Yes. My husband's down in the lobby. Look, if you give me those letters he wrote, I'll pack up my little bag and leave, and everybody will be very happy. Yeah? I think I know the next line, but go ahead. I hope you keep on being that smart. My husband was watching for you when you came in, so he knows you're up here. Naturally, he knows I'm here, and he's on his way up. We want those letters. This isn't just a badger game. This is the World Series. If I don't give you the letters, your husband busts in here, shoots me, and I get written off under the unwritten law. Neat, neat, neat. It's a handy law. You're right. It's covered a multitude of sins. Where are the letters? Where's your husband? What's the matter with you? What do those letters mean to you? Well, right now, they look like my only hold on the future, Mrs. Hill. How do I know that you and your dear Lawrence won't kill me after you get them? You want me to take your word for it? Well, I... I I'll have to trust Lawrence. He'll know what to do. I already know. There's nothing else for him to do. Look, Mrs. Hill, why don't you wise up? Your husband is ready to commit one murder to remove the evident motive for another. And he's dragging you into this with him. You'll wind up an accessory before, after, and during the fact. You're running up a blind alley as fast as you can run. And it's too late to turn around, so I'll just have to keep running. Ah, well, here he is. Lace up your track shoes, lady. The race is on. Come in. All right, sit still. Freeze, both of you. It's okay, Alice. You can hold off on the dog and pony show. Save it for the witnesses when they arrive. Don't waste it on Lawrence and me. That, that isn't Lawrence. What? Oh, so this must be Baron. You all through? Now, that depends on that gun in your hand. Where are the letters? Letters, letters, letters. You know, I'm beginning to feel like a mailman when he's late getting around in the morning. There's one thing I want to know. Where did an ugly part-time Romeo like you find all those pretty words you wrote? Look, don't get me sore. I'll blast your letters or no letters. Ah, that's the tone I was trying to bring your voice up to, Mr. Barron. No letters is exactly what I've got to offer. He's lying. He admitted to me that he has them. He's trying to blackmail you, Barron. That's what he's doing. Who are you? Never mind. My husband's in the same boat you are. I read the papers. Lawrence, huh? That's right. He'll be here any second. Between us, we'll figure out something. Now, stay away from it, Dollar. I'll answer it. Yeah, good idea. If a man answers, hang up. It'll be Lieutenant Roach. Uh, wait a minute. Okay, answer it, Dollar. Yeah. But the first wrong word fires this gun. Oh, you can believe me. Nothing but right words are on the tip of my tongue. Hello? Whoever was on the other end of the line decided not to talk and hung up. 
So I started an imaginary conversation with Lieutenant Roach of Homicide. While I was talking, I was thinking. Baron's voice was the voice I'd heard when I was locked in the closet. That made him the guy who shot the girl who turned me in. By the process of elimination, Lawrence Hill was elected murderer of Marilyn Major. During my talk, which made no sense, and my thoughts, which made plenty of sense, I was checking the length of cord on the phone. I needed Baron a little closer, so I started tossing enough dangerous words into the, mouth, the mouthpiece to draw him closer, threatening me with his mutters, his looks, and his gun. He moved into range, and I moved into action. I heaved the base of the telephone straight into his face. I moved in with my knee right after it. Stumbled back, letting go of the gun, which I kicked under the bed. Then I made a break front out of the dresser next to the bed, using his head to break the front. The water from the cracked up pitcher hit him in the face, but it didn't do him any good. Hey, get out from underneath there. Get away from that gun. Come on. Well, I got a hold of your ankles. I got a good mind to do this thing right and heave you out the window. Let go of me. Let go of me. Come on now, stand up. You, you. All right, how much do you want? We don't want any trouble. Just let me out of here. We'll pay you anything. My husband's an important man. So am I. I've had all the pushing around I'm going to take. From now on, I'm the dealer. And your hand is to shut up. All I want to do is get out of here. No, no, you don't. I baited you. You tried to bait me. Now we'll both sit here and bait your husband. That must have been him that called this room and hung up when he heard my voice. One thing I didn't bother to tell you. Your husband couldn't have known I was up here until then. Because I came in the hotel the back way. And came up here the back way. Elevator and all. What do you mean? You, you baited me. Why do you think the police put my name, my address, and my picture in the newspapers? To draw autograph on us? Oh. Oh, is right. Now get over there in the corner while I retrieve Mr. Barron's gun from under the bed before some mouse crawls out of the woodwork and tries taking a shot at me. Go on, get going. Turn around. Okay. Now, if you don't want me shooting runs in your stocking, don't make a move while I'm under the bed. I feel like something that old maids hope for. Lawrence! Where is he? On the floor. He's got a gun. Shoot him. Kill him under the bed. No, no, Lawrence. Not him. No, he's under the bed. Under the bed. I'm taking no chances. Listen, Roach, you may be a lieutenant to the police department, but to me, you're just a big, fat private. Now, now, calm down, darling. I don't mind setting myself up as a pigeon, but you promised me protection. Where was it? Temper, temper. Now, who's who here? Let's get these stiffs sorted out, then we can talk. There's only one stiff. The other one, the one near the door, is Lawrence. He's only wounded. I had to shoot his pins out from under him. He came crashing in and killed Baron by mistake. That's Baron over there by the bed. Ah, another case of mistaken identity? How did he miss you? I happened to be under the bed at the time. Oh. And I wasn't hiding. No? I was looking for a gun, and I found it, and I used it. And if I had one right now, I'm not so sure I wouldn't use it on you. You still haven't told me why you left me here alone, holding the sack all this time. I'll tell you why. And I guess it was our fault. The men I had posted in the lobby didn't see you come into the hotel. Well, how do you like that? Johnny Dollar. Wise guy. Huh? Lieutenant, I got some news for you. Just to make sure I was taking no chances, I came in the back way. Expense account, item eight. $62. Hollywood Entertainment. Seeing what there is to see at Ciro's. Item nine, $105. Seeing to it that one of the things I saw at Ciro's had a good time with me at the Mocambo. Item 10, $186.13. Plane fare, Hollywood back to Hartford. Item 11, $1. Ticket to the movies, back in Hartford, to study the last motion picture of Marilyn Major, so that in the future I'd be sure to steer clear of her kind of a woman, who is too much of a jinx for my kind of man. Uh, expense account total, $948.76. Signed, yours, um, truly, Johnny Dollar. In 
in keeping with the Easter season, you'll hear a different kind of story on CBS Gangbusters tomorrow night. The authentic story of a former gangster's fight to go straight, broadcast in cooperation with outstanding parole authorities. You'll find this Easter Eve Gangbusters drama as gripping as any program CBS has ever brought to you. Tomorrow night, you'll also find a mid-April adventure with the intriguing title, The Heat Wave, on CBS Philip Marlowe program. Gangbusters and The Adventures of Philip Marlowe are regular Saturday night features on most of these same CBS stations. Listen in again next week when CBS brings you yours truly, Johnny Dollar, with Charles Russell as Johnny. Written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd with music by Mark Warno, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Time now for... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he's just an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, American Pioneer Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, W.K. Green, General Manager. The following is an accounting of my expenditures in the case of Barton Drake, or how I played ducks and drakes uh, with a drake who ducked. Expense account, item one. One hundred dollars I'm charging you for one hour's sleep I missed answering your telephone call at nine o'clock in the morning. Expense account, item two, a dollar and a half. I had to go out for breakfast. The Easter Bunny didn't leave me any eggs. Item three, cab fare to your office, one dollar. Tip to driver, one dollar. morning, Johnny. Why don't we make that good night sometime soon? Shall we, Chickie? Well, I've had to type up some of your expense accounts. I think maybe an evening with you might be fun. But business first. Old Stonewall's waiting for you. Oh, hasn't he gotten out of that military kick yet? <laughs> no, he still thinks he's a general. But to me, he's still just what he was before he ever went into the army. His belts never stopped fighting the battle of the businessman's bulge, huh? Well, forward march. Good morning, Mr. Green, sir. Mr. Dollar reporting as ordered, sir. Eddie. Hmm? Oh, yeah. what's this saluting and heel clicking about? Oh, I thought you might be homesick for some military courtesy. Yeah, I'd be surprised to get any kind of courtesy from you. But we're not paying you to be polite. Sit down. Here. I got a job for you. Here. I had a copy made of the file in that case. You can take it with you. Thanks. Barton Drake, huh? Oh, yeah, I remember him. Let's see. Life insurance, $30,000. Beneficiary, Mrs. Barton Drake. Well, what is it? Is he dead or just dying? Neither, we hope. Well, if you'll pardon a little before noon philosophy, just by living, a man is slowly dying of old age. We have a statistical department to worry about that, Dollar. Your job is to find this man, Barton Drake. Okay. What's the story? As far as the company is concerned, the story started one night just short of seven years ago. Oh, that would make it uh, 1942. Yes, the same year I was called upon to fight for my country. Uh, Yeah. In the insurance division, Pentagon Building, Washington, D.C. But don't get me wrong. Those who serve can be just as proud of what they did as those who fought. As you were saying. I merely use the word fight as a... This is a general term. Yes, General. Barton Drake, one night about uh, seven years ago? Uh, yes. When we issued the life policy on Drake, he uh, listed his occupation as that of uh, 
hardware store proprietor. Hardware? <laughs> As I recall it, he specialized in unregistered pistols, handcuffed keys, and hacksaws. And if I'm not wrong, at the time he disappeared, he was under suspicion of grand larceny and wanted for assault with intent to kill a police officer. Yeah, that's right. At the time, he was suspected of a number of large robberies. Yeah. Refresh me on that cop shooting. How'd that happen? Uh, you remember. When the police arrived at the house to pick him up, he opened fire from the bedroom window, made a dash for it out of the back to his own car. And there was a chase during which the car skidded and went through the rail of a bridge into the river. Uh, oh, yes. Now I remember, yeah. They never did recover the body or the loot. All they got back was a wet Buick. Uh, Dollar, that was seven years ago. At least it will be seven years in one more week. At that time, Barton Drake will be declared legally dead by the probate court. His wife has already instituted proceedings. And when the court says she's a widow, she says, I want my $30,000, and you have to pay it, right? Exactly. But we're not going to pay that $30,000 if we can help it. At 9 o'clock this morning, the missing persons bureau of the New York Police Department called us and gave us reason to hope that Drake is still alive. What happened? Did they see him in a crystal ball? You don't know how close to the truth you came, Dollar. Oh? The missing persons boys have a new habit these days. Whenever there's a television show there's, where there's a public crowd involved, they watch it. Last night, they think they spotted Barton Drake at the prize fights. Now, that's all we've got to go on, but we think he's alive and that he's somewhere in New York. Well, that's a start, anyway. I know where to find New York. <laughs> Expense account, item four, seven dollars. Mileage, Hartford to New York. I stopped in Bridgeport to soak up a dish of coffee and whatever information there might be in the insurance file. Of the two, the coffee was the stronger. All I learned from the file was Drake's physical, physical measurements, the birthplace of his mother, his wife's maiden name, the last known quotation on his blood pressure, and his home address in Manhasset, Long Island, to which I went. The house had a $40,000 look about it, and its grounds were being manicured by a gardener who had a $12 a day look about him. Yes, sir? Uh, I'd like to see Mrs. Drake. Here's my card. Yes, sir. Get in, please. Thank you. If you wait here in the hall, sir, I'll go tell her you're here. The maid had a $40 a week look about her and completed the picture of prosperity. For a hardware merchant, Barton Drake had died leaving his wife living a soft life. Either that or he was still alive and not giving his wife grounds for divorce on the basis of non-support. Or she was that certain kind of gal who wouldn't have any trouble making that certain kind of man get up that certain kind of money. And when I saw her, I knew not only that I couldn't afford her, but the Drake probably hadn't been able to, which probably led to his undoing. Just to give you an idea, she was wearing a diamond necklace and a negligee, and it was two o'clock in the afternoon. Mr. Dollar? Mrs. Drake? Yes, Stella Drake. I'm having breakfast. Won't you come in and join me? Well, I'll join you, but uh, no breakfast. I just had a tomato surprise. Hmm? Lunch. Oh, <laughs> I'm glad you didn't mean me. Uh, come on, right in here. Are you sure you won't have some breakfast? No, thanks. I couldn't bring myself to hurt that poor, tired trout you've got there. Oh, please. That's a genuine English kipper. Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't recognize it without its monocle. <laughs> oh, you're more fun than an eye-opener. I should have you around when I get up every day. Well, I have something to tell you that should make you really feel good. You don't mean that bunch of stuffed shirts at the insurance company have decided to give me my money without going through all that fuss at probate court. Oh, I've got better news than that. You may not get that money. Uh, but we think you have a good chance of getting your husband back. What? Yeah, the New York police think they saw him last night. Alive. Oh, maybe I was wrong. Maybe that doesn't make you happy. Why, uh, yes... Yes, of course, of course it makes me happy, but her to live without a man for seven years and then have a, a stranger just sit across the table and calmly tell you he's alive, but it, it's just too much. Tell me, where did they find him? They didn't. They think they spotted him at the fights they were watching on television. I imagine they're looking for him. I know I am. Well, it's impossible. If he were alive and back in New York, he'd come to me. That's what I was hoping, Mrs. Drake. Well, I don't believe it. Why would he do a thing like that to me? Why would he make me suffer all these years? 
I think you'd better go now. I've got to be alone. I've got to think. Oh, Barton, why? Why? Please, Mr. Dollar. I want to be alone. I figured if she wanted to be alone, it was for a good reason. Because that lather she'd gotten into was strictly from soap opera. She flooded me to the door on a tide of tears. Once outside, I picked up the hedge clippers the gardener had conveniently left near the front walk and pruned the telephone wires leading into the house. Then I took a plant on the place from the other side of the street. I figured Mrs. Drake would want to share her troubles with somebody, and with the phone wires cut, she'd have to leave the house to do it, giving me a chance to follow her. And that's the way it worked out. She led me someplace all the way into New York City, but not to Barton Drake. That would have been too easy. Once in Manhattan, she headed for a drugstore and the telephone booth. I slipped into the phone booth beside hers. I got the receiver off the hook and my nickel in the slot in time to use an old trick of mine. As she dialed, I tried to duplicate it with my phone. She dialed. And I dialed. I was just one number behind her all the way. When she was through dialing, I held off dialing the last number on my phone until she got an answer. And then I let it go. The number she was calling was busy. There was still room for coincidence, but it was good enough for me. I jotted down the number I'd gotten out of my little telephone game of tag and then listened. I've got to see you right away. We're in trouble. All right, I'll meet you in 20 minutes. The usual place. <laughs> usual place turned out to be the usual place to meet trains, Grand Central Station. But no train ever pulled into where Mrs. Drake went. As a matter of fact, no man ever did. Unless he was a plumber, maybe. That's right, where the ladies go to powder their noses and things. She came out 30 minutes later alone, but she never hit the street. Instead, she went through the tunnel into the adjoining Commodore Hotel and checked into room 407. The only room I could get was 1313. Expense account item five, ten dollars. Tip to hotel detective for keeping an eye on the Eiffel in 407. Item six, thirty-five dollars. Purchase of portable phonograph. Item seven, sixty-five cents. Purchase of phonograph record, Frank Sinatra singing night and day. With this for ammunition, I went back to my hotel room and gunning for a bird I'd never seen. I set up the phonograph near the telephone, put on the record, and placed a call to the number Mrs. Drake had called earlier in the day. Hello there, 7 p.m. again, and this is your favorite disc jockey, Happy Jack the Money Man. Yes, your favorite disc jockey, your spinner with the winners. Tell me, are you listening to our show? My radio is not on. Goodbye. Oh, hold the phone, madam. A little thing like that doesn't make any difference to Happy Jack. Here's all you have to do to win a house full of prizes. Now, you just listen closely over the phone and identify today's puzzle platter, and you'll win all these wonderful prizes. A genuine sunbeam mix master that makes those fresh little eggs just happy to get beat up. Yes, and you'll clean up with the next prize. Make a real clean sweep with a Hoover vacuum cleaner with all attachments and no strings attached. <laughs> and to send you tripping happily through life, you'll also receive a handsome set of easy-to-lug luggage, a pair of gladiator bags. Are you interested? Why, of course I am. All right, then. Here's the tune. There it is. What's the title of that song? Night and Day. You're right. You win all the sensational prizes. Quickly now, give me your name and address. They'll be delivered tonight. Mrs. Knott. Yes, Mrs. Knott. The street number? 127 East 89th Street, apartment 3C. Thank you, Mrs. Knott. You'll get the whole works immediately. <laughs> Expense account, items 8, 9, and 10. $39.50, purchase of Mixmaster. $79.50, purchase of vacuum cleaner. And uh, $89.50, purchase of luggage. You may resent this expenditure, but there's one thing you must remember. Nobody can resist trading their name and address for something for nothing. I felt like an out-of-season Santa Claus when I knocked on the door of apartment 3C at 127 East 89th Street. 
The frame suddenly became a picture frame encasing a live version of Whistler's grandmother, complete with wheelchair and crocheted afghan. Just bring them in and set them down. Yes, ma'am. I'm Happy Jack, and I'm glad to meet you. Right in here and set them down. Ah, yes. There you are, Mrs. Knott. You lucky woman, you. Is that all? Almost. Now all we need from you is a little information. Just some background on today's winner to pass along to my radio audience. Be off with you, young man. I'll write you a letter. Oh, but come now, Mrs. Knott. Never mind. I have no time now. Just a few questions while I check you out on the Hoover. I don't need any checking out. Now go away. I must say, Mrs. Knott, you're a bad winner. So now I'm afraid I'm going to have to stick around to find out how good a loser you are. What do you mean? Come in. Uh, You. Stella, do you know this man? Do I know him? He's that insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. Granny came flying out of the wheelchair, multiplying in height by three. When I first saw Granny's hand flying toward me, it looked like there was an old-fashioned wedding ring on each finger. But just just too late, I saw it was only a set of brass knuckles. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. CBS cordially invites you to hear the adventures of Philip Marlowe and the stories of modern crimes and their solutions as unfolded on Gangbusters when they come to you every Saturday night on most of these same CBS stations. Tomorrow night, Philip Marlowe will investigate the mystery behind the cloak of Kamehameha, and Gangbusters will deal with the case of the callous killers. Now back to Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> up, the thunder and lightning in my head was getting an answer from the sky. And I started getting some answers, too. You, James, give me a page. Granny's You're voice had changed You're to the base register, and its it. owner was smoking a big cigar. Right. I stayed on the floor and quiet. Listen, I didn't want those you. brass knuckles crooning me another lullaby. Come awful close to fouling up the whole deal. I told you I didn't want you to try to collect on that insurance. Why'd you do it? It's $30,000, that's why. You hear you talk, you'd think you were going hungry. What do you think I am, some empty milk bottle you can run down to the corner and get your nickel back on? What were you trying to do anyway, sell me out? Sell you out? You know what started this trouble. You had to go to the fights last night. Oh, a big man. Dumb cops, you call them. Don't worry about me. They haven't found me. I'll take care of myself. But not with you lousing me up. Getting mixed up with dirty dealers like this guy, Dalton. Oh, you're so smart. Why did you let him in here? Shut up. He wanted to give me something for free. That's why. Well, I've got something for him. A free boat ride. Wheel that chair over here. We'll take him out in that. The wheelchair ride was short to the street. The auto ride was longer to the ocean. And from what I could gather on the dock, the boat ride was to be even longer to my doom. I was still playing Sleeping Beauty and listening to the supposed-to-be dead man, Barton Drake, telling his wife, Stella, how he was going to make my slumber permanent. Come on, come on, get a move on. I've got his hands tied. Hurry up with his feet. I'm almost through. There. Now what? Now, I'll stand back while I heat him up on the deck. Well, aren't you going to tie him to something? For what? If they ever find this boat, they're going to find it empty. One good wave out there, and this guy goes for a swim. There. The wheel's lashed. He's got plenty of gas and plenty of ocean out there. That'll teach Mr. Happy Jack. Now I'm giving him away. Taking that salt shower bath with my clothes on wasn't the big chill in my life. I was scared. My heart was racing faster than the boat engine. And for the first 20 minutes, all I could think about was hanging onto that slippery deck with all I had to hang with, my hopes and my heels. I was on a thin strip of deck after the wheel. Hard by my hands was a deck cleat. But that for a starting point, I went to work, trying to outnavigate that rope, with which Bart and Drake had lashed the wheel. I worked my tight wrists over the cleat and dropped my legs down over the side into the icy racing water. I had rigged myself into a human jury rudder to swing the boat off its course. I didn't know where it would take me, but I didn't care so long as it wasn't out to the open sea.
Waking up, eh? Might as well tell you. Your boat sunk and you ruined the dock last night doing it. You have to pay for it. Oh. My name's Fred Kindly. I pulled you off the beach. I expect to be paid for that, too. Well, it cost me to find out where I am. Well, it ain't worth nothing. Talk, ain't. Eh? You're on Slate Island. It ain't worth much, neither. All Slate. Didn't have a cent to grow no chalk to go with it. Dandy. Where are my clothes? Out in the sun. How about my wallet? Uh, fish must have got it. Mind if I feel your back for fins? Now don't get funny, young fella. Might want to be getting off this island someday. Someday? Some minute is more like it. You got a boat? Of course I got a boat, but uh, ain't got much food. Maybe if I could afford to buy some supply canned goods when I got to the mainland, well... Uh... Well, how much would it cost? Oh, uh, much as a hundred dollars, maybe? Okay, it's a deal. Let's go. Uh, hold on now. Only said maybe... Come think of it, might cost uh, two hundred. Oh, okay, you swindler. Two hundred then. Oh, swindler, am I? I say, a fellow might as well have the game as a name. Makes my price five hundred dollars worth of grade A canned goods. And if you don't want to pay it, you can get out this shack and wait for the mailboat. Maybe I will. When does it get here? A uh, week from Tuesday. Uh, uh okay. You'll get your five hundred dollars worth of canned goods. When can we start? I'll give you your clothes soon as you put it in writing and sign your name. Where's the paper? Uh, right here. Keep it handy. Uh, just fill in the amount here. Five hundred dollars worth. It's my regular contract for shipwreck. Okay. Give it here. Five hundred. And where do I sign? Right there at the bottom. There you are. All signed. Uh, that's a peculiar name. Ali Khan. <laughs> I'd had more than my share of wind the night before, so I decided to throw caution to it. I went into the building at 127 East 89th Street and up to apartment 3C. First, I knocked with my knuckles and got no answer. So then I knocked with my feet. Well, what do you know? The lock broke. There was nobody home. And Barton Drake must have been out calling himself Granny at the moment because the wheelchair part of his disguise was also among the missing. The closet was empty. And the brand new gladiator bags I had delivered the previous evening were nowhere to be found. Now, nobody could say I hadn't made it easy for Drake to make a getaway with my little giveaway. I'd even supplied the luggage. But all the traffic wasn't going. Some of it was coming. Oh, well, Stella, there's one bad thing about kicking your way into places. You can't lock the door behind you. Well, now that you're in, you better come all the way in. What are you doing here? You should be asking me what I'm doing alive. The only answer I've got for that is I don't murder easily. Where's Barton? Oh, that was the next question I was going to ask you. Now that that one's gone, I've got a couple more I'd like to ask you. And don't argue. I don't know anything. Well, then, let me tell you something. If you're not guilty of anything else, you are guilty of attempted insurance fraud. That's in my department. The tougher you make it on me, the tougher I'm going to make it on you. Now, about those questions. How long has your husband been back here in New York? He... He never left here. Oh, the night his car crashed through the bridge, he just grabbed himself a hideaway in New York and stayed put, huh? How long has he been using that old lady disguise? All the time. Okay. Well, now my last question. That bag in your hand, where were you going? Okay, let's find out. Give me that bag. Uh-huh. What's this? Well, it's either a bathing suit or a two-piece handkerchief. And that blouse there, that doesn't look like it's for dinner wear and an igloo. You were headed south. So we were headed south. What about... We, huh? If you ask me... And I doubt that you will, so I'll tell you anyway. Your hope's just headed south. Lady, you've been double-crossed. Your husband took off without you. I don't believe it. If he left here, he had a good reason. That's your guess. But for, for we're not playing your hunches. We're playing mine from here on in. Just where did he say you were going? I don't remember. Maybe it'll help if first you remember what I told you about insurance fraud. It's good for 10 to 20 years. Now, do you remember? He bought... Tickets on the Orange Blossom Special for Florida. It leaves Penn Station in an hour and a half. Oh, you've got that little backwards. The Orange Blossom Special pulls out in half an hour. Huh? That doesn't even give me enough time to get down there. Get out of my way. <laughs> Sit down. Information. Hello. Information. Look, I want the telephone number of the Penn Station branch of the Traveler's Aid Society. This was once when I didn't want the society to aid the traveler. I told them that Barton Drake was my invalid aunt and as nutty as a fruitcake. 
With Stella's help, I described his costume from the daisies on his hat to the buttons on his shoes. I tagged it off with a warning that when my aunt left the house, she thought she was a honeybee and was on her way to throw herself in front of the Orange Blossom special, wheelchair and all. The guy on the other end of the line took off to round up the railway police, and I took off to round up a taxi. the escalator into the main waiting room. And halfway down, I spotted Barton Drake in his grandmother get up. He was surrounded by police, and the police were surrounded by a small crowd. I walked over. I don't know what kind of a practical joke this is, young man, but it's not funny. You made me miss my train, and I don't even have a nephew. No, no, Mother, don't be upset in yourself. Don't you now, now, me, young man. Just get me on a train. Any train headed south will do. Drake was getting ready for trouble. If the cops couldn't see it, I could. His hand was under his afghan, and I knew the least it could be holding was a fistful of brass knuckles, but probably more. He was getting ready to make a run for it. I wasn't taking any chances. I edged my way through the crowd, up behind the wheelchair, and spun it around, and hit what looked like somebody's grandmother a beautiful shot in the whiskers. He hit the old lady! I got him. Now, wait a minute, officer. You don't understand. I don't understand, don't I? Hit an old lady, will you? He's not an old lady. Uh, trouble you want, you scoundrel. Here, maybe this will quiet you. Oh, no. So you don't... Hiya, Chicky. Oh, that, that bandage. What's the matter with your head? No brains. Where's the general? Oh, when he found out you saved American Pioneer $30,000, he decided to take the morning off and celebrate. He's out playing golf. Oh, great. To celebrate my getting hit on the head with police clubs, he goes out and swings golf clubs. Oh, Johnny, I was sort of Now, don't that... worry, Chicky. I've still got enough energy left for nightclubs. You want to help me with this expense account? I'll have to get it out of the way. Oh, that's all that stands between uh-huh. us. Uh-huh. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, American Pioneer Life Insurance Company. First, the police held me and let Granny Drake go to the hospital where they learned the truth. Then they let me go to the hospital and transferred Barton Drake to the pokey where he was soon joined by his lady-in-waiting, Mrs. Drake. Uh, expense account item 11. Something I almost forgot. $500. Canned goods. For the man who got me off the rocks on Slate Island, Mr. Fred Kindly. Even if he did rob me, I didn't feel like robbing him. The only thing I did do was remove all the labels from the $500 worth of canned goods. I'm sure that this will see to it that Mr. Kindly has some very unbalanced meals because I happen to know that there's no difference in the sound of canned tomatoes and uh, canned peaches when you shake the can. Uh, expense account total, $1,482.63. Yours, um, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> last, mankind is facing up to one of its most feared diseases, cancer. Research scientists are working tirelessly, exploring every avenue that might lead to new treatments, new cures, and new insight into the causes of the disease. At the same time, the American Cancer Society is working to keep the public informed of all the progress that has been made, trying to reach everyone with the message that the sooner a diagnosis is made, the better the chances of cure. Together, this public education and research attack should bring great progress in the control of cancer. But both phases of this program are costly. Realizing you are giving to a fight against a disease that could menace you, give generously to the American Cancer Society's Drive for Funds this year. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Charles Russell as Johnny. Our music is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. 
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd and is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Everybody knows a taxi driver likes being over-tipped, but you can't blame him for not liking being tipped over. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he's only an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Home Office, the Nutmeg State Liability Underwriters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of the disappearance of 12 Apex cabs. Or, who took the taxis for a ride? Expense account, item one, $3.10. Train fare, Hartford to New York. Item two, $1.10, dinner en route. Item three, $18, club car. Expense account item four, $1.30, cab fare from station to garage and offices of Apex Taxi Company. I naturally waited for an Apex cab, but could have saved my time. The driver told me nothing, except that the man who came rushing out of the Apex office when we pulled up was the big boss, Mr. Gordon McKissick. Thanks, driver. He's just the man I'm looking for. Here. Thank you, sir. Hey, McKissick! Can't stop now. I'm in a hurry. See me tomorrow. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, will you? I'm Johnny Dollar from the insurance company. Oh, oh, good. That's different. Just in time. Come along. Where are we going? Come on. Tell you in the car. Just had a call from the police. Another one of my cabs has been stolen. Huh? They found the driver slugged and unconscious, and I got to get out of there. Huh? I tell you, Dollar, I'm going crazy. This has got to stop. It's not only driving me out of business, it's driving me out of my mind. The police have done their best, and Lord knows I have too, but I'm about ready to give up. This makes 12 of my taxi cabs disappeared off the face of the earth. It's fantastic. I can't hold, believe it. Hold it, McKissick. Do us both a favor, will you? Huh? What? Play cucumber for a few seconds. Oh. Remember, the insurance company I represent has plenty to scream about, too. What I need is some facts. I haven't got any facts. And if this keeps up, I won't have any taxis. They're gone, that's all. 12 of them, that's all there is to it. Any idea of a motive? Some new kind of car theft? That's what the cops say. Okay, what's your idea? Robbing the drivers? You don't have to steal a cab to rob a driver. It's ridiculous. All right, then. What else could it be? Competition? Sabotage? That's my guess. Competition. So far, it's only a guess. I'd give anything to know. So would the insurance company. Anything. They'd even give up my happy young life. <laughs> Thirteenth and East River. Yeah, and there's the crowd. Humanity's strongest all magnets. Right, right, Blood. Yeah. Please, please, back. please, stand back. Come hey, on. officer. Huh? Officer. What do you want? Look, here's my ID. This man is McKissick, the victim's boss. How about getting us through that crowd? Well, all right, but I don't know. The right side of his face don't feel much like talking. It's caved in. Stand aside now. Come on, move, move. Come on, Dollar. Let's move in. Plenty okay. Up. I can't breathe right. in here, let alone the hurt man. Get out of the way, will you? Okay, Mr. Dollar. Here you are. Oh. Hey, are they right? Is this one of your men, McKissick? Yeah, George Brandon. Been with me four years. Oh. I. Oh. Brandon. Brandon, listen to me. Uh, who did it? Do you know who did it? Try hard, will you? Uh, never strong before. Yeah, hey. yeah. Yeah, Brandon, only one. Well, what did he look like? Come on, boy. Hey, hey little guy. Dark. Uh, talk funny. He talked funny? How, Brandon? How? An accent? Hey, hey. Come on, Brandon. Uh, well, now, that's it. All right, clear the way. Stand back. Clear the way for the ambulance. The ambulance. The ambulance turns out to be the wrong kind of a wagon.
expense account, item five, $28. Transportation the following day, visiting hospitals and the homes of the other 11 Apex drivers who had lost their cabs. During the course of this, I contracted a severe case of what G.I.s used to refer to as Jeep Seat. Out of 11 interviews, I got three clues. One, that up until last night's killing, the cab nappers had worked as a team. The little dark guy with an accent, as described by the dead driver Brandon, and a 300-pound accomplice wearing a seersucker suit, a Panama hat, and a complexion akin to a perspiring blob of leaf lard. This heavier of the two heavies, it seemed, never actively participated in any of the rough stuff, merely assuming the role of director of operations. Clue number two, that in each instance, the driver's uniform cap was also stolen, which indicated to me merely that the getaway driver was very much interested in looking like a cab driver. Finally, clue number three, from the most disgruntled of the drivers interviewed, the fact that the fleet owner McKissick had spent three years bootlegging, another four bookmaking, and had spent some very short vacations getting away from it all in prison which naturally led me back to McKissick's Apex Garage and office. Come in. Oh, Dollar. Well, what have you found out? Well, I'll tell you, McKissick. So far, I've just hit the ABCs. Later on, I'll get to the XYZs. Look, Dollar, I'm getting fed up with double talk. What I want to talk about is a double life. Yours. What? I once broke a leg jumping to a conclusion, so don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm doing. But uh, a less experienced investigator might immediately assume that a man like you, an ex-bootlegger, ex-bookmaker, ex-jailbird, just might be stealing his own cabs for the insurance money. Now, wait a minute. Don't get that way, or I might also get the idea that you have a killer instinct. My record's my own business. It was okay with the hack bureau. It was okay when that company sold me the insurance, so it'll have to be okay with you because you're stuck with it. Nobody's calling you guilty. Okay. Okay, all I'm telling you is this. I want your cabs off the street until this thing is cleared up. That's big talk, little man. When the day shift comes in at 4.30, tell them to park their cabs in the garage. And you can tell your dispatcher the night shift isn't working tonight. Bad enough to have my competition running me out of business. Now the little helper from the insurance company shows up to finish the job, huh? I'm not trying to put you out of business. I'm trying to keep you in. Well, it don't sound like it. No cooperation from you, no insurance. I'll have it canceled as fast as I can get to a phone. How about it? Okay, Dollar. I can't do anything about it. But if I were you, I wouldn't be caught hanging around here by any one of those drivers you're putting out of work. Some of them play rough. <laughs> You can always depend on a cab driver for being on time uh, when it's time to knock off work. By 5 o'clock, the garage was full of taxis and carbon monoxide fumes. By 5.30, it was devoid of humanity. And a night watchman I'd met before stood guard outside the locked gate. At 6 o'clock, a visitor dropped in on him, followed almost immediately by me. It's so important that I find it. Yeah, yeah. It contains everything I have in the world, almost. Yeah, oh, yeah. my money, even my purse. What's this, Vinny? Huh? Oh, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, yeah. Well, a young lady claims she lost... My purse, senor. I hired one of your taxi cabs this afternoon and left my purse in it. It's so important that I get it. Yeah, yeah. I told her to call Lost and Found in the morning. But, senor, what will I do tonight? While we're trying to figure that out, will you join me in a drink? I would like that. Her name was Marita Guastella. She was the dark type, so I took her around the corner to a dark saloon. On the way in, we passed four grumbling Apex cab drivers shooting hot looks at me over cold beers. I arranged her in a booth so I could keep an eye on them, in case their intentions were no good, and an ear on her story, which I knew wasn't. You see, this is my first trip to America. I came from Spain two weeks ago. This afternoon, I was shopping on Fifth Avenue, and that is when I took the cab from 49th Street to the Sherry Netherlands Hotel. Uh-huh, 49th, Sherry Netherlands. Yes. What time do you take the cab? Wait, uh, I'm not sure exactly. That uh, would help. Oh, it, it was... It was exactly ten minutes after four. I remember now I looked at a clock. Uh-huh. And uh, what time did you arrive at the hotel, Marita? Why are you writing all this down? I was trying to help you find your purse. Oh, but I do not want to put you to any trouble. I am perfectly willing to search through the taxis myself. Honey, the city of New York has gone to a lot of trouble to save you that trouble. 
Every driver has to keep a record of every trip, where he picks up his passengers, where he drops them, and when. Oh. He puts it on a big card. So all we have to do is find out which card has your trip listed on it, then we'll know which cab. Oh, then we'll go to the little cab and probably find your little purse. All right? Oh, it is very good of you, Senor If you would not mind the trouble. Sometimes bothering with this kind of trouble eliminates my uh, employer's troubles. How about the martini? Expense account, item six. Four dollars, bar tab. Tip to waiter, one dollar. And here's a tip to young ladies who are pretending that they just came from Spain two weeks ago. Don't order bird bath martinis and put them away in one gulp. The drinking taste of Spanish ladies is more the sherry type. And martinis are hard enough to get used to in two years, let alone two weeks. Oh, who knows? Maybe she was just in a hurry to get to the Spanish olives. One thing was fairly apparent, though. She seemed to be in a hurry to get something out of one of those cabs. And not by way of the lost and found department. The least I could do, both as a gentleman and an insurance investigator, was to accept her phony-sounding story and take her back to the garage. I arm and arm the sometimes senorita around the block, <laughs> passing the time in a conversation not exactly based on her mother's favorite oh, recipe Johnny, or a rosa con pollo. <laughs> as we passed the office portion of the Apex cab building, I gave up looking into her eyes and saw something that was open even wider, the garage gate. Jenny, what is it? The watchman, he's gone. Perhaps he just stepped inside. Uh-uh. Look at the stains on the sidewalk. Blood. <gasps> Bridewell. He's been... Bridewell? Who's Bridewell? I do not know. Who's Bridewell? Please, let me go. Let me go, please, Johnny. You're hurting my arm. Marita had twisted away and was hightailing it up the street. I went stamping up the ramp in the direction of the source of the scream. On the way up, I hit the light switch. In this racket, even big boys should be afraid of the dark. The first portal, I slowed my run into a pussyfoot pace and edged around the corner, sliding my back along the dispatcher's counter. When I got halfway down, the corner of my right eye picked off a pair of high black shoes, night watchman type. Heels on the floor, toes pointed up, sticking out from behind the end of the counter. I didn't have time to get a look at the rest of them. Something so round, so firm, and so fully loaded gave me a cold steel kiss under the left ear. Pray do yourself the favor, sir, of remaining absolutely still. Now... Now, you may turn around. Would uh, this be Mr. Bridewell? Good indeed, sir. Well, what about the night watchman? I have no fears for him. I am fortunately accomplished in the administration of first aid. But a good deal of practice. I've seen to it that he's resting comfortably. I'll bet. Well, Victor, my boy, I trust your search was successful. Yes, sir. Uh, somebody beat us to it. All them cabs has been searched. Nonsense, my boy. How can you tell in so short a time? How about taking a look for yourself, fat boy? You couldn't possibly have picked over all of them. Proceed with the search quickly. In the meantime, okay. perhaps our friend here is the proprietor of the search that preceded us. In this case, practically anything could happen. Yes, anything could. Knowing that should encourage you to mind your manners. Now, sir, will you come to me to my hotel where we can discuss this weather? Now, with you holding that thirty-eight caliber steel-engraved invitation in your hand... I'd be a perfect cad to refuse. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, your armed forces are constantly searching for new methods and devices for national security and better peacetime living. Today's serviceman is a skilled professional who works with advanced techniques and equipment. If you're interested in science and technical subjects, your armed forces offers you a great opportunity now. Find out how you can join the world's greatest scientific enterprise, the Armed Forces of the United States. Now, with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, and tonight's story, Who Took the Taxis for a Ride? <laughs> looking for some stolen taxi cabs and wound up in a hotel room looking stupid. Not wishing to make this a permanent effect, I put my mind to work, and the fruits of its labor went something like this. Whoever had been stealing those cabs, and I figured I was face-to-face -face with one of them now, had not been stealing the apex rolling stock for the cabs themselves, but for something evidently hidden in one of them. From here on in, there was only one way to play it. 
by ear. That was easy, because the pasty-faced 300-pounder draped in a double-breasted seersucker tent was doing all the talking. Back in 1912, when I was expelled from Oxford University as a result of an unfortunate association with an unscrupulous proctor, I arrived at this decision, sir. It's sometimes not profitable to be on the apparently right side. Do I make myself clear? Well, in a roundabout way, I think so. Now then, I am thus fully acquainted with my position in regard to this matter of the Scarlet Madonna. But you, where do you stand? I'm running a one-man escort service for Marita Guastella. Ah, Marita. So, the lovely but unwise Marita has taken unto herself an accomplice, has she? Well, as long as you're allied with her, you and I must be at cross purposes. Well, I'm open to suggestion. Good. The girl is nothing more than a penniless adventuress, a common thief. Well, I, sir, may be able to tempt your transient loyalties with some very fetching terms. Mm-hmm. Well, Victor? Yes, it's our man, all right. Knocked it out of that night watchman when he came to. There was only one guy in that garage besides us. This is him. Let's go to work, man. Here, here, Victor. This is not the time for violence. The gentleman and I are about to discuss terms of mutual profit. Are we not, sir? Uh, you were discussing. I was listening. Yes. You'll find that I can be concise when the situation demands that I be. Shall we start with a figure of, say... $5,000? Hey, I'm not. Let me work him over. Well, Victor, you can't remember that I deplore violence. Uh, well, young man, what do you say? Nuts to your 5000 Mr. Bridewell. Good heavens, man. Have you lost your mind? What do you think the Scarlet Madonna is worth to you? Well, so far it's been worth one man's life, 12 taxi cabs, on a used car lot that comes to more than $5,000. 7500 there. Keep coming. Now, see here now. There's not only a limit to my generosity, there's a limit to my patience. How else do you expect to realize that you have to profit? I haven't made up my mind. Perhaps I can help you. Here are the problems you face. The Scarlet Madonna is no ordinary gem to be disposed of through the ordinary channels. You, sir, have the faintest notion of the importance of the jewel. Well, I've got a hunch I could retire for life on it. A very short life it might be. It would be a pity if your blood were mixed with that already shed through the centuries over the Scarlet Madonna. I don't waste time with that story, fat stuff. We haven't got all week. My purpose in this repetitious recitation is bona fide. The bloody history may convince our friend that no one since the year 1256 has been able to share for any appreciable length of time the company of the Scarlet Madonna. Hey, 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 tell him about the well, that pirate. was the year it was fashioned. He won the vestments of John of his sense. On March 20th of that year, he was ordered by Alexander IV to hasten to the province of Tuscany to aid in the routing of the heretics. The pirate. There, John was murdered and robbed of this jewel. And since that date, it has never ceased its bloody journey through history. England, France, and Spain. Don't forget the pirate that stuff. Thank you, Victor, for your helpful interest. Indeed, it is true. During one of its bloodier experiences, it was woven into the beard of an Alsatian pirate, from which it fell when his head tumbled into the basket beneath a guillotine. <laughs> that one too, me. <laughs> you see, mister, don't go losing your head. <laughs> I'm trying not to. Look, Bridewell, if this rock is so hot, how come you're willing to risk your pudgy little neck for it? <laughs> Victor here and I are only the temporary middlemen for this infamous gem. Uh, you aren't yet. Am I to understand that you refuse? Well, I must say you tell a very good story. But the answer is still nothing doing. I told you fat stuff. You are wasting your breath on this guy. Oh! Well, no, Victor, that's enough. You now get up, young man. That monkey over me, or I'll yell the roof off this joint. Yes, no, that won't be necessary. Now, put your hands up, please. Now, Victor, go through his pockets. Okay. Not that anyone would be foolish enough to carry the Scarlet Madonna. Okay, now. Stand easy. Oh, you'll kick your teeth in. Uh, don't try it. Hey. Come on. You know what we got here? An insurance stick. I know, Victor. One gun is enough. Not for me, it ain't. It must be from the company insuring the rock. No, no, Victor. I am thoroughly familiar with the policies covering the Scarlet Madonna. What's the gentleman's name? Uh, Johnny uh, Dollar from uh, Hartford, Connecticut. And right now, thinking there's no place like home. I'm leaving. No, not alive, you ain't. We can't let him out of here. He's red hot for us. down your weapon, Victor. There's been trouble enough. Now you don't. Oh, yes, I do. Back off, Buster. Uh, Victor. I must insist. Let him get away. Let go of me. Insurance investigator, whatever. If he knows where the jewel is, he's more good for us alive than dead. More valuable than even you. The 
The elevators weren't fast enough. I hit every fourth step down eight flights of stairs to the lobby and out into the street. Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Johnny. Johnny, I must see you. Oh, Marita. Well, this saves me looking for you. You just tag right along. Taxi! Here you are, sir. After you, Lady of Spain. Thank you, Jenny. You're welcome. Oh, my poor Johnny. What did they do to you? A gentleman named Victor hung a right hand on me, complete with signet ring. Oh, Johnny. Oh, never mind that hanky. I'm not in the mood to be dabbed at. I'm so sorry. Johnny, what did they tell you? Oh, oh, no, you don't. First, I want to hear what you have to tell me. Then we'll compare stories. Wait. There's not much to tell. This Scarlet Madonna is rightfully and legally mine. My only crime was to bring it into this country illegally through customs. I met Bridewell and that horrible victor on the ship. And when I got to New York, I realized that they were following me. I was terrified. That I'll believe. I was in a taxi cab, and they followed me in another. It, it forced us to a curb. And, well, I hid the jewel in the upholstery of the taxi. Then I jumped on him and fled for my life. Oh, I remember it. That it was an apex cab. I've been trying to find the exact one ever since. So apparently are they. How'd they find out? They ran after me that night. They searched me and all of my belongings. And then when I started my search, they realized what I was doing. Well, looks like anybody can catch the brass ring on this merry-go-round. Please, Johnny. Tell me that you will help me to recover the Madonna. <sighs> Look, gorgeous. All I'm trying to catch up with is a dozen stolen taxi cabs. But you are not just going to leave me flat? With that figure? Impossible. I took Marita to a small hotel, got her a room, and uh, while she was taking a bath, I stole her clothes and left her, locked in that strongest of midtown prisons, nudity. The first joker I went looking for back at the Apex garage was the unfortunate night watchman. I found him sitting up and taking nourishment out of a bottle and nursing an egg on his head that would have hatched an ostrich. Oh, it's you, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. I tell you, I've been worried about you. Yeah, yeah. Thank heavens you're all right. No thanks to you. No. Well, what do you mean, sir? I mean, why'd you tell that sawed-off ape who slugged you around that I searched these cabs in here last night? Why, I didn't mention you, sir. I told him it was the boss, McKissick. Huh? Yeah, yeah. McKissick? Where is he now, do you know? He just came by. I believe he's next door in his office. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Oh, McKissick. This case is developing more suspects than a garlic breath in a crowded elevator. Now, listen, let me... Trust me, I don't trust you. Right, you had your chance. From now on, there ain't no money. There ain't no money in it. Oh, no, Victor, no, no, no. Hey, what's it? Here's what I owe you. Come on, get up. Boy. Hey, a then I finished the job he had started. I found the Scarlet Madonna clutched in McKissick's dead hand. For a Scarlet Madonna, it was mighty green. It was an emerald about the size of a pack of cigarettes that's been flattened out in your pocket. A Madonna figure was carved in bar relief on one surface. As I stood over the body of McKissick, looking down at the green gem in my hand, I realized where it got its crimson name. For on the floor, outlying my hand, was a spreading pool of scarlet blood. Well, sir, we meet again. Yeah, so it seems. May I offer you my congratulations at the same time request that you hand over the Scarlet Madonna? Being unarmed, as you are, you're not welcome to it. <laughs> well, perhaps I have something more persuasive than a weapon. Here. Here are my credentials. I'll look at them if you'll back up against the wall. Very well. You'll also find there a letter authorizing me to the legal possession of this infamous, this hateful, this accursed instrument of greed. To explain that it's been my odious duty to retrieve it for its rightful owner, the Stilwell Museum in London, from which it was stolen by Victor and his erstwhile lady-in-waiting, the exotic Marita. 
insurance investigator. You. Where do you come from? What's your outfit? <laughs> yes, I thought I'd set you back on your heels. <laughs> I'm from London. Pity we didn't have each other's interests classified earlier. We might very well have, shall we say, collaborated in this matter. Yeah. I'm sure there's an unvoiced question lurking on the tip of your tongue. My association with the bestial vicar. Well, at this point, I didn't want to insult you. <laughs> yeah, think nothing of it, my boy. Due to a fortunate similarity in voice and physique to your accomplished actor, Mr. Sidney Greenstreet, I find myself automatically listed as undoubtedly the villain of the piece. In this case, as in many others during my fantastically successful career as an insurance investigator, I was able to align myself with the basic source of the villainy involved. Further, I pray that you not accuse me of being associated with any of the physical violences which have punctuated this case. In short, this uh, Victor fellow occasionally slipped through my fingers. Look, all I'm trying to find is 12 lousy taxi cabs. <laughs> well, then, your troubles are at an end, my boy. I oh, shall good. write out an address. Fine. And then... there you shall find them unharmed yeah. in the warehouse hard by the East River. Okay. You'll forgive me, I'm sure, if I tell you that in this case, it is but another small milestone in the glorious pathway strewn with superior accomplishments in solving those minor mysteries evolved by the niggardly minds of the sniveling criminals who would offend the sanctity of that guardian of the peace of the public mind. The insurance company. Amen. Expense account, item seven. A dollar ninety-five, one evening gown, which was hard enough to find, but would probably be even harder to wear at that price, purchased in an all-night salon de mode on 136th Street. This dress I gave to Mr. Bridewell to take with him when he went calling on Senorita Marita Guastella prior to turning her over to the police. Expense account, item eight, six dollars and ten cents. One bottle of you-know-what with which to gargle the half-good, half-bad taste left by this case out of my mouth. Expense account item nine, transportation. No, come to think of it, you can forget this item for a while. I think I'd better stay here in Manhattan and rest up a bit. Expense account item nine, uh, $400. Advance, entertainment and things while resting on my laurels. Or possibly Mr. Bridewell's laurels. But anyway, resting. Expense account total, $1,100. You fill in the cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and stars Charles Russell with script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Herb Butterfield as Mr. Bridewell with Paul Dubove, Lillian Bayef, Lou Krugman, Junius Matthews, Jan Arvin, and Jack Crucian. The special music is written and conducted by Leith Stevens. Be sure to be with us again at the same time next week when another most unusual expense account is handed in by yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The great hit tunes of early 1939, Deep Purple, Penny Serenade, I Cried for You. How many more can you remember dancing to, romancing to? You'll hear them in smart new 1949 arrangements when your hit parade on parade comes along immediately over all of these same CBS stations. Alan Botzer speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. St. Peter's listening, this report may one day help qualify me for that pass through the pearly gates. This case almost rushed me up there.
This is another adventure of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is just an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Two... Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. This one's on the house. I wouldn't even bother itemizing it, except that the whole thing is probably tax deductible. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of Bonnie Goodwin. Or, she was under 21, but that didn't mean she was involved with nothing but minor vices. Or, murder ain't minor. Expense account, item one. $12.40, scotch whiskey and cigars consumed at surprise party arranged for me by one Mr. King Hart at my apartment in Hartford, Connecticut at 1.25 in the morning. Well, who are you? And which one of us is in the wrong apartment? Neither one of us. I'm King Hart. I came down from New York to see you. I hope you don't mind my helping myself to a cigar while I was waiting. Well, no, not at all. I'd even join you in a drink of my scotch, only I don't think I could squeeze it out of the cork. Uh, I'll send you a case. Uh, send me a copy Jeffrey of your John pass key while you're at it. Maybe I can drop in on you sometime. Much. This verge is on the illegal. Let's not waste time trying to scare each other, huh? Let's talk business. What is your business? Well, that verge is on the legal. That's why I need you. In your record, you're well enough known to do me some good. In mine, I'm too well known to do it myself. Do what? Find a girl for me. Wait a minute. I'm in the insurance business. So's the girl. She's a beneficiary of my insurance policy. This is a very unusual case. I was a sucker. The way that policy is written, I need her signature to do what I want to do. Change the beneficiary? Yeah. I'm all set to marry an honest dame. She's lovely. Well, I'll tell you, Mr. Hart. I make it a habit to work for big insurance companies, not individuals. Sorry. How come? I can't look up your credit rating in Dun & Bradstreet. Look it up in this wallet. Go ahead. I'll be bashful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you're solvent. Corners of these bills look like a tally on a baseball scoreboard. One run on the first, and then three goose eggs. Help yourself. Ah, uh, not so bad. Your money may be okay, but about your story. What about it? Look, there's any number of good licensed private detectives that you could have gone to. Philip Marlowe, Sam Spade, and Richard Diamond. And he would not only have solved your case, he would also sing you a song. Why did you come to me? I thought you had me straight. I don't like detectives. I'm allergic to coppers, pro or semi-pro. So's the girl. Look, Dollar, all, I have to, all you have to do is find the girl, get a signature on the form, and bring it back. Is that so tough? Yeah, my wisdom, too, still finds it a little tough to chew. I'd like to see the policy. Sure, I brought it with me. Here you are. Wow. Is this a motive-sized policy? A hundred grand. How'd you ever get it, Mr. Hart? When I took it out, I was a haberdasher. Uh huh. Specializing, no doubt, in bulletproof vests styled by Hart, Shatner, and U.S. Steel. Oh, yes. Beneficiary, Bonnie Goodwin. That's her. Well, before I can start looking, I should know where she stopped being around. Chicago. You'll find that and a lot of other stuff about her staples to the back of the policy. My, you're the very model of efficiency. I should be. As a model prisoner, I ran the accounting department at Leavenworth for five years. Thanks for not being bashful about your past. Makes it easy for me not to be bashful about asking you this. What's that? My assignment in writing. I just don't want anybody to get the wrong idea about my association with you. That's okay. All right. If you'll pay for the ticket. I guess I'm ready to take the ride. How much? A $3,000 retainer, and I'll bill you for my expenses. It's a deal. And don't hesitate to travel first class. Don't worry, Mr. Hart. Don't worry. <laughs> Expense account, item two, $55.32, plain fare, Hartford to Chicago. Expense account, item three, $4, cab fare from airport to downtown. It takes about half as long to get from the Chicago airport to downtown as it does from Hartford to Chicago airport. I checked into the ambassador where I intended to live, first class. And uh, expense account, item four, $1.20, cab fare to the Muriel Arms. A female hostelry where I didn't expect to live, but which was Bonnie Goodman's last known address. 
Even at noon, it looked like a good place to start an investigation by either the police, the fire, or the sanitation department. Well, I can listen, sir. Somebody's going to sing on me. I stand my constitutional right. Yeah, why don't they give you an answer? 30 days. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Hello, Muriel Arms. I'm sorry, Miss Graham left the notice serve until 2.30. Hello, Muriel Arms. Call back after 2.30, please. Pardon me. Muriel Arms. No, she isn't. She'll be back in five days. Hey! Yes, sir. Where can I find the room clerk? That's me. Oh, good. I'm looking for a girl who used to live here. Her name's Goodwin. You remember? Oh, the little princess... Yeah, I remember. I'm trying to forget her. Well, I'm trying to find her. You know where she went from here? No, and I don't care. One of the girls said she saw her hanging around Emma's place. That's over on West Street. You'll we'll hear it before you see it. I'm sorry, mister. That's all I got time for. These calls are piling up. Well, hello. Muriel Arms. <laughs> Where can I find Emma? I'm Emma. And no jokes. What do you want? I'm looking for a girl named Bonnie Goodwin. She ain't around. You told her she wasn't wanted around here. Well, that's your business. My business is to find her. Who are you? From the law? Well, from the law of averages. The insurance business. If you're selling insurance, you're going the right way. She needs some. Why don't you try to flag her apartment? Not only did the Flagler apartment fail to produce Bonnie Goodwin, but so did about 18 other wayward way stations scattered from the loop to the far north side. She was an easy girl to follow, but a hard girl to find. One of the things they learned along the trail was that Bonnie's heart was apparently no express train. It made a lot of local stops. And one of the things I was reminded of during the tedious search was a philosophy passed along to me by the tender age, by an old Pinkerton operator. She said... Being a detective is 90% legwork, just like being a mailman with no address on the letters. Fence accounts, item five. 1495, shoe leather. My brogans and my nerve ends were worn to a frazzle by eight o'clock that night when I went sniffing up my latest lead, which took me to the desk of a tasty little flea bag on Dearborn. Oh, it felt like you were picking up the seven-year itch just walking into the lobby. Hiya, Sonny. Are you looking for somebody? Yeah. And if I don't find her soon, I think I'll just sit still and let her find me. One of your guests, Bonnie Goodwin. You know her? As much as I know any of them, I guess. Is she still here? No. Well, do you know where she is? No, all I know is she moved out of here. Because I asked her to this morning. Tell me, what makes this kid so popular? She makes me nervous. I don't like the people she brings around. You mean me, Grandma? Or do you mean you don't like her choice of friends? I didn't say they were friends. No, I'm through talking. Read it. Now, wait a minute. I've got to... Now, listen, little boy. I'm awful good at not talking when I don't feel like it. And right now, I don't. Save yourself some time and get out of here. Okay. Now I know what was wrong with that little Red Riding Hood story. Grandma was the wolf. Boo! Oh, no. Hey, mister. Hmm? Hey. I... hey, I think I want to talk to you. No way, don't bother me. You were asking about Bonnie, weren't you? I'm a friend of hers. Oh? Well, where can we talk? Well, we... we better get away from this lobby window. Come on. Where are you headed? Out of town? Huh? Oh, all the suitcase? Mm-hmm. No, I just came back to the last of our things. Bonnie and I took an apartment today. Well, your roommate, huh? Yeah. What do you want with us? Wait a minute. Huh? Can you think of any good reason why two men should be following you? Where? Don't turn around. Where can I meet you? You're not going to leave me. You're just long enough to get where we're going. Where's a good place? The hangover house on North Park. Who do I ask for when I get there? What's your name? Jenny Page. Why can't I go with you? I want to find out who's being followed, you or me. Now, there's a hat stand. You take the first can, yeah. I'll take the second. Bill and Darby take the third, and then we'll know. Mm-hmm. 
What did you find out? Oh, nothing, Janie. Those guys pitched me the biggest curve since Lefty Grove. What does that mean? Well, we took two cabs, so they took two cabs. One of them followed me, so it figures one of them followed you. Any idea why? Now, wait a minute, mister. First, I gotta get you straight. I just picked you up on a hunch, because you don't look like the other one. Who are you, and what do you want with Bonnie? My name is Johnny Dollar. My business, insurance. Insurance? Who's dead? King Hart? Did I hear a hopeful note in your voice, Janie? Well, is he? Like in my business, I've learned never to give a definite answer to that question. But, as far as I know, he's still alive. He was when I saw him yesterday. He hired me to find Bonnie because he wants to get her name off his life insurance policy. As simple as that. That skunk. And what he put her through. You can file this question under N for none of my business, but uh, just what did he put her through? He built her way up and then he dragged her way down. And she's still too good for him, for anybody who works for him. I'm getting out of here. Maybe I told you too much about my business. Just enough. You're trying to help King Hart take away the only thing he left her. If I have my way, she'll never sign away the money from that insurance policy. Good night. This was the first chance I'd had all day to make anything happen. With a little luck, Janie Page was going to finally bird dog me straight to the little chick who had flown so many coops, thus making herself so hard to find. As she started down the 60-foot length of the long, narrow bar toward the back door, I saw two familiar hulks launch out of their chairs up near the front door. They were after her, and too big for me, our opponents from that game of taxi tag. So I set about stopping them. I took advantage of the narrow room, the big crowd, and a little bitty drunk. I hated to do it, but I had to turn the bottle baby into a bottleneck. <coughs> I hope he was too numb to chair. Hey, lay off the little guy! Hey, Come on, let me like through here. Get, get out of our way. We're If you like mob scenes, it was a great go-round when it lasted. But it only lasted 40 seconds. And then we got upstaged by some off-scene action out in the back alley. The crowd went out to look. I didn't. Somehow I knew. My live lead had turned into a dead one. And the morning news flash over my hotel room radio read the funeral services over what little remained of my host. Guns roared on Chicago's north side again late last night when six slugs tore the life out of a 105-pound brunette in an alley shooting reminiscent of the early 30s. Listed at the city morgue as dead on arrival, the body was identified as that of 19-year-old Bonnie Goodwin, ex-girlfriend of the notorious hoodlum King Hart. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, a burly sea captain, a fashion designer, a neurotic young gun collector, and a wealthy socialite. One of them very much dead. These are the elements Police Commissioner Bill Grant faces in his adventure on Call the Police tonight. Join Bill Grant for the thrills of the chase as he sets out to solve the case of the hero's funeral. And then take in Sam Spade's latest two-fisted adventure, Well Spiced with Wisecracks. Bill Grant of Call the Police and Sam Spade, like Johnny Dollar, are regular Sunday visitors on most of the same CBS stations. Now with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. In an alley shooting reminiscent of the early 30s, Listed as dead on arrival at the city morgue, the body was identified as that of 19-year-old Bonnie Goodwin, ex-girlfriend of the notorious hoodlum King Hart. And now for yesterday's baseball scores in the national... Spence, I count item six. 22.50. Replacement of one hotel room radio, which I punched in the dial. After it told me that the girl I'd been using as a bird dog the night before was really the bird. That I had spent an hour with Bonnie Goodwin, looking for Bonnie Goodwin. I agree, that isn't the proper way to turn off a radio, but the fight up to that time had been one-sided. I had to throw one punch even if the fight was all over. But then the bell rang, calling me out of my corner for another round. The bell on my telephone. Hello. Hello, Dollar? Yeah? This is King Art. I just got in town at the airport. Well, 9 a.m. News travels fast. You got private lines to the major morgues of the country? A friend of mine phoned me last night. Devil happened, Dollar. I'm not sure, Hart. It could be that you used me for a leadoff man on a relay team. 
You hire me to find the girl, then hire some government to follow me. And when I find her, boom. Now, wait a minute, Dollar. From now on, it looks like you don't have to worry about who's going to collect on your insurance. Do you, by any chance, collect on hers? That's out of my line these days. And flying 800 miles just to be at the scene of the crime has never been one of my habits. I'm not so sure you just flew in, but I'm dead sure that I'm not on your payroll any longer. Dollar, listen to me. You listen. I didn't follow through last night because I didn't want to be picked up as a material witness. First, I'm going out to prove a few things that'll keep me from being picked up, and then I'm going to make my report to the police. Aren't you telling the gun, Dollar? You know more about guns than I do. But I learned a lot about Bonnie Goodman while I was tracking her down yesterday. And one thing I learned, I like her kind better than I do yours. There wasn't anybody around to help her last night when she needed it. But I'll bet she had plenty of help making her first big mistake. Probably from you. is a masterpiece of refrigeration. Just thinking of one can give me a real cold chill. When I walk into one, I feel an icicle forming on each separate vertebrae in my spine. And when I start walking out of one, I feel the ice begin to melt. You do yourself any good? Maybe. Thanks for letting me go through a thing. Here, buy some cigars. Oh, this I'll buy a box. It's a big dip. It should be. You've been a big help. Going to the morgue to find an address, and I found it in the suitcase monogram BG for Bonnie Goodwin. I also found that the body had been identified by her roommate. What do you want? I was a friend of Bonnie Goodwin's. I want to talk to you about her. You're no friend of hers. I knew them all. Leave me alone. There's nothing to talk about. She's dead, isn't she? Yeah. I have a pretty personal interest in it. Why? I was with her just before she walked into the alley. And uh, you might be interested to know that she was using your name. How do you know? You don't know my name. It's Janie Page. Are you packing? I might be unpacking. Uh, when you pack, you fold things on the bed. When you want, you put them on hangers as you take them out of the bag. Now, do you know where you're going? You better close the door. Well? I don't have to be a quiz kid to figure out that you're leaving because you're scared. Probably running away from the same thing Bonnie didn't have a chance to run away from. I'd like to find out what it is. Bonnie didn't have any big brothers looking out for her. What's your angle? I'll break it down for you. About 10% of my interest is keeping myself from being implicated in what happened last night. The other 90% might get me a merit badge in a Boy Scout troop. I'm just trying to do my good deed for the day. I'd like to see somebody get paid off. Who's your candidate? King Hart? He's one of the people she was afraid of. For a little girl, she had a lot of people after her. She double-crossed too much, talked too much, or just know too much. She knew too much. About what kind of thing? The kind of thing smart people stay away from. Wasn't she... Couldn't. For a girl being mixed up with the wrong people is an incurable disease. She, she just waited out. Mm hmm. I see what you mean. You can't throw a bad reputation into reverse. You can uh, stand a compliment. You strike me as being a gal who might have a better chance than most of busting into this uh, unsmart set. I can't figure you out. What do you really want from me? What are you doing here? Who are you working for? I always feel sorry for these kids. Particularly the nicer ones. Oh, who knows? Maybe I'm just being selfish. Maybe this is a good chance for me to show off in front of heaven. I'd like to revise those percentages. From now on, let's call it 10% me, 10% Boy Scout, and 80% you. Well, now that I've cut you in for most of the profits, can I get some help? I haven't got much to give you, but I think it was King Hart. Why? Is that insurance policy? That'd be one good reason. And the others? She brushed him. He wanted to marry her, but she brushed him. He, he was crazy jealous. King Hart claims he was in New York at the time of the shooting. If he can prove it, he's clear. But assuming that he did have some gun work to do in Chicago, who would he hire to do it? A guy named Joe Emma, for any, by any chance? Joe Emma? He'd be more interested in shooting King Hart. They split up over Bonnie Goodwin. Emma wouldn't leave her alone until after Hart got out of town. Is that enough reason for him to kill her? I don't know. I, I don't know how jealous he gets. There's only one other thing I'd like to know. What? How I'm going to help you. 
I want to do something more than just help you pack. Hey, how does this sound? You and Bonnie are about the same type, same build, same hair. Close enough to confuse anybody in the dark alley. Hey, what have you got going? If I could get a little story published on the first, the first page of the evening paper, to the effect that the body in the morgue, originally identified as Bonnie Goodwin, is not Bonnie Goodwin, that it was identified in error and actually as you, Janie Page, I think we could sweat Bonnie's killer out into the open, trying to finish the job. Hey, what are you trying to do to me? I'll get killed. No, you won't, because you won't be waiting here for them. I will. <laughs> Expense account, item seven, five cents. Phone call to an old newspaper friend. Expense account, item eight, another nickel, one evening newspaper. Which proved to me the power of having old friends, and which I hope would prove to me the power of the press. The story, including the girl's address, was right above the weather report. And it looked like a fair night for Chicago, but a stormy night for me. my career that when you're waiting in an apartment for the arrival of killers, don't just wait. I open a window onto the street, lay myself a pot of coffee, some sandwiches, sat down in an easy chair facing a door near the telephone and had a picnic. For dessert, I had a sweet, rich idea which made me feel much better. When a little after ten, I heard a car pull up outside. When I heard footsteps coming up the hall 20 seconds later, I picked the telephone out of its cradle, dialed one to get rid of the telltale tone of a line not in use. Come on in. It's unlocked. King Hart. Repeat. King Hart. What are you up to, Dollar? I'll tell you what I'm up to. At the other end of this phone line is a police lieutenant listening. He knows that you're here with me, so don't get rough. I don't care who's listening. Where is she? Who? You know who, Bunny. That body found some more juice than her. I wish I had this much luck fishing. People seem to bite easier. I suppose you're here because you missed her the first time. Don't be stupid. I'm trying to save her life. Where is she? She's sitting next to the lieutenant who's listening on his telephone. I don't believe it. Come on. You can talk to her. Okay. But you better be right. Here. Take the phone. Right over the head. Mr. King Hart in the living room closet, went back to the phone and really told the police to tell them that I had their man. I still had the phone in my hand when the apartment door opened, framing two masses of manhood, one of whom I knew. So this time, just to play safe, I said into the live phone, Joe Emma, Joe Emma and help her. Shut the door, Andy. Yeah. Well, that ain't our insurance deal. Who are you talking to with that telephone? Police. I just gave him your name. Hang it up. Okay. Pretty smart trick, Tyson. But I got news for you. What you just did ain't even evidence. But you ain't gonna be around to corroborate it. We ain't gonna be here when the cops get here. Now, where is she? If you're looking for Bonnie Goodman, your search is narrowed down. You've got the whole rest of the world to look because she ain't here. Too smart. Now, where is she? in that closet there. The knob just moved. Oh? Huh? That's where you got. Okay, Angie, stay on this guy. I'll take care of Bonnie. On out, sweetheart. I'm coming, Joe! Who are you? <laughs> Joe Emma had expected the pleasure of kicking a girl around, but instead found himself being belted around by a man. Angie's right hand go for his armpit and not to scratch himself. Just as he snapped another shot at King Hart, I snapped a flying tag on him. Oh. Now you missed again, Angie, and it's all for you. Oh. Oh, congratulations, King. It's a delightful right hand you throw. Never mind that. Where's Bonnie? She's dead, Hart. I planted that newspaper story that she's still alive. I didn't read any newspaper story. I just came from the city morgue. The babe they got isn't Bonnie Goodwin. I never saw her before. Isn't Bonnie? Well, then why did... Oh. Emma kills her roommate in the dark alley by mistake. So Bonnie switches identities to make herself officially dead so she can live longer. Where is she? I want her back. I thought all you wanted was to get her name off that insurance policy. That isn't true. 
I want an insurance investigator to find her. What else could I tell you so you take the case? I want her back. You'll have to make up our own mind about that. For you, I'm not playing Cupid. I'll tell you what I'll do. You tell me all the sweet, pretty things you want to say, and I'll repeat them to her. Expense account, item nine. Twenty-eight dollars and forty cents. Dinner, while repeating all the sweet, pretty things King Hart had wanted to say to Bonnie Goodwin. And telling her all the unsweet, unpretty things I felt about his kind of guy. Don't worry, Johnny. I'm not going to him or anybody like him. Well, where are you going? Back to my hometown, I guess. Your hometown doesn't seem to do a very good job of giving you a start the first time. How far from Chicago is it? It's only about 28 miles north of here. Here. Here's an envelope. But what's in it? You'd better buy yourself a ticket. It'll take you about $3,000 worth west of here. Oh, Johnny, I... Thank you. <laughs> Expense account, item 10, 20 cents. Two beers, one for me and one for King Hart. I told him that his money was taking Bonnie on a little trip back to happiness. And he told me that if I ever expected to collect any expense money from him, I knew where I could go. Expense account total, $163.55. You'll notice that this is very low, but remember, I'm paying this one myself. Yours, very truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, directed today by Gordon P. Hughes, stars Charles Russell, with script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Georgia Ellis, Paul Dubov, Martha Wentworth, Lou Krugman, Gene Bates, and Larry Dobkin. The special music is written and conducted by Leith Stevens. Be sure to be with us at the same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by yours truly, Johnny Dollar. I'm in the mood for love. Isn't it a lovely day? That's what you think. Nope, that isn't just a mixed-up sentence. That's just for the top hits you'll hear on your hit parade on parade tonight. Top hits from 1935. Without a word of warning, I'm on a seesaw. Yes, more hits dressed up in bright new 1949 arrangements and played and sung by the nation's top vocalists and musicians. Be sure to hear your hit parade on parade this evening in Jack Benny's time on all of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan. Your hit parade on parade follows immediately. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Mrs. Perkins won the prize, but I got in the biggest pickle at the county fair. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Two, 
Home Office, Corinthian Liability and Bonding Company, Terminal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my assignment as bodyguard to Grand Blue Ribbon Champion, Spotted Poland China Hog, Rosie Barron of Iowa. Or, how you cast my pearls of wisdom before swine. Or, out of the fire into the frying pan. Expense account, item one. $76.80. Train and bus fare, Hartford, to the town of Carver, county seat of Carver County, Iowa. Expense account, item two. Two fifty. One Coke, three handkerchiefs, a bottle of salt tablets, and sunglasses with which to combat the Corn Belt heat. Item three, six bits, jitney ride to the Carver County Fairgrounds. Undoubtedly named that because the band I found in the midst of playing its afternoon concert was only fair. Hey, uh, uh, friend. How's that? I'm looking for a pig named uh, Rosie Barron of Iowa. Tell me where I'll find his cage. Cage? They don't keep Rollo in no cage. Rollo? Who's he? Well, that's short for Rosie Barron of Iowa. Oh, yeah, yeah. Any fool would know that. Uh-huh. Can you tell me where he is? See that building over there, the livestock building? Yeah. And you'll find Rollo in the swine wing. Swine wing? Uh-huh. Well, that conjures up a dainty picture. A flying pig. Uh, afraid Rollo won't ever do much flying. Weighs 980. Oh, well, thanks a lot. Uh, old neighbor. Yeah? Why don't you try slipping out of that there coat? You won't find it near as sweaty. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Hiram. Oh, he didn't even wait to be my best friend. Hey! hey. Wait, wait, I'll come with you, neighbor. It was 96 in the shade, but things were getting hotter. Shots and screams from the livestock building were the only things that could bring me on the run. With Hiram on my heels. Hey, what do you suppose that was? First, I ran into a stranger just outside the entrance. Oh, get out of the way. Let me out of here. There's a spoon in there. Then I ran into the door. Somebody do something. Don't just stand there. Where's the sheriff? Oh, hey, uh, Hiram, Hiram, what happened? Well, well, didn't you see? Didn't you hear? That there woman's Mrs. Tiller. Somebody must have stole her diamond brooch. Oh, good. I was afraid somebody might have put the snatch on Rollo. Her husband owns Rollo. Uh, oh. They must have been taking her pictures of Mrs. Tiller in the middle of a crowd. And, and when they had her smiling real pretty, them flash bulbs went off. And then somebody must have reached around from behind her, yanked the brooch, and started shooting a gun in there. That's a tried and true method of busting up a crowd to help make a getaway. You think anybody saw who did it? Uh-uh, couldn't. Yeah, those flashes would have had them blind as bats for a minute. Oh, uh-oh. Oh, there's the sheriff. What's his name? Oh, yeah, that's, that's uh, Harry Blewett. Harry Blewett? Yeah. Sounds like a slogan from the Republican campaign. Hey, here, here, you... you oh, I, I, oh, I, I, wait a minute, let's go. When everybody around here is trying to get my coat off. Come on, Sheriff, loose the haberdash. All right, now, never mind the fancy talk, young fella. I saw something pass between you and one of the thieves just outside the door. Oh, you're out of your mind. That guy bumped into me. He came crashing out of here, and I happened to be in the way. I'll bet you happened to be in the way, accidentally on purpose. Now, that's an early American comeback, but that's the way it was. Now, look, I won't ask you for a search warrant, Sheriff. You think I got the brooch on me? Start looking. All right, I will. All right. Yeah, now, in that pocket, cigarettes and a lighter. I see them. You see? Yeah. And uh, in that pocket, handkerchiefs and salt tablets. Salt tablets? Mm-hmm. Now, why don't you look in my inside coat pocket? And there you'll find my wallet and identification. I was coming to that. You, well, yeah. Dollar, insurance investigator, right. Hartford, Connecticut. Well, what brought you out here? I'm a piggy sitter for the Corinthian Liability and Bonding Company. They wrote a policy for $25,000 on your friend Rollo, Rosie Barron of Iowa. Who ever heard of taking out a $25,000 insurance policy on a hall? I did. And right now, I wish I hadn't. Some people pay high premiums for publicity, Sheriff. And that's what the Blue Ribbon Prime Packing Company is doing in this case. Now, may I have my wallet back? I want to count my money. Yeah, now, here. All right. Here's your wallet. You may think you're quite the joker, young fella, but I'm telling you right now, I'm going to keep an eye on you. I got a better idea than that, Harry. If I were you, I'd go looking for that photographer. Yeah. Why? What did he do? He took the picture... And there's just a chance the thief may be in it. Say, that gives me an idea. 
Sheriff, whoever says you aren't smart makes no mistake. Rollo, the prized porker, wasn't hard to find. First, I followed a few signs. Then it was a matter of closing in on a contented series of juicy, slurping grunts that came blurping up out of a succulent mound of Louisiana yams. Rollo was all fat and a yard wide. His table manners weren't much. He didn't look very smart, but he sure looked healthy. 980 pounds on the hoof. A fine figure of a pig. Uh, pardon me, miss. Could you tell me who's in charge around here? Well, just for the moment, I am. Well, I'm trying to find a Mr. Worthington Tiller, who I take it owns this monster. Monster? What? What? Well, what what's the matter? Have I said something wrong? You certainly have. And you've also said it to the wrong person. In case you don't know it, my name is Alva Anderson. Oh, my name is Johnny Dollar. How do you do? Uh, what's all this got to do with Rollo? Nothing. I just raised Rosie Barron of Iowa from a suckling, that's all. Kind of got away from you, didn't it? Oh. I, sorry, Miss Anderson, I apologize. And to you too, Rollo. Oh, I'm sorry about the interruption, Miss Anderson. Some fool made off with my wife's diamond brooch. Uh, oh, how is this excitement affecting Rollo? Oh, I hope he hasn't lost any weight. Well, he took it very well, Mr. Tiller. Oh, good, good. This uh, gentleman wants to <clears> see you, <throat> uh, Mr. Dollar. Oh, oh. Oh, yes. oh, from the insurance company. That's good, right. good. Well, I'm glad you're here. Uh, we'll have your picture taken right away with my well, wife and, uh, and Rollo. Oh, it'll make... Grand publicity for Blue Ribbon Prime Packers. Oh, I don't mind having my picture taken. Yeah. Just so long as your wife doesn't mind having people pinch your diamond brooches. Oh, well, then, I don't worry about that. It was fully insured. Oh, that kind. The huh? thing I want you to worry about is Rollo here. Mm -hmm. As president of Blue Ribbon, I paid Miss Anderson $10,000 for this magnificent swine, and I don't want anything to happen to it. You bought him for 10000 insured him for 25000 and you don't want anything to happen to him? It will. I don't mind paying those exorbitant premiums when I get back the kind of publicity this will bring in. I, I, I can see it in the papers now. America's fabulous insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar, sent from Hartford, Connecticut, to guard the life of that fabulous prize swine, Rosie Barron of Iowa. Here, well, Mr. I, Tiller, I don't mind getting my name in the paper for it, a pig. Just so long as it is not in the obituary column. I just couldn't stand having my tombstone read, Johnny Dollar no longer am. He gave up his life for a great big hand. <laughs> my tombstone tagline was over the head of Mr. Tiller. But it went over right nicely with Alva Anderson, who paid off with a smile. I parlayed that into a conversation. Helped me pass the time while guarding Rollo, the poor man's blue boy. By the time it was over, Alva knew a lot about me, and I knew a lot about pigs. <laughs> you know, you have beautiful eyes, Alva. Mr. Dollar, do you know it's really interesting about the origin of swine? Why, it's estimated that the Chinese people domesticated swine about 2900 B.C. And not only that, but I'm sure you'd like Hartford. And Mr. Dollar, you probably don't know this, but a pig is one of the most important food animals. It's an economical converter of grain and other feeds into body tissue, as the products of which furnish meat and fat for human consumption. Alva, darling, I'll only be in town for a little while. And not only that. But people who say that pigs are dirty don't know what they're talking about. Why, sanitation is essential to good health, rapid growth and development, and profitable production. Oh, Rollo, what have you got that I haven't got? <laughs> I still don't know whether Alva stuck around because of my charms or Rollo's. But she was still there at the changing of the guard when Mr. Tiller, in person... Came to relieve me long enough for a trip to the dining hall. And what do you think they had for dinner? What else? Baked ham. Oh, oh, dinner was wonderful, Johnny. Coming from you after eating baked ham, that sounds practically cannibalistic. Oh, Johnny, stop. I, uh, more coffee? No, nah, I've had it. Alva, you know, there's something I've been trying to say to you for the past five hours. Yes, Johnny? Well, it's just that, well, I want... 
Oh, oh, he's the sheriff. Oh, why doesn't he blow his siren? Well, I, I have to be going. It, it's time to get Rollo ready for the winner's trade past the grandstand. I'll just run along. I'll just go with you. Hey, hey, Dollar, huh? Dollar, I, I, I want to talk to you. Uh, well, I'll see you later, Danny. Yeah. Well, Sheriff, hey, you being a sort of investigator, Dollar, I knew you'd be interested in my methods. Well, you're sure interfering with mine. Huh? Yeah. It, oh, well, do you know what I did? What? I found that photographer, had that picture developed, and rushed it up to the state capitol. Mm-hmm. And they just called me. Dollar, there's a known criminal in that photo. He's got that brooch, and he's on the loose. Do you know what that means? Yeah. It means that you shouldn't be sitting here talking to me. Who is this villain? They say he's the... Ooch over here. Though. Yeah. What? They say he's known as Little Rock. Originally hailed from Arkansas. You'd know him if you saw him. He's the fellow that bumped into you. Oh. I want you to help me look for him. I take only one job at a time, Sheriff. Right now, I got a pig to mind. I think it was the Grand March. Boy, in case I'm interested later, how much do you pay your special deputies a day? Seven dollars. And expenses. Sheriff Blewett, I'm afraid that blows it. Carver County Pickle and Pie winners were lining up to lead the Grand March. By the time I got to the grandstand, down at the tag end of the livestock echelon, there was a shiny white cab and trailer sporting the markings and mottos of the Blue Ribbon Prime Packing Company. And high upon it, perched on a platform and surrounded by a sturdy iron railing, stood that champion, the pride of the fork set, Rollo, Rosie Barron of Iowa. It was lovely. It was divine. I had a feeling that swelled my heart with pride. Here they were, products of the American home and the American soil. A fanfare of foodstuffs flowing from the horn of plenty. Just because of my association with Rollo, I felt that I was playing some small part in this gallant parade as it was started the first leg of its journey. It was inspiring. It was thrilling. It was... Boing! All of a sudden, it was downright frightening. As Rollo's chariot rolled by, I got an eyeful of its driver. It was my comrade in collision, the guy who had put the snatch on Mrs. Tiller's diamonds, Little Rocky from Arkansas. I added to my treasury of thankless tasks by trying to pin a tackle on a five-ton truck. I got a door handle with one hand, running more with one foot, and a clout and a teeth from an unexpected adversary. Knock him loose, Rollo! He's on the running board! Hey, what the... I was flat on my back. Everybody was screaming and hollering. The truck went crashing to the fence. And Rollo, Rosie Barron of Iowa, was one little piggy who wasn't staying at home. In just a moment, the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first... Taking in the action from Johnny Dollar, are you? All right, that's good, because staying with CBS is the way you'll head straight for the big return from vacation eight days from now, Monday the 29th, of Lux Radio Theater and all the other big Monday night CBS favorites. And by staying with CBS, you'll find more action later tonight with Bill Grant of Call the Police and with Sam Spade, who will be heard from on most of these same CBS stations. Now with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Oh. Hey, Johnny, hey, Johnny, are you all right? Can you get up? Oh, well, the spur is willing. I'm not sure about my spine. Here, here, here let me help. Oh, I'm the guy who goes around telling kiddies never to hitch rides on trucks. <sighs> Well, nobody can say I didn't make a dent in Iowa. It was wonderful the way you tried. But what are you going to do now? Right now, I don't know. The only place I can think of at the moment where I might find a hot pig is a barbecue stand. Oh, this is no time to be funny. Well, look, up until now, all the laughs are on me, kid. So let me be the judge, huh? Well, what are you going to do? Well, first, I'm going to practice my arithmetic and see what adds up. You can't unload a stolen pig in a pawn shop. So, question number one is, where do you unload it? Where would you go? Well, where would I... I'd never thought of it. Well, here's what I figured. The Rollo on the hoof is too well known to peddle for anything like the dough he's really worth. I mean, he's not like a big diamond that you can cut up and lift. Or is he? What is the going price on pork? I said market this morning was at 2350. Oh, well, that kind of money hardly sounds like little Rocky's kind of project. But maybe things are tough. 
By the way, Alba, have you ever been in Arkansas by any chance? Why, no. Why do you ask? Just wondering. Hey, Dollar, Dollar, just, just a minute. I want to oh, talk to you. Oh, Barnyard Bloodhound himself. Yeah, Sheriff? Uh, would you mind, Alva? I was just leaving. How could she be that cold on such a hot night? Huh? What's bothering you, Sheriff? Yeah. I saw your little performance, Dollar, when you leapt at that truck. Just how hard was you really trying? How hard was I? Why, you ought to punch you in the nose, badge or no badge. Uh, 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 now, now, don't you go getting huffy. I just want you to know that I don't fool easy. When I'm on a case, I'm suspicious of everybody. Yeah, that must be rough on your wife. How often do you have her in handcuffs? Huh? Well, I... Now, look, oh. Sheriff, all I need from you is the use of a car so I can go looking for old Lardhead. No, no, you don't. There's enough missing around here as it is. Rollo, Miss Tiller's jewelry, and I ain't about to add a county vehicle to the mess. And besides, I want to keep an eye on you. Good. You might learn something. Come on. Here, wait, wait a minute. Where are you going? Over to the Ferris wheel. That truck hasn't been off the fairgrounds more than a couple of minutes. I want to get a look at the countryside. Ferris wheel. Say, that gives me an idea. I hoped it would. Come on. Say, uh, you know, Sheriff, I don't know very much about this farmside ferreting racket. Well, there's more to it than meets the eyes, I can tell you that. Oh, well, I bet there is. Tell me. Didn't I see a feed trough on Rollo's truck with a lot of mash in it? Well, now, let's see. If he ate yams this afternoon, he'd eat mash tonight, all right. Does mash kick up any kind of a smell? Oh, sour swill. But the pig seems to like it. Uh huh. How does this sound to you, Sheriff? Suppose right after you take your ride to the top of the Ferris wheel to case the countryside, we were to get ourselves a nice hungry pig. Say, that gives me an idea. We could take that pig and he could smell that mash in the air and sniff out the trail of that truck. Sheriff, if you aren't a genius, I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, Shaw. Sure. <laughs> it was planting time in Iowa that night, at least for ideas. Two of which I had planted in the not-too-fertile mind of Sheriff Harry Blewett. And as long as it took us to walk from the trotting track to the Ferris wheel, it came harvest time for notion number one. Okay, Mr. Okay, I'm the sheriff. I want you to run me up to the top of that wheel and hold me there long enough for me to get a look around. When the wheel came to a stop with Harry Blewett sitting in his little cage at the top, I pulled a low trick on a high sheriff. I bought a pink lemonade from the juice stand next to the Ferris wheel, walked over to the motor that rolled the big heap, unscrewed the cap on the gas tank, and gave it a big, long drink. I hope it wasn't doing to people's stomachs what it did to that motor. You might well remember this harmless little deceit the next time you have occasion to get rid of a sheriff. This kind of publicity is a little too expensive, Dollar. I demand that you do something. Now, don't worry, Mr. Tiller. I am going to do something. Yes, well, and sure. I'll thank you to remember that the only ones who stand to get hurt right at this point are the insurance companies that wrote the policies on your pig and your wife's diamond brooch. Why, Worthington, I hadn't thought of that. Huh? Why should we worry? My brooch is insured for way over the value yeah, there. Oh, we oh. had the... Hortense! You keep flapping that loud tongue of yours, and the first thing you know, they'll be accusing us. Why, they wouldn't dare. Oh, yes, we would, Mrs. Tiller. But we're just not the time. A $15,000 profit on a pig, and whatever else you could make on your jewelry, might make anybody the type, Mrs. Tiller. I now, beg now, your now, pardon. Now, see here, Dollar. I've had just about enough of your slanderous implications. I have a few thoughts you might profit by. Go ahead, Worthington. I'm always interested in profit, Tiller. My father had the yeah. same thing happen to him back in 1902. That's right. Remember, dear? Yes. In Nebraska. He bought a prize pig at a fancy price. And then the scoundrel that sold it to him turned around and stole it back. Hmm. There. See? See? What do you think of that? Hmm? Would this huh? be uh, a suggestion that we throw the young lady who sold your pig to you in the pokey? 
on the strength of something that happened 37 years ago? Well, that, you... That's for you to decide, Dollar. Right. Just don't say I didn't warn you. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh, I see. Yeah. If you don't have an orchid to pin on a young lady, try suspicion. Most of the crowd packed in the grandstand watching the free attractions, I had a good chance to scout the fairground for Alva Anderson, from whom I wanted to learn a little bit more about the habits of not only pigs, but their ex-owners. Her trail led me past the home-baked cakes, hybrid corn, the watermelon pickle, fracture and harrow exhibits, and all the way back to where I'd first met her, Rollo's pen in the swine wing of the livestock building. But when I got there, Rollo's cupboard was bare. Alva was leaving for the rear door in the company of a small, tough-looking gent carrying a sack over his shoulder. Name of Little Rocky from Arkansas. I could hardly believe it, but they piled into a car and hauled off up the road. At the risk of adding one last insult to the most recent injury I'd inflicted upon Sheriff Blewett, I stole his car and went dusting up the highway in hot pursuit. There's nothing easier to follow than a red taillight on a clear night. And the bright Mazda Ruby tacked onto the rear of Little Rocky's car led me around the village of Carver and 11 miles out to the pastures to a shack hidden in a grove of elm trees 100 yards off the road. I parked the car. I legged it in. From 25 feet away from the house, I could call the roll through an open window. They were all there. Little Rocky, the strong-armed man who had knocked me off the running board, Alba Anderson, and... Last, but not least, it was Rollo, all 980 pounds of him, and most important to me, still alive. Here you are, Milo, you stupid clown. Now, stop. This is all the sweet potatoes that was left. First, to go through them, and then we'll be ready for you, Albert. Oh, but I told you I don't have it. We'll see about that later. Hey, Milo, don't get the porker excited. I didn't do Here, put the sack on the table. Then when we look at him, we throw him out the window and away from him. Now, hurry up. All right. Well, it ain't this one. Uh, uh, ain't this one either. Nope. Ain't this one. Shut up. Just look. Well, I just... And from now on, from you, no thinking. Anybody dumb enough to stash a $30,000 hunk of jewelry and pig food ought to go see a head doctor. Oh. Come on, come on. Through the open window, I was being bombarded by sweet potatoes and facts. While making a getaway after ripping the brooch from Mrs. Tiller's throat, Little Rocky's accomplice had suffered a sudden attack of panic and had hidden the brooch in one of Rollo's lunchtime yams. Whether that yam was inside the piggy or out, they and I were apparently just on the verge of learning. Uh, that does it, I guess. Ain't here. Then that means... That you... means your little friend here had a $30,000 snack today. Which right now is giving me a great big belly ache. You know all about pigs. What do we do about it? Well, Rocky was yelling. He wouldn't rub them out. Look who's talking. Here, take my 38 if you're so tough. Yeah, I thought so. Now, shut up. Well, I ain't killing no piggy with him just standing there looking at me. If he'd only make a break for it, I'd mow him down. Ah, you. Now, look, baby. We'll kill him if we got it. We want that chunk of ice and we want it fast. Milo, tease him into the corner with a sweet potato. We're throwing them all out the window. Oh, please, Mr. Rocky, you don't. You shut up, too, and sit down. Close your eyes if you want to. Oh, please, Mr. Rocky. <laughs> In the manner of Sheriff Blewett, I had a idea. All right. Given to me, of course, by Rocky. Alba was sitting in the corner. Rollo was scratching his side by rubbing it against the opposite. And Rocky and Milo were standing shoulder to shoulder in the middle of the room, ready to advance on him. I groped around in the dark until I found one of the yams. And taking the sweet potato delicately in my hand... I tossed it through the window so that it would roll to a point just behind Rocky and his pal Milo. Oh, look at Daddy, he's 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 shooting him! Oh, Daddy, help! Rollo took my bait and getting to it, knocked his two would-be executioners in a heap on the floor. I took over from there, jumping to the window and applying a kitchen chair dutifully to the areas, reducing enemies to a state of unconscious surrender. Oh! They gave out. Alva gave up. And Rollo gave me a dirty look. Well, Mr. Tiller, here he is. 
Safe and sound, good as new, fat and sassy. Well, well, good, good. Congratulations. And not only that, but in him someplace, he not only has a good fighting heart, but also that diamond brooch of your wife's. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, very interesting, very interesting. Well, um, I'd better go charter a plane. Rollo is due in Kansas City at noon tomorrow. Oh, but it might upset him, Mr. Tiller. Rosie Barron of Iowa's never flown before. He might lose weight. Yeah, what, what's the big hurry to get him to Kansas City? Is he booked for a personal appearance? Oh, no. No, no, hardly that. He, he, he's due to be slaughtered at a special ceremony. Uh, all the plans are made. Oh, I wouldn't want to disappoint my boys. They, they've been looking forward to this. Oh. How do you like that? <laughs> well, it's almost murder. Poor Rollo. Oh, Johnny. Come on, let's get out of here, Alva. Gosh, who would have ever thought I, Johnny Dollar, would ever gotten so attached to a pig? Expense account, item four, three fifty. Dinner for Alva and me. A vegetable dinner, by the way. And speaking of that reminds me, if you find a thirty thousand dollar brooch in a pork chop. It'll only mean that the Blue Ribbon Prime Packing Company didn't have much luck when they went looking for it. Expense account item five, twenty dollars. One new gold-plated badge, which I sent to Sheriff Harry Blewett, appeasement, for having stranded him atop that Ferris wheel, for stealing his car, and for suggesting that he use a hungry pig for a bloodhound. Oh, the porter followed the mash scent all right. Next morning, they found Sheriff Blewett searching an old mash factory. Eight miles the wrong side of town. Um, item six, $76.80. Bus and train fare, Carver, Iowa, back to Hartford, Connecticut. Well, I'm still wondering every morning at breakfast time, what else can you eat with eggs? Except ham or bacon or sausage. And maybe you don't think that's a problem, having known a certain champion named Rollo, Rosie Barron of Iowa. Yeah, expense account total, $1,463. Yours, um, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and stars Charles Russell with script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Parley Bear, Sammy Hill, and John Daner with Junius Matthews, Ann Morrison, Jack Crucian, and Paul Dubov. Pinto Kolvig was Rollo. The special music is written and conducted by Leith Stevens. <laughs> Be sure to be with us at the same time next week when another most unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Your Hit Parade on Parade will be back tonight in the familiar CBS Jack Benny time with the great tunes of August 12 years ago. Sweet Leilani, and Where or When. Many another still green in your memory will be among the hits you will hear. Speaking of hits, put down August 29th this year in your little book. That's when Arthur Godfrey and his talent scouts, the stars of Lux Radio Theater, My Friend Irma, and Bob Hawk return to join Inner Sanctum. So make your Monday nights a regular date with CBS. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Stay tuned now for your Hit Parade on Parade. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I always say if you take a trip halfway around the world, you've got to expect you'll get your ticket punched. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense accounts, he is an absolute genius.
expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Constant Sun Trading Company, Cairo, Egypt. And uh, may I say, this is an unexpected pleasure. The one thing I didn't expect to bump into during this case was somebody to pay the bill. It started out being my answer to a fire alarm rung 12,000 miles away by an old wartime friend. It wound up being a game of who gets killed first with a bunch of guys who suddenly declared themselves a small peacetime war. The difference of opinion arose over a little hassle I might call the expiring nickels and the Egyptian jackpot. Expense account, item one, $2,200. Air transportation from little old Connecticut to big old French Indochina, or specifically Hartford to Haveney. That's where I got off the plane to take a breather, but after smelling the air and getting hit in the face with a bucket full of lukewarm raindrops, I got right on another plane bound for my destination, where I'd been summoned by an urgent cable, Calcutta. <laughs> took off on instruments in the downpour of a drenching monsoon. It was like climbing up a waterfall, blindfolded. We got chased up to 20,000 feet, clear up into the penthouse by a batch of black-hearted thunderheads laced with lightning. And there we stayed, sucking oxygen for nine dreary hours and waiting for the moment we'd get off our island in the sky. Item two, three rupees. Transportation from airport to the address of old friend who had summoned me. A place you'd never expect to find trouble. In church. And what a church. Two Quonset huts on Chowrangi Road. A couple of dozen wooden benches. A retired USO Hammond organ. And most important, it's pastor. A guy I'd met when I was calling the CBI theater my home away from home. Kaplan Joe Blessings. Johnny, it's good to see you. Long time, Joe. Too long. Well, haven't changed a bit since you were passing out those SL slips to unhappy GIs. <laughs> so you did decide to stay out here after all. Yeah. Yeah, I decided the East Indian brand of soul needed a little more saving than the kind I used to know back in Magnolia, Tennessee. <laughs> now, come on in the office, Johnny. It was good of you to come right over. You must be wondering why you did. Well, your cable did start a worry or two, Joe. You know, when an ex-soldier gets a trouble call from a chaplain, something's really wrong. What's up? Sit down, sit down. Johnny, tell me. How'd you like to do some work in my department? Wait a minute. I wouldn't know where to start. I'm asking you to save a man's soul. And to save another man's life while you're doing it. Well, why me, Joe? Why did I ask you to come all the way from Hartford, Connecticut? Well, Johnny, the ways are devious. There wasn't time for me to do anything else. Huh? If I'd gone through the proper channels here, if I'd become involved with all the inevitable red tape, I... Well, there just wasn't time. Johnny, there's a man in Cairo waiting to be executed at dawn day after tomorrow for a murder he didn't commit. And here in Calcutta... And here in Calcutta is a man who not only witnessed that crime, but has in his possession the evidence that can save that man from swinging. Uh-huh. Well, who is this man on the flying rope end? Lionel Brook Nichols. He's the president of a vast enterprise called the Constant Sun Trading Company. Now, Johnny, I wasn't ignoring the fact that you work for a living. I'm sure that if you're successful, you can name your own price. <laughs> this is not a colloquialism, Johnny. But Mr. Brooke Nichols has nothing but money. I didn't realize that such big men got into such big trouble. Oh, he didn't get into it all by himself. Huh? Oh, no. Now, this particular big man had the bad luck to have a fun-loving cousin who'd like to see him out of the way and the faster the better. Name of? Miles Atkinson. Uh, he must be some sort of big wheel in the Egyptian government. That's all I know about him. Except that to gain control of the Constant Sun Company, he would move heaven and earth to see Brooke Nichols dead. Well, I don't care what he does with the earth, but uh, I guess I can't stand by and let him mess around with your heaven. Now, let's get down to cases. What about this dude here in Calcutta, the witness with the evidence? Well, his name's William Briggs. He's a very sick man, Johnny. Knowing that he might die soon, and it looks like he might. He's had a sudden rush of conscience to the mouth he wants to talk. Evidently, he's decided that since it's too late to save his body, 
He'd better do a quick job on his soul. And I'd urge him to Cairo, is that it? No. I'm sending a young assistant of mine who will take that job off your hands. I think you'll like him, Tony. Now, I want you to get Briggs to the right official. Arrangements have been made for an ambulance to meet you in Cairo. And, well, we've chartered a cargo plane to take you there. Now, the pilot says he can get you there by tomorrow night. Well, I've spent so much time in the air getting here that it shouldn't make any difference. But uh, why a cargo plane? Why not a passenger plane? They have nice, soft seats. Well, Johnny, the airlines refuse to transport a leper. Heaven sure has some good salesmen on the road, and Chaplain Joe Blessings is one of the best. Before I knew it, a big Horizons Unlimited plane was lifting off the runway at Calcutta, and I was in it. Sitting on a suitcase, it looked like I'd never have time to unpack. The invalid Briggs was forward, being bedded down under the gentle hand of Chaplain Joe's assistant, Frankie. Well, that is done. And I give up me Saturday afternoon at Belmont Park for this. You're in luck, Frankie. Think of all the losers you miss betting on. Mr. Dollar, you have the philosophy of a man who has never enjoyed the exquisite thrill of losing his last two dollars upon a horse who was retarding the improvement of the breed. Young man, you've never heard of the bluegrass branch of the Dollar family? Kentucky, sir. Mr. Dollar, sir, uh, uh. if it were not for a certain horse from Kentucky named Breezy Boy who ran a very poor eighth at Rockingham, I would not only be a Kentucky colonel, I would be a Kentucky general, passing the time of day with my esteemed co-general... Three star Hennessy. Uh, yes. What's this? Who's briefcase? Briggs. He wants you should take care of it. And what's that? What's in it should be in a holster. How do you know? Mr. Dollar, I got a sense of feel. Besides, I looked. It's a Luger. A Luger, huh? Yeah. Off that, I'd say we are now in possession of the evidence. The murder weapon. In person. Exhibit A. Good. Still loaded. Exhibit A, making an arsenal out of my right coat pocket, we touched wheels at Bombay for three hours and fuel, and then hiked back up for the run across the Arabian Sea. We made landfall high on the coast of Saudi Arabia. And the freight of the Cuff shoreline led us on to the Queen of Sheba's old hometown, Aden, where we sat down again for service, airplane and personal. Frankie and I got our sick man Briggs out and into the shade of a hangar, figuring he could use a breath of fresh air. But he didn't find it in that sun-baked hellhole. A grubby little ground crew burned up four valuable hours, taking their own unsweet time servicing the ship. That left us just eight hours to get Briggs and his evidence up to Cairo left me almost enough time to save Mr. Brooke Nichols from taking the rope ride. Estimated time of arrival, midnight. Time of execution, 6 a.m. And I've learned that British officials are hard to wake up. The pilot stood the ship straight on its tail and made a fighter takeoff getting out of there. We were 40 minutes out of Aden, about 5,000 feet above the Red Sea, when we ran into what I've learned to expect in my business, the unexpected. Hello. Could uh, either of you gentlemen tell me where I pay my fare? Well, for... Cr where did you come from? Hey, a walk-on like this I have not seen since Minsky. It's all right, gentlemen. You can pop your eyes back in. You've seen a woman before. Oh, I've never scooped one up out of the sky before. Could it be she's an angel? What are you doing here? I... I'm afraid I'm what you'd call a stowaway. How'd you get aboard? When the plane was empty, I locked myself in the popper room. I'm sorry I had to do it this way, but I have to get to Cairo immediately. The next airline flight doesn't go out till 11 tonight. I should write to the captain and have him turn around and dump your back. Please, don't. I'm perfectly willing to pay my way. Don't worry. We can't spare the time. Mr. Dollar, there are only certain things which make air travel a pleasure to certain people. With me, that is a stewardess, and I would be glad to brief her about her duty. Uh, you go check the patient, Frankie. I'll check Miss Stowaway. Uh, that's what comes from always being only an assistant. I noticed that poor man on the stretcher when you took him out. Who is he? Never mind. What's your name? Nate Fabian. 
Uh, what's so important you've got to get to Cairo this way? Sorry, Mr. Dollar, that's a secret. It's also a secret how you get into that tight little dress you're wearing. I'm glad you like it. A dress, yes. Secrets, no. When I find myself in an airplane with a stowaway, I smell trouble. That trouble you smell costs $85 an ounce. Now, listen, save your sharp talk for a cocktail lounge. Don't waste it here. You must think I'm kidding. This is serious. You're flying across international boundaries. Now, who are you? I told you. Fate Fabian. Here. Here is my passport, and here is money. How much? Okay. We'll call it a sort of bond to ensure your good behavior. Five hundred dollars. All that for good behavior? That's awfully high. So is this airplane. If you don't like it, jump. <laughs> She didn't jump, and uh, after seven and a half more droning hours, I was glad of it. Fate Fabian was all woman, all beautiful, all in a pretty nice relief from watching the time run through my wristwatch. She spent most of the trip sharing my suitcase with me. But once I looked up at her, when she was silhouetted against a window, posed against that moonstruck Egyptian sky, and it was almost worth the trip, the way she looked wearing those stars in her hair. Just about then, a vague glow on the horizon took over where my conscience left off. We were coming into Cairo, and the problem of landing 50,000 pounds of airplane replaced the problem of landing 120 pounds of woman. I've never learned how to hold back a sigh of relief when I hear those big tires take a hold on the runway. I sighed another one when I saw an ambulance standing by at the parking ramp. By the time the loading platform was pushed into place and the door opened, the ambulance was backed up, ready to receive Briggs. Oh, are you the chap bringing a Mr. Briggs in from Calcutta? Yeah, that's right. Never mind a stretcher, he's on one. Oh, right, sir. We'll fetch him off then. Come along, Roscoe. Come in. You all ready to go, Frankie? Mr. Dollar, watch your language. That is not the thing to say about Mr. Briggs. But he will look at home in that ambulance. Now oh, then. Oh, congratulations upon the trip, Governor. Thanks. Uh, take the other end, Roscoe. Right, we'll hoist the poor chap out of... Oh, oh, here we go now. Hey, I'd better oh, check with the pilot, Frankie. Give these guys a hand, will you? They may need it getting down that ramp. Anything that moves me toward the end of this is a pleasure. Easy now. You want me to help lifting him in? Hey. Hey, Mr. Dollar. These guys ain't just plain ambulance drivers. <laughs> In just a moment, we return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, whatever you're planning to do over the Labor Day weekend, be sure to plan to listen over most of these same stations tonight to a wonderful new show on CBS. It's Horace Heights' original youth opportunity show, a full half hour of fun and excitement. You'll get the thrill of a lifetime hearing talented young Americans get the chance of a lifetime. Don't forget, Sunday night with Horace Heights. The Horace Height Original Youth Opportunity Show, starting tonight on CBS. Tune in, tune in this fall for the shows that you love best of all. Listen carefully, here's the address. It's CBS, CBS. Now with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. made four steps toward the cockpit when I heard Frankie yell, and a half a step back toward the door when I heard the shots. By the time I got to the top of the ramp, the ambulance was about 20 yards away, and pitted against that distance were two overlapping thoughts. One, the way to stop, or at least slow it down, was to puncture the rear tires. Two, the tool at hand was that loaded Exhibit A Luger that should have been in my pocket. It wasn't there. I looked around, didn't see it. But I thought I knew where to find it. Come on. Come on, open up. Or I'll put this fire extinguisher through that door. And if your head isn't in the way, I'll get that Wait neck. Wait a minute. 
Moro, don't use the same hiding place twice. It could be that I wasn't hiding. And it could be that that purse is now holding a looter. Uh, Give me it. Yeah. Now all I need is to hear you say you don't know how it got there. I don't know how it got there. That does it. Come on, you're coming with me. Come on, <laughs> get going. Ouch! You don't have to do that. What I did have to do was dig up some transportation. It turned out to be a taxi whose driver had slept for the excitement and therefore was the only one at the hack stand. I think he was still asleep when I gave my unwilling companion an ungentlemanly shove into the rear seat. And we left. Nobody in full control of their faculties could drive the way he did. He knew he had a horn, but somebody had forgotten to tell him about brakes. All I had to go on was the direction in which that ambulance had taken off, straight toward Cairo. So, that's where we went, straight toward Cairo. Oh, hello. Come on, whatever your name is, sit up and start your story. My name is Fate Fabian. That I couldn't be less interested. What I want to know is where those friends of yours take Briggs and Frank. I have no friends. I can believe that. <laughs> Whatever those thugs are, where are they? I don't know what you're talking about. Now, don't be coy. You and those mugs in that ambulance add up, that's all. Doesn't take any brains to figure out what you're all working for the same guy. What same guy? Miles Atkinson. A guy that's trying to keep witness Briggs and his evidence from saving Brooke Nichols from hanging about five and a half hours from You're now. being stupid. Maybe so. All I know is somebody got away with a witness. And I find the evidence sharing your purse with your eyebrows. I found it on the plane. Somebody must have dropped it. Oh, don't give me that. You can probably recite the serial number. Okay. You want the murder weapon? I'm going to be a real nice guy, just long enough to give it to you. And then I'm going to give you to the police. They have a nice little game they play with combinations like that. Chief Inspector? I am. Now, this girl keeps telling me her name is Fate Fabian. How do you do, Inspector? I've looked forward to this. I'll bet. Well, my name is Johnny Dollar. I'm looking for somebody who knows the Brooke Nichols case. Well, you certainly came to the right place. I know about the Brooke Nichols case. Well, that's what I'm here about. You can bust that case wide open, Inspector. Brooke Nichols is innocent. Now, here. This Luger is all the evidence we'll need. Thank you, Mr. Dollar. Uh, one thing you'll still have to help me find, though, is a man named Briggs. Uh, he was an eyewitness to the murder. I brought him all the way from Calcutta, and somebody put the snatch on him at the airport. Not only that, they grabbed the guy who was helping me. Oh, yes. Yes, that would be the obstreperous young gentleman you call Frankie. Oh, you know where he is? Oh, yes, indeed I do. Then he's all right? Yes. If you could call a man all right when he's just been arrested for the murder of Mr. Briggs. Murder? Yes. Mr. Briggs was shot in the ambulance that took him from your plane. Hey, what is this? This is a very good time for both of you to remain perfectly still, Mr. Dollar. After you raise your hand, yes. Miss Fabian, you needn't bother. There's hardly enough of that dress to conceal all of you, let alone the weapon. Thank you. Mr. Dollar, this is what a romanticist would call a poetic injustice. You see, this Luger, the evidence, as you call it, happens to belong to me. But that's the murder weapon. Who are you, anyway? Chief of Inspectors, Miles Atkinson. Miles Atkinson? Oh, no. Oh, yes. I fly 5,000 miles from Calcutta to put you in the hands of the police. And you turn out to be the police. Yes. Uh, bloody convenient, isn't it? Not for me, it isn't. Get steady, old boy. You know, this gun was probably the most fortunate purchase I ever made in my life. First, it killed a man who was in my way. Then, because it disappeared, it made it possible for me to establish false evidence, ostensibly proving that my esteemed cousin, Brooks Nichols, was guilty of the murder. And now, his death by hanging will place in my hands the controlling interest of the Constant Sun Trading Company. Quite a bargain. Thank you, Mr. Dollar. Not you, the gun. Which I shall now put to its final use. 
And after it is disposed of you two, I shall dispose of it. That was the prettiest confession I've ever heard. I'm surprised that a chief inspector and bargain hunter should sell himself out so cheaply. What do you mean by that? That the confession was complete, voluntarily made in front of witnesses, and that we are leaving with it, and that you are coming with us. Hey, fight, baby, take it easy. No sense going on a make for a hot bullet. Mr. Dollar is right. I warn you, the one who moves first dies first. Very well. Hey, one step closer, Miss Fabian. I'm not afraid of you. All right, you asked for it. Now take it. What is this? No use, what no bullet. This? No, you can't stop me now. Hey, you won't. Wait. It's been ladies' day so far. Now it's boys' Look time. Look out, he's going to die. Oh, he did throw the gun, but not at me. At the single light fixture in the middle of a ceiling. And when that went out, so did Atkinson. Out through the door. And the case was on. There was no dope. He knew where the light switches were, and he, as he went racing past them, he switched them off. It was like night flying without the benefit of carrots in my diet. Chasing him down those long, empty, echoey corridors and up the stairs to the roof. At the door to the roof, I threw on our brakes by throwing an arm around face. She was soft, and it was dark, but I was scared. I figured Atkinson might have picked up a weapon on the way. And that turned out to be an underestimate. What he had picked up was a fire hose. When we stepped through that door, we got hit by a big fat bolt of liquid lightning. A couple of hundred pounds of water backed up by a couple of thousand pounds of pressure. It felt like a salmon swimming upstream to spawn. Over at the edge of the roof, braced against the low parapet, was Atkinson, using all his weight to keep the writhing nozzles from flipping him around. He was just one man on a fire department's errand. I'll move around the other side. Try and throw that water off you. Get over that valve. See it? That wheel over there. The end of the hose he ain't on. Turn off the water. Come on. Quick. I see it. I'll get it. Instead of dropping away to a dribble, the hose suddenly snapped its muscle up to its hardest as the driving surge of water went through it. Ah! And before Atkinson could get himself untangled from the canvas and rubber snake, it snapped him over the parapet, off the roof, and high into the night. Hey, Fate! Turn off that water! Justice, baby. That mm-hmm. fire hose threw Mr. Chief Inspector mm-hmm. Atkinson off the roof. And he made a hole in one. Right through that gallows down there. The same gallows from which Brooke Nichols was supposed to hang in a few hours. Well, that's horrible. Let's, let's move away from him. Uh, hey, wait a minute. That's not like you. After all, you're the gal who turned that water up and stood it down. If you wanted it done right, why didn't you send a plumber? I won't ask you whether you meant it that way or not. As far as I'm concerned, it turned out to turn out just jolly this way. Oh, and uh, while I'm at it, I'd like to thank you for taking such a brave chance with my life downstairs in the office. Oh, really, Mr. Dollar? I knew that gun wasn't loaded. I unloaded it myself back in the powder room in the airplane. Just before you accused me of trying to steal it, remember? The next time I take a shower, I promise to wash my mouth out with soap. But now I figure it's also about time you came clean. Really, now, who are you? I'm sorry. My name is still Fate Fabian. All right. You've made a sale. Your name is Fate Fabian. What's your interest in this case? No interest at all. It's just part of my job. They do hire people to police the police, you know. I happen to be one of those people. Do you want to see my credentials? Your credentials look all right to me, baby. got off the subject, off the roof, and into the problem of getting Brooke Nichols off the end of a rope. After going through those motions, and that gal made all the motions, including retrieving young Frankie from the pokey, I kissed Faith Baby and goodbye, just for luck. And receiving no interest on that investment, we headed back to the airfield. By the time that fireball Egyptian sun had poked its top rim over the leftover GI issue hangers, 
at the east end of the field. The plane was serviced and planning to pry open the sky. Came the time to board ship, came a visitor. I say, old boy, is Mr. Dullard about? Yeah, about right here. Oh, splendid, splendid. I'm Lionel Brooke Nichols. Congratulations. I suppose you know you saved my life. Yeah, with a lot of help, yeah. Well, I should like to make it up to you somehow. Is there anything I can do? Well, uh, besides paying my expenses. Oh, naturally, naturally. Send your chit to the Constant Sun Trading Company. You'll be paid post-haste. But beyond that. Well, uh, could do something for the guy who got me out here. Back in Calcutta, I have an old army buddy named Chaplain Joe Blessing. He runs a church. Oh, splendid, splendid. Perhaps I could donate a stained glass window or uh, anything you suggest. Did you say anything? Yes, anything. Okay. Well, look, Chaplain Joe Blessings doesn't need a stained glass window because he hasn't got any place to put it. What he does need is a new church, a real one with steeples and all that. Oh, oh. All right, then. Very well. Done. Expense account, item three. Same as original entry. Transportation from the land of the Sphinx to the land of the free, by way of Calcutta, where I delivered a happier, though wiser, Frankie. Received the blessings of Chaplain Joe Blessing and ordered a custom-made, lightweight, pearl-handled blackjack in blue suede and inscribed to Fate Fabian with a hope that you will never fail to supply the black to go with its blue. Love, J.D. Ah, well, I guess that's all. Oh, expense account total. Oh, wait, uh, there's one more. Expense account item four, ten dollars. Paid to Cassidy's Pawn Shop, Hartford, Connecticut, for a purchase of one Hawk Air Medal. After all that flying, I thought I deserved one. Now, uh, expense account total, $5,350.40. If you don't think the founder of your company is worth that, kindly suggest someone who might. Yours, um, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Truly, Johnny Dollar was produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell with script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Georgia Ellis, Jack Edwards, Harley Bear, and Paul Dubov. The special music is written and conducted by Lee Stevens. Be sure to be with us again when Johnny Dollar returns to the air after a short vacation. Listen on Saturday, October 1st, when another most unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Next week at this time, on many of these same stations, Eve Arden will bring you the madcap adventures of America's favorite schoolmistress, our Miss Brooks. Miss Arden, who has been heard later on Sunday evening for more than a year, is moving to this new time, and CBS cordially invites you to hear her and her famous brand of comedy. To make sure, consult your local newspaper listings next Sunday for the new time, when you'll hear Eve Arden and our Miss Brooks. Now, stay tuned for your hit parade on parade, which follows immediately over the same CBS network station. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Sure, they may have plenty of blue blood in Boston, but from what I just saw, they've got plenty of the other kind, too.
this is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by special investigator Johnny Dollar. To Home Office, Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my search for your missing policyholder, Miss Michelle March. Or, she came in like a lion and went out on the lamb. Or, she should have been banned in Boston. Rent account, item one. $2.85. Railroad transportation, Hartford to Boston. Expense account item two, a dollar eighty. Cab fare to the corner of Longwood and Huntington Avenues. A half block from the apartment house that was Miss March's last known address. Boston may be called the cradle of liberty, but somebody else got rocked to sleep that morning on Longwood. <laughs> the shots came from two carbines and two men in one light tan club coupe parked across the street. <laughs> I waited long enough to memorize the license number as the pot rotted out of there, and then I headed for the victim. My heart was pounding, but not from exercise. He'd been sprayed coming out of a doorway that, in another 20 seconds, I would have been going in. But the coincidence didn't stop there. Oh, Take it easy now, will you? We'll get you some help. You know who did it? Mark. What? I, I didn't get you. Tell him. Tell him. Ask. Michelle March. Michelle March? Well, that's who I'm looking for. What's she got to do with it? Can you hear me? What's Michelle March got to do with it? Come on now. Try. I wonder if I should have stayed in heart. But it should have, but I should have it. Like a shooting gallery. I was inside the shop, and brother, that's where I stayed. Hey, mister, how is he? Can you tell? Yeah. Let's just say you don't need to stand back to give him air. He can't use it. While the two limelight-happy characters from the crowd argued about who was going to notify the police, I disappeared from the scene by way of that desk doorway, pausing inside just long enough to learn from the buzzer panel that Michelle March's apartment number was, unluckily, 213. <laughs> bother to look for the apartment house manager. I didn't even bother to pick the lock. I put my shoulder to work on the door. It was an easy apartment to search, but it didn't offer anything to find. The only thing even faintly resembling a lead I found on the floor behind the bureau. A book of matches that advertised Boston's best bar by far, Flannery, with an address on Washington Street. About then, I decided that rather than being found at the scene of breaking and entering, I'd look up the police at the scene of murder. Lieutenant, you shot from across the street by two men in a tan club coop. Probably stolen. License number, Massachusetts, 3R165. Weapons were carbines, 30 caliber army issue. Hmm. You sure of all that? Yeah. Here. This will tell you why I make it a habit to be sure of things. Oh. Dollar. Insurance investigator. Uh-huh. Hartman. Well, in a way, that makes two of you. Huh? I'm Lieutenant Bell Dollar. Sorry to meet you. The dead man was a local detective. Private license, good business. And a bad reputation. Name of? Uh, uh Something I can't pass out right now. Well, look, here's why I'm interested, Lieutenant. If friend detective was on a case, he could have been hired to find the same party I was hired to find. And since he was blasted at said party's last known address, it could be that somebody doesn't want said party found. Which paints an interesting but uh, gloomy picture of my future. <laughs> <laughs> 
Who is this said party? A girl, Michelle March, reported a missing persons in New York yesterday by a worried sister who is also the beneficiary of a $25,000 insurance policy owned by Miss March. The insurer's Tri-State Life got the report from missing persons and hired me to find her. You think she's dead? I'll tell you when I find her. Yeah. Now, uh, what makes you think the deceased might have been looking for her, too? Because he mentioned her name just before he went bye-bye. Uh, where are you staying, Dolly? Uh, just in case we need you. Cartwright Hotel. Now, look, Lieutenant. You've got a murder and I've got a missing person. You can loaf if you want to, but I'm eager. I want to talk to the apartment house manager. Any objections? No. Go right ahead, Dolly. Good luck to you. Mr. Dollar, I've managed rooming houses for over 30 years in Boston, some very nice ones, too. This is the first murder I've ever had. Oh, why did fate point at me? Fate didn't point, Mrs. Macy. The gentleman was knocked off because he was involved with one of your tenants. Oh, oh that's impossible. I've tried so hard. References, my own personal observation. Oh, I'm glad to hear that, Mrs. Macy. In fact, the more personal your observations were... Glad I'll be. Well, it isn't that I snoop, Mr. Dollar. Oh, of course not, Mrs. Macy. <laughs> Who was it? Michelle March, 213. Oh, she's a lovely girl. But her habits were quite irregular. Often came in late. Oh. I understand she hasn't been staying in her apartment for the past two weeks. Do you know where she went? I know, but I, I did happen to be just outside her door when she came out with a suitcase and her gentleman collar. Her employer, I believe she said. Something about some work they had to do in the country. Uh-huh. She leave a forwarding address? Uh -huh. She had little reason to do that. Why, all the time she's been here, the only letter she's gotten is from somebody in Chicago. One a month. A man, I'd say, from the penmanship. Did I get one this month, though? Do you, uh, by any chance, remember what those letters said? Oh, you young upstart. I'm only trying to help. I know, Mrs. Macy. You're a lovable old gossip. <laughs> After Mrs. Macy chased me out of her apartment, I questioned some of Michelle's second-floor neighbors. What they gave me only augmented the story I already had. She hadn't been seen in the company of anyone for four or five months until Dapper, Medium Build, and Swarthy took over. All of them had seen him. None of them knew his name. But they all agreed he was the guy Michelle March had marched away with. Everything I learned added up to a dame getting tired of waiting for somebody in Chicago and ducking out with somebody else. It would have looked that simple if it hadn't been for that detective who had so recently taken up new headquarters in the city morgue. Friends account, item three, $4.75, drink and dinner. After which, expense account, item four, 180, taxi ride. Taken on the strength of the weak clue I found on Michelle's apartment floor. The match folder from Boston's best bar by far, Flannery. Flannery looked like they wouldn't want to know how old you are, but how many stretches and in what prison. Above a row of greasy bottles, the wall in the bar was covered with pictures of fighters. Right from old John L. up to Rocky Graziano. But none of them looked as brutal as the eight or ten gorillas who had their feet on the brass rail. I decided this was no place to ask for a lady. So I asked for a drink. Yeah. A straight rye. Double. You've never been in before. Where are you from? I'm trying to forget. Has, um, Blackie been around lately? Who's Blackie? Well, maybe that's not his full name. It's the one I knew him by. Uh, he wore a lot of sharp suits, you know, about medium build, dark, swarthy. That could be anybody. Now, drink your drink, pay for it, and move along. Now, wait a minute. Now, I haven't got anything against the guy. I'm looking for a dame that's with him, see? What's the freeze for? I need the room. Expecting a private crowd. I'll beat it. Time off, Flannery. Oh, uh, maybe I want to talk to these guys. I'll see them, Flannery. Yeah, I told you. I'll beat them. I'll get closed up again if I get any more trouble this week. Take them outside, Roxy. Huh? Shut up. What's this Niles' name you're looking for? Michelle March. You know her? Yeah. 
Let's go someplace and talk. Thanks for the invitation, but... Let go of the arm. You'll get gangrene when the circulation is cut off. Sorry. Come on. What makes you so upset about the lost Michelle? What do you want with Louis Marine? Louis Marine? If he's the guy she's with, all I want him to do is to point her out. You and me might get along with that. It'd be worth plenty to... Look out! Get this bike! Oh, get your head! The car they were in was different, but those carbines sounded the same. I rubbed my nose raw, trying to bury my head in that sidewalk. I knew they had to empty those carbines sometime, but instead of sounding better, it started to sound worse. I twisted my head, shot a look at the street, saw one of the attackers in the process of falling out of one of the windows of the gun car. Closed my eyes again and realized why they never let my kind of insurance investigator be a policyholder. I'd been sent to find a missing girl, and there I was in the middle of another Boston massacre. Listening to Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Charles Russell. It took a full 20 seconds after the smoke of battle had started to clear for me to realize that I'd been saved by the arrival of fire support from an unexpected source the police. I looked around for my new friend and brother target, Roxy, but he had disappeared. A wave of suspicion broke over my flow of thought with this question. How did it happen that all those cops with all those guns just happened to be in all those hiding places waiting for those gunmen to drive up and open up? Answer? A hunter's stew like that usually calls for a pigeon. I didn't feel like flying, but I did. Straight back to my hotel. With one landing and a newsstand. An evening paper gave me everything else I needed, except the feathers. But I wasn't exactly cooing when I got to my hotel room phone and put a call through to the Boston police. South Precinct, Sergeant Miller. Give me Lieutenant Bell in homicide. One moment. Homicide, Lieutenant Bell. This is Dollar, Lieutenant. I... Oh, oh, Dollar, sure. I'm glad to hear from you. I'll have your badge for this. What? What did you say? The evening paper. Quote, Boston private detective whose name has been withheld by police was slain today, presumably to stop his search for a missing girl. It was learned by this paper from reliable sources. Oh, now, Dollar. But another investigator still alive has joined the hunt for the girl. Well, I... Johnny Dollar, well-known Hartford insurance sleuth, checked into room 705 at the Cartwright Hotel today. Well, you want more? Why, uh, I can't understand it. I, I told the boys not to say a word. I think the boys didn't. Oh, now, see here, a man would have to stoop pretty low to use methods like that. You probably touch your toes every morning for practice. Well, I hope you got the results of your stake out in front of Flannery's. You got two hot carbines in a hot car. The evidence that could have talked, those gunmen, are so full of police lead that your only chance of learning anything now is to find somebody strong enough to pick them up and write with them. Now, wait a minute. You know who hired them? Well, I'll find out. Now, when you get confused, check with me. I think I know. Now, shall I get the name of that private detective? The deceased? Well, I don't see any harm. Uh, Bernard Knight. Hired by? Well, all right, Dollar. If you'll cooperate, I will. According to his files, he was hired by uh, Roxy Morris to find the girl. Now, who hired the gunman? I think, but don't know that they were hired by a gent named Louis Marine to stop Roxy Morris from finding Michelle March. Why? We'll have more about that later. But if you'll put a search on that pair of names, I'll look for a good night's sleep. And after that sidewalk, it was easy to find. Pick you up off the floor. 
Uh, who is this? Is this Mr. Dollar? Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, this is Michelle March. Huh? Oh, oh well, uh, uh, good morning, Michelle. I've been looking for you. That's why I called. I read that you were hired by my insurance company. Yeah, that's right. They don't like disappearing policyholders. Well, let me tell you this. If they want to save the money, they'll have to pay for me. Stop looking for me. What are you afraid of? That Roxy Morris will follow me? What do you know about Roxy? Well, he'd like to find you and Louis Marine. What did he tell you? Oh, what counts is that I filled in what he didn't tell me. Namely, that he was in Chicago for a year, and you were supposed to be waiting for him in this fatal apartment on Longwood Avenue. But instead, Louis Marine landed, took the situation well in hand, and captured you for himself. You're just trying to sound size, aren't you? If it fits, keep it on approval. Now, the point is, there are too many people looking for you to stay lost. Where can I meet you? How do I know I can trust you? I can't trust anybody. Look, I'm still working for insurance company, so my greatest interest is keeping you alive, not selling you out. What about the police? Well, my promises aren't equipped with lifetime guarantees, but I'll do what I can. If you tell all, and if the story is big enough, they should be willing to make a deal. It's big, all right. They'll clear something out of their books that's been there for a year. Where do I meet you? You know where Charlestown is? Well, I know it's part of Boston. Take the subway and get off at City Square. An hour from now. I'll be in a bar. The gangplank. On Chelsea. Near the Navy Yard. Okay, sweetie. I'll be there. Up until now, whoever's been doing the shooting has used everything but battleships. Even though Michelle's story sounded like trap bait, cheesy indeed, I had to take a chance. I dove into a cab and had the cab drive into the top of Hanover Street and down to Boston's north end. Playing quiz games with strangers in that section is called Take It or Lump It. But a few well-placed 20s led me to a neighborhood undertaker who had the officially unproved reputation of creating a large demand for his own services. We swapped donations. I gave him 50 bucks, and he gave me a large out of the corner of his mouthful. Uh, listen to me good. Uh, about a year ago, the laws picked up a Roxy Morris on a suspicion. They had a good idea. He's a heist of the 75 G payroll. But there were no witnesses. He didn't believe none. Roxy knew they'd watch him, so he hightailed it out of town. Mm -hmm. But he didn't detect the loot with him. The boys around the year got it back on the grapevine. He was uh, suffering from the short. So everybody figured he had the dough uh, stashed away uh, somewhere right around the year. Is that all? Have you got anything else to tell me? Yes. Goodbye. <laughs> I didn't like the way that undertaker said goodbye. I legged it up to the subway station marked Union, went down in and caught a train for Charlestown. Once the city square, a three-block walk down Chelsea Street produced the gangplank bar, which in turn produced that nose-bruising smell which comes from slopping beer on sawdust. Out of place in the place sat Michelle March. She was a good looker with a bad look. And if I had been Roxy Morris, I would have elected her the last national bank. I flopped into a booth beside her. She turned her head my way, looked me straight in the kisser, blew a smoke ring at me, and popped two words through it. You dollar? Yep, I'm dollar. You march? And me shall march. Well, so far so good. It's nice hearing you breathe. That means Tri-State Insurance can keep its nice $25,000. Only if you keep me this way, Mr. Dollar. And that might prove to be a difficult thing to do. Oh, maybe not so difficult. Why not? Well, you indicated yourself that your magnetic personality might suddenly attract a few steel jacket bullets. That means there'll have to be somebody to pull the trigger. So all I have to do is to sit around and see who tries to take a shot of the target. You, and we've got our man. It's not that easy. I'm in trouble three ways. And it's hard to see three ways at once. Look, I know all about Roxy Morris. He's wiped $75,000 and gave it to you to mine. You don't know the half of it. Two months after Roxy was gone, a guy named Louis Marine came to me with a story that Roxy had sent for $20,000. I gave it to him. Then he told me that Roxy had never sent for him. And that if I squawked, he'd convince Roxy that I'd fallen in love with him and just given him the money. Either that or he'd tip off the police. He had me going and coming. Nice fellow. He wouldn't leave me alone. 
He made me give him 15,000 more of Roxy's money. And two weeks ago, I got word through to Roxy in Chicago. He blew up. Turned on me. I've been running from him ever since. He wants his 75,000, all of it. And I haven't got it. Oh, seems like you've been taking chances all the way. Now, you know what I want you to do? No, what? Take one more. I told Michelle what I had in mind for her, during the next few hours at least, and grabbed a cab back across the bridge into the north end. Expense account item five, fifty dollars. Another donation to my expensive undertaker. This time I paid him for talking, but not to me. Then I took over the telephone and dialed my way through to the guy to whom I was about to give a chance of becoming the ding-dong daddy of the Boston Police Force, Lieutenant Bell. Yes, Della, this is Lieutenant Bell. Bell, how would you like to get the goods on Roxy Mars? I'd like it fine. Okay. And along with that, how would you like to pin a receiving stolen property wrap on Louis Marine? I hope you aren't just being salty, darling. I'm not, Lieutenant. Now, look. Uh, you may have to do some trading with a gal on this deal. Yeah. You may have to promise her some time off for verbal good behavior. Well, such things are possible. All right, what's the pitch? Listen, I have baited a tall, thin granite trap for Roxy Morris and Louis Marine. The bait is Roxy's ex-girlfriend, Michelle March. Okay. What then? I had a tipster call Roxy Morris and tell him that Louis Marine was meeting Michelle at a certain place at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. I also had Mr. Blabbermouth call Louis Marine and tell him that Michelle is meeting Roxy at the same time and the same place. What? I had him tell each of the gentlemen that Michelle was meeting the other one with what's left of the money in cash. Oh, you started a war, Dollar. Uh, but if it does the trick, it's worth it. All right, all right. Uh, what's my move? First, call the call the place where I've arranged a surprise party and uh, tell them to get rid of the public. But, uh, also tell them to let a girl named Michelle March come and go as she pleases. Also me. Oh, don't tell me you've set this thing up in a public place. Where is it? Lieutenant Bell, yes. what I want is for those two characters to run up a blind alley. And when I say up, oh, brother... They got the word the Michelle meeting would be held at the top of the Bunker Hill Monument. Oh, no. And you might remember what General Prescott almost said. Don't fire till you see the red in their eyes. I was back in Charlestown and at the base of the Bunker Hill Monument at a quarter to three. The door of the museum at the bottom was open, but a state park officer stood by its side. I told him who I was, and he nodded me through the bronze doors. Uh, officer, did, uh, Miss March get here? Yes, sir, young man. She went up the shaft. Oh, uh, well, look, can I run the elevator myself? Uh, there isn't any elevator. Just step two to three hundred of them. Oh. Ow, this may be going to heaven the hard way, but here goes. Halfway up the winding granite stairs, I yelled for Michelle. But she either didn't hear me or just didn't want to answer. I kept going and hoping. As I came closer to the top, I tried yelling again. Still no answer. Finally, I made it. Up into the observation landing at the top. Michelle was there. She still wouldn't talk. But she had written me a note. Beside her crumpled figure was a vial that hadn't been filled with perfume. The note was short and to the point. Dear Johnny Dollar, I still want to help, but I hadn't better be around here alive when everybody gets here. And it was time to shell. As I bent over to see what kind of bye-bye medicine she'd taken, I heard something that might mean a sudden dose of lead to the head for me. <laughs> Either Morris or Marine had landed, and there I was stuck at the top with a bait that had suckered them into a trap, which suddenly turned out to be mine. Waiting up there in that tiny room for death to come get me would have killed me anyway, so I started down. With the pounding of my heart and my own steps on the granite blocks, I heard the pitter patter of anything but tiny feet come charging up a narrow staircase. Whoever was coming up, and I both slowed down. My heart didn't. And I crept around a curve and my eyes went to a head-on collision with a pair staring back. What are you doing here? Uh, I, I'm a tourist, uh, Roxy. You may be right, white guy. You may be taking a trip. Who's up there? Uh, oh, up there? Oh, I don't know who they are. Just some girl with a guy. She keeps calling Louie. Okay. Let 
big boy. Easy now. Don't try anything. <clears throat> Roxy Morris tagged me with a butt of a 32 going by. But lying there with my head against the cold granite inside wall of the monument brought me back. And conscious was a very dangerous condition for me to be in. Because charging up the stairs came another pair of unfriendly feet that couldn't have belonged to anybody but Louis Marine. Who are you? What are you doing here? Well, up until somebody hit me on the head, I was trailing Roxy Morris and his girl. They're up there? Sure, Louis. Yeah, they're up there. Then let me by. Come on. Get up out of my way. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Bye. Yeah. But wait a minute. I got an idea. Come on, chum. Ahead of me. Up you go. You can affront for me. Move! Louis had a gun at my back, and Roxy had one waiting for me up front. We took the last few steps up to the top real quiet-like. When my eyes came level to the floor of the observation room, Roxy was bending over Michelle. But he snapped up in a hurry, and his right hand was loaded with heat. Louis pushed me ahead of him, up and in. I stood there between them, listening to them grind their teeth at each other, with one foot under Michelle's arm. Then I got two big shocks. A scream from Michelle, just before she snatched my legs out from under me. What are you doing alive? I don't know. I don't know. I guess I, I didn't take enough. Well, whatever you're doing alive, I'll tell you one thing. Your two boyfriends sure took care of each other. Come on. Let me get you out of here. Oh. I didn't think I'd be able to carry me down all those stairs. Now I have to carry you. account, item six, twenty dollars, to the hospital, having Michelle's stomach pumped out, and the way Michelle took my suggestion that she voluntarily turn herself over to the police was very good. Lieutenant Bell was very cooperative, otherwise I might let it be known that the reason that he didn't show up on time to help me in the 1949 Battle of Bunker Hill was because he forgot to reset his watch at the end of daylight saving time. He showed up for our three o'clock appointment at four. Uh, expense account total, you know, seven hundred and eighty-six dollars and no cents. Signed, yours, um, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell with script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Bill Boucher, Myra Marsh, Dick Ryan, Larry Dobkin, Charles Seal, and Dorothy Lovett. The special music is written and conducted by Leith Stevens. Be sure to be with us next Saturday, October 1st, when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. That's right. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, will be heard on Saturday evenings starting next Saturday. And look at who's going to be here at the same time on Sundays. The world's most famous blockhead, Charlie McCarthy, accompanied by a man who shadows him closely as Johnny shadows the suspect, Edgar Bergen. Yes, Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen have joined the great parade of stars to CBS along with Jack Benny, Amos and Andy, Horace Height, and Red Skelton, whose show starts next Saturday, or rather next Sunday also. Don't miss the first hilarious appearance of Charlie and Bergen on most of these same CBS stations at the same time next Sunday night and every Sunday thereafter. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This you can really call a fish story. And I was the live bait.
This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Intercontinental Marine Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during assignment in San Pedro, California, investigating the loss of two pieces of property insured by you. Or the tuna were running and so was everybody else. Or I caught a fishing boat, but you should have seen the one that got away. Expense account item one, $176.87. Airfare from home base in Hartford to off base in California. Expense account item two, $10. Cab fare, Los Angeles Municipal Airport to the waterfront office to the Pacific Deep Sea Canning Company in San Pedro. There was perfume in the air, channel number five. Inside, the name on the door said Walton. That's who I wanted to see, so I walked in. Well, who are you? I'm here to follow up the claim you made to Intercontinental Marine Insurance Company. My name is Johnny Dollar. Oh, would well, you bring the money? I need boats. The tuna are running. No, Mr. Walton, I didn't bring any money. All I brought is a suspicious nature and an inquisitive mind. What the devil do you mean by that crack? I don't get your fish in a stew, Mr. Walton. This is standard procedure. No insurance company is going to shell out $400,000 without first taking a long, lingering look. Well, there's not much to look at. Yeah, so I understand. According to your claim, two of your boats, the, uh... Now, oh, here. The, uh, Frank Walton and the Nancy Walton left port Monday afternoon and headed out in a southerly course. When you tried to establish radio contact Tuesday morning, you couldn't raise them. Pieces of wreckage and the bodies of two men were found Tuesday night, indicating that both boats were lost. That's the story. What made you so sure that both boats went down? Because of those two men whose bodies were found, one sailed in the Nancy Walton, the other sailed in the Frank Walton. What more do you people want? Just enough time to check everything thoroughly. You know, this wouldn't be the first time a shipwreck has been faked to collect insurance. I see what you mean. Yeah, I guess the faster I get you satisfied, the faster I'll collect my money. Sorry I lost my temper, Dollar. I'll do everything I can. Send Captain Carpo in. Carpo's my fleet captain, Dollar. He can give you all the details. But I'm telling you, there aren't any more. Well, one thing for sure, Mr. Walton. We can't blame it on the Pacific Ocean. According to my report, those boats sailed in fine weather. That's right. Me, boss. Yes, uh, George, this is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company. He's here to investigate the sinking. So? I'm happy to meet you, too, Captain. What do you want? First, I want your theory as to what could have happened. I don't know. I wasn't there. Maybe they run into each other. As fleet captain, you hire the hands for the boats, don't you? That's right. Are you the kind of man that would hire the kind of skippers that run into each other in clear weather? They were good skippers. Now you listen to me. I've been captain of this fleet for five years. First time we ever lose a boat to lose a man. You think we like this idea? No, I don't, Captain Carpo. I don't think you like it. Any better than the insurance company likes the idea of losing $400,000. Well... At least if I find those sunken boats, that'll be salvage. No, Mr. Dollar. That'll be miracle. The meeting busted up without me getting busted up, which was uh, unusual in itself. And I hitched myself a ride out to an outfit who knows more about salt water than a Coney Island taffy maker. The U.S. Coast Guard. And closed, find the statement of the commander of the station, Lieutenant Senior Grade Miles P. Endicott, Jr. We have made thorough patrols using both air and surface craft. The bodies of the men recovered show signs that lead us to believe that they were blown clear of the lost ships by violent explosions. All the lieutenant needed to say to make my eyes light up was that one word, explosion. Because in a marine insurance investigator's book, the word explosion sets off another word, scuttling a widely used wet variety of fraud. 
In other words, blowing up your own ship to collect the insurance. And continuing this chain reaction, I found the best available lead. The man in charge of the vessels involved, Captain George Carpo. I found him at 11 that night at a combination restaurant and bar named after the oriental fishing bird, the Cormorant. As I looked in through the greasy window, an interesting sight greeted me. Captain Carpo slipping into a booth already occupied by an olive-skinned brunette, who was good enough looking, but uh, obviously less than a queen. Carpo stuck his face in hers, spat a few words at her that I couldn't hear, shook his sledgehammer fist at her, and stomped out through a back door. I gave the front door some business, and, trying to look like I belonged to the place, strolled to the bar, bought myself a blast, and walked it over to the ladies' booth. Well... Who sent for you? Do you mind? I haven't got anything to lose if you haven't. What do you mean by that? If those are your own teeth, maybe you don't want to lose them. Oh, Carpo's a jealous time, huh? He don't believe in sharing the wealth. Are you Carpo's girl? What time? Who are you? Well, if Captain Carpo comes back, he'll tell you anyway. So the name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Investigating what? Marine life? Uh Uh-uh. Marine death. There was two sinkings in the Walton fleet. The company that sent me here insured the boats. Sounds to me like you got yourself a tough job. Why? Oh, I don't know. Who are you going to ask questions? They've been reported up with all hands lost. Who knows? Maybe I'll bump into a talkative seagull. Or uh, maybe, if I'm lucky, a talkative girl. What have you got that could make a girl talkative, mister? Well, discounting my natural beauty and charm, I have money. Not too much money, but money. Keep coming. I know enough not to talk before I give what I want. Well, that makes it a Mexican standoff. I know enough not to pay for something I haven't heard yet. Let's start out with an inexpensive question, like, uh, what's your name? You can have that for free. Anita Vargas. How long have you known Carpo? If you'll pardon the expression, on and off for the last six months. How's he for money? Has he turned into a big spender recently? <sighs> sure. Instead of two drinks a night, he's now buying me four. Carpo will never be a big spender. Where does he live? 1423 Parade Street. How far is that from here? It's here. He lives upstairs. That called for a change of scene. I didn't know whether Anita Varghese really had anything to sell or not. But I didn't want what was left of our tete-a-tete to be interrupted by a violent re-arrival of the mighty Captain Carpo. So, expense account item three, four dollars. Picking up our tabs. Item four, six bits, picking up a taxi, which dropped us at another bar. Slightly less oriental, but definitely more obnoxious. We grabbed ourselves a table with a view, a view of the sawdust on the floor, and waited for a waiter. He didn't come, but somebody else did. The owner of the lost fishing boats, Mr. Roscoe Walton. What are you doing with this character, Anita? I met him in college, Roscoe. Now beat it. Since one of you been getting drunk? Don't tell me he's your boyfriend, too. Uh-huh, part-time. Maybe I'd better get lost. Uh, I'll call you later. Yeah, maybe you better get lost. And stay that way. Go ahead, Johnny. You better go. Well, uh, happy hangover, Mr. Walton. You don't look like no college boy to me. I was no professor of mathematics, either. But I could add this much up. If those tuna clippers had gone down by explosion, somebody had to buy some explosives. Maybe locally. That problem I took to the local police, who went to work looking up names in the dynamite register. And since those explosives would have been planted while the boats were under the care and supervision of Captain Carpo, that problem I decided to take to him. It was 1.30 in the morning when I got back to the front of the Cormorant restaurant and bar. The grease joint was dark but a light was burning on the second and top floor. I got halfway up the front stairs to ask my leading suspect a few questions about explosions when I heard something. Carpo was still moving when I got up there, but not for long. The back door was as open as the captain's life was closed. I looked down the back flight of stairs. It was either too dark... Well, there wasn't anybody there, and I wasn't going down to look. I bent over the body just to make sure. Oh. 
First, they beat him half to death. I wonder why they didn't finish him that way. Huh? Well, sir, perhaps it would be best if you were to remain where you are. At least, my pistol seems to recommend it. Well, well. You seem to have done inestimable damage to my good friend, Captain Capo. The poor fellow seems to be definitely dead. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first... You might be interested to know that CBS has acquired a couple of blocks of wood. You're not interested? Well, would you be interested if you knew that those blocks of wood had been carved into certain figures? No. Well, then let's try this. Uh, Would you be interested if you knew that those carved blocks of wood could talk? Ah, now you're beginning to sit up and take notice. Well, we might as well come out and tell you that these talking blocks of wood are named Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Snurd. That they and a lively fellow named Edgar Bergen will be making their first appearance over most of these same CBS stations this Sunday evening, and that you'll be able to hear them every Sunday thereafter. Now, with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. There I was again. Always the suspect, but never the tried. With a dead body at my feet and a pistol at my head. The man holding it was neither small nor large. Thomas Mitchell type. His frame was fighting the seams of a sloppy tweed suit. And his pouchy face was fighting the alcoholic content of his blood. Well, sir, what do you have to say for yourself? Oh, don't be ridiculous. I came to talk to this man. Killing him would hardly be the way to kick off a conversation. How about you? What are you doing here at 1.30 in the morning? <laughs> Most amusing, most. Two accused men, each of them judging the other. Ha <laughs> ha! With a dead man for a jury. All right, then. As for my testimony, my name is Cricket. I was on my way to discuss with the good Captain Carpo a matter of possible mutual profit. Naturally, when I heard the shots from the street, I hastened to his assistance. I won't ask you how you knew Carpo was getting shot instead of doing the shooting. My name is Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator from Hartford, Connecticut. I was sent out here to look into two sinkings in the captain's fleet. Oh, then you and I share a common interest. My business is ship salvage. (laughs) It's obvious that I should put up this pistol and replace it with a shake of a hand. (laughs) How do you do, sir? In my business, you never know. How do you do? This is indeed a most fortunate meeting. Uh, A pity that it should take place upon the very threshold of tragedy. (laughs) Poor, poor Carpo. His face seems to have enjoyed the worst of an encounter with a monkey's fist. How's that? A monkey's fist. I mean, what's that? Well, a monkey's fist, sir, is a highly complicated knot woven about a slug of lead uh, to lend weight. Ordinarily, it is intended for use at the end of a heaving line. However, it is sometimes used by seamen in the forecastle in the administering of torturous beatings. Now, what do you make of that? Well, if we can take the word of the centuries for it. Torture suggests the violent seeking of information. That would indeed seem to be the case. Well, from the looks of this room, a monkey's fist or any other kind of knot wouldn't be hard to lay your hands on. What's that one on the wall there? Oh, that, uh, that uh. is a miniature of a knotted ship's fender. Fender? Uh, it's a device for cushioning the shock between a ship and a wharf or another vessel. Uh. In modern sailing, this type has largely been replaced by the commercial cork variety. Mm-hmm. Oh, Somebody evidently heard the shots and notified the police. <clears throat> Awkward. Uh, look, Mr. Cricket, yeah? I feel like talking, but not to the police. Uh, splendid. <laughs> Perhaps then you would be kind enough to uh, join me in a nightcap at my quarters? Uh, lead me to it. Mr. Cricket's quarters turned out to be afloat and moored to a dock. It was a PT boat, ex-Navy. <laughs> Sit down, sit down. Make yourself comfortable. All right. Now, first, uh, uh, that nightcap. <laughs> yo ho ho sir, and a bottle of rum. And now, uh, if you'll do the honors... Delighted. I will invite the London Symphony to play behind our chair. Tchaikovsky. 
The Pathetic. Oh, utterly beautiful. Wow. Sweet phonograph records, soft lights, and hard liquor. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff I enjoy in my time off, which this doesn't happen to be. Hey, there we are. Now, now to business. Mr. Dollar, I assume that the insurance company that sent you out here is not uh, satisfied with the story of the sinking of the two vessels, Frank and Nancy Walton. Mm -hmm. I assume further that you have been authorized to spend any necessary monies to not only view the evidence firsthand, but also if that evidence proves a criminal intent to be able to retrieve it from the ocean floor for use in court. Are my assumptions correct? They are. But uh, it can't be as simple as you make it sound. Uh -huh. The first job seems to me the toughest, finding the spot where those clippers went down. Uh -huh. I, I would venture to say that with my special equipment, I could detect the presence of the fillings in Davy Jones' teeth. Uh -huh. it, it is fantastic, sir. And uh, about your price, is that fantastic, too? My proposition is this. A flat price of $5,000. And in the event that criminal intent is proved, the possession of the recovered hulks. I assume this 5000 is only payable if you succeed in locating the boats. <laughs> Let us substitute the term returnable for the word payable. I will need $5,000 in advance, and our contract shall state that in the unlikely event of failure, you shall get your money back less my necessary expenses. Agreed? Agreed. Good. I'll have your money for you in the morning. Good. I trust I shall have your boats for you in the afternoon. I couldn't tell yet about his fantastic sonic sounding device, but uh, otherwise, Mr. Cricket was well equipped. If I shipped ashore a telephone, he ordered me a taxi, which I ordered to a corner near Roscoe Walton's Pacific Deep Sea Canning Company. Carpo's death made me want to get a good look at Carpo's office. Something about the way he died kept baiting up the thought that there was something fishier about this case than just plain old-fashioned insurance fraud. The only thing that was out of place in the place was under a rug, under Carpo's desk, a wall safe sunk in the floor. That proved easier to open than a poker hand with three aces. I lifted the heavy steel door. The first thing I saw was an oblong package, brown paper, stuck one hand in to lift it out, and I couldn't. So I used two, and my back was as heavy as lead. But when I tore off the wrapping, I saw that it was as valuable as gold, because that's what it was, a gold ingot. I didn't even have time to wonder, because the subject suddenly changed from lead to gold to cold steel in his void in his hand. Hold it there. Hey, Mr. Dollar. Oh. It's a little late to be canning fish, isn't it, Walton? Yes, but it seems to be just right for breaking and entering. What are you doing here? Entering the last phase of this investigation, Walton, and breaking the back of your little racket. Or I should say big. What do you mean, racket? To me, it looks like your boats have been bringing in more than fish from the Mexican coast. This heavy little handful makes it look like they've been hauling in Mexican gold. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not going to stand here and be accused. You're so right you're not going to stand there. Not on those feet. Give me that. You and take this. Oh, oh. oh Johnny. Are you hurt? Are you kidding? You'll never make a living being a fight referee. I'm what is commonly known as the winner. Johnny, do, do you really believe what you said is true? What about smuggling in Mexican gold? Yeah. Listen, Anita. When you find a private citizen with a gold ingot, he is not using it for a watch fob. The only thing I learned after that was that two hours in the sack does not constitute a good night's sleep. By 10 in the morning, one phone call east and one telegram west delivered $5,000 into my hands from a local bank. And I, after a quick call to the Coast Guard to cover a few final details, placed myself into the hands of Mr. Cricket, Deep Sea Guide Extraordinary. Two jolting hours later, our bucking bronco with a briny had us crashing through the swell somewhere off the island of San Clemente, which is somewhere some 60 miles off the coast of Southern California. Well, Dollar, my boy, enjoying the voyage? Yeah. Oh, oh come now. This isn't what a sailor would call rough weather, you understand? Uh, I understand. 
I only hope my breakfast does. Oh, this is nothing. Why, I recall one time off the Spanish coast. Mr. Cricket! Yes, my man? According to my reading, we're about there. Good, good. Reduce your RPM. Now, now, Dada. Now, prepare to be amazed. Mr. Cricket had good reason to chirp about one thing. He sure knew his business. An hour later, the hulks had been located. We were riding on a mushroom anchor. A diver had been put over the side and was tug of war topside by a cable on a winch. All right, careful now. Okay, clear the rail. Easy, does it? Far away. He's a fork and flat. Quickly, quickly now, get his helmet off. <laughs> now, Dollar, we shall see, we shall see. For 5,000 bucks, I'm going to have to see. <laughs> well, Riley, what not? We hit it right on the nose. They're both down there 30 yards apart. <laughs> well, Dollar, are you satisfied? Just about 90%, Mr. Craigert. Oh, and the 10 percent? Oh, look, it's this way, Mr. Cricket. If this case gets any place, I'll probably have to testify in court. So far, everything I've got is secondhand. That isn't worth much in court. I've got to see those boats. What? What well, good heavens, man. You, uh, you mean you want to go over the side? I don't particularly want to, but it seems to be part of this job. Many times before in my career, I have thought I had a heavy weight on my shoulders. But that diver's helmet set the new record. And those lead shoes and that rubberized canvas suit didn't feel exactly zoot. The temperature of the water outside felt much cooler than that forming on my brows. This was a steam bath, beer type. Eight days later, in my mind at least, my lead wedgies groped for a foothold on a slimy bottom, and I had arrived shipside. As I had no immediate way of determining the sex of a sunken ship, I couldn't tell from a bath beam whether I was looking at the Frank or the Nancy Walton. About then, a passing current grabbed me and invited me out to dance along the ocean floor. I grabbed out for anything for support, and it turned out to be a rope hanging from the clipper's gunnel. Well, Dollar. When a drift the passed on in the hut, right? I had a chance to take a closer look at what I was hanging on to. The line was secured to a woven rope ship's fender, which Mr. Cricket had not so long before told me was fashioned about a bullion core of cork. But this one felt heavy enough to be loaded with county cork. And as for buoyancy, this was about as buoyant as a lead balloon. Dollar, it was resting on the bottom and heavy to lift. There? The next current that swept over me was mental. I clawed the shark knife out of the diving suit belt, started hacking at the woven rope, Dollar, come, come. then Stop. through a thin layer of canvas. And that's as far as I got. Dollar, is this phone system operating? Here now, Dollar. Are you there? This ain't the three little fishies. Oh, good. Have you seen the ships? Yeah, they're here, all right. Are you satisfied that they were sunk by explosion? Yep. They're blasted in all directions. Then I have earned my $5,000, and I must bid you farewell. What? What are you talking about? Oh, you have been all but lost in a diving accident. Oh, ho, yourself. What will that get you? In disposing of you, sir, I am confident that as well as pocketing your $5,000, I will also do away with the meddling of the insurance company. You see, when my diver comes down to recover your unfortunate body, he will continue our search for the gold. Oh, well, I've got news for you, pal. You evidently didn't knock the hiding place out of Carpo before you killed him. But I was lucky. Not only have I already found that gold, I have stashed it. Here now, Dollar. You're bluffing. If you think so, turn off my air. Ah, so you do know about it. Uh, Dollar, tell me honestly, are you open to terms? Well, uh, I'll think about it. All the way! The trip up was slower than the trip down, which was luck for me. 
The first thing I heard when I broke to the surface was muffled by the helmet, but unmistakably gunfire. The Marines hadn't landed, but by George, the Coast Guard certainly had, and I had a grandstand seat for the whole affair. My winchman was busy ducking bullets, and the winch just didn't decide to stop on its own hook. So I went riding skyward until I was stopped by the tip of the boom. And there I was, hanging on its own hook, suspended over the deck, looking through my helmet glass at the raging battle below. Cricket directly below me was pumping a high-powered rod rifle, and between shots, shouting curses at whoever had opened fire on the U.S. government. Lieutenant Senior Grade, Miles P. Endicott Jr. stood silhouetted against the sky on the flying bridge of the Coast Guard cutter. I looked down 20 feet between my dangling lead-weighted feet and saw Cricket taking careful aim in his direction. So once again, I grabbed my razor-edged shark knife, stuck it under the copper rim of my breastplate, and ripped at the canvas, and bombs away! My weight did the rest! Expense account, item five. Cab fare to the San Pedro Police Headquarters, where I made my statement and heard Mr. Cricket's, a badly damaged Mr. Cricket. Well, sir, during a short stay in Cleveland, it was brought to my attention that every city in the country was suffering an epidemic of small-time gold robbery, dentist offices, pawn shops, and so forth. Such a condition piqued my curiosity. Yes. Well, there's my love for money. And I studied the situation more closely. To my amazement, I learned that the gold was being melted down, fashioned into ingots, and sent off somewhere to the Orient for use in the gold and gun smuggling traffic. It occurred to me that if I could intercept the gold immediately after its dispatch, under the guidance of Captain Capo, to a larger ship, being met at sea by his tuna clippers, then I could realize for myself a tidy profit. Expense account, item six. Seven dollars and fifty cents. A five-pound box of chocolates for Miss Anita Varghese. Address, San Pedro Municipal Jail. It seems that the police sometimes classify a part-time girlfriend as an all-time accomplice. Expense account item seven, airfare, Los Angeles to Hartford, $176.87. And uh, being Friday, what do you think they serve for dinner on the plane? What else? Tuna fish salad. Uh, expense account total, $1,264.28. Yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Willard Waterman, Junius Matthews, Edmund McDonald, Georgia Ellis, Larry Dobkin, and Paul Dubois. The special music is written and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Be sure and be with us at this same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Every fall, the ladies like to go out and get some new fall clothes. Well, CBS has gone out and gotten some new fall shows. One of the gayest of these new programs is the Red Skelton Show, which makes its bow over most of these same CBS stations this Sunday night. There's no one quite like Red Skelton, as you'll find out when you tune in tomorrow. The Red Skelton Show is a part of the CBS great Sunday night laugh lineup. Don't miss it. Now stay tuned for Vaughn Monroe, who follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Paul Masterson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
This is a horse on me. But I did find out that in a race for life and death, the police laboratory is where they make the photo finish. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Hartford Branch, Lloyd's Underwriters Association. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the circumstances threatening the life of the insured, the racehorse pile driver. Or, he'd have been way off his feet if I didn't know my oats. Or, it's great to get a kick out of life so long as it isn't a kick in the head. Expense account item one. 18 cents, one package of cigarettes. You may consider this a personal item, but uh, that's where this case really started. At the cigar stand, ground floor, terminal office building, here in Hartford. I had come down in one of the elevators and noticed a little guy with a cane standing with a starter. After I passed them, I felt myself being pointed out. And not being the type who likes being followed for long periods of time... I gave myself a good reason to stop and look things over. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Hiya, Mac. Give me a pack of luckies, will you? Uh, I just sold you a pack when you came in. I know. But things may really start smoking any minute. Here. Ah, good morning to you, sir. I've been led to believe that you were one Mr. John Dollar. Would that be a fact? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm Dollar. What can I do for you? Well, I am quite a famous fellow myself. Perhaps you've heard of the fabulous jockey Earl Sand? Yeah, but... Uh... Well, next to him, I was among the best. May I introduce myself? I'm the famous little Nettie Montana, sometimes called the short Johnny Longdon. Shake hands. Oh, how do you do? Oh, to business. I think I have a way for you to solve my problem and make yourself an honest buck, besides. Oh, now, whoa, pony boy, you're wasting your time. I don't bet the horses, and when I do, I don't buy tips from touts. Oh, now, wait a minute, pal. I did not introduce myself for the purpose of being insulted. I will have you know that I, too, do not consort with touts. I will thank you to keep a civil tongue in your head. Oh, I can see this is going to be one of those days. What is your problem, mister? Well, it is a problem best not overheard by people in the lobbies of office buildings. But this much I can tell you. It is about a horse and $50,000 insurance. That is why I came to you. Well, I'd be richer if I'd known more about horses, and poorer if I'd known less about insurance. Maybe in this thing I can break even at least. Come on. I uh, hope you are not too much of a purist to ride in a taxi. Little Nettie looked like he'd stopped growing physically at the age of 14. And every once in a while he talked like his mind had also called it quits at about the same time. The only thing slick about him was his hair. The only thing sharp, his clothes. Liars always talk too much, and little Nettie wouldn't say a word until we were inside my apartment. So even before he started his pitch, I half believed it. Well, to take it from the beginning, I was born in a stable, and that's not just a figure of speech. They brought the hot water in a feed bucket, so you can understand my deep affection for horses. Yeah. Now... On top of that, kindly consider this. Mm -hmm. One horse in particular, a very brave steed by the name of Pile Driver, has not only made me very famous, but has also made me a very large pile of hay. I have ridden Pile Driver to a win position since he was a maiden. Pile Driver, huh? Quite a hunk of horse. Uh Aha. Ah, you remember. Yeah. Then you might also remember that he was on his way to becoming one of the big money winners of all time. Until I had to go and fall off a livery stable horse while teaching a girl how to ride in Central Park. It busted up my leg and, I might add, my future. To say nothing to pile drivers. He hasn't won a race since I got grounded. Yeah, well, what's all this got to do with insurance? Mr. Dollar, they are going to murder him. Oh? Can you guess why? I can try. Pile driver is heavily insured. He's also no longer winning races. He's also a man who can't have a family. No good for studs. So if Pile Driver should trip and break a leg, the owner would be entitled to shoot him, and he'd still collect the insurance. 
I know. It's been done. You have hit the horseshoe nail on the head. Mr. Dollar, I have a considerable bundle of money stashed away, and I am willing to devote a considerable lump of it to the purpose of saving pile driver. Now, maybe you wouldn't understand such a thing, but I happen to love that horse. I understand it, Nettie. Where is he? Well, he is currently stabled at a track named Hiawatha. Oh, by the shores of Gitchigumi? No, no, by the shores of Lake Michigan. This is located slightly north of a place called Chicago. Five telephone calls and a few hundred questions later, I learned that Piledriver was insured by your company. Got the assignment and was on my way. So, expense account item two, airfare, Hartford to Chicago, $57.72. Little Nettie insisted on coming along, and he kept the hum of the plane from being humdrum as follows. Well, Johnny, the gentleman who owns Pile Driver is an old Kentucky mint julep sponge named Colonel Faraday Bushnell. Mm-hmm. Now, this character has a very black heart hiding beneath a head of white hair. Yes, I trusted him until I heard him say what he was going to do. From then on, I have been seriously tempted to wrap these hands around his neck and squeeze. All I can say is he had better not hurt pile drive. Expense account item three. Sixteen dollars and forty cents. Cab fare, Chicago Municipal Airport to Hiawatha Racetrack. Arrival time, 10 a.m. To me, a racetrack always smells good. Of horses, green grass, and excitement. Hey, our driver. Keep the change. Well, this, as the saying goes, is it, Mr. Dollar. You will have to take it from here. Okay. Oh, hey, uh, one last word of warning. Watch out for his daughter, Lila. Why? Is she dangerous? To a guy like me? No. But to a guy like you, yes. Uh, uh, pardon me, uh, miss... Can you tell me where I'll find the boss around here, Colonel Bushnell? Oh. Mm-hmm. I was just going to chase you away. But you don't look like just another hay and grain merchant. What you selling? I'm not. I'm buying. Where's your daddy? How do you know the colonel is my daddy? Well, he told me he had a pretty daughter. Oh, well, thanks. Just who are you, mister? Well, as for the name, that's Johnny Dollar. As for my business, that's trying to buy one of your father's horses. Well, the colonel won't be back for a little bit, but I'm bossing while he's away. I'll tell you now, I don't think he's figuring on selling any of his horses. But I'll be glad to show them to you. Good enough. But there's uh, only one I'm really interested in. Pile driver. Pile driver? Why, no, Daddy wouldn't sell him. Why not? Well, he's practically one of the family. He he put me through the last two years of college. Do you mind if I see him anyway? Why, no, not at all. Right over here. Okay. Here, baby. You have company, darling. Meet Mr. Dollar. Hello. Quite a horse. No, he's just a perfect deer, aren't you, darling? Mr. Dollar, why do you want to buy a pile driver? Oh, he's a great horse. Got a great record. Have you been following him lately? Yeah. Oh, I know he hasn't been winning. That ought to make his price cheap and the odds long when he gets back running. I just happen to think I can make a winner out of him again. But his spirit's all gone. How do you think you're going to do that? Well, I told you, his price might go right back up. Johnny, darling, hmm? I can't help it, darling. Hey, well, Kiss wait a minute. Let's take a go. Wait a please, minute. darling, please. Uh, well, uh, it was great fun. Uh, but what was it for? Johnny, you shouldn't have right out here in the open. Huh? Oh, Leo. Yeah. What's going on? Now, wait, Leo, honey. This guy ain't your brother. He'll wish he was. Besides, that's no way to kiss brothers. You, get out of here. Look, Buster, if you aren't this girl's father, you'd better start doing some wishing. Oh, you think so, huh? This is the roughest game of post office I ever got mixed up in. like that, please? Johnny! Johnny, what are you doing to him? Hammer heads like this hammer locks. But I'm getting tough now, and I'll bust his arm. There, run along now about your business. Leo, I must say I am surprised at you fighting in front of a lady. Oh, Dad. Get him off of me. Here, young man, I demand that you dismount, Mr. Corbett. Well, sooner or later, I guess I'll have to. 
Now, listen, Leo. Are you paying close attention? Uh, yeah. After I let you up, if you make one move, except away from here, I'll give you a pair of fat ears, okay? Now, look at the suit. I'm going to have to start wearing knee pads. Come on, Leo, honey. Let's get away from here. I hope you're not blaming me for what happened. I don't I'm know. Hold up, Mike. Now, see here. I demand an explanation. So do I. I came here to get to the horse business, and I end up in the fight racket. Who is that guy? That gentleman, sir, is Leo Corbett, the brother of horse owner. And I might do the favor of warning you that Mr. Corbett is a hard enough man in business dealings. But when it comes to my daughter, he's downright violent. Your daughter was downright impulsive. Maybe so. But Leo is hardly the type to stand by while some other fellow kisses his girl. And I saw that happen with my own eyes. Well, don't let it worry you, Colonel. I didn't come here to collect lipstick samples. Well, there's one thing I can be glad about in my encounter with Mr. Leo Corbett. What is that? That he isn't James J. Come on, Colonel. Let's talk business. Hey, bartender. Hey, Mr. Dollar, over here. Oh, uh, never mind. There's my man over there. How are you, Nanny? Oh, I'm fine. Hey, but you, where did you catch that mouse under your eye? Oh, I'm sharp as a trap, I am. You were so right about Miss Bushnell. She's not only dangerous, she's daffy. Huh? I didn't know she could hit that hard. No, she didn't. Let's just say that she has a novel way of introducing people to her boyfriend. Oh. You know him? Leo Corbett? Well, if I knew any more, I'd be the racing commission's witness. He owns a string of very fast horses who run very slow until the odds get right. Then he bets him up to the brisket, wins himself a potful. It's also rumored that he is uh, stiff competition to the Perry Mutual machines. He books big bets among the owners. Well, they'll catch up to him sooner or later. They always do. Amen. But uh, about that yeah. human glue factory, my friend, the horse-killing colonel, what's with him? Well, I offered him $60,000 for pile driver. Huh? That's 10000 more than he'd get if he knocked him off and collected the insurance. Yeah, where are you going to lay your mitts on 60 Gs? I haven't got that kind of dough. We don't need that kind of dough, little Nettie. You see, I told Bushnell that I was sending to California for my private vet and that he'd be here in three days and that once he pronounced the horse sound, I'd give him the money. Yeah, but that only means that pile driver is safe for another three days. And then what? In those three days, it's up to me to prove intent. And if it's there, I'll prove it. And have the policy canceled. Once that's done, he'll probably be willing to pedal the horse for 10000 That I can handle. But in the meantime, I'm not taking any chances, see? I'm keeping pile driver under my own personal eye. I wish you wouldn't, Eddie. We don't want the colonel getting suspicious. I can't help it, Mr. Dollar. I just can't help it. Okay, Nettie, but don't blow it. Be careful. <laughs> Like all racetracks, Hiawatha was surrounded by motor courts and bungalows with rooms for rent. So, expense account item four, three dollars, room rent. I set the tin alarm clock for eight and my ear for any time and went most of the way to sleep. First things being first, I dreamed of girls. Then, I dreamed of fire engines. And suddenly, I realized why. I was hearing some. I bounced out of bed and over to the window. There I saw an incendiary sunset hanging over the racetrack stables. I jumped into my pants and into the landlady's car and got over there as fast as a 1929 Ford could take me. Hey, you. You. How'd it start? Where'd he go? I didn't see him, but I hear he ran in the fire and didn't come out. Some crank, I guess. I had one particular horse to get to in a hurry. And I hoped one particular guy. The door to pile driver's stall was closed and padlocked. I crowbarred the stable out of the wood with the pick end of a fire axe. Threw the door open, grabbed a lung full of fresh air, closed my eyes and slammed into the smoke. Could have been smoked to death, burned to death, or stamped to death, but I had to take the chance. <coughs> Steady, yo. Whoa, whoa, pile driver. Now, take it easy. Easy, easy, boy. <coughs> I whacked him on the rump with the axe handle and dropped it. 
I slipped to my knees, started groping across the straw-covered floor. I knew that if there was any air in there, that's where it would be. If there was an ex-jockey in there, that's where he would be. And that's where he was. In the first corner I tried. I crawfished backwards toward the door, dragging him inch by inch out into the clean, cold shower of fresh night air. I could have saved myself the trip. Little Nettie Montana was dead. He'd had a horseshoe hung on his forehead, but not for luck. And all I could think of at the moment was a jockey's best friend is not always his horse. <laughs> In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, may we take just a moment from tonight's Johnny Dollar story to remind you that three more fine adventure shows come your way each Saturday night on most of these same CBS stations. First, there are the adventures of Philip Marlowe, based on the smart and tough private eye created by Raymond Chandler. Second, there's Gangbusters, one of the most famous crime shows on the air, reenacting outstanding police cases in real life. Third, there is Escape, a highly unusual adventure show which fulfills your need for escape. Hear these three, Philip Marlowe, Gangbusters, and Escape, along with yours truly, Johnny Dollar, every Saturday night, won't you? Tune in, tune in this fall For the shows that you love best of all Listen carefully Here's the address It's CBS, CBS, CBS. Now with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Tough luck. Nice try, little Nettie. Mr. Dollar, Mr. Dollar, this is horrible. I hope it's little Nettie. It sure is. What's left of little Nettie? You don't... Yeah, I mean, he's dead. You know, when I was a kid, I knew about a story with a horse and a woman in it. Helen of Troy. I should have remembered that before I tangled with you. Why don't you get lost? Well, whatever's the matter with you? Look, Miss Bushnell, two minutes after I met you, you bagged me into a fist fight with your boyfriend with a phony kiss. I don't know how much you had to do with putting little Nettie where he is, but I intend to find out. Why, you're insane. Any fool, even you, Mr. Dollar, can plainly see that this boy's been kicked in the head by a horse. Lila, Lila, child, what are you doing here? Why, I saw Why? the... What? Who's that on the ground? What? It's little Neddy. Don't tell me he's dead. What would you be if you got kicked in the head by a horse, Colonel? Why, why the poor boy. I held this lad in deep affection until just a few months back. He was my best jockey. What on earth was he doing around here at this time of night? From all I can see, little Neddy swapped his life for pile drivers. As small as he was, it's a pretty big price to pay. Although I guess you wouldn't think so, would you? What? What's that? I demand an explanation of precisely what you mean, sir. I mean that to some people, a dead horse is more valuable than a live one. Too bad you can't go count your money. I gotta take my friend to the morgue. An hour later, little Nettie was resting better than I was. I'd made my report to the police and was back pacing the floor of my rented room. There wasn't a long walk. Yeah? This is Lila Bushnell. I gotta see you right away. Why don't you start another fire? That'll draw me. I didn't have anything to do with that fire, but I must talk to you right away. Where can I meet you? Have you got a car? Yes, yes, I'll come any place. Well, pick me up here in 20 minutes. Come alone, and we'll take a little drive to the country. I want it to be just the three of us you and me and the dewdrops. <laughs> Dawn was making a dark gray promise in the sky when she picked me up. And a few easy-to-please birds had found something to sing about. During the first five miles, Lila denied everything except that she was a woman. And there was no hiding that. I had her pull in under a tree and said, Well, then why'd you call me? It... It was something you said to my father. About... About a horse being more valuable dead than alive. You sold me out once. What are you planning on now? Selling out your old man? 
You women. You know, if the truth is ever told, it'll probably come out that Goldilocks cut her grandmother's throat to swipe the gold out of her teeth. Please don't make fun of me. Fun, she calls it. Well, if you got something to spill, get it off your chest. My father owes Leo Corbett $50,000. He lost it betting on pile driver. Leo's been demanding his money, and father doesn't have it. And I heard Leo practically order father to destroy pile driver for the insurance. And what did Daddy dear say to that? He, he said he'd do it. But I know he wouldn't. I know he didn't set that fire. How do you know? I... I just know, that's all. Now, that'll sound good to a jury. Why are you coming to me with all this stuff? Because you're our only hope. Can't you buy Pile Driver right away? It would solve everything. Everything but one thing. What's that? Why did you go to all that trouble to get me punched in the eye? Oh, that? Yeah. I just wanted to show Leo that he wasn't going to have everything his own way. And you look strong enough to do it. Wow. That's a stupid answer. Why not? Makes a stupid kind of sense. She dropped me off at my rooming house where I dropped off to sleep. It was, however, only a four-hour plunge. Expense account item five, six fifty. Cab fare to headquarters, homicide division, Chicago police. That's one city where the cops still wear an old-fashioned star, but they sure do operate with a new fashion speed. As witness, the enclosed report made by Lieutenant Craig six hours after filing of inquiry. According to the findings of the autopsy, Dollar, your hunch, or whatever you call it, was right. The deceased, uh, little Nettie, was not kicked to death by a horse. Examination of the wound reveals that it was administered by a new horseshoe. A shoe on a horse's hoof would have left traces of uh, straw, etc. We say that the fatal weapon was swung by person or persons unknown. As you suggested, he'd have to have been standing on his head to have the horseshoe make the mark it did if the horse had kicked him. The lieutenant had made only one mistake. He should have said person or persons known. <laughs> Expense account item six. Ten cents. Two telephone calls. The idea I was working in, I'll give you for nothing. Expense account item seven. Six fifty. Cab fare to administration building. Hiawatha racetrack. Where the afternoon's program was in progress, and uh, where I got the wholehearted cooperation of the track officials and the use of a vacant office in which to hold the meeting I had set up. I sat myself in a swivel chair and waited. Come in. Mr. Dollar, I can't tell you how happy I am that our little transaction is about to be consummated. If you have the money with you, sir... Pile driver is yours. Now, wait a minute, Colonel. Let's not go consummating too quickly. But, my boy, you indicated over the telephone. I indicated over the phone just this. I said my offer was as good as it ever was. And to tell you the truth, it's not very good. Now, see here. Who's that? Sit down, Colonel. Come in. Why, Leo, what are you doing up here? Anytime anybody shows up to hand over 60000 to you for pile driver, I'm going to be here. That's exactly what this smart guy called me up to tell me he's about to do. Now, now, gentlemen, gentlemen, let's take it easy. Before I do anything, I want to make sure I'm not doing business with a murderer. Sir, I demand an explanation. What about you, Leo? Yeah, so do I. Well, here it is. The Chicago police know two things. One, that last night's fire was set. And two, that little Nettie was murdered. And that little Nettie got a couple of lungfuls of smoke before he got hit over the head with a horseshoe. That means that whoever hit him over the head sucked in some smoke, too. Well, I've never heard such a pack of nonsense in my life. What are you getting at, wise guy? Just what I told you. I don't want to do business with a murderer, especially $60,000 worth. But I've made it easy on you to prove that you aren't. You see, I got a doctor in the next room with portable X-ray equipment. If you've got fire smoke in your lungs, it'll show up. Now... How about it? Why, this is ridiculous. Why don't you leave the Dick Tracy stuff to the funny papers? Because I don't feel like laughing. Now, once more, how about it? Tracy, I, I still don't know what this tomfoolery is about, and I, I'll feel downright silly while I'm doing it, but I'm willing to take my chances. Okay. Leo, you're first. Follow me. Yeah. Oh. Turning your back on a murderer is no way to stay healthy, but very often it's a good way to get him to make his move. This one did, right out the door, knocking me down en route, and the chase was on. Out of the building, and out toward the grandstand, and the racing circle. And there they go, on the outside. 
It may have been Dreamy Boy at the quarter and on the track, but it was Mike Quarry by 50 lengths as he headed up an aisle into the grandstand. Dreamy Boy was still doing fine down there, and I was moving up, up here, but up near the top of the grandstand and onto the ramp leading to the press box section. Just as Dreamy Boy hit the three-quarter, we hit the grandstand roof. And then we went into the stretch. Hey, Corbett, it's hopeless. You can't get much farther. You're running out of roof. I slid behind a ventilator and showed myself to draw his shots. He was lousy. If he hadn't been, he'd be dictating this with an air-conditioned elbow. Okay, Corbett, you've had it. I've been counting your shots. Corbett tried a few ventilators himself. And then apparently he decided the second time he fought me, he'd do better. He rushed in swinging. I was doing great trading punches. But he finally moved inside and threw one. I took low, but he came up fast with his knees. I sat down, and he took off. Straight to the back corner edge of the pitched roof. He swung over the side and started to shinny down the 100 foot rain pipe. But that pipe was built to carry rain, not people. At the finish line of one tiny segment of the human race, it was gambler, arsonist, murderer, Leo Corbett. By a head. Expense account item eight. Dinner for two at the Changri La in downtown Chicago. Thirty-four dollars and forty cents. Uh, dinner itself only took forty minutes and eight of the dollars. The rest of the evening and the money was spent listening to the story of her life. A story which would not, by any means, win any Pulitzer Prize, or, for that matter, any husbands. But sometimes when you're interested in a girl like Lila, you have to act like you're interested in what she's saying. Expense account item nine, $57.72. Airfare, Chicago to Hartford. Item ten, $1.50. One book to read on airplane, titled How to Win at the Races. As if I just hadn't found out. Uh, expense account total, $1,449.22. I guess you could call that horse sense. Signed, yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Bill Conrad, Doris Singleton, Jerry Hausner, Herb Butterfield, and Hal March. The special music is written and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Be sure to be with us at this same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Those mystery adventure shows we mentioned earlier, the fun and music and fabulous jackpot of Sing It Again, and two outstanding music shows. They're on tap for you every Saturday on most of these same CBS stations. Gene Autry comes along with his sagebrush ballads, and Vaughn Monroe is due with his songs and his great orchestra. In fact, you're invited to stay tuned right now for the Vaughn Monroe Show, for it follows immediately over most of these stations. Paul Masterson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Well, anyway, I learned the answer to the question, what does a doctor do when a doctor needs a doctor? (laughs) 
This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. Expense accounts submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to American Volunteer Liability Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Homer Shalley, General Manager. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of one of your policyholders, Dr. Otto Schmedlich. Or an apple a day sent the doctor away. Or it couldn't have happened to a bigger worm. Expense accounts, item one. 80 cents, cab fare to your office in answer to your call. Tip to driver, one dollar. Oh, morning, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yeah. Go right in, Mr. Shelley, the second. Thanks, sir. Uh, good morning, Dollar. Good morning. Sit down. Thank you. I, uh, I'm sorry we had that uh, unfortunate altercation over the last expense account you submitted to this office. Oh, that's all right. Because it was ridiculous. You're going around tipping cab drivers a dollar after a 50-cent trip. Well, you know me, Homer, just a silly, headstrong, impetuous boy. It was somebody else's money, yes. Uh, we've been through all that. What I want to talk to you now is... Uh... Oh, yeah. Oh, oh here, here, here. Dr. Otto Schmedlich, Los Angeles, California. California? Doesn't anything ever happen in Hartford? I've been using an airplane seatbelt so much lately, I'm about ready to throw away my suspenders. Dr. Otto Schmedlich. Uh, I suppose you're familiar with the existence of that type of insurance policy which protects doctors against charges of malpractice. Yeah, I've heard of them. Well, we had the rare misfortune of issuing such a policy to this... Uh, this quack Schmedlich. Well, what do you want me to do? Go out and take his temperature? <clears throat> Dollar, when I want to laugh, I tune in Jack Benny. Now, this is serious. The policy we issued to Dr. Schmedlich only covers him up to the extent of what is construed as accidental malpractice. If we can prove criminal malpractice, we can cancel the scoundrel's policy. Do you have a good reason to think it's criminal, or are you just toying with a happy thought? Look, our company has already paid off on two claims. Recently, we've heard rumors about this man. It seems the Medical Association is watching him very closely. But so far, no one can prove anything. Now, Dolly, do you want the assignment? No, but I'll take it. Expense accounts, item two, $194.04. Airfare, Hartford to Los Angeles. Item three, four fifty. Cab fare, Los Angeles Airport to the Sun Tower Medical Specialist Building which I first spotted looming through the smog on Wilshire Boulevard, high in the high-rent district of the city beautiful. Item four, 55 cents, 11 nickels. Spent telephoning the Schmedlick office at 15-minute intervals until I at last found the doctor not in. In California, the doctors really specialize. And the buildings they work in sometimes really make the most of it, as I found out in the elevator going up. Second floor, eye, ear, nose, and throat. Doctors Care, Crider, White, Tiss, and Osterban. Uh, pardon me. Third floor, fractures, strains, sprains, and dislocations. Doctors Fowler, Woodruff, Toygo, and Brown. Oh, pardon me. Fourth floor, obstetrics, orthopedic, pediatrics, and general practice. Dr. Small, Collier, Reynolds, Frank, Stanley, Feinbaum, and Schmedlick. Would all these medical terms you just tossed off by any chance mean that we have now arrived in the land of the mechanized stork? To put it crudely, yes. Thank you, Jack Armstrong. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, Dr. Schmedlick in? Well, no, I'm sorry he isn't. Oh, good. I mean, that's too bad. Just what do you mean? Well, I meant to say that, uh, well, since the doctor isn't in, I I mean, I'd rather talk to you anyway. You're prettier. I should be. I'm a girl. Now, is there something I can help you with? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, you can. I have a sort of 
of empty feeling around my heart. What would you prescribe? Bicarbonate of soda. Is that all? Touche. Now I have an empty feeling around my head. Please, will you state your business? Oh, now, honey, you should know that anybody who walks into a doctor's office wants to live. And after seeing you, I really want to live. What are you doing tonight? Well, you... I am not in the habit of making dates with strange men. Who's strange? And furthermore, you are perhaps the most insufferable, egotistical... No, if you just person. give me a chance, darling, I'm sure I'll be able to prove you're right. Why, I wouldn't be caught dead, would you? <laughs> oh, Johnny, you ain't. You like that, huh? <laughs> yeah, this is the first time I've ever tasted champagne. Good old champagne. The rich people seven up. Well, here's to us. To us. Doreen, I feel like talking. Well, thanks for putting me on guard. Listening to you can do strange things to a girl. I want you to know more about me. I'm an insurance man. I didn't go up to your office hoping to see the doctor. I wanted to see his nurse, you. Why, Johnny Dollar, if you try to sell me... Oh, hey, now, wait a minute. Hear me out. You can probably guess it's getting pretty tough trying to sell insurance these days. Uh -huh. More than anything else, a guy needs a new angle, and I've got one. People who go to doctors are worried about their health. Now, people who are worried about their health are worried about the security of their families. So, they become good prospects for insurance policies. No, but at the same time, aren't they also bad risks? A lot of them are, yeah. But they can't pass the insurance physical. But there are plenty of others. You should know the figures prove that as many healthy people go to doctors as do unhealthy. Perhaps the most popular disease in America is hypochondria. And the national headquarters seems to be located right here in Los Angeles. I see and from me, you want a list of Dr. Schmedlick's patients? Smart girl. Uh, smart boy. Expense accounts, item five, a dollar forty. Cab fare to Doreen's apartment, where I told the driver to wait. Expense account, same item, part two. Twenty-eight dollars. Waiting time before I took the cab the rest of the way back to my hotel. Expense account, item six. Breakfast the next morning. Two hard-earned dollars for two soft-boiled eggs. The hen that laid them must do barnyard bits in the movies. At least at those prices, she could have autographed them. At 9.30, I was right on time for my morning appointment with Doreen to pick up the list of Dr. Schmedlick's patients a half hour before the doctor was due to arrive. Well, Johnny, for a man who stayed up so late, you're very punctual. Oh, that's me. <laughs> the early worm who so often gets the bird. You got a copy of the list? Yeah. Got here at 8 to type it for oh, you. Oh, fine. Here it is. So this is wonderful. You're a doll. Yeah. A. A. Aaron's. You make the top of any alphabetical list. Look, uh, this is a selfish way of saying thanks because I'll enjoy it more than you will, but dinner at Romanoff's alone? I love it. Good. Uh, good morning, Miss. Oh, oh, good morning, Dr. Schmedley. Oh, this patient's already? Oh, uh, yes, Doctor. This is a uh, dollar. He's from out of town. Good morning. Well, all right. What's the matter with you? Oh, it's, it's really nothing. Well, let me be the judge of that. I will make the diagnosis. I will see you in a moment. Johnny, I don't know what happened. He's never come in this early before. Oh, mind that, but I wish you hadn't met a patient. Well, I just had to say something. He wants to know about everybody who comes in here. Johnny, you'll just have to go through with it. We can't let him know about the list. Okay, okay. But what's this going to cost me? What does the old square head get for a checkup? Fifty dollars in consultation. Oh, uh, honey, instead of Romanoff's for dinner tonight, we'd better make it a drive-in. Hmm? I'm sorry, Johnny, I am. But... You can come in now, Mr. Lawler. Oh, well, uh, with a D, Doctor, the name is Dollar. Oh, yes, yes, I forget. I have so many cases on my mind. Now, if you will be so good to slip off your jacket and your shirt while I talk. All right. Now, what is the nature of your complaint? Well, uh... Um, uh, my, my back. Ah. See, I was in a small automobile crank up driving out here. No, that's a dangerous, complicated area, the back. Now, if you'd be so good to get up on the table and lie down. Oh, all right. No, on your stomach. Oh. Yeah. The feet down here, please. Right. That's good. Now, I tap your back. 
when I reached a painful area. Please, to tell me. Yes, Doctor. Mm -hmm. oh. Very well muscled, Mr. Dollar. No bruises, strange. Oh, uh, ooh, there it is. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, not dangerously near the spine, but very interesting. Here, I think this will help. <clears throat> oh! At first, it felt like a big bee sting about a quarter of the way up my back. Then came the buzzing inside my head. Whatever kind of liquid lullaby the good doctor sunk into my spine, it really rocked me to sleep. I had time to move my head and watch Schmedlick put down the hypodermic, walk across the room to my coat, and take from it the list of his patients, plus my wallet containing my ident identification. But I didn't give it a second thought. I didn't have time to. For me, the lights went out. <laughs> In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, assets, one block of wood. Liabilities, more trouble than the legendary paper hanger with the hives. It sounds as though Edgar Bergen had a pretty bad bank balance, doesn't it? But luckily for you, he comes back week after week to the CBS studios with his block of wood named Charlie and lets himself in for more trouble. As for you, you're really in the chips when you take in the Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy show heard over most of these stations every Sunday. Don't miss their brightest, gayest show tomorrow night on CBS, where this fall you hear them all. Tune in, tune in this fall for the show that you love best of all. Listen carefully, here's the address. It's CBS, CBS. Now with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. In my racket, sleeping on the job isn't always fun, and this was one of those times. Waking up from Dr. Schmedlick's slumber treatment for nosy people carried with it a dark brown taste in the mouth, thickness of the tongue and big bells ringing in your steeple. I was scoring on all those counts when I rolled open my eyelids, which fought me all the way. I sat up and found myself on a hard canvas cut in a bare room with soft walls. They were padded. The window wasn't much, and what there was of it was barred. So was a tiny opening in the upholstered door. At first, I thought I was going crazy. Then I realized I was in the kind of place where they put people they think have already joined the ranks of the Enchanted. It took me only ten years to make it over to the door before I looked out through the small slit. Hey! Hey, come here, someone! Hey, room service! All right, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm coming. Hold up your voices. Now listen, mister. The first thing you're learning here is we don't like noise. Makes the other patients nervous. Okay, okay, okay. Where am I? Who are you? I'm your nurse. Oh, sorry I didn't recognize you. I thought nurses were supposed to wear little caps. I got a little cap, but I don't wear it indoors. It ha hey, listen, you. Don't go making fun of me. You'll be sorry, see? I'm sorry now. How'd I get in here anyway? Well, all I know is this place is for your own good. When you say outside, you're dangerous. I can depend on it. If I ever get out, I will be. What'd you say? Nothing. Uh -uh. You're one of them, all right, talking to yourself. What's your name? Well, it's none of your business, but I'll tell you. I don't like people calling me, hey, you, so I'll tell you. My name is Foggy. Okay, Foggy. Listen, all I want is a chance to talk to somebody who's in charge. How about it? That's easy. When your time comes, the boss will be here without no asking. You get one visit from the boss every day, just like all the others. When will that be? Just before supper. So why don't you go back to sleep? That won't be for four more hours. Oh, dandy. Who is this boss? What's his name? The boss is not a he. It is a she. And her name is Dr. Doreen Smith. I 
had four hours to think of different ways of calling myself a sucker. At the end of hour number one, I ran out of fingernails. At the end of hour number two, I ran out of patience. And the other two, I spent devising torturous new ways of getting even with a combination that shanghaied me into that fancy four-walled straitjacket. They had left me only one move to make. That was out. I figured that if the winsome Dr. Doreen Smith paid me a visit, she'd come with her body well guarded, probably by the charming, bemuscled behemoth, Nurse Forgy, who, from what I saw of him through that slit in the door, was no Florence Nightingale, believe me. For him, I needed a club. I didn't have much to work with. The iron and canvas cart was heavily bolted to the floor. That was the only other piece of furniture in the room, a small but sturdy table. Took off one of my shoes, ripped the heel off in an angle of the cot, and looked lovingly at the shiny little nail points gleaming back at me from the solid piece of leather in the palm of my hand. I put it to work, ripping a four-foot square of canvas out of the cot. Then I put both of my shoes into the center of the square, picked up the corners, tied them together close to the weight, gave it a heft, feeling that I now had at least the start of a weapon. suppose you think that's good news. He's safe, Dr. Smith. He's still groggy from that uh-huh. show. Don't trust him. Grab his arms when you go in and hold on. Now, go ahead. I'll follow. Don't try any tricks and we won't hurt you, see? Thanks, nursey. I wouldn't... Think of it! <laughs> Come here, you! Back in here, sweetheart. <laughs> Oh, dropped your hypodermic. Planning on rocking me to sleep again, huh? Get that go of me. Let, Gee, oh, right, let me tell you something. This is one squirrel that's going to get out of this cage. Yeah. Don't rub my fur the wrong way. My head aches. I'm seeing double. My nerve ends are whipping me to death. And for two cents, I'd punch you square in the nose. Right. Because one thing for sure, you ain't no lady. Now, sit down. Stay there while I put on what's left of my shoes. You better go back to Hartford, little boy. This is big for you. Being around you will make anybody grow old in a hurry. What do you think you're going to do? Right now, I'm going to take your keys, lock you in here with Sleeping Beauty there, and then I'm going after a breath of fresh air. Have fun, the two of you. You can make a peach of a pear. I stumbled through the rest of the building, which turned out to be nothing more than a country house. There were no other rooms like the one I had just vacated. For that matter, there were no other so-called patients. It could have been a place maintained for the purpose of making people talk or keeping them from talking. There was no telephone. I couldn't call out, but neither could anybody call in to find out that something was going wrong. This little crime crib was apparently located well out in the country. That meant that Dr. Doreen Smith had arrived in the car, which I commandeered and drove to the nearest filling station. No longer having in my possession that list of Schmedlick's patients, I flipped through my memory and came up with a single name I had noted in his office. A. A. Aaron. Uh, hello, is uh, Mr. A.A. A. Aaron in, please? It is Aaron speaking. Oh, good. Uh, uh, Mr. Aaron, I'm representing a group of West Coast druggists. I'm making a survey. Uh, where do you have your prescriptions filled? It is at the Enjoy Pharmacy on Beverly Boulevard. Oh, I see. Uh, one more question, Mr. Aaron. I know that in many cases, people go to the pharmacist recommended by their doctor. Is this the case with you? Yes, that is right. Well, thank you, Mr. A.A. A. Aaron. Pardon me, Mr. Anjoy. The clerk up front told me where I could find you. My name is Dollar. I'd like to have a word with you if you have the time. On the basis of ethics, the state of California should have picked up the gentleman's pharmaceutical license and issued him a barber's permit. Mr. Anjoy loved to talk. From the few thousand words he threw at me during the ensuing half hour, I managed to sift the following information. Dr. Schmedlick's prescriptions were usually refillable, dangerous, and habit-forming. I also managed to memorize the names of a few of his patients from the narcotics book. With these tucked into a lonely corner of my cerebral cortex, I limped out into the newborn night. Spence account item seven, 50 cents, having the missing heel on my shoe replaced by late working cobbler. Checking the owners of the first four names drew me nothing but blanks. The fifth... Drew me closer. Come on in. 
Her name was Millicent Royal. She was the kind of girl whose family takes up a full page in the blue book and whose personal habits take up full pages on police blotters. Well, don't just stand there. Come in. Thank you. Sit down. Miss Royal, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm an insurance investigator. I don't want any. You don't understand. I said investigator, not salesman. I want to get a line on a doctor. Otto Schmedlich. You recognize the name? I might, but I'm not sure it's any of your business. Look, little lady, let's quit sparring. I've tailed French Schmedlich this far, and now I want some information. What have you got? Nothing. He's a fine doctor, a wonderful doctor. I don't think he's doing you any good at all. You don't know anything about me. I'm afraid I do, more than you think. I know enough about Dr. Schmedlich to know that he's doing a lot of people a lot of trouble. I want to put him on a business, and you can help me. Oh, look, honey, Schmedlick isn't the one that needs protection. You do. You and the other people on the same spot you're on. Why don't you do yourself some good? I think you better leave now. Okay. Perhaps I'd better drop around to the home of Quincy P. Royal, Bel Air. My father? No, no, don't do that. And give me some answers. You can't make me. Nobody can. Anything that passes between a doctor and his patient is a secret. Nobody can make me say it, not even a judge. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute, wait a minute. All right, all right. If you change your mind, I'm staying at the Park Beverly Hotel. I'll trip them up sooner or later. If I have to, I'm turning it over to the federal men. Narcotics department. Why did I ever let you in here? Get out. Leave me alone. Go away. Please. You can't make me do anything. Well, well, well. Is my estranged wife having a lover's quarrel? No. Get this man out of here. Make him leave me alone. I don't see why I should rescue you from anybody's clutches. But you, I don't like your look, so get out before I bust you in half. You know, you look like just the guy who might be able to do it. Happy honeymoon. My hangover from Dr. Schmedlick's health cure hit me again as I hit the street. What I needed was a hot shower and a cold drink. After the water hit me in the face, and a trifle of the same hit the scotch in my glass, I sat down in the big easy chair in my room, posing for a picture. Johnny Dollar, lonesomest man in town. I was mixed up in something mighty big and mighty wrong, but something I couldn't as yet put a finger on. Up until then, I had to go on with ability, experience instinct, all unacceptable to the police as evidence. I asked myself why I hadn't called the law and told them about my party with the lady doctor and the man nurse. Then I answered myself that if I did, I'd probably be the one charged with assault, battery, and uh, whatever else they wanted to trump up. Again, it would only be my word against that of an established medical man and his doctor-type nurse. So I decided to leave Doreen and her monster-type nurse where they were until I could turn them over to the cops. Four drinks later, I was beginning to realize that those kind of troubles don't drown easily. And then the phone rang. Yeah? Mr. Dollar? Yes, this is Dollar. This is Millicent Royal. I want you to come over right away. Right, right away. Wait a minute. What's the matter? I, uh, I changed my mind. I'll tell you everything. Anything you want to know. Oh, listen, Millicent. Take the advice of an old hand at this sort of thing. If you want to help, tell me now. Over the phone. No! Somebody's always listening. Oh, listen to me. It never fails, Miss Royal. You're playing around with the kind of suspense they like to put into movie scripts. The dame calls with some hot information she's afraid to spill over the phone. Then when the investigator gets there, she's dead. Hurry. Goodbye. I went there. I was right. She was dead. That gave me two people to go looking for. I didn't know where her estranged husband Bill lived, so I went to work on the doctor. His all-night telephone exchange gave me the information that he had called in just before leaving the hospital on his way to the office and could be reached there in 20 minutes. I was apparently closer than he was, so I walked over to the building and up to the fourth floor. There were lights on in the Schmedlick office, so I walked in. What do you want? I came here to see the doctor, Bill, but uh, I was going to get around to you eventually. I just came from your wife's apartment. So did I. That's what I mean. You've got some talking to do. 
I know who you are, but don't go getting any ideas. I didn't kill her. I loved her. It didn't sound like love when I met you in the apartment. We made up right after you left. I went out to get her something from the drugstore. When I came back, she was dead. That's what I'm doing here. I'm waiting here to kill the man who did it. How do you know it was Fedley? Because after you left her apartment, she called the doctor and told him if he didn't stop shaking her down, she was going to tell you the whole story. And he threatened her and she called me. What was the grounds for blackmail? Narcotics? That's right. He got her started on her during the long illness she had. After she was well but still needed the drug, he told her he'd see that her family heard about it. She didn't pay him off. Nice guy. He wrecked us, wrecked our marriage, made a victim of her. And she wasn't the only one. There were others. He made drug addicts out of them and then threatened to blackmail them if they didn't pay off. Can you prove all this? I can't prove it. Nobody can. The cops, the medical association, they've tried. But Schmedlick is clever. Too clever. When I blast that monster out of the world, I'll be curing it of a big sickness. Now, hey, take it easy. Look, I know how you feel, but you haven't got the right answer. Why don't you let me take over? Stay out of it, Dollar. I never belonged to any Boy Scout troops. I'm not joining now. You know what they say, an apple a day? Well, I've got one here for the doctor. You see this? It's left over from Guadalcanal. I sure do see it. A pineapple. Army type. Hand grenade. Well, I'm going to feed it to him. Oh, Bill, now look. I know you're upset, but don't forget. Those things were designed to take care of more than one man. Have you thought of that? I've thought about it a lot, and it still all adds up. I haven't got a thing left to live for. I... Hey. That's him. Bill, Bill, you're off your rocker. Don't do it. Give me that thing. Shut up. Stand away. Uh, what is this? What are you two doing here? Come and get it, Schmedlick. Uh, a bomb. Before the grenade could explode, I did. With one foot, I kicked Bill mightily in the shin bone. Oh. Uh. With a pin pulled, I only had about five seconds. I took two steps, and with the other foot, I kicked the grenade out to the corridor, then I hit the floor. All right. I'll still take you to pieces, Schmedlick. I let Bill go to work on the doctor until he had socked him into a state of unconsciousness. And to save Bill from a murder rap, I did the same for him with a loose, portable typewriter. Sorry, but it's time to typewrite the tagline, William. Oh. P.S. Then I called the police. Expense accounts, item eight. Fifty dollars, airplane rental, Burns Lee Charter Service for a flight to Palm Springs. Item nine, sixty-two dollars. Dinner at the Dunes, party of three. Included in said party, me and Haig and Haig. Expense account, um, item nine, airfare, Palm Springs to Los Angeles, Los Angeles to Hartford, $244.04. Expense account total, $1,211.69. All that for getting rid of a doctor. And if you react the same way you reacted to my last expense account, it'll probably mean that you will be needing a doctor. Signed, uh, yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Willard Waterman, Betty Lou Gerson, Larry Dobkin, Paul Dubov, Georgia Ellis, and Edmund McDonald. The special music is written and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Be sure to be with us next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Stay tuned for Vaughn Monroe and his caravan, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. Paul Masterson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
this case, most of the principals were out on bail. It put me out on a limb. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar, starring Charles Russell. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is just an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. Expense accounts submitted by special investigator Johnny Dollar to Max Krause, Krause Bail Bond and Insurance Agency, New York City, New York. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of two of your clients, or witness, witness, who's got the witness? Or, he said, give me liberty or give me death, and got both. Expense account, item one. One dollar, one cigar, to replace the asphyxiating stogie you were smoking when you arrived unannounced at my Hartford apartment door. My name is Max Krause. Here's my car. Krauss Bail Bond Insurance Agency, State, Federal, and Immigration. All forms of surety bonds and insurance. Got it? <coughs> yeah, I got it. Oh, well, I got a job for you to the tune of saving me $50,000. <coughs> okay, okay, you can come in. Uh, but you'll have to tie up that cigar outside. Okay. Here, better yet, give it to me. Hey, hey. Thanks. Come on in. Hey, what's the idea of throwing it out the window? That was an expensive cigar. Oh, can you think of a better way to get rid of it? It was killing me. Here, have one of these. Hmm? Oh. Ah. Well, not the quality I'm used to, you understand, but much obliged. Forget it. They were a gift. Maybe I won't even charge you for it. If I go to work for you. Well, shall we find out if I will or not? Oh. Sit down. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you know about Leo Persina? <laughs> Just what I read in the paper. Did you put up his bail? I wish I had. Well, the bonds I put up were for two prosecution witnesses. Know what I mean? Yeah. And they either took a run out, jumped from one of the bridges, or some of Leo's men put them out of the way. Get me? Uh, vaguely. They're gone. Yeah, that's right. And unless I can prove they're dead or find them, you understand, before the trial, which is a week from today, I forfeit the 50000 25 apiece. See my problem? Yeah. Huh. Tell me something, Mr. Krause. Why don't you come to me? Well, I'll tell you why. To the police... These witnesses are only two names on a long list of missing persons. You up with me? Uh-huh, yeah. Now, and as for private detectives, I could never be sure that one wouldn't make a deal with Persino and make more money not finding them than I'd be paying to find them. Get the point? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, what makes you think you can trust me? Oh, well, you were mentioned by one of the insurance companies I sell for. They tell me that you're straight, except for padding your expenses here and there. Hmm? Hey, now, that's an insult. Ah, what's a little padding? <laughs> I used to do the same with my old man when I was in grade school. That kid stuff. You'll find out. What's that? I said uh, I'll find out what I can. Who are these lost, strayed, or stolen witnesses? <clears throat> Nippy Cochran is one. Real name is Glenn. You hear? Glenn. Yeah. The other is Dan Patterson. I got their addresses next to Ken. You know what I mean? What else do you need? A big fat retainer, about 2,500 bucks. Ah, that's pretty steep. I've only got a grand with me. It just so happens that I'm a grand person to do business with, Mr. Krauss. I'll take the thousand. Expense account, item two. 345, train fare, Hartford to New York. A high wind and I hit the big city at the same time. 4 p.m. to be exact. So I set storm canvas and tanked cross town toward 81st between Madison and 5th. One of the bits of information that had come with that $1,000 bit of paper was the fact that one of the missing witnesses, Nippy Cochran, had a sister. Stage name, Mona Doyle. She'd been born in Hell's Kitchen and she'd worked out her own little recipe consisting of brains, beauty, and cheesecake to cook up her own version of heaven on earth including Angel's Broadway type. When I hove to in front of her 81st Street brownstone, a delivery boy was buzzing his way into the building. 
Not wishing to argue with Mona over the intercom system on the buzzer panel, I waited for the boy to come out. Caught the door before it closed. Thanks, bub. Went in and up to a second floor apartment. My name is Dollar. You don't know me, but uh, I have some news about your brother. Oh? Just a second, I'll let you in. Come in. Thanks. What's this news you have about Nippy? Oh, well, the uh, guy who put up bail for him, Max Krauss, has hired an insurance investigator to look for him. Oh? Well, what am I supposed to do about that? Ask me to sit down. I'm the investigator. Well, you're awfully clever, aren't you? No, I hire a couple of radio writers to work these things out for me. Well, please do sit down. Thank you. Uh, why did you do it this way? Didn't you think I'd let you in if I knew what you were? Well, lots of people are allergic to what I am. Well, I'm not. That helps. Do you know where your brother is, Miss Doyle? No. No, um, could I fix you a drink? Does that mean that this is the end of our little discussion? Mr. Dollar, I don't know where Nippy is, believe that or not. I haven't seen much of him the last few years. He doesn't approve of me, and I don't approve of him. But that doesn't make any difference. What does is that if I did know where you could find him, I wouldn't tell you. I don't hate him enough to kill him that way. That way? Are you holding out for a choice? Hey! That was a nasty thing to say. Well, that slap you handed me ought to make us even. Don't you know what would happen if you found Nippy and brought him back? Oh, I've heard that Leo Porcina has some quaint habits with people he doesn't want around. Something about wrapping their feet in a concrete block and lowering them into any handy river. Uh, but the law will give him protection until after the trial. What difference would that make? Even if Leo were convicted, don't you think he'd leave orders behind to take care of Nippy? Well, that could probably be worked out, too. Well, look, I wasn't hired to worry about that. I was hired to find your brother so my client won't lose his money. Well... Oh, this is a lousy way for two people to meet, isn't it? I wish it were different. What's that supposed to mean? Well, I'd... I'd like to ask you again to have a drink with me. That wind has my nerves jumping. And you haven't helped. Be a good guy, won't you? With what she had to back up that invitation, I defy any guy, good or bad, to come up with anything but an acceptance. Unless he was crowded in 70... And had a car double parked outside. And was married to a suspicious wife who was waiting in the car. So, I stayed. And we learned to know one another. Twenty minutes later, we were close friends. I knew it had to end. And it did. The door buzzer sounded and Mona bounded over to the little button that controlled the lock on the downstairs entrance. Don't be shocked, Johnny. I brush off a lot of my admirers this way. The only thing I admire about you is the act you put on. It's a good one. I'm glad you enjoyed yourself. There was one thing I forgot to tell you about my brother. I can hardly wait. I'm all ears. He gave me everything I have. Without him, I'd have none of all this. What, is it Nippy who's on his way up here? That isn't what I mean. All Nippy did was introduce me to Leo Porcina. That's who's on his way up. Oh, yeah. Well, blood may be thicker than water, but where you're concerned, it isn't thicker than champagne with ermine on the side. Come on in and see what's on there. Well, what do you know about this? Who's he? Johnny Dollar, an insurance investigator, hired by Krauss to find Nippy. Well, that's interesting. Yes, it is. Oh, boy. What are you going to say for yourself? Matter Harry there said everything there is to say. Except that I'm also looking for the other missing witness, Dan Patterson. Yeah, yeah, I assume that. Very apt, Mr. Dollar, that we should meet this way. Two men interested in the same uh, subject. The subject was more interesting before you came in. I'll ignore that. Natural. What I meant was that I, too, am quite anxious to find Nippy and Patterson. Uh, can I mix you a drink, Leo? No, no, leave us alone, Mona. Go in the bedroom. All right, Leo. And close the door, please. Now, uh, man to man, Dollar, how do you propose to go about finding Nippy and Patterson? <laughs> what would you suggest, Porcina? Dragging the rivers? 
Now, see here, Dollar, there's no need to take such a uh, pessimistic view. Oh, I realized that an unfriendly press has endowed me with a reputation for violence, but I, I don't deserve it. I hope you aren't bucking to be canonized. <laughs> That's a picture, isn't it? St. Leo Porcina. <laughs> Saint. Quite a sense of humor, Dollar. But my motives are honorable. I'm not afraid of the testimony of those two men. I want them back because their disappearance makes it look bad for me. It's the kind of thing that uh, sways public opinion. <laughs> I got nothing against them. I'll believe that when I see the three of you enjoying a nice, friendly game of billiards. Well, yeah, have it your own way. I thought we could form a combination, you and me, to find the boys. But a combination's no good if I trust you and you don't trust me. <laughs> Go ahead, Dollar. Bullet through alone. And good luck to you. Thanks, Leo. I've enjoyed your pack of lies no end. So I put on my top coat, picked up my hat, and left. He didn't shoot me while I was on the stairs, so by the time I felt the sidewalk underfoot, I also felt fairly safe. But not for long. The chauffeur in a limousine parked at the curb took off his uniform cap and put on a hat with an eye-hiding brim. I looked up at the lighted window of Mona Doyle's apartment and saw Leo's figure just slipping out of sight. As I started down the street, the chauffeur was no longer a chauffeur. At a signal from Leo, he had turned into a man who was following me. I grabbed a cab on Madison... And by the time our zigzag trip to Patterson's address was over, I felt reasonably sure that I was no longer being followed. The hall was like a mine shaft and smelled worse. Four doors down on the right, I found the number of Patterson's apartment. Come on in. The man who bid me enter was still wearing the hat with the eye-hiding eye brim. But something new had been added to his right hand, 45 caliber. Leo Porcina's chauffeur hadn't followed me to Patterson's address. He beat me there. Close the door. I don't like to ask foolish questions, but what are you doing here? I live here. Or I did. Oh, Patterson. Oh, great. I'm looking for you, and the way I do it is to try and get away from you. Look, take the little of your right hand, will you? I want to talk to you. Sure, but not here. Let's go someplace. <laughs> For me, that someplace was out. But before I got there, I had time to pass myself a question. What better place for a missing witness to hide than the employ of the guy he was supposed to testify against? Then I found a hiding place of my own. It was nice and dark, but the only person I was hiding from was me, Johnny Dollar. America's fabulous insurance investigator. Fabulous indeed. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, a battle to the finish, and no holds barred as far as words and opinions are concerned. That's only one of the entertaining elements of People's Platform, a Sunday daytime feature on most of these same CBS stations. Attack and defense and attack again. Politicians, labor leaders, statesmen, farm leaders, men and women from all walks of life find themselves going from the frying pan into the fire many times in each Sunday half-hour session. You'll enjoy People's Platform every Sunday on CBS. Now, with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. When my brain started the trip back from unconsciousness, I thought at first I had passed out in one of the tunnels. The air, what there was of it, was thick with the smell of burned gasoline. It was still dark, and it seemed like cars were going past me without headlights. Then I noticed that the tunnel was moving. It took me a long time to figure out that meant it wasn't a tunnel. It was a car, and I was on the floor in the back seat with a blanket covering me. It took two hands and all my strength, but I managed to lift the blanket away from my face. 
The first thing I saw was one of those old-fashioned speaking tubes that sometimes are used between a limousine's rear and driver's seat. It was hanging down, the mouthpiece a few inches from my head. But what was coming out of it was not noise, but that smell of burned gasoline, carbon monoxide. I didn't have to try them to know that all the doors were locked from the outside and that all the glass was unbreakable. From there, it took me only one short mental step to realize that speaking tube was connected to the exhaust pipe, and I was in the process of being executed in laughing Leo Porcina's private gas chamber. There's nothing so exhilarating as being slapped in the face with death. I wrestled a handkerchief out of my breast pocket, twisted it up into a stopper, jammed it into the tube, and clamped my hand over the mouthpiece. It didn't help the air any, but at least it wasn't getting any worse. Then I settled back to wait, trying not to breathe. Chauffeur, leg man, executioner, Dan Patterson. Opened the rear door. When we came to a stop, waited a few seconds for the wind to clear out the fumes, then reached in, grabbed me under the shoulders, and dragged me out. I managed to stay limp until we got a few yards off the road and into, into the brush. Then I dug my heels in and he... It was surprise more than strength that toppled him, but it was no time for niceties. I picked up a handy rock and bashed him one on the head. Danny boy, uh, get with it. You'll catch your death of coal lying on this uh, damp ground. What, what? Oh, dollar. Yeah, dollar, which uh, probably makes you feel like two cents. Listen, I couldn't help what I did. But Leo, it's either do what he tells you to or get it done to you. Oh, save that uh, pitch for the jury, will you? I want some answers. Uh, First, where are we? In New Jersey, about 40 minutes out from the city. Listen, give me a break. I'll, I'll help you all I can. I ought to break your head. Uh, and save your time and effort. There's nothing in that shoulder holster your hand is moving for. I've got it. Now, do I use it or do you tell me where Nippy Cochran is? I don't know. I swear I don't. You've got to believe that. If I knew, I'd sell the information to Leo for plenty. He wants him bad. Yeah, dream boy. I'll just bet you would. Okay, get up. Uh, wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait, what are you going to do? I was hired to find you and I found you. And now I'm going to put you away where you'll keep. Come on. Get up. Listen. Maybe I do know where Nippy is. Why don't you and me? Patterson, I'll have to stop you. I didn't want to fire, but I had to, and fast in the darkness. Aim was next to impossible, but I shot low. I guess it takes more lead than I threw into him to kill a guy who's so full of mental poison. Patterson was alive when I got to him, and alive and conscious when I left him in the hands of the nearest police doctor. Score? One up. One witness found and one still missing. Expense account, item four, 50 cents. Toll paid to get Leo Porcina's lethal limousine across the George Washington Bridge and back into New York City. Expense account, item five, five cents. Phone call soon after I got there. Yes? This is Dollar. Let me speak to Leo. Oh, Johnny. Yeah, sorry to disappoint you, but I'm alive and almost well. Johnny, I don't know what you mean, and I don't care what you think of me. You gotta help me. With what? Nailing my casket together? Nippy's in town. He, he killed Leo. Oh? Well, if it's true, that's a switch. All over the country, defendants are knocking off witnesses, but when I show up, the witness knocks off the defendant. I repeat, if true. It is true. I was with Leo. We, we went from here to his apartment. Nippy came in with a knife, and you gotta help me. I don't know what to do. Well, it's generally a good idea to call the police. Did you? Are you crazy? Probably. Where is Leo's apartment? Do you have to go over there? Well, why not? All right. Pick me up here. I'll take you over. Goodbye. Hmm. Whether she was asking me or telling me, she was right. I must be crazy. I gave myself ten to one odds that my journey would end in a trap. But I've been wrong before. Leo Porcina was in his apartment, all right. Ungracefully spread out on the floor in front of a not quite clean white leather chair. There he is. What are you going to do? Knife wound. Left side of chest. No signs of struggle. 
Where were you? I was in the other room. You didn't see it happen? No, I, I hardly heard anything. I, I didn't even hear Nippy come in. The, the radio was on. I, I heard a mumble of voices that didn't mean anything. And then Leo screamed, Nippy. And I ran in there, and Leo was just falling, and Nippy was watching him go down. I, I wish I knew whether you were bawling because you're grief-stricken or because you're scared. I wish I knew a lot of things about you. Now, come on. Let's go back to your place. And maybe I can find out. Here you are. Johnny Walker for Johnny Dollar. Oh, thanks. Would you also say it's Johnny on the spot? I don't know why I thought I had the right to ask you to help me. Well, I didn't have anyone else to turn to. Oh, you ought to improve your dialogue. I'm not trying to be clever, Johnny. I'm petrified. Nippy knows I saw him. I, I'm the only one that saw him. If, if you could just stay with me until I could get out of town or until this... Until this is cleared up. If I could keep my eyes closed, I'd say you weren't worth it. What you're trying to tell me is that you're afraid Nippy will show up with his dandy little carving set and go to work on you. Is that it? It's an awful thing to say about my own brother, but that's right. I'm afraid he'll kill me. He hates me. He blamed me when Leo kicked him out of the combination. Was he right? Of course not. But I couldn't make him believe me. He swore he'd pay us off. He did. He sold the information that got Leo indicted. and Now he's killed him. You know, that's an interesting point. That he'd go to all the trouble to turn state's witness against Leo and then kill him. Why would he do that? To... I don't know. What you started to say was to make it look as though you killed him, wasn't it? Yes. He'd do anything to hurt me. Johnny, if you, if you only knew... Hold it, hold it. Never mind the dust in my eyes, gorgeous. To frame you, Nippy would have to supply you with a motive. Unless you already had one kicking around someplace. And your silence says you probably have. Johnny... Leo was nailed on tax evasion because it turned out that he had undeclared income deposited in various banks under various people's names. How much is in your account? This much. Not very doesn't take a wizard to add two and two and come up with a motive. With Leo out of the way, there's very little chance that you'll be dragged into court as an accomplice. And I'll mention in passing the bank balance you didn't deny having. I, I know it looks bad, Johnny. Please put your drink down. Well, why not? It's empty. I know it looks bad. I, I'd be in big trouble if the police found out about the account. But do they have to, Johnny? According to all the rules, yeah. I didn't kill him, Johnny got to believe that. I'd like to. You've got to, darling. Don't you think it'd be worth it? There's the money. And there's me. Darling. Oh, Johnny. Get away from me! Well, Johnny, what's wrong? In this case, everything. I've been slugged and gassed. I'd have shoot a man. I missed my dinner. But the worst of all is you. You think because you've got your kind of hair and your kind of eyes and mouth and the rest of it, you're going to hide all your lies and greedy ideas behind them and put a leash on any man you see. Well, it might work with a human being, but I'm not human. I'm an insurance investigator. What are you going to do? I'm going to turn you in for murder. That's what I'm going to do. Operator, operator, get on this thing before I change my mind. Mona didn't really turn on the tears until two men from Homicide took her and tucked her into a squad car. And I didn't warm up to my story until the press arrived. In print, in a very early morning edition that hit the stands at 12.01 a.m., it looked even better than it had sounded. Headline, Insurance Investigator Records Confession of Murderess. Lead. Police, late last night, booked Mona Doyle for the murder of Leo Porcina, racket boss. In an exclusive statement, Johnny Dollar, Hartford, said he was able to record the voluntary confession of the shapely knife killer by means of a tape recorder and a microphone concealed beneath a sofa, thus lifting the suspicion from her brother, Glenn Nippy Cochran, who has been sought for the slaying. The wind was dying, and so was I by the time I got back to my hotel after making one stop at an all-night drugstore for expense account item 7, uh, $1.79, adhesive tape, which might be classified as an odd item, since I didn't, as yet, have any broken bones. 
In my hotel room, I put the tape and the two telephone books, one classified, one general, to what I hoped would be good use, slipped on a dressing gown, and sat down to wait. An hour and ten minutes later, it turned out that I'd waited long enough. Can't say much for his originality. Wait a second. I'll slip on a robe. Okay, Dollar, get back in the room. This is hardly the way to deliver a telegram, is it? I've got a message for you, all right, but it's not in an envelope. I'm Nippy Cochran. Well, hello, Nippy Cochran. That confession you coaxed out of my sister isn't worth the tape it's recorded on. It's phony. The police seem to like it. And nuts. I kill the old porky now. Oh, that's your story, and it could be phony. Look, I'll tell you why the police like Mona's better. Huh? Leo died from a knife wound in the left part of his chest. There were no signs of a struggle. That means he was probably killed by somebody who just walked up to him and pushed. Someone he trusted, a friend. That doesn't fit you, but it fits your sister. I've got the answer to that. It says in the paper that confession of hers lifted the finger off me. The least I can do is take it off her. And you know how that's done. It's a little late for guesswork, Nippy. I'll be killing the same way with the same knife while she's alibied by the police. That'll clear. What's it going to do to you? And if you get close to me, you can believe me. There's going to be signs of struggle this time. I don't have to get close to you. The knife came from the usual place in his collar behind his head. His aim was perfect. I felt the shock just over my heart. But the telephone books I taped to my chest called his number. The knife bounced off and Nippy stood there with his mouth hanging open. Then I found something to throw. Something I could aim just generally. A chair. Ah! He stumbled back from the impact. And before he could collect his wits or his balance, I let him have a barrage. (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) I should have known. A bail bondsman doesn't know the right people. Expense account, item eight. Fifteen dollars, doctor fee. If it wasn't worth it to you, it was worth it to me to get that adhesive tape off by using alcohol instead of violence. Uh, expense account, item nine. Twenty-eight fifty. Replacement of hotel room furniture broken in final brawl. And expense account, item ten, if you don't mind. Three hundred and sixty-seven dollars and twenty-five cents. See enclosed bar, cafe, and theater receipts, buying my way back into the favor of the magnificent Mona. Oh, and you may ask me how I was clever enough to know that she was innocent all that time. I didn't. But I could hope, couldn't I? Um, expense account total, original retainer, not returnable, $500.71. Signed, yours, um, truly... Johnny Walker. I mean, dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Ed Max, Paul Dubov, Sidney Miller, Jim Nusser, and Georgia Ellis. The special music is written and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Be sure to be with us at this same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. It's fascinating, it's challenging, it's something unusual in radio fair. Yes, that's what folks are saying about CBS's popular Sunday program, Invitation to Learning. You'll renew old acquaintances in literature. You'll make some exciting new ones when you make a Sunday afternoon listening habit of CBS's Invitation to Learning. Remember the time every Sunday afternoon over most of these CBS stations. Stay tuned now for Vaughn Monroe and his caravan. They follow immediately over most of these CBS stations. Paul Masterson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. If you're looking for murder, 
I know a guy who can get it for you wholesale. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar, starring Charles Russell. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by special investigator Johnny Dollar. To West Coast Underwriters, San Francisco Branch, attention Bradford L. Coates, General Manager. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of uh, the little man who wasn't all there, or in most cases, there at all, or the unpaid premium payoff. Expense account, item one. Three cents postage due on your airmail special delivery letter containing said assignment. I can just hear you dictating it. Take a letter. To Johnny Dollar, you'll find his address in the files. Dear sir, better make that dear Dollar. Enclosed find copies of letters received by us from one Mr. James Yarbo, period. This man's wife was insured with our company until recently. One day before her death, her period of grace and an unpaid premium ran out. We canceled her policy in the amount of $20,000. Her husband, Yabo, first made every effort to collect, then threatened us. Since then, we've received the enclosed series of letters intimating, without confessing, that he's had a hand in the accidental death of at least 12 of our policyholders to date. The police have been working on it, but they're getting nowhere. If you are available, please come immediately. Uh, uh, yours very truly, uh, so far. Expense account, item two, $176.87. Airfare, Hartford to San Francisco. Item three, 540. Cab fare, airport to your office. Dollar, glad you got him. You've no idea what okay, a mess is Okay, thing. okay, Mr. Coates, okay, don't get excited. We'll nail this guy before you run out of policyholders. Well, the dozen he's apparently done away with already have cost us darn near a quarter of a million. You've got to move fast, Dollar. The man is a homicidal maniac. Yeah, but a smart one, though. He's put just enough in those letters to, he sent you to let you know that he's working on a grand-scale revenge against your company. But he leaves out just enough so the law can't lock him up. He's had perfect alibis in every case. Uh, look, uh, Mr. Coates, tell me, have all these deaths been local right around here? No, they've been all over California. Mm -hmm. Well, one other thing, the method. From this list you gave me, Mr. Yarbo seems to have a preference for killing people through the noisy and gory method of fake automobile accidents. Yes, very true. But what about this last one? Airplane crash. That was a $30,000 loss to us. Uh, just think. Our poor, innocent policyholder flying around and then his engine quit. Thanks to a man he's never even seen. Tell me, Mr. Coates, <sighs> just how difficult would it be to get a list of your California policyholders? Names and addresses, you know. Why, that would take days. But goodness gracious, man, you can't hope to keep an eye on them all. Besides, the minute you went off the job, he'd strike again. That's a preposterous Whoa, idea. Cut time... Look, I don't want the list. I was just wondering how Yarbo got it. Oh. Now, so far you've given me nothing to go on. I'd like you to add two things to that. Yarbo's home address and a $50,000 life insurance policy made out to me. What on earth is that for? Well, look, in the first place, if we're going fishing for Mr. Yarbo, I might as well be the worm. In the second place, if I should get gobbled up in the line of duty, that $50,000 life insurance would make several attractive young ladies of my acquaintance very happy. Not, mind you, as happy as I can make them by remaining alive. Expense account, item four. Thirty dollars. Rental of limousine complete with chauffeur. I figured if I was riding the trouble, I was riding in style. So I started on a house-to-house -house survey. You might say... Knocking at death's door. Yes. What is it, the police? Oh, uh, I'm sorry to bother you, Mrs. Chianelli, but I'm from the insurance company. Oh, yes. It'll only take a moment. One question about your son. Oh, poor Angelo. What do you want to know about my poor son? He will drive away in his automobile. That's all. I'll never see him in life again. Yes, I, I know. Uh, tell me, Mrs. Chianelli, 
Did you ever hear your son mention a man named Yarbo? Yarbo? Yeah. Yarbo. I don't know about no such Yarbo. Not please. Please believe me. There was so much sadness in my house. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Dykes? Yes. I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm from the insurance company. About your son's plane crash. Oh. I thought all those details had been taken care of. But just one thing, Mr. Dykes. Did your son ever mention a man named Yarbo? Yarbo? Yeah. That's an unusual name. I'm sure if he had, I would have remembered. Okay, sir. I'm sorry to bother you. And thanks. <laughs> Yes, sir. May I help you? Yes, I'd like to have a word with Mrs. Weatherly. I'm from the insurance company. Well, sir, Mrs. Weatherly has been indisposed, not receiving visitors. What is it, Brian? Uh, How do you do, Mrs. Weatherly? My name is Johnny Dollar. Oh, dear, dear. Uh, You may go, Brian. Oh, I'm ashamed to let you see me in this condition, Mr. Dollar. Just ashamed. But you understand. I I do indeed. It was bad enough. The accident, I mean. But the scandal! Oh, oh, I'll never be able to hold my head up again. Yes, and no. If Harvey had to get himself in an automobile accident, why, oh, why, I ask you, did he have to have that awful Mrs. Barclay in the car? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, it was very unthoughtful of him, yes. uh, Mrs. Weatherly. Would you mind answering one question? Well, if I can. Did your husband ever mention a man named Yarbo? Well, no. No, he never mentioned a man named Yarbo. But neither did he ever mention Mrs. Barclay. I tried a half a dozen of the other beneficiaries left behind by Mr. Yarbo's list of victims. All I got out of it was a very watery afternoon. The tears were falling like monsoon time in Burma. But of information, I got none. This brought me right smack up to a point I didn't want to have to reach. The point of contacting Mr. Yarbo in person. At 8.30 that night, I took a plan on Yarbo's house on Lombard Street. At 11.30, I saw the lights go out, as did Yarbo. He was a little guy, stooped over like he was looking for cigarette butts on the sidewalk, needing a haircut, and, true to type, wearing a long black overcoat. But worst of all was the little satchel he was carrying... Items like this always set off a chain reaction in my imagination, and I could just see him on his way to atomizing the Oakland Bay Bridge, thus causing the biggest automobile accident in history. I very cleverly forced my way into the house by breaking a first-floor window, reaching in and opening same. Cyclops' eye of my flashlight started picking up information on the subject of Mr. Yarbo immediately. The room I had entered looked like the Hobby Lobby of an English Bobby, a crime museum if I ever saw one. On one wall, a gun case. On another, a crime library. And scattered around the room, a grisly collection, ranging from blood-stained hatchets to shrunken heads. But the most surprising criminal curio of all stood right behind me. Mr. Yarbo, complete with little black bag. Well, well, I must say, the current second story man dresses well, but I must also say you, my man, must have the old masters of the art turning in their graves. For you, young man, are a heavy-fingered bungler. Sir, let's have a better look at you. Now, that flashlight, I'll feel better after you've dropped it. Hey, what am I doing? You're not even pointing a gun at me. Don't feel too comfortable, You are well covered from many points. A step from you in any direction may detonate any number of explosive devices. Uh, Why did I have to pick this joint to burgle? I feel like a city councilman playing a call in the White House. You seem more the kind of a guy I should be working for instead of on. What's your racket? Racket? You were in a racket, my little friend. My pastime is a science. Yes, I I take it you are impressed with my collection. Uh, uh, who, Who wouldn't be? Well... If you're interested, come here. Uh, about 
those booby traps. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. Note well the design of the rug. The large roses. Avoid stepping on them for the time being. Oh, great. And I was in here stumbling around in the dark. May your good luck continue. But look, look here in this case, the small vial on the right. That was purloined for me to order from the famous Black Museum in Scotland Yard. That little vial once rested in the case of the fabulous murderer, Dr. Crippen. And there, beside it, that lock of hair, mm-hmm. that is from the head of the second victim of the noted mass murderer, Neil Cream. And up there, look up there, the hangman's noose over the mantel, from that one swung the body of the notorious western bad woman, Fanny Turner. Oh, uh, how's chances for running this place for Halloween? Well, well, all right, then, since you no longer seem interested in playing the part of a bungling burglar, then I assume that I am also free to discontinue my pose as a victim of your disguise, Mr. Johnny Dollar. Oh, ah, looks like the chips are down and I'm the fish. Yes. And there are a lot of other fish in your sea, Mr. Dollar. Poison eels, that's what you are, the lot of you. Parasites, gambling on death, and then not paying when you lose. Uh, listen, Mr. Yarbo, you're placing a big hunk of blame where it doesn't belong. You're confused about things. Confused? Yes. When your wife's insurance premium was overdue, you were allowed a 30-day period of grace. And when that went by, the policy was canceled. Now, that's not the insurance company's fault. It was your fault. But it wasn't. I gave her the money. She spent it on herself. I'd have made it up. I told them so after she died. I told them, but they wouldn't listen. I'll show you. I'll show you. The Arbo looked like he was headed to show me the chopping end of an axe laying on top of a small table. I hit him just as he hit the table. As he hit the floor, I noticed what I was standing on. One of those big red roses in the carpet. It hadn't exploded yet, but that was one flower I wasn't standing around waiting to see bloom. It took a lot of nerve picking up a telephone in that room. But I finally got a good hold on my nerves and a fair hold on an imitation of Yarbo's voice. Took one deep breath and picked up the phone. Yes? Hello, James. This is Martha. I'm at the office. I have good news. Two more. Mr. and Mrs. Granville Morse. Killed tonight on the Great Highway. Two miles south of Seal Rock. 8.45 tonight. Ran into a post. Both killed. Insured for a total of 80000 I gotta go now. Goodbye, Jane. Well, congratulations, Brother Yarbo. Two more at 8.45 tonight. And who's your new alibi? Me. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, did you ever think of and as a comedy word? Maybe not, but you'll get a full demonstration on CBS this Wednesday night. There'll be Groucho Marx and his guest on that hilarious quiz, You Bet Your Life. For it's the guests who sometimes floor Groucho with their wisecracks. There'll be Bing Crosby in his regular Wednesday night CBS show and his special guest, Bob Hope. There'll be George Burns and Gracie Allen and Bill Goodwin. And, and becomes more filled with comedy when you tell or learn that Lum and Abner will have their premiere as Wednesday night regulars on most of these same CBS stations. Yes, this fall, you hear them all on C and B and S. Now, with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Yarbo might have been lying unconscious on the floor, but in that setting, I was still afraid of him. I'd have looked the place over with a fine tooth comb, only having none, I used my hands. I put the pat test to Yarbo's pockets for a gun. He was unloaded. Then turned my attention to the little black bag he'd been carrying when I saw him leave the house, and which he still had with him when he returned. I hoped it wasn't booby-trapped. Opened it and discovered that it was a trap the type my kind of booby stepped into. Inside the bag was a small radio receiver tuned to something I looked for and found in the room. A small radio transmitter of the type formerly used in army tanks. Through this, Yarbo had heard me enter his little museum of murder 
and had returned to catch me in the act of prowling the premises. About then, I caught him in the act of coming to. Well, welcome home, Yarbo. Time to get up. I just had a long chat on the phone with Martha. She thought I was you. You think you're very clever, don't you? Martha knows my voice. If she talked to you at all, she didn't tell you anything. Of that I am sure, so save your breath. There is no use your telling me she gave you any information. Oh, no, you got me wrong, pal. I only told you Martha called to let you know I know there is a Martha. I figured it might make you nervous, and nervous men are easy to beat. Other nervous men may be easy to beat, Dollar, but not James the Arbo. The police have tried, and they couldn't prove a thing against me. Now, may I have your permission to get up? Yeah. Maybe the police haven't been able to get anything on you, but I have something. Attempted murder. The hatchet you went for. <laughs> the pitiful mistake of a pitifully suspicious mind, Dollar. I wasn't reaching for that hatchet on the table. I was trying to show you something in the table drawer. There it is, spilled out on the floor. My wife's insurance policy. The one your unscrupulous thieving superiors refused to pay. The vampires. Here, look at it. All in order. Much of it in fine print. Fine. Just fine. <laughs> okay, Yarbo, that did it. Come on, ahead of me. Uh, where are we going? To find some place to lock you up. I was hired to stop you, and until I do, I'm at least going to try and slow you down. Now move. Uh, Linen closet. No room here. Come on. Bathroom. No window. Yeah, this will do. Go on, get in there. No, 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 not in here. Anywhere but in here. It's a good place. You may get thirsty. No, no, no. This is where my wife died. Not in here. No. Which, on the surface, may seem to have been a move on the cruel side. But Yarbo was a man obviously off his rocker, and I needed him more nervous than I already had him. Too nervous to attempt killing any more people. Expense account item five, a nickel. Phone call, downtown office, state police. A Mr. and Mrs. Granville Morse had indeed crashed to their death on the great highway south of Seal Rock at 845, which made the lady with the early telephone news flash, Martha, a gal with whom I wanted an early date. <laughs> Hello? Uh, what is it? Hello, Mr. Coates. This is Dollar. Uh, oh, yes, Dollar. What do you want? Well, first I want to tell you that you just lost two more policyholders. List price, 80000 Oh, good Lord. This is terrible. Who, how, what... Never happened? mind that. I've also got something else. On the good side, I need your help tonight. Uh, of course. Anything. What can I do? Meet me at your office. You and I are going to go looking for a dame named Martha. Martha? Martha who? I don't know but I hope she works for you. I'll be there in a half hour. Make that 20 minutes, and you'll be 10 minutes closer to happy days. The office personnel records of the West Coast underwriters turned up not one, but three employees named Martha, which gave me three choices as to who had been supplying Yarbo with a list of West Coast policy, insurance, policy holders. Finding the exact Martha was even easier. On the phone, she had told me that she was calling from the office. And the night elevator operator's in and out book showed the signature of one Martha Kinsey. And I just couldn't wait to hear her report. Who is it? I've got a message from Mr. Yarbo. Oh, just a minute. Message from James? Oh, what does he want? Well, what he really wants is to get out of the bathroom. That's where I've got him locked up. Who are you? You ought to know who I am. I assume you're the one that told Yarbo he could be expecting a call from an insurance investigator named Dollar. Well, that's me. Well, I don't care. James told me girls give out lists of names all the time. Sell them for mailing lists. Ten cents apiece. May not be ethical, but it's not against the law. James told me, and I believe James. Oh, he's the smartest man I ever knew. Well, he may be the smartest, but he's right in line to be numbered among the deadest. One of these fine mornings, the state is going to give him a cyanide egg for breakfast. What do you mean? 
You should know. Murder, execution, gas chamber. Well, you can't prove a thing. James told me so, and he knows. Well, he's smart. I hope he's not smart enough to pick a lock with a bath mat. Now, come on, sit down. You and I are going to have a nice, long talk. We are not. I won't say a thing. I don't have to, unless you have a warrant, an indictment, and a court reporter. James told me so. Yeah, I know. He's smart. But no matter what he told you, you're going to tell me a few things. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. So, I was wrong. Martha didn't tell me anything. But her stubborn attitude did. She was in love with Mr. Yarbo, a stupid middle-aged woman having her last fling at romance, doing her best to keep her last chance alive in the person of the man who had made her his partner in crime. As crazy as it was, this grotesque pair of lovebirds created the only real emotion in the case to date and switched my thoughts from the widely scattered deaths which had brought me into the case and over to the single death of Yarbo's wife, and closed, find a transcript of statement made to me at 2 o'clock in the morning by the doctor who signed Mrs. Yarbo's death certificate. Cause of death, cerebral hemorrhage, result of severe fracture of skull, region medulla oblongata, contributing factors, woman bathing in bathtub at home, slipped and fell, striking head on shower spigot. Gone is finding death due to misadventure. Accidental. It took the doctor two minutes to get around to making that statement. I figured it would take Martha at least 30 minutes to get her hair out of her curlers and make herself presentable enough to risk being seen on the street. That left me 28 minutes to get back to Yarbo's house before she did. And I didn't need half that long. In the cab on my way over, I took inventory. One, to date, Yarbo's alibis covering him on all the so-called revenge murders had been perfect. Too perfect. Second, when I first faced Yarbo, he screamed about his wife's death, not in the light of having lost his lady love, but in the light of having lost her insurance money. Just as my third and most important conclusion came upon me, the taxi came upon our destination, and I had to go to work. Once inside the little horror house on Lombard Street, I got set for a long search. But it turned out to be a short one, and it proved two things. Yarbo was not only a murderer, he was as crazy as he'd acted, and having kept the evidence around... Okay, Yarbo, come on out. Well, I hope you have enjoyed your waste of time, Mr. Dollar, as I've enjoyed my chance for meditation. You saw Martha, I suppose? Yes, I saw Martha. Bless her silent little soul. Yes, I was sure of Martha. She believes in me. Uh, you can say that again. Come on out here. Mr. Dollar, I suppose you are aware that this is the second time tonight you've been guilty of breaking and entering. I am, however, willing to forgive that should you come to your senses and decide to go back to Hartford and leave me alone. Uh-uh. Oh. Mm. Um, mind treading on the roses in the rug, Mr. Dollar? Sorry, Yarbo. I fell for that gag earlier tonight. People who smile at that joke give me the last laugh. Now, look, Yarbo, I know exactly what you've been up to, and I know why you've done it. But your little war of nerves has got to stop. It will never stop. No one can prove anything against me. I can. I can prove that you haven't done a thing to bring about those accidental deaths you've been taking credit for. Martha has sat down that insurance office, uh, office and notified you every time there's been an accidental death of a policyholder in this part of the country. Then you've written the company your little letters and gotten your little kicks out of it, right? That's a lie, lie, lie. This is a switch, a guy yelling that loud that he's guilty. You'll have to prove it. You will have to prove it. Don't worry, chum. I'm not going to waste a breath proving murders that you didn't commit. But, brother, I'm really going to go to town on the one that you did. Your wife, Mr. Yarbo. Oh, that is the most ridiculous statement you have yet made, young man. Look around you. Take note. I have profited by all the mistakes made by the original owners of these bloody souvenirs from Dr. Crippen on down. You will see in me the living composite of them all. And I intend to stay that way, alive. I'm afraid you will, but it's going to be inside an upholstered room. And this is what will put you there. Oh, God. Yeah, Mr. Yarbo, you carried your little hobby of crime souvenirs too far when you saved this hunk of pipe and the faucet with which you clubbed your wife to death. She slipped and fell. She was in the tub. I'm sure the police microscopes can give you a strong argument on that one. Now, come on. 
Now, let's make it easy on each other, shall we? No, no, I didn't do it. I, I didn't do it. Let go. Whoa. Let go of me. You, you have to fool me. Help me, Martha. Help me. Hit him with something. I'd have bet on myself against the two of them if I didn't have to fight while playing hopscotch over those roses in the carpet about which I still wasn't quite sure. It was touch and go. Martha would try to touch the back of my head with something, and I'd go. Do something, Martha! Do something! I'll fix him, I'll fix him. Something Martha tried to do was pick up a heavy-based urn and aim it at me. <sighs> she missed. It started to roll across the rosy carpet. When Yarbo saw where it was headed, he wrenched himself loose and dove through <laughs> the carpet. I dove the other way. He got there just too late. <laughs> I didn't have to look twice to know he was dead. Fate had called James Yarbo up on his own carpet. When Martha threw that urn at me, it had rolled straight for the only rose in the rug that had been booby traps. Which only goes to prove that sometimes a rose by any other name can be anything but sweet. Expense account, item six. A dollar and 40 cents. Three month subscription, Love Life magazine. Sent to accessory to murder, Martha Kinsey. To Hatchaby State Prison. I figured three months was about all she had. The judges and juries in California being rather efficient that way. Expense account, uh, item seven. Six bucks. Dinner and diving for pearls in a barrel of blue points at Fisherman's Wharf. Diving for Pearl's earring, which she lost while bending over the barrel trying to see what oysters looked like. Uh, item eight, $176.87. Airfare, San Francisco to Hartford. Uh, expense account total, $942.08. Not including defense lawyer fees if you decide to sue me for not being able to add correctly. Signed, yours, uh... Truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Jay Novello, Martha Wentworth, Paul Dubois, Gigi Pearson, and Larry Dobkin. The special music is written and conducted by Wilbur Hatt. Be sure to be with us at this same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Everyone is concerned about world affairs these days. If we want world peace, we'll have to have national peace first. In order to keep America's strength and prestige, in order to preserve her freedom, we must do away with group prejudice. Let's stop judging people by the color of their skin or the place where they worship and start considering them for what they do. We'll be sure to have a happier world. Stay tuned now for Vaughn Monroe and his caravan, following immediately on most of these PBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I took this case on a savage island off the coast of New Guinea was that I'd been having a bout with a bottle of old fairy godmother, and I was hoping to run into a native who would shrink my head.
This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Seven Seas Maritime Underwriters Association, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Enos McArdle, General Manager. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my assignment on the island of Tinu Tan, or south of the equator, things can get hot in more ways than one. Or, Mother, call my draft board. I'm leaving the country again. <laughs> Expense account, item one, $830.81. Uh, and three and a half shillings. Airfare, Hartford, Connecticut, to Port Moresby, territory of Papua, island of New Guinea. That's a long trip, brother. And by the time I got there, I felt that my spine could use a new seating arrangement. Expense account item two, $36.80. New outfit, consisting of bush jacket, linen shorts, and a pith helmet. Item three, two bits. The street beggar regarding location of building in which was situated the Port Moresby branch of the Seven Seas Maritime Underwriters Association. Oh, him, long, long house, him, long, white fella. Little way, big bit, money, money. You catch him sleep, long side, hurry, hurry. You hear joyous, big fella buckets, you fight him cry. Him, long, long house, blown from there, no? No. Thanks a lot. I'll go look it up in a telephone book. Oh. <laughs> Yes, sir, I'm Mr. Narky, and it's lovely having you here, Mr. Dollar. I wish I could say the same about being here. Oh, now you get used to it. Ah, I don't expect to be here that long. Cool. You're a feisty one, aren't you? You have a very large job to do. Mm Mm-hmm. Let's just say I'm usually very lucky. Look, first, let me tell you what I've been told so far, and then if I've left out anything, you fill me in, okay? That'll be ticky-boo, Mr. Dollar. Your company issued a group insurance policy to the Grand East Development Corporation in the United States. Now, that company used $50,000 life insurance policies as part of the inducement to get executives and divers for their pearling fleet. That's right. Well, about a month ago, they got word that the bodies of two of their six-man crew on the island of Tinu Tan had been found hacked to pieces. The other four men were missing, which adds up to a possible insurance payoff of $350,000. That's what I'm doing here, and that's all I know. Well, that's all there is to know. Uh, Oh, dandy. Has anybody done anything? What about the police? Uh, They got their own troubles right here in the port. And as for the government officials, they'll look into it the next time around. Uh, It should be in about 90 days. Oh, fine. That leaves you. What have you been doing to earn your money? Waiting for me? Well, you could put it that way, Mr. Dollar. Why haven't you gone over to Tenu Tan? Well, now you might say that I'm I'm just not a man of great courage, eh? Hey, but say, I can help you to get there. Oh, thanks. Heaps. Hey, ahoy there, aboard the kitty wake. I'm looking for Captain Steve Granger. That's me. Come on aboard. Captain Granger, I'm Johnny Dollar. Pleased to meet you. Mr. Narkey of the Seven Seas Maritime Underwriters tells me you might be available for a charter job. Where to? Tinu Tan. Well, well, I guess so. Now, this is a big boat. It'll cost you big money. Narkey says your prices are fair. When do we leave? Tide will be ready by five. I can't be too. Good. I'll go get my toothbrush. Good. And since you're going to ten, you ten, he might also bring one other thing. A forty-five. The Kitty Wake was a two-masted schooner, and it skimmed the swell of the Arufa Sea like a saltwater bird after which it was named. I guess I'm like most guys. When I'm standing on my sea legs, I suddenly feel like a giant, standing alone against the world. 
Romance is no longer a sleazy blonde in a tinny bar. All of a sudden, it's all stars and sky, horizon. And when the wind and the water start to sing their song to me, any bad in me decides to reform. I was standing on top of the deckhouse like uh, Captain Horatio Hornblower, with my legs spread and my outstretched hands gripping a pair of backstays. Or at least that's what I think they were. And just about the time I'd reached the decision to trade my Hartford apartment for a berth on a Macassar purling lugger, I heard a footstep from out of the night behind me. Fair passage, eh? Huh? Oh. oh, yeah, Captain. I guess you caught me dreaming. A waste of time. This is the only place where dreaming can't possibly be as good as living. It's none of my business, but this sudden jump in 10 year 10 tourist trade, what's it all about? What do you mean, sudden? Well, this is the first time I've ever taken one passenger there, let alone two. Two? Yeah, another guy came to me after you did. He's below deck. Oh. Well, that ought to make you happy. It'll cut you fair in half. About that, I'll just let the guy who pays my expenses be happy. As for me, I like privacy. Who was this guy? Look, Tyler, I didn't ask you any questions, did I? Well, I didn't ask him any. <laughs> My racket, coincidence, is just another name for trouble. I wanted to get a look at and trade some words with my suddenly acquired fellow passenger, but he wasn't having any. He stuck to his cabin, claiming seasickness. However, from the native galley boy, I learned that he was eating like a horse, which in my book was a new way of being seasick. I borrowed a copy of Western Story magazine from the skipper, crawled into my bunk, and let the kitty wake rock me to sleep. Next morning and afternoon were as uneventful as they were beautiful. At sunset, we raised the island of Tin Yutan. All right, boys. Here's where you go to work. Out all sails. We'll go in under power. Hey, Beaky. Here's the crew of the ship. We've got an up help back here. Beaky, don't move. Hey, plate that line. Don't leave it just lying in a big heap. The big gas engine took over where the wind dropped us, and Captain Granger stood at his wheel, outfencing the submerged swords of coral with the slim prow of the kittiwake. The ship had only inches of elbow room as we chewed our way through the boiling white passage of the reef, and my heart felt suddenly becalmed as we finally achieved the peaceful waters of the lagoon, which had protected Let's go to the power anchor! Hey, never mind that anchor. All bets are off. We're getting out of here. Captain Steve Granger looked like a hard man to scare, but what I saw up ahead on the beach would scare a hard man. A broken body of a shipwrecked curling lugger, and hanging from its foremast, the elongated body of a native who had been strangled out of one paradise and into another. Stranger spun the wheel to starboard, and the kitty wake started a retreat. But it wasn't that easy. Cut your power, Granger, and straighten out your rudder. We're staying here. Finally getting a chance to meet my fellow passenger. I couldn't very well shake hands with him, though, because he had a gun in each one of them. What the devil's your game, Keeney? I said cut your power. Got it! Keep that crew of Kanakas up forward. If you don't, we could use a few less natives around here. Hey, by the clock, clock, it's time Use to English. Me. I want to know what you're telling them. You, Dollar, get back there by the wheel. Keep your boys back there, Granger, I warned you. All right, you think I won't pull your bluff? Who oh, got cuts? No, no, I'm native, you ugly pig. You can't stop the other two, I can. Now, maybe you'll tell me what you were saying to him. I told him there was a crazy man aboard and to go over the side. They decided to protect me. They didn't make it. Now lay this rowboat in close to the beach and drop your hook. We're staying. <laughs> One Matt Keeley, 
Two guns and what was left of 12 bullets had me outnumbered. I decided the best thing I could do was stay quiet and stay alive. And apparently the skipper felt the same way. After we dropped anchor, Keeley herded us into the small boat and we rowed him ashore. His gun shoved us up a path through a grove of Nipa palms and into a clearing. First natives I saw there were even deader than the ones we had just left on the kitty wake. About a dozen of them in a semicircle. And what added up to the red-crusted craters on our naked, withering bodies was sticking out of a window in a small wooden tin-roofed hut. The water-cooled barrel of a 30 caliber machine gun. South Sea Island magic, huh? Oh, I heard you were a wise guy. Well, that can be changed. Now, come on, inside, both of you. Really, my friend. <laughs> Why, you're shooting over the water. What's the matter? Big trouble you have getting here? Huh? Yeah, no, Porch. There's little ones. This big blonde guy's a skipper. We got his boat and it's a good one. Ah. This other one, yeah, he's an insurance investigator. Oh, see. <laughs> yeah, Portez, I'm your new nursemaid. The insurance company sent me out here to look you up and take care of you. I hope I get around to it. My way. Hey, Keeley, what's that you say? You got my boat. Yeah, don't worry, big boy. We're going to pay you for it. We might even go as high as $500. Oh, that's <laughs> great. It's only uh, worth $50,000. Well, having 500 alive is better than 50000 dead, my friend. Right, what's <laughs> your pitch? Yeah, it's simple. We want off this island. We got a long way to go. Cortez, me, and the native girl. She's in the next room. We may have to stay at sea for a couple of months. Not on my ship. Use your head, you won't get hurt. Oh. Hey! Hey, you woman! Get back in there! No, I stay. Really put her away. Keep her out of here. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah, for such an ugly broad, she sure has got a pretty name. Papa Liar. Well, Dollar, you've seen yourself a South Sea Island princess. She's your day, Keely, not mine. Kind of boy, Dollar. They do look like they were meant for each other. Save your one for your sails, Granger. Now, what about your boat? Do we get it with a bill of sail or without one? Either way, it's all right with me. If you'll take what goes... With Cortez out of the room with Nature Girl, Granger's move looked like a good one. I was halfway across the room to make it two against one for the right side when the odds snapped back to even money again. Cortez came rushing back to join the fray, and he started fighting when he was five yards away. Just about then, Nature Girl came charging out of her quarters, swinging a chair over her head. I'd just gotten in position to shoot a right hand at Keeley's chin, when another shot from Cortez's gun put me strictly on my own. I caught Granger square in the forehead, and he went down without a sound. I had time for one more try. <laughs> Keeley's chin telegraphed a knockout message. Da-da-da, da-da-da, KO, bank up my arm. But something was wrong. Oh, I passed out. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first... 50,000 or more, always in the jackpot on Sing It Again. Music by Gene Autry and Vaughn Monroe. Music and thrills with Gangbusters, Philip Marlowe, Johnny Dollar, and Danny Clover, the Broadway cop. That's the one-way ticket to top fun on most of these CBS stations every Saturday night. This fall, when you hear them all on CBS, Saturday nights promise top music, top adventure, and a chance at radio's top prize. Now, with our star, Charles Russell... We return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. It was a beautiful dream while it lasted. It wasn't night, it was morning. I was in a hammock slung between two banyan trees framed in hibiscus bushes. Someone was bathing my face with a cool, damp, gardenia-scented cloth. A tame parrot was feeding me toasted pumpkin seeds as a smooth-skinned, soft-skinned, cafe au lait-skinned, half-caste, and all-woman-type girl gazed into my eyes and cooed softly in my ear. 
This doll would make Dorothy L'Amour look, look like an Irish washerwoman. And the boots she was wearing a short around. Oh, poor, poor man. Please to wake up. Hey, it wasn't a dream. It was really happening. Everything was there. All but the parrot and his lousy pumpkin seeds. And who needed him? Oh, poor, poor man. Please to wake up. Well, uh, where am I? Uh, Studio One? Huh? Uh, who are you? I, I thought you were talking in my sleep. I am Punta. Oh, this is awful. Awful? Yeah, this all reminds me. My copy of Tales of the South Pacific is 17 days overdue at the Hartford Public Library. How? Forget it. Uh, where am I? What am I doing here? And, and who are you? I am Punta. You were brought here by the Princess Papalaya from the village of Great Day. Oh, well, that place isn't hard to remember. Wish I could forget it. Uh, the princess! The one with the, the droopy ears, the long feet, the flat nose, the pot belly, the, the bad complexion and dirty hair? <laughs> yes, she is here. <laughs> She's a doll. Last time I saw her, she was swinging a chair at my head. Oh, no. She hit other fella on head after he hit you. She saved you. <laughs> she liked you. She tell me save you for her. Oh, what a way to die. Why didn't she hit me over the head with a chair? Hey, you speak pretty fair English. Where'd you pick it up? My father was Chinese merchant on island of New Guinea. Same time as the war. You like G.I.? I I certainly do. Sorry I didn't bring a Hershey bar. Uh, But tell me, why did the uh, Princess Papaya, uh, whatever her name is, why did she save me? I tell you. She liked you. Oh, stop saying that. Uh, all I want to know is, what was she doing with Keely and Portez? You know Keely and Portez, don't you? Yes, I know them. They bad. I work in village until they make the great death. They kill all their friends and many natives. They bad. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. What was that all about? They die for Pearl here for a long time. The native boy, they do not like these men. They do not die anymore. So these bad men steal all Pearl first. Then they steal princess to make boy dive some more. Oh, kidnap, ransom, more pearls. What is this, ransom? Oh, that means they'll hold the princess and won't give her back until they get what they want. Oh. But, uh, dream girl, for me, a scheme like that wouldn't work with a gal like you. Oh. Uh... Now, just holding you would be getting what I want. <laughs> Only one thing wrong, my knees were getting a little knobby, thanks to a combination of insects and my new white linen shorts. However, Punta was good nerve medicine. The rest of the story came out later, and in her soft voice, it was a bloody kind of lullaby. She crewed me to sleep with the facts that the natives had tried to rescue their princes from Keely and Portez, which gave me an answer for that semicircle of machine gun bodies outside their shack. Also, that the princess had taken temporary refuge up in the hills. As nearly as I could figure out, I was left facing a very peculiar problem. Two men out of six insured men had killed the other four, and the two murderous survivors had this much going for them. To the insurance company, they were still worth $50,000 apiece on the hoof, which meant that my job was to keep alive two guys I felt very much like killing. And believe me, they felt the same about me. And with these beautiful, happy, restful thoughts, I left the call for darkness and went back to sleep. And who do you think I wound up with in my dreams? That hokey old parrot and his lousy pumpkin seed. Johnny, Johnny, it's time to get up. Huh? Oh. Hurry from your sleep, Johnny. Um. There is more trouble. Huh? Hey. Somebody's getting strafed. What's going on? They are killing again with their machine gun. My people trying to fight them off the island, but they are being killed. <laughs> now you must go and lead my people. Help them kill those bad men. This you won't understand, Gorgeous, but my job is to stop your people and save Keely and Portez. Johnny, you say that now? You are one of them. No, I'm not one of them. I told you you wouldn't understand. There's something I don't understand. <laughs> Why don't they leave? They've got what they want. Why don't they pick up their pearls and the schooner and the rotten hides and get out of here? Johnny, they do not have the pearls. Here, see? This one is for you. 
black. Wow. You say for me? Where'd it come from? The princess. She come back some time ago. She tell me she took all their pearl. She tell me to tell you that this black pearl, not company pearl, this her own for you. She like you. Oh, I like her, too. Just the way she is, up in the hills. Right now, I wish you looked like her. Oh, Johnny. You don't like the way I, I look like I am? I love the way you look like you are. Why you say that? <laughs> Because if you did look like her, I think I'd have an idea that would stop those men. Yeah. Turn around. Yes, John. Oh, this'll be the crime of the year, but maybe I can do it. And I did. I gave Punta a thorough loss of beauty treatment. With the help of padding, dye, mud, and other jungle cosmetics... I had, at the end of an hour, a reasonable facsimile of Papalaya, the unprettiest princess in the history of royalty. I briefed the suddenly uglified Punta on what she was to do and had her lead me most of the way back to the fortress shack in the clearing. She put a few words on the jungle grapevine, and by the time they reached the end, the native side of the battle, the home team, ceased activities. Hey, Keely! Hortense! Time! Cut! Hold it! There's nobody here to shoot at but me, and I want to talk. Stay where you are, Dolly. Don't move. We'll shoot at anything we hear moving. Brother, we're getting so we can play this thing by ear. Yeah? Close enough? See what we mean? Now, what do you want? The princess has the pearls, and I've got the princess. I want to make a trade. What kind of trade? You'll get the princess and the pearls... We get rid of you, all this killing stops, and you're alive. We're supposed to believe you got the princess? You don't have to, but here's something you can believe. You'll never get it this way. Sooner or later, you're going to run out of ammunition or food or water or everything at once. We still don't know you got the princess. And we ain't buying that pig in any boat. We want to see her. You'll see her when you're out of that shack and on the boat. We ain't moving out of here in the dark. Nobody's asking you to. Take me until dawn to get the princess down out of the hills. Okay, supposing we decide to do business. How do we know we don't get swamped by those natives between here and the boat? I'll take care of that. You can depend on it. Remember, my job is to keep you two guys alive and save the company I'm working for for $100,000. All right, we'll give you a chance. We'll be on the boat at dawn watching the shoreline, and this machine gun will be at the rail watching the shoreline with it. You send out the princess. Hello? You got a deal. And that ain't all you're going to get. I hope. I hit the beach two hours before dawn, with Punta ready to paddle me out to the Kittiwake in a native canoe. I wanted to be there with all weapons handy when Keeley and Portez stuck their heads up over the rail. But it seems they had thought of that, too. When we hit the sand, there they were, in the small boat, halfway out to the mooring. Oh, Johnny, there they are. They spoil everything. They stay out of sight, won't they? Yeah, they spoil everything, but not for long. Well, one thing for sure, I can't use the canoe. Tell me something. Are there sharks in this lagoon? Oh, no, not many. Well, I hope traffic is light tonight. I've got a chance. At... Okay, Porter, you better stay here. I'm going a few hundred yards up the beach and swim for it. Oh, Johnny, be careful. Oh, baby doll, you sound so pretty, and you look so ugly. The water was warmer, and the pool at the Hartford Y. Certainly not as much fun. I spent most of the trip trying to keep from splashing and watching for shark rudders around me. That was good in a way. Helped me forget that I don't swim very well. Forty-five minutes later, I was still half alive, looking for a handhold on the slimy waterline of the Kitty Wake on the seaward side. And there I stayed for the next hour and a quarter, listening to Keeley and Portez on the other side of the boat, nursing their machine gun and waiting like I was for the dawn. Okay, Portez, clear your gun. The news pushing over on the shoreline. I see it. I see it. Put the glasses on it. We don't want another mistake. Is it a princess? Yeah, wait till I get her in focus. They'll tell me. 
These glasses will bring in every line in her fat, ugly face. Those glasses brought something else, if they were that good. A hop in my heart, a lump in my throat. I had to move faster than I figured to. I had to get into action while the retention was all on the approaching canoe, and before they discovered that its passenger was not the princess, but her stand-in, Punta. I grabbed the gunwale, then the rail, cursing every drift that splashed back into the water off my body. I went slipping and sliding and rushing across the deck. Keeley was leaning forward, looking through the glasses, That's thighs true, against that. the rail, so I hit him first, <laughs> sent him flying over the oh! side. With or without a machine gun, Louis was a tough guy. This one for the road, jump I turned around to see what had to be done to take care of Keely and saw that it was already being taken care of. We had canoe paddle in the hands of an irate dame. Puta! Puta! Don't kill him! I want him alive! Puta, stop! No, no! I kill enemy of man I love! Huh? Who? Oh, no! Princess Papalaya had pulled a rank on Punta and demanded that she be the one to come out to the ship in the canoe. Because, as she kept telling me on the voyage back to New Guinea, she liked me. Oh, well, she may have been awful ugly, but she was also an awful good sailor. And knowing the way, the way to a sailor's heart, I bought her a present. Expense account, item four. Ten dollars. Tattooing job on the Princess Papalaya's fat right shoulder. A picture of a ship under full sail. So now when she laughs, it goes bounding over the waves. Uh, expense account, item five. Forty dollars. Long-winded cable to Seven Seas Maritime Underwriters. Uh, that's you, gentlemen. Recommending immediate cancellation of policies covering the lives of Keeley and Portez, who were in the hands of the New Guinea officials and looking forward to a short life and an unmerry one. Item six, $831.81, three and a half shillings. Airfare, Port Moresby to Hartford. Item seven, 48 cents. Past due charges at two cents per day. Hartford Public Library on my copy of Tales of the South Pacific. Incidentally, I never did get around to reading. After all, it would be an utter waste of time for a man who has known a gal like Punta. Uh, expense account uh, total $3,286.44. Assigned yours, well, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Mary Schiff, D.J. Thompson, Tom Holland, Clark Gordon, Willard Waterman, and Larry Dobkin. The special music is written and conducted by Leith Stevens. Your announcer is Paul Masterson. Be sure to be with us at this same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Who's got the nation's most popular band? Vaughn Monroe. And who's the nation's most popular singing band leader? Vaughn Monroe again. Now, who brings you a caravan of the nation's most popular tunes every Saturday night over most of these same CBS stations? You guessed it. It's Vaughn Monroe. That's why everyone listens on Saturday nights to the Vaughn Monroe Show on CBS, where this fall, you hear them all. Stay tuned now for Vaughn Monroe and his caravan, who follow immediately on most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The most popular sport on Boston's Charles River is rowing in one-man skulls. Or rather, it was the most popular sport, that is, until they took to beating on one man's skull. Mine. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. <laughs>
Suspense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Miss Melanie Carter, Pinckney Street, Beacon Hill, Boston. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during assignment as your representative investigating list of your relatives who might be interested in murdering you for your insurance. Or who'd like to rock the old doll to sleep. Or the unnice niece and the charming young rat who put the few in the word nephew. Expense account item one. Five dollars and ninety-eight cents. Airfare, Hartford to Boston. Item two, three and a quarter. Cab fare, Logan Airport to your residence on Beacon Hill. Uh, this is Mr. Dollar, the insurance man from Hartford. Good, good. Just a minute. Come in. Come in. An electric latch unlocked the door of your flat, and I stepped through. Straight out of this century into the last. It was another world. The remnants of which you see today in antique shops. Including those Chinese wind chimes that tinkled over by the window. And you... It's tiny and aged queen set across the 19th century room in your modern throne. That chromium and black leather wheelchair. Come in. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Oh. oh what's, what's the matter, ma'am? Oh, nothing, nothing. You just remind me of someone I once knew. That's all. Uh-huh. He was so... Come sit down over here. Thank you, Miss Carter. Uh, I take it you are, Miss Carter. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. You probably expected a younger woman. <laughs> Maybe, but certainly not one any more attractive. Oh. <laughs> you hold on to that gallantry of yours, young man. It's very difficult to find these days. And a very precious treasure to women. Uh, Miss Carter... Since you seem to know my name, I guess there's not much use in my telling you that I'm the investigator recommended by your insurance company, Royal Life. Oh, yes. They sent me a telegram saying you would be here. No telephone? No. No telephone. You see, Mr. Dollar, I was once a very happy young lady. Yesterday was very good to me. Today and tomorrow. Who knows? And why take chances? What little life I have left, I want to enjoy. That is why I've sent for you. You mean somebody told you I was an early American insurance investigator? No, no, my dear. It's just that experience is such a good teacher. Mr. Dollar, hmm? many years ago, my husband was murdered for his insurance money by his very own brother. Would you hand me my smelling salt, please? Oh, yes, certainly. There you are. Well, fate was very quick in passing judgment on the case because the brother was killed by a runaway horse as he was leaving the scene of his terrible crime. I not only received my half of the insurance money, but also the half that would someday have gone to him. Oh, and now you feel that your life may be in danger for the same reason. Oh, well, whether my life is actually in danger is not the most important thing. It is my mind that is in danger. As beneficiaries to all of my insurance. And as the company may have told you, it is a lot of insurance. Are my niece and my nephew, the children of that murderer. You see, I adopted them after their father's death. Oh, bad blood is bad blood, Mr. Dollar. And I want you to make sure that, that I am not engulfed by it. So, for the two names and addresses you gave me, written in your precise copper plate handwriting, I set out to give the once-over lightly to the two people you were afraid might someday give you a once-over not-so-lightly. Move number one. A quick trip up the financial pathways worn bare by credit bureaus, income tax investigators, and other types of snoops. I learned that thanks to your generosity, both your niece and your nephew had just enough to live graciously on, and uh, thanks to your frugality, no more. Move number two. A quick trip to Cambridge, the address of your nephew, Chalmers Carter. A stylish fire trap near Harvard Square. A maid let me in and summoned her mistress. 
Her entrance was announced by the jangling of a stack of bracelets and bangles running up her arm. So sorry to keep you waiting, darling. What was it you wanted? <clears throat> uh, how do you do? Uh, Mrs. Carter? Oh, yes. yes. I'm Crystal Carter. Of course. Oh, I say that's a beautiful suit you're wearing. Not Boston, I can tell. No, New York. $185. Oh. Right oh. off the racks. Hmm. Uh, Mrs. Carter, the maid tells me your husband isn't at home. I know. He isn't. Well, when do you expect him back? He always calls me before he comes. Why? I want to talk to him. That's why. Business, you know, that old stuff. Oh, business. Who can have any fun business? Hmm? Who are you, anyway? Sit down. I'm a guy who suddenly knows what the old-fashioned ice man must have felt like. Huh? Oh. <laughs> who are you, I ask? Mrs. Carter, I am what is known in the investment business as a finder. My job is to find money for people who have bona fide projects, but who are short on cash, with which to develop them. Oh, that sounds like a lovely job. It is, when you find the money. You work on a percentage. Now, right now, out in California, there's a little man who some time ago bought a lot of oil rights covering a big piece of property. It's right near Newhall where there's been a lot of gushers coming in. He's got the property. I'm looking for the money with which to develop it. I hoped your husband would be interested. Oil? There's a lot of money in oil. Well, of course he's interested. I'll call him right away. Uh, before you do, maybe I'd uh, better tell you. What I'm looking for is a lot of money. Uh -huh. So unless your husband has a lot available, it'll be no use. Well, I... Well, he can get it. I'm sure he can get it. He, he's often told me all I needed was one big chance... Maybe this is it. I know where to reach him on the phone. Where can he reach you? The chance to make a lot of quick money melted the love light right out of Crystal Carter's eyes. And if anything, the money look that replaced it was even wilder. She moved fast. By the time I got back to my hotel, there was a message there telling me where I could find her husband, Chalmers. And her directions took me back into a taxi. Back across the Charles River and move number three to the Bayshore Trotting Club. A fancy little track where millionaires who like the smell of stables see how fast they can make horses trot. Chalmers Carter was up there among the rest, in spirit if not in prosperity, sitting in the low flat grandstand watching the afternoon workouts, knowingly holding a stopwatch in his hand and keeping one eye on a blazed-faced filly who was kicking up the dust in the racing oval and one ear on me. May or may not know, Mr. Carter, the best thing about an oil investment, the first 27% of your income from it is tax-free. What? Say that again. That's right. The first 27%, tax-free. Hmm. Uh, Dollar, just how much money do you need? Mm, about 120000 should do it. Uh-huh. 120000 huh? All right, I'll see what I can do about it. What did you say about 120,000, uh, Carter? Uh, George. When you get I'll... your hands on 120,000, Chalmers, don't forget the 500 you owe me. Move number four. A quick trip back across the one more river I seem to have to cross, the Charles, to a pompous little apartment on Bay State Road, where I found your niece, Sophia. Very pretty, but uh, very stuffy. Your proposition interests me. However, I would naturally first have to check everything very closely with my business advisor. Oh, naturally. This first visit is only to find out whether you are interested and whether you do have money uh, immediately available. Immediately? Yes. I see. Very well. I think it can be managed. Then having made those moves, I was in a hurry to move you out of the way, which led me straight back to your flat on Pinckney Street, Beacon Hill. And there, once again, I bumped into what I've learned to expect in my racket, the unexpected. Your apartment door was slightly open. Your wheelchair was empty. And from outside, I saw you across the room, standing there, talking into something that earlier in the day you had very deliberately told me you didn't have. A telephone. Oh, Joseph, I'm so glad I was able to reach you. Now listen, I have another little job for you to do. I want you to come right over, both of you. You need Rocky, huh? You know where it is. 
No. No, this time it's somebody I have to get rid of. I took up a plant in the antique store across the street and waited for your visitors. They were charming. Just the sort of folks you'd expect to see on Beacon Hill, dropping in for a spot of afternoon tea. They were the kind of guys who never wear wristwatches, handcuffs being rough on watch crystals. I gave him a short lead upstairs, then pussyfooted up behind him. Oh, one of these days, my right eye is going to wind up shaped like a keyhole, with my left ear shaped like a cauliflower from pressing against door panels. It's so nice having you young fellows around to depend on. Sit down, sit down. You want some nice tea and cakes? No, thanks, dear. We just had some pizza and beer. Yeah, Joe and me just had some pizza and beer. What's on your mind, Grandma? Yeah, what's on your mind, Grandma? Well, boys, you know how worried I've been yes. about that family of mine. Well, things are even worse now. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, what's up? Well, I want you to understand that it wasn't that I didn't have complete faith in your ability to protect them. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But I finally turned to my insurance company, hoping to save a few dollars. Yeah. yeah. They sent a scoundrel named Dollar from Hartford to protect me, mind you. And do you know what he did? No, what did he do? No, what did he do? Well, just to make sure this dollar fellow, I called a private detective and had him followed when he left here. Yeah, good. And that detective told me that Dollar went to Sophia and my nephew Chalmers and is trying to entice and to kill me for my insurance money so they can buy some phony oil stock he's trying to sell them. Huh? That guy sounds like a big operator. Yeah, that guy sounds like a big operator. Well, whatever he is, I want that young man out of the way. Grandma, dear, you don't really mean out of the way. That's exactly what I mean. Joseph, I see something I don't like very much. <laughs> what is it? Some shadows moving around under the edge of the front door. Well, what are we waiting for? Yeah. I wasn't a match for one of those guys, let alone two. And Rocky, Big Sir Echo, not only repeated everything Joe said, he repeated everything Joe did. Take this! Yeah, take this! That's good. That's very good. Now, that's him. That's Dollar. You hold him. Hold him. Don't let him get away. Mr. Dollar, unless you're in a big hurry to get measured for a cement suit, don't start no funny business. Uh, Don't worry. I feel about as funny as a funeral my own. Well, I hope you've learned your lesson. Although, don't you think for a minute it's all over. This will teach you honesty is the best policy, and cheaters never prosper. Take it easy, Grandma, dear. This boy will not ever bother you again. (laughs) Come on, Buster. Yeah, come on, Buster. Yeah, go on, Buster. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, this fall, you hear them all on CBS. And you hear from the top mystery writers as well as top stars like Jack Benny, Bing Crosby, and the Lux Radio Theater luminaries. One such master of mystery, Raymond Chandler, and his world-famous private eye, Philip Marlowe, will be heard from later tonight on most of these same CBS stations. Be sure to hear this latest hard-bitten, wise-cracking adventure of Philip Marlowe later tonight, won't you? with our star, Charles Russell. We return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Usually, when people are taken for a ride, at least it's a free one. However, Joseph and his friend Rocky didn't feel that way. So, expense account, item three, a buck twenty, cab fare up Tremont Street toward Boston's south end. The three of us sat packed in the back of the taxi with me in the middle, and just as we passed King's Chapel burying ground, Rocky and Joseph suddenly felt the urge to be alone with me. Hey, driver, crank up your window. We wish to be in private. Well, it happens I've had the crates fell off. Yeah, you and your lousy cab. Yeah, you and your lousy cab. Well, step on it! <laughs> There were also things to step on in Joe's lousy hotel. 
Up in his room, they gave me the hot seat of honor on the edge of the bed, stood over me, one on each side, and issued me an invitation, but not to dance. We think you are a smart guy, Dumber, and we want a piece of your action. What are you talking about? Yeah, Joe, what, what are you talking about? That! Well, you just keep your muscles handy. I do the thinking and the talking. Okay, so go do it. Huh? What? Do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Where was me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I was saying, Dollar, you got a good racket, and we want a piece of your action. Oh. Okay, Joe. What do you think my action is? That's damn bloody. I've been around hustlers all my life, so you ain't fooling me. You set up the old lady to get knocked off just like she said. Mm. In the meantime, you get all the people who will collect their insurance nice and ready to sell them some no-good oil stock. Your hands are clean, except for a bush league swindle. The most you could get out of that is from three to five years, and that's the only chance you're taking. You... Joe, you're a genius. Huh? Well, let me ask you one thing, though. Huh? Why should I go to all that trouble? Why shouldn't I just sell my hot oil stock to the old lady in the first place and save all that extra trouble? Huh? Huh? Uh, yeah. That's where guys like you are smarter than guys like me. You got your reasons. You ain't kidding nobody. Huh? We like the way you operate. And we want in. Oh, uh, I guess I've found myself a pair of partners. <laughs> Good. Shake. Yeah, shake. No, one at a time. Joe? Rocky? Oh, I'm sorry. This is great. Yeah, you know, Rocky and me have been taking Grandma for a few bucks now and then, protecting her from them squares she's afraid of. Oh. <laughs> but I never thought it would turn into anything as big as this. Just out of curiosity, how'd you guys meet Grandma in the first place? Uh, we was doing a little social break in the net from one night, and it turned out to be her house, yeah? She got the drop on this seat. We seen her there in her wheelchair, pushed her into the bedroom, and went to work. Yeah, yeah went to work. And the next thing we know, she's standing there pointing a old shotgun at us. Yeah, yeah, what? You creep, that was no shotgun. What? Ah, what are you, uh, it's a very hysterical musket. Oh. You stupid. And she told me. Uh, let's see, where, where was we? Uh, oh, yeah, a anyway, that's how we met her. She made us a deal. She, she wouldn't call the cops if we'd done a return. Besides, she paid us for it. We ought to have a bottle set up. Yeah. What for? Well, all we got to do is wait till the nephew or the niece knock off the ready. So why not have a drink while we're waiting? A war and a hold everything. That's not the way to do it. How come? Yeah, how come? Now, look, if we sit here, we blow a big chance. The chance to get rid of whoever murders the old doll. We see who do it. We turn them in. They're out of the way. And the insurance money goes to the other one. Then I go to work on them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You see what I mean, Rocky? That's why guys like him has got more brains than guys like me. Yeah, more brains than guys like me, too. And stay. Okay, Donna, what do we do? I was in a bad spot, but I'd put you, Andy Carter, in a worse one hoping to attract any bad apples that might be hanging on your family tree. Then all of a sudden you decided I was a worm and eliminated me as your number one protector. Among your spoiled family fruit, there was nephew Chalmers, fishy-eyed and money-hungry, his wife Crystal, who was no killer to look at, but who could be sure of her with a gun in her hand. Then there was Sophia. She was stuffy, but strangely reminded me of a precocious young lady who strangled her mother so that she might wear her evening gown to her high school senior prom. So, when Joseph, expert in giving a fellow's eye a coat of many colors, asked me, what do we do now, I honestly didn't know. The best answer I could come up with was get back to where we could keep an eye on your address on Pinckney Street. But when we got there, Pinckney Street was blocked off by blue uniforms, and reinforcements were still arriving. Hey, what's going on? Yeah, what's going on? Well, you got to be sure of one thing. This ain't the policeman's ball. Look. How well are you guys known to the Boston police? Yeah, some of their best quiz masters. They failed to make us talk. Yeah, they failed to make us talk. Okay, you better let me go ahead. Uh, not too far ahead. Don't worry. Hey, look, Joseph, uh, the cops are coming down out of her house. Oh, what do you mean now? Looks like the job is all done. Yeah, I'd better get up the hill and find out for sure. And don't forget, partner, we're watching. Don't worry. Keep moving, folks. Just keep moving, mister. Hey, uh, officer. Officer. Yeah. 
I'm I'm Dollar of the Boston Globe. Ah. What's going on? Am I going to make the front page? Yeah, you might. Well, what's it all about? Some dame, a friend of the commissioner's, called for protection. Oh, I thought it was a murder. It is. By the huh? time we get here, the dame up there is colder than Sunday morning beans. How do you like that? Uh, hey, Dollar, when you're writing this story, my, my name is Fred Mosher. Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, Fred Mosher. Yeah, yeah, I used to play basketball for the Boys Club of Boston. And when you're writing this story, put my name in, will you? Uh, the wife will get a kick out of it. Well, I got to get back to headquarters. Headquarters? Hey, officer, yeah. uh, uh, Fred, yeah. come here. Listen, I'll see that you get your name in the paper if you do me a favor. Oh. Act like you're arresting me, will you? A couple of friends of mine are just down the street. I want to pull a gag on them. Sure. With or without handcuffs. Anyway, just grab me by the elbow and throw me in that squad car. <laughs> I could tell by the eyes of Joseph and Rocky that I had just successfully dissolved a partnership. At the corner of Arlington and Boylston, I swapped the patrol car for a cab. And, what do you know, I headed back across the Charles River to Cambridge. Oh, hello, darling. I'm sorry the maid wasn't here to answer the door. I'm all... Would you mind, Crystal, Mm -hmm. walking just a few more steps ahead of me? It'll make you easier to follow. (laughs) Where's your husband? Oh, stop worrying about my husband. He had to go out for a while on business. I told you before, he always calls before he comes home. In case I want to spread something. How long has he been gone? I wish you'd stop worrying about Charles. Why don't you stop paying some attention to little sick? Hey, uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute now. Stop. Get a grip on yourself. Wait, oh. uh, watch it. You, Dollar. A finder, huh? Just what are you trying to find? Now, wait a minute, Carter. Oh, Thomas, thank heavens you got here. He forced his way in. He's from New York. I am not. I'm from Hartford. It's only my suit that's from New York. Why, you despicable cad. I- I've a good notion to to thrash you to within an inch of your life. I was certainly in no position to ask any questions around there, so I hit him a shot in the whiskers and left. <laughs> I went back across the Charles River to Bay State Road and niece Sophia's pompous little apartment. Nobody answered, so I broke rule number three in the book of how not to get your head split open when nobody answers the door. Picked the burglar's friend type lock and went in. I thought at first I'd set off a new polite kind of burglar alarm, but it was only a grandfather clock tolling out 10 p.m., as the moonlight boffed me smack in the kisser. First thing I saw out the window was my friend the Charles River, over which I'd made more crosses than the X-Man in a tic-tac-toe tournament. My tongue was as dry as that was wet. The second thing I saw, thanks to my fountain pen-type flashlight, was an open drawer in a kidney-shaped desk. Sophia Carter was no housekeeper. The white paper lining inside it was dusty except for the portion that held the vacant outline of a junior miss-sized revolver. Then the lights went on. Well, Mr. Dollar, you'll be the death of me yet. Auntie, what are you doing alive? Oh, you're surprised. (laughs) You hoped I'd be dead, didn't you? Well, I'm not. I'm not, you see? Yeah, I sure do see. But you'll be dead if I pull this trigger. Honey... When I don't walk in on a man with a gun in his hand, it's a matter of courage. When I don't throw a flying tackle on a girl with a gun in her hand, it's a matter of etiquette. And when I don't get rough with an old lady holding a gun in her hand, it's a matter of knowing that your age, your reflexes are gone. You can be talk out of things. With me holding your gun hand straight up overhead, I hope nobody's at home upstairs. Give me that. Let me go. 
Let me go. Don't you kill me. Everybody's trying to kill me. Sophia was when she came to my flat this afternoon. Oh, which must mean that Sophia is the body in your flat tonight. The body I thought was yours. I know she was. She's been threatening to kill me for years. Now, what's that you've got in your other hand? No, no, you can't. Yeah, give it no, to me now. No, you can't. Come on. It. No, no, no. What I ripped out of her hand was a very old note written on very old paper. Give me that. And reading it, what with the clawing, scratching 82-year-old woman tucked under one arm, it read like a voice from out of the past. That is mine. The voice of that 82-year-old woman's long-dead husband, Caleb Carter. To my beloved niece, Sophia, in these last remaining moments of consciousness, I tell you this. My wife, Melanie, has made repeated attempts upon my life. This time, I'm afraid she has succeeded. Also, crushing the life from your father, my brother, beneath the wheels of her carriage as he rushed to my rescue. Well, I guess this means that Sophia had this letter and has been holding it over your head for years. Yes. You've been blackmailing me. Blackmailing me. Blackmailing me. Melanie, it was your conscience that first called me into this case to protect you from your relatives. It was your conscience that hired that private detective to protect you from me. And it was your conscience that got you mixed up with Joe and Rocky to protect you from the detective and me. Then again, it was that same old conscience that called in the police to protect you from your gangster friends. Now there's only one more thing, I hope. What's that? That that same conscience will prevent you from making an undignified surrender. My arm. Thank you, young man. Your arm. Expense account, item four, 15 bucks, pipe and slippers. Appeasement to Charmer's Carter, nephew of the accused. To give him a symbol that all I was really trying to find was a way to straighten out his home life. Item five, fifty dollars, uh, a personally autographed check in lieu of his name in the paper to patrolman Fred Mosier so that the wife would still get a kick out of the publication of his name on the payable to line of said check. Expense account item six, fifteen dollars, gift to Joseph and Rocky, one roll of tickets on the River Queen sightseeing boat, which gives daily round trip tours of the Charles River. Maybe they'll do me a favor and fall in. Uh, item seven, five dollars and ninety-eight cents. Airfare, Boston to Hartford. Expense account total. Uh, uh, what's the use? Where you are now, Aunt Melanie Carter, you're never going to be in a position to pay. I won't even bother to sign it. Yours, mm, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell, script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Be sure to be with us at this same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I knew when I went to the desert that anyone who plays around with cactus is liable to get stuck. But I didn't remember that another way of saying death is going west. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, He's an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by special investigator Johnny Dollar to Old Caledonia Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Oscar M. Wheaton, Chief Investment Counsel. 
The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of suspected skullduggery in a Skull Canyon mine. Or, uh, Mr. Bones, who was that lady I seen you with last night? Or, messing with a mule train is one good way to kick off. <laughs> Expense account item one. 25 cents. Tip to busboy who brought telephone to my table at the Blue Danube restaurant, Robertson Boulevard, Los Angeles, uh, where I happened to be uh, working on a case. Your call came right after the liver dumpling soup, taking me out of the soup plate and putting me in the soup. Now, this is the story, Dollar. You make notes and don't interrupt. Two years ago, this company made an investment in a bona fide working gold mine, the Skull Canyon Mine. That's just outside Twin Buttes, Arizona. I see. I said don't interrupt. That's just over the border from Nogales, Mexico. Now, up until three months ago, everything was fine. The profits shown by the mine were good. And then suddenly, our returns dropped 50%. However, operating expenses, man hours, and so on remain the same, indicating there's been no fall off in the removal of high SAR. Now, there's something wrong. We want you to go down there and find out what it is. Expense account, item two $12.80. I decided that since you invited yourself to the table, dinner at the Blue Danube was on you. Oh, in case you're interested in what you didn't have, it was uh, that liver dumpling soup, veal paprikash. Harry Strudel and a small coffee. Enjoyed with that case I was working on. An eccentric millionaire who wanted to marry me for her money. She had yes, yes in her eyes, but when I told her I had to say goodnight immediately, she said, Oh, no. Expense account item three. $120. Burns Lee Flying Service. Charter plane to Twin Buttes, where I checked into the Waterfield Hotel. Called the mine and told the girl who answered that I wanted transportation out there. She said she'd come after me. Having seen too many Western movies, I figured she'd arrive in a buckboard, but instead she picked me up in a Jeep. Oh. Oh. Hey, slow down, will you? Before my teeth start falling out. Oh, sorry. I, um, forgot you were tender for That's not where I'm tender. Oh. Uh, by the way, Miss Moreland... How far is it out to the mine? 23 miles. Oh, no. Is the road like this all the way? Oh, no. About another half mile out of town, there isn't any road at all. Oh, oh. oh if I ever lived through this. From now on, I'm taking my bumps in a burlesque theater. Oh. Much better than walking, mister. Yeah. Yeah. Say, uh, you said you're out here representing the owner. Uh, What's your job? Uh, well, I'm a, an efficiency expert. Oh, uh, speaking of efficiency, what's your first name? Jackie. Oh, well, in that case, mine should be Gwendolyn. But it's not. It's Johnny. Well, let's not bother shaking hands on it, pal. Here comes the end of the road. Oh, 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 oh. The scenery was jumping around like a whole movie. My teeth were trying to find out how much abuse my uppers would take from my lowers. I felt like I was gradually being hammered down from a tall, thin man into a short, round one. And there I was, caught without my rhinestone-studded motorcycle belt. Well, here you are. Want me to help you out? Oh, very funny. <laughs> oh, get, away. get lost, you little monster. I admit I look like a bag of bones, but I'm too young to die. Go on, I'll beat it. Oh, be a good dog now. Lie down, Nugget. Down. Yeah, Nugget, drop dead. This the mine office? This is it. Well, Dollar, welcome to Skull Canyon. I'm Doyle, the manager out here. I'd be happier to meet you if I met you in town. Mr. Dollar's in a foul mood, Jeff. That ride was a little too much for him. That ride would have been a little bit too much for Buffalo Bill. <laughs> well... That's how Jackie keeps that figure as trim as she does. Now, come on inside, Dollar. That's where the books are, and that's where the chairs are. With cushions, I hope. I'll see you guys. All yeah, right. Sit down. Thanks. Oh. Oh. Well, there you are. You'll find all the figures right in that big, fat book. Uh, all but Jackie's. Well, I'm not in any hurry to do my arithmetic. Tell me, uh, 
What do you think of the results around here? You know more about it than I do. How are things going? Well, Dollar, I'll tell you. It was going better than it is right now. But mm-hmm. Just a few months back, we worked out a pay vein. I'm hoping we'll pick it up again any day now. That sounds reasonable. Any trouble? Help, equipment, working conditions? Well, working conditions could be a lot better, but that, that's a geographical problem. You see, the mine is located here, and the big water supply is eight miles west. We haul the ore across the desert by mule train to the smelter. If it's cheaper than trucks, we'd have to build a road for them. Not here, hay is cheaper than gasoline. Uh, you'd um, like to take a look at the mine? Frankly, Mr. Doyle, I'd just as soon climb up a chimney. I hate dark, confined spaces. But since it's part of my job, I might as well get it over with. The entrance into the mine was through an adit, a horizontal shaft into the side of a hill. We rode in on the tail end of a small red dynamite car, drawn by a donkey junior grade, a burrow. It was cooler in there, but I started to sweat the minute we left sunlight and fresh air behind us. I could hear the jackhammers nibbling little gold ear bobs out of the quartz rock for the Christmas tree. Then I heard them stop, and Doyle told me why. Uh, sounds like they're about ready to blast. Oh, great. Oh, open your mouth and cover your eyes. A hundred and fifty yards deeper into the earth, I was beginning to think that mankind is mighty hard to satisfy. The Lord gave us the world's whole surface. Then we had to go and invent gold mines and airplanes. And right then, I'd have settled for an airplane. What's the matter, Dollar? You look a little green. Oh, feel a little green. Well, look, look. Take some deep breaths and hold them as long as you can. Okay. Yeah, there. That'll perk you up. Well, this is it. Right here is the only face we're working. Ah, it doesn't help. So this is it, huh? Well, let's see the rest of it. What? I told you, this is it. This is the only face we're working. Okay, you guys. Keep it moving. Hold that oar. Fill them up. Come on, bend your back. (laughs) Well, let's get out of here, Dollar. Okay, Doyle. I've seen what I came to see. And I also figured I had heard what I came to hear. Dinner that night I had with Doyle and Jackie, and the steak they served gave me a rough idea of what they did with their old burrows. Doyle's attitude gave me a rough idea that maybe he'd seen my eyes light up when I heard those jackhammers snorting away in some other part of the mine, just after he had told me that where we were standing was the only place being worked. After dinner, Doyle went back to the mine, leaving me alone with Jackie, which was better than dessert. Uh... By the way, Jackie, just what's your job out here? Oh, I'm just sort of a secretary and bookkeeper and chief driver. Uh Uh-huh. How did you happen to land here in Skull Canyon? Well, I took the job because I was going to marry the man who was the manager then, Doyle's old boss. I met him in college. He was a mining engineer. His name was Larry Hodges. Oh, what happened? I was left at the altar. When I got out here, he was gone. Guess he got stage fright and changed his mind. Anyway, nobody's heard from him since. Least of all me. Come on, I'll show you where you sleep. It was a real romantic night. Old Nugget the dog was carrying on a long-distance conversation with his country cousins, the coyotes up in the hills. The air was soft and warm, and so was Jackie's arm. Stars hung low. And so did my spirits when she bid me good night after she introduced me to my roommate. Hiya, sonny. An old mule skinner named Kangaroo. Uh, make yourself comfortable. Oh, that chance. Well, better than a sand bed and a saddle pillar. Uh. Oh. The, uh, for a pine shack, this has a mighty fancy floor. What is it, mahogany? Nope. Tobacco juice. Oh. Helps keep out the sidewinders. What do you mean, helps? Little snake critters crawl in out of the hot sun to get cool. 
Where are you from, Sonny? Uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Well, I'll be turned to. I don't reckon it shows through, but I'm an Easterner myself. Come out from New York State 53 years ago. Little town of Prattville. County seat it was. Mm, that's pretty dull. What'd you say? Oh, nothing. Say, uh, are you the one that handles the mules on the run out to the smelter? I'm one of them. Well, how's chances of hitching a ride with you in the morning? You'll have to get up early. All right, then. I'll get up early. Well, then stop wasting your breath on a lot of dang fool words. Use some on the kerosene lamp. Quick. Night. I lay awake, thinking about that jackhammer I'd heard working the supposedly inactive end of the Skull Canyon mine earlier that day. This didn't take too much pounding into my skull before I decided that Doyle was working on a vein for his own personal profit. I also knew that for him to convert the ore into gold, he had to get it to a smelter. So I figured that the mule skinner, Kangaroo, was the best place to start asking questions. Ah, uh, it's funny how a sleepless night can sour the beauty of a desert sunrise. Sun's getting awful hot. Why, it ain't nothing, Sonny. Some days that old sun's got your tongue hanging out your fur. Gets a real nice tan. Uh, how do you stand it? Hey, what's that stomach pump doing way out here? Stomach pump? What in tarnation are you talking about? Oh, uh, that's a clever name for a light airplane. Hey, looks like he's getting ready to give us a buzz. Hey, hey, mules! Hey, you, Monroe! A steady blast is... Monroe! Uh, oh, it, he's the loudest mouth ding ding old mule I ever did here. Hey, here he comes. Oh, 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 First thing I learned was, if you ever want to panic a team of mules, just buzz them with an airplane. The second thing I learned was that little canyon we were approaching was loaded with armed horsemen, who came galloping out like they were trying to make history at Tan Foran. The gunman didn't do anything to me except hold me at bay while the plane picked itself a landing and disgorged its one-man air force. Buenos dias, amigos. Ah, you don't look happy to see me. Maybe my friend scares you with their guns, eh? Hey, old man, who is this new boy who ride with you today? His name's Dollar. Well, right now, I wish it was Hopalong Chancity. Well, let me introduce myself. They call me El Puerco. That's because I look like a pig. <laughs> but maybe it is because I'm so greedy, too. I want what you got with you. Why, Galdin, your miserable son beats high. Now, you. take it easy, old timer. It's well, okay. All I've got on me is a wristwatch and a few bucks. Let them have them. And besides, what's he going to do with a wagon load of unrefined gold ore? <laughs> you talk like a little boy. I know what you have with you. And I know where it is. It's under the seat. The little white bags. $30,000 of pure gold. <laughs> In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, 
hardly a clue to start on, and the witness's story is at hopeless variance. That was the job that the Birmingham, Alabama police faced in the murder called The Case of the Hue and Cry. Later tonight on Gangbusters, Birmingham's own police chief comes to CBS to tell you how they tracked down the apparently unmotivated murder. Be sure to hear this true-to-life police story, reenacted on Gangbusters. Gangbusters and the Adventures of Philip Marlowe are regular Saturday night features on most of these same CBS stations. Now, with our star, Charles Russell... We return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. So there I was, Johnny Dollar, efficiency expert. I had efficiently gotten myself in trouble. I was efficiently letting El Puerco walk off with a large pot of your gold and stood a good chance of efficiently getting myself shot in the belly. Here we are, amigos. I feel better now the gold is in my little aeroplane. I hope you're not mad with me. You know, I need the money to pay my taxes. <laughs> okay, okay, you got what you wanted. Why don't you take off and get out of here? That ding-dang rascal, he's probably figured on shooting us. Oh, no, old man. I'm a very scientific bandido. You think I want to shoot you and get killed myself for murder? Oh, no. I let your mules do the dirty work. Well, Manuel, Pedro, Juanito, here, adelante. Take this man and tie them up. Tie them to the stair back to back. And the rest of you tie up the mules in a circle around them. In nice and close. Then I will get him a little aeroplane and dive on the mules. And the mules will kick their heads off. <laughs> Pitching of horseshoes may be fun, but not when they're being pitched at your head by a mule. Once we were tied back to back on the stake, the nearest available technical advisor, Kangaroo, was anything but encouraging. That's your trouble with a girl darn mule. When they get riled up, they think with their feet. Here he comes. Oh, there, ho, you mule ho. Oh, there. I guess we showed him. Yeah. I ain't stunned mules 40 years for nothing. I can handle them. Oh, nice going, kangaroo. Now, listen, Sonny, I got me idea. Yeah, what is it? Well, go something like this. Hey. Oh. Just as the idea, whatever it was, hit Kangaroo, a hoof from one of the mules scored a ringer around my cranium. Ah, the stars looked beautiful. They came out in the shape of a horseshoe. And as I slipped into that familiar Betty Bye for private eyes, the world of hit-on-the-head darkness, I could hear Kangaroo's advice, too little and too late. Ah, there you see. You can never trust a mule. Never trust a mule. Never trust a mule. A long time later, the curtains of my eyelids went up on the next act. But something was wrong. The stage was still dark. The stars were still there, but not in a horseshoe pattern. I closed my eyes and dreamed some more. I was lying near an oasis in the Sahara Desert, and a beautiful maiden was bending over me, kissing me. She was breathing hard. But she could have used some sense then. Huh? Nugget, get away from me, you mangy cur. Nugget, get away from me. Johnny, you frightened me. Huh, what? Uh, Jackie, what are you doing out here? Well, take it easy, pal. It's a darn good thing I am out here. You getting yourself kicked in the head. That's just say the wrong end of a horse got mixed up with the wrong end of a mule. Where's kangaroo? Where are the mules? What's going on? Johnny, relax, relax. Kangaroo and the mules are on their way back to the mine. Oh, where's uh, Pancho Tortilla? Who? There was a Mexican bandit out here. The greatest piece of typecasting since the Gutenberg Bible. Oh, El Puerco. Yeah. Yeah, Kangaroo told me about him. Come on now. Try to get up. Come on. Oh. Uh, yeah. Mm. Hey, hey, what happened to you? Your clothes are all torn. Yeah. 
This is Mr. Doyle's idea of a proposal of marriage. We were mm -hmm. supposed to fly off together to South America tonight. He's been planning it for a long time. Well, what made you change your mind? Oh, you know how it is. Best laid plans of mice and men. Oh, yeah. You're talking to an expert. If everything went all right for me, where would I be next week? Same time, same station. But, but what's your angle? I told you before. I came out to Skull Canyon to marry a man. I've reason to believe that Doyle did away with him. To get his job so he could milk the mine. Well, I stayed on and acted just interested enough in Doyle to get him nice and relaxed. Hoping he'd spill something. Well, so far all it's been is bragging up life in South America with him. Oh. Now, I, I hope you can help me. And I know I can help you. How? Oh. Well, Doyle set up a refining layout right in the mine. When the gold he's been stealing comes out, it's pure gold. Aha! Uh -huh. Then somebody in the mine must have tipped off El Puerco. Mm hmm Doyle did. Oh. He and El Puerco are working together. El Puerco's job was to get the gold across the border and you out of the way. I see. Well, listen, you ever been in the mine? I mean, could you show me the way the refining layout? Oh, no, no. Doyle's never let me inside. Well, how about the charts of the mine? They're in the safe. I've got the combination. If we can just get in without Doyle seeing me, I can get him. Now, leave that to me. Come on, let's get going. If, if, wait a minute. How do we get back? Well, I came out in the Jeep. Oh. Oh, my aching head. Uh, this is close enough, Star Eyes. We better pull up right here. All right. Now get quiet. Say, the wedding may be off, but it sounds like the reception is still on. No, that's the regular Saturday night square dance. Oh. Well, look, from here, which way is the office? I I'm lost. It's right over here. Oh. Come on, I'll show you. You were in it yesterday. When we rounded the corner of the office building, my heart was doing a dozy do. Oh! The door of the safe was open, and so was the mouth of the fellow in front of us. But he wasn't saying anything. He was lying on the floor, dead. El Puerco, the pig. Oh, what a spot for a big red apple. Johnny, he's dead. He must have come back for something. Kangaroo must have caught up with him. Uh, whoever caught up with him, caught up with him, but good. Come on, let's go take a look for Kangaroo. Wait. Yeah. Careful, darling. Dog may be in there. Boy, tight spots really give that word darling a good workout, don't they? Okay, darling. Wait out here. I'll be careful. Uh, say, partner, huh? you seen Kangaroo around here? Kangaroo? Yeah. Well, sure. Kangaroo came in here uh, looking for Doyle. Well, did he find him? Well, uh, don't know. Doyle went over to the mine. Is that where Kangaroo went? Well, if I was looking for Doyle, that's where I'd go. Thank you, bottleneck. <laughs> I don't know why I was in such a hurry heading straight into trouble. But the trouble started popping before we got to it. Oh, poor kangaroo. Jackie was only guessing, but I could only hope she wasn't guessing right. Johnny. Hmm? Johnny, I thought I saw something flashing just inside. Probably somebody's last spark of life. Now, take it easy. You stay right here. I'll move in from the side of the entrance. No, I don't... Oh, all right. Be careful. Oh, he sure got you good, partner. Okay, Jackie, you can relax. The right man got it, your play man. Mr. Doyle. Oh, Johnny. Oh, Johnny, it's awful. What, what a relief. Hey, kangaroo, you can come out now. Everything's all right. It's us, Jackie and Dollar. Hey, uh, don't make a move, I'll shoot you down. Hey, what, what the... Harry! Stay right up. Larry, you mean the guy you thought was dead? The guy you were supposed to marry? Yes. Oh, Larry. Larry, darling. I'll, I'll kill you. No. Oh, Larry. Larry, what's happened to you? I'll kill you. All right. Come on, 
kid. It wasn't <laughs> worth waiting for anyway. <laughs> your first interest was feeding your mules so that you didn't get mixed up in all that shooting. Yep. Poor. Well, I'll tell you. When three bad eggs like Hodges and Doyle and El Puerco get together double-crossing each other, they all gotta wind up in the omelet. They're dead. Sure feels good to get your boots off. That uh, Larry feller thought he was pretty smart. Holding up in that mine with his own private smelter, using Doyle for a front. The only thing was, he didn't figure on Doyle falling in love with his woman. Yeah, who wouldn't? Hey, hmm? for a young fella, you sure talk a lot. How about using some of that breath you're wasting on that kerosene lamp, huh? Huh? Right. Right. <laughs> Expense account, item four, six dollars and ten cents. One quart snake bite medicine, 32 ounces of prevention in uh, case a snake should bite me. Item five, three dollars and forty cents, with which I purchased the nicest gift I could think of for a gal in Jackie Moreland's position. A telegram to you, requesting that you give her a job she very much deserved. The managership of the Skull Canyon Mine. You see, when she first found out that man she was going to marry didn't love her, she took out her affection on the territory, which makes me very sorry that I wasn't born in the state of Arizona. Uh, expense account item six, $164.35. Uh, transportation, Twin Buttes to Hartford. Uh, expense account total, $947.99, which makes just about as much sense as you can make without making a dollar. Signed, yours, uh, no charge for that double talk. Uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Dora Singleton, John Daner, Willard Waterman, Fred Howard, and Don Diamond. The special music is written and conducted by Leith Stevens. Your announcer is Paul Masterson. Be sure to be with us at this same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Music Popular and Music Western are on the bill for CBS listeners again tonight. Vaughn Monroe and his band will present the five top tunes of the week, plus Army and Navy marching songs, Anchors Away, On Brave Old Army Team, and many others. Gene Autry follows right on the heels of Vaughn's caravan with favorites straight from the land of sagebrush and six-gun. For an hour of wonderful music, hear Vaughn Monroe's caravan and The Gene Autry Show tonight and every Saturday on most of these same CBS stations. Stay tuned now for Vaughn Monroe's Caravan, which follows immediately on most of these stations. This is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, meets adventure every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This case looked refreshing at first. It took me to Milwaukee, the brewing capital of the USA. But it occurred to me later, for a guy who appreciates a good head on a glass of beer, I take lousy care of my own. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar, starring Charles Russell. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius.
expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Two, Home Office, Ambassador Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Franklin Haley, General Manager. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my assignment as bodyguard to your policyholder, Ann Connolly. Or, it may have been love at first sight, but the last sight was down the barrel of a 45 automatic. <laughs> Expense account, item one. Two ninety-five. One copy of The Case of the Playful Siamese, a novel of detection and suspense. It was a story about a private eye named Dexter Payne. But before I could learn whether poor Dexter was dead or alive at the end of Chapter One, the phone rang, and there you were, Mr. Haley, telling me I'd leave for Milwaukee on the next plane. So I returned the book to the lending library, bought a copy of my own, and came to your office to find out what my assignment was all about. Come in, Dollar. Come in, come in. Thank you. How are you, Mr. Haley? Fine, my boy, fine. Glad to see you again. Just sit down, sit down. Thank you. Ah, adding to your store of knowledge, I see. What are you reading? Oh, uh, uh, the case of the playful Siamese. Bah, crime fiction, trash. When there's good literature available, why waste your time on such mediocre drivel? What do you think you're playing, Noel Coward? Millions of dollars taken in on it every year. Well, what's the difference so long as you're not taking in? Oh, you bet they'll not get a penny from me. Oh, yes, they will. Huh? What's that? Oh, I said uh, Will. Will uh, Shakespeare. You know, Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello, crime fiction. <clears throat> no comparison. That's different. Anybody knows that. Uh, well, I guess we'd better get down to business. Your plane leaves in an hour and a half, 6.30. This girl who needs a bodyguard, who is she, and what's she afraid of? Uh, it's a sad, tragic case. The result of a misdirected, uh, surely not faultless life, but nevertheless a situation that demands outside help. Oh, there, there now, don't go to pieces. All I asked was what's her name and what's she afraid of. Her name is Anne Connolly. Six years ago, she had the misfortune to fall in love with a man named Neil Grafter, a man of violent passions, jealousy, and so on. He misrepresented himself to her. He plied her with luxuries. And then, practically on the eve of the wedding, he was arrested for grand theft. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think I can ad-lib the rest. While he was in prison, she didn't get tired of the luxuries he'd given her, but she did get tired of waiting for him. Well, he had lied to her, and five years is a long time. True. The point is, Grafter's coming out on parole today, and Miss Connolly is terrified at the prospects of her first meeting with him. His violence, you know. Mm-hmm. He once threatened to kill her if she so much as looked at another man. We want you with her when Grafter arrives. Well, why me? Aren't there bodyguards for hire in Milwaukee? Well, we hold a large paid-up policy on her life, and we want her protected. Besides, she's practically penniless. She couldn't even afford to hire a private detective. You know, it's a tragic case. And then, on the other hand, possibly all her fears are imaginary. Perhaps nothing will happen at all. Look, Mr. Haley... You can count on one thing. If I'm mixed up in it, something will happen. Expense account, item two, $55.10. Airfare, Hartford to Milwaukee. I switched on my reading light, settled back in my reclining seat, and once more buried my nose in the case of the playful Siamese. I should have buried the book. It turned out that Dexter Payne had lived through chapter one. And he really started to live in chapters two and three. A beautiful blonde in a slinky negligee had just made herself comfortable on Dexter's lap. And guess what happened? A fuse on the plane blew, my reading light went out, and I spent the rest of the flight in a dark cabin in a black mood. Expense account, item three, 250 cab fare, airport to the address of Ann Connolly, which, uh, for a girl who couldn't afford a detective, was quite a hunk of a dress, uh, unless she was living on Friends. Good evening. Good evening. In case you are looking for Miss Connolly, she is not here. In fact, she has went out for the entire evening. Oh? Well, I uh, think she's expecting me. At least she sent for me. She sent for you? Yeah, I'm Johnny Dollar from the insurance company. Oh, how dense of me. She did mention in passing that a detective would show up. Step inside, please. Thanks. Just hang up your coat and things. All right. She wishes you to remain until she comes home, which could be any time after the joints close up. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, in the meantime, I have been instructed to see that you are comfortable. So uh, what would you care for, a straight slug or a highball? Well, a highball would be fine. Hmm. Step this way, please. Yeah. Oh, uh, the floor's wet, so watch that throw rug if you don't wish to land on your ear. Okay, thanks. Hey, that's a nice place. Do you own it? Most decidedly not. To me, it is a sweatshop. I am Cora. I am Miss Connolly's personal maid. Personal maid? I agree that I do not look the type. I only accepted the position because I was on my uppers. My regular racket is specialty dancing. Please be seated. Thanks. Uh, Cora, if I may call you Cora. Oh, please do. Cora, as I understand it, uh, Miss Connolly needed a bodyguard, but she couldn't afford to hire one. So uh, she asked the insurance company that holds a policy on her life to supply one. Well, that's me. And now I find out she lives in a house on the right side of the tracks and has a personal maid. I'm confused. Listen, Mr. Dollar. Hmm? It is my opinion that preventive measures should start at home, if you know what I mean. No, I don't. In other words, she needs a bodyguard like I need a foster mother. What do you mean by that? From what I have saw, she has more men hanging around her protector than Princess Margaret. You know, if they were divided into a line in a backfield, they could walk over Notre Dame? Especially a handsome specimen named Ray Merrick, whom she is dating tonight. Well, what about this guy who's coming out on parole? Pardon me? Uh, Neil Grafter. While he was cooling his heels in prison, she was cooling her love for him. And she's afraid of what will happen when she tells him. This is news to me. Of course, I have been in Miss Connolly's employ only a few days. But I have not heard mentioned any kind of a grifter or a stir bum in her past. Now, as regards to your highball, would you care for scotch, bourbon, brandy, soda, or plain water? Make it scotch, soda, and no ice. Um, hey, Cora, if you don't mind a compliment, that outfit you're wearing, naked sandals, quilted skirts, and that uh, sweater make you look less like a personal maid and more like a personal friend of Errol Flynn's. I should live so long, but I thank you for your appreciation. It's part of my condition here that I am allowed access to Miss Connolly's wardrobe. Except for, uh, here, with the same size. Here's your scotch and. Thanks. <laughs> and, uh, if mm. there's anything else that would add to your comfort while you wait, name it. All I need now is an easy chair and a lamp. I'll get back to the case of the playful Siamese. Pardon me? So there I was, Johnny Dollar, with Johnny Walker in one hand, Dexter Payne in the other, and a few questions simmering in my mind. They really boil down to one. Namely, what was I doing there? Oh, well. In Chapter 5, Dexter finally found a clue. Yeah, I wish things would work out as easily for me sometime. I was just turning to Chapter 6, when guess what happened? Anne Connolly came home. Morning, darling. Have a nice day before you go home. Huh? I'm in. The first thing I noticed about Miss Connolly, after the size of her escort, was that there was more similarity between her and Cora than just body measurements. Their hair was the same shade of brown, and at first glance, at least, even their features were the same. Then she saw me. But you must be Mr. Dollar from the insurance company. Check. Uh, this is Mr. Merrick, my lawyer, and my friend, Mr. Dollar. How are you? How do you do? I hope you've been comfortable. Thanks, I have. Too comfortable. Usually when I'm sent to guard a body, the body is there to guard. Not out on the town until 2.30 in the morning. Well, of all the... Now, oh, wait, wait. Wait a minute, honey. Uh, we thought it was a smart move, Dollar, to get Ann out of the house and keep her out of it until you got here. Oh, all right, Mr. Merrick. While you're in the mood to answer questions, maybe you'll tell me why... With a layout like this and a personal maid, did Miss Connolly turn herself into a charity case? Why didn't she hire a local muscle man? That is none of your business, and if you don't oh, like and, your work, and, go and, back to Hartford now. Go and, back tonight. Go. And, darling, hold your My temper. Now, you'll have to forgive Miss Connolly. Stall. Dollar, her nerves are on edge. You can understand that. A dollar, the fact is that she couldn't afford to hire protection. A, because her funds are low at the moment. B, because there's, well, there's no telling how long she'll need protection. There's no way of knowing when Grafter will show up. Does that answer your question? I had planned a winter in Bermuda. I hope Grafter makes up his mind before the thaw sets in. I only hope you're as sure of yourself as you sound, Mr. Dollar. I try to be. Um, well, I think I'll skip that drink, Ann. Now that you're in safe hands, I think I'll go home, get some sleep, 
course, Ray, if you think it's all right. I'll see you tomorrow. Yes, I'll call you in the morning. Uh, Dollar. Yeah? If there's trouble tonight, Ann has my phone number. Oh, thanks very much. But I'd rather have a baseball bat. <laughs> I learned early in my career that an excellent way to court disaster is to wait for trouble because it usually sneaks up behind you. But it was too late then to go looking for it, so I made the rounds of the house, checking the locks on doors and windows. Then I turned off the lights and hunched myself up on a couch that would have tested the stoicism of a bed of nails type Indian faker and tried to stay awake. (sighs) I wondered about Dexter Payne. I wondered if the playful Siamese was a cat or somebody from Siam. And I just about made up my mind to duck into the closet with my trusty Ronson and read until the fluid ran out. And guess what happened? A door closed quietly. And a white-robed figure floated toward me. Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Pardon the intrusion of your privacy, but there are certain things I'd like to hash over with you in secret. Oh, well, let's see if I can... Straighten my back, Cora, and I'll make room for you on the couch. Oh, many thanks. All right. I hope you don't mind my state of attire, but I didn't bother with the robe in case the noise of the closet door might waken Miss Conway. That double talking nail. Oh, here, I'll put my jacket on your shoulders. Thanks, but I can only stay a minute. Listen, Johnny. Hmm? You may think me meddlesome since it's none of my affair, but I couldn't help but over here. And them two were feeding you a line of downright untruths earlier in the p.m. Well, this is the best news I've had since I got here. Give me more. It was in regard to Miss Connolly's financial standing. I happen to know that dame is as solvent as the state of Wisconsin. Well, on that, I haven't read up. She's fat, and I'm not casting aspersions on my own figure. Oh, please don't. How'd you find this out, Cora? It is not that I make a habit of putting my nose where it does not belong. But when I see a book lying open, I can't keep my eyes away. Yeah, I know just how you feel. Well, in this case, it happened to be her bank book. And with that balance, she could afford J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah. Why are you telling me all this? Have you got something against her? Mr. Dollar, if you are casting aspersions upon my honesty... It's only a faint suspicion, but you could be trying to talk me into leaving the case and leaving Miss Connolly unprotected. Well, I am thoroughly disappointed. A fine lot of thanks after I braved possible pneumonia. Oh, Cora. It so happens that I told you because I am a strong believer that it is decidedly crummy for anyone to take advantage of their fellow man. Now, look, Cora. But from now on, you can take a flying leap. Cora. If you were dying of thirst, I would... (laughs) What's that? As I stumbled across the room and into the pitch-black hallway leading to the bedrooms in the rear of the house... I wondered what Dexter Payne would do in a similar situation. To both Dexter and me, life was just a bowl of uncracked nuts, unopened Chinese fortune cakes, and unanswered questions headed up by Who Shot Whom? In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar, but first... The Case of the Paper Stars, a thrilling true story from the police file, starts a three-week serialization on CBS's Gangbusters tonight. Don't miss the first episode of this story of police on the trail of a gang that terrorized three states. Also on CBS tonight, you'll hear the latest adventures of that famous private eye, Philip Marlowe. The adventures of Philip Marlowe and Gangbusters are regular Saturday night features on most of these same CBS stations. Now, with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Help me! Somebody help me! Ann Connolly's hysterical screams told me the way to her room, but before I got there, a stream of cold night air blowing into the hall through an open door to another bedroom stopped me. The draft was coming from a smashed-out window. And the smell of cordite that came with it meant that this room had been the shooting gallery. The corner of my eye picked up the corner of a white garage just as a king-sized shadow of a man crossed it. And I went out after him. I made the garage in a dozen heartbeats. 
believe me, the way my heart was going, that was record time. And as I skidded around the corner, an arm about the size of a fire hose came out of the darkness, crooked around my neck, and pulled. Uh, face that loomed up above and in front of mine was ugly, bearded, and wild-eyed. So, you're working against me, too. Oh, let go. What the hell's the matter with you? Yeah, sure, I let go. Oh. Oh, you must be Neil Drafter. I didn't kill her, did I? Because she wasn't in her bed. Oh, where was she? With you? No, she wasn't with me. What's the matter with you, anyway? So she wants sour on you. Happens every day. They even write songs like Don't Try Joe about it. Look, you spent enough time in prison to learn not to like it. Why set yourself up to go back for the rest of your life? You were smart enough to get out on parole. Why don't you get smart enough to pull yourself together? Prison? I don't remember any prison. I, I, I forget things sometimes. Oh, but... Uh, uh, I, I could ask the doctor. No. No, not anymore. Uh, who are you? Another one of her men? Look, uh, Neil, why don't we go someplace where it's more comfortable than this, huh? What? Someplace nice and warm, and we'll talk. Oh, no. Oh, no. Everybody tries to play tricks on me. Nice and warm. With bars on the windows. And people making noise all over the place. Well, you're not going to stop me. Nobody is. Well, why don't you let me help you, then? Come on. That's what the doctor kept saying. Uh, you're a doctor. Well, I don't need any help. I can do it myself. Now, calm down, Grafter. With my own hand. Here, I'll show you, doctor. <laughs> No. Oh. Oh. Why should I kill you? Uh, don't help me. Just stay away from me. He went. And what's more, I watched him go. One, I didn't have enough strength to get off the ground. Two, if, if I'd had the strength... My extreme dislike of being choked to death would have argued me out of going after him. Three, the guy was obviously nuts. When I finally could make it, I staggered back to the house. You can turn on the lights, Miss Connolly. He's what? gone. No, wait a minute. On second thought, maybe we'd better make sure all the shades are down. He might come back. I might say he saved my life. At least when he got halfway through the job, he changed his mind about killing me. You talked to Neil? I tried to, but he didn't understand anything I said. And Miss Connolly, he didn't talk about wardens and paroles as in prisons. He talked about doctors and barred windows and noisy people as in mental hospitals. <laughs> Do I translate that to mean that he's off his rocker? Oh, Cora, please, go over there and sit down. Well, I'll get to you later. Well, pardon me. Just pretend I'm elsewhere someplace. After all, it was only my bed that he blasted. Did you hear that, Miss Connolly? Yes. Yes, I know it was a horrible thing to do, having Cora sleep in my room. I was half crazy with fear. I... So why doesn't Ray get here? He promised to hurry. Maybe we can air some of the linen before he arrives. Instead of being in prison, which was a story I got, Grafter was in a hospital for the criminally insane, nursing a big yen to ventilate your head. Is that right? Please, I... Yes. Yes, that's true. He escaped a month ago. A month ago? Yes. The doctors notified the police here that I was in danger and they supplied a 24-hour guard for the house. But after a month, they, they decided Neil had gone someplace else. So they withdrew the guard. Oh, great. So the only people left who cared more about your fate than they did about mine was your insurance company. Well, we had to do something, but I didn't have any insurance. What? So Ray bought a policy for me, and then we contacted the company. Uh-huh. Legal blackmail, huh? Which brings to mind a meaty little question. Did you lie to the general manager, Franklin Haley, about where and what Grafter really was? Or did that misplaced con man hoodwink me into this mess? We told him the truth. I swear we did. Okay. 
I hope he lives through my expense account because that little trick is going to cost him. Expense account, item four, $43. Breakfast the next morning. <sighs> Over which I managed to steal a few moments alone with Dexter and his dilemma. In Chapter 7, Dexter finally came upon the corpus delicti. The only sign of life in the place was a Siamese cat playing with a ball of string. But before I could find out how the cat figured into things, the phone rang. Hello? Mr. Dollar, please. Yeah, this is Dollar. Your call to Melville State Hospital is ready. Oh, fine. Go ahead, please. Hello? Dr. Downer here. Uh, who is there, please? I, I am so busy. Oh, well, this is Johnny Dollar, doctor. I'm an insurance investigator. But, uh... I am so busy, please. No, doctor, investigator. I want to talk to you about a patient of yours, uh, Neil Grafter. Grafter? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, the paranoid schizophrenic. Oh, a very interesting case. Uh, Complete fragmentation of the mind, uh, total loss of synthesis. But uh, uh, he is uh, no longer here for a while. Yeah, I I know. He was here last night. What, what, what? Oh, uh, what uh, what was his condition? Uh, uh, perhaps a state of passive negativism? All I know about his condition is that it's dangerous. He tried to kill his ex-girlfriend. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember extremely strong obsession. An extremely strong man. Look, I've been hired to protect this woman. Now, what I want to know is, will he try again? There is no doubt. But when? Tonight? I would say tonight. The degree of hallucinatory enmity towards this woman and everybody about her, the depths of his obsession... Whoa, wait a minute, doctor, wait a minute. You're way over my head. But you do think he'll be back tonight? I am positive. Thank you, Dr. Kildare. And all Dexter has to worry about is a playful Siamese. Waiting for a paranoia killer can be depressing all by itself. But to make it more so, in Milwaukee, the sun went into hiding behind a layer of dark gray clouds about 4 p.m., and it started to snow. It had the mood of wuthering heights with icicles. At 5.30, daylight shut down, the night shift took over. And at 8, after a dinner that nobody dined on, I didn't brush my teeth, I lied in them. And uh, what kind of protective measures do you propose to make tonight, Dollar? Oh, none. As far as I'm concerned, this is a night off. Mm. Uh, Dr. Downer out at the hospital, who knows Grafter better than anyone else, says he won't be back tonight. Oh, I wish we could be sure of that. Yeah, so do I. How can he make such a positive statement? Probably because he spent his life with people like Grafter. No, I tell you, there's nothing to worry about. Miss Connolly, I want you and Ray to go out, just like you did last night. Cora and I will stay here. All right, if you think it's the thing to do. But I'm, I'm worried about Cora after what happened to her bed last night. Uh, how can we protect her? It's a little late to worry about that after you set her up. But forget it. Just to make it safe, she won't be in that room. I will. (laughs) Expense account, item five, $50, refreshments. I needed something to bolster my courage, so I ordered it. At 2.30 a.m., things were looking good for Neil Grafter. Ray Merrick and Ann Connolly had returned from their date. Merrick had left. Miss Ann Connolly was trying to sleep in her room. Cora was on the couch in the living room, and there was a rolled-up blanket in her bed to make it look like that's where she was. And me? I was out in the snow, huddled near the incinerator, with an iron poker freezing to my hand, with a good view of the house and a poor outlook on life. Nothing happened until about 4 o'clock. That's when I spotted a familiar-looking big shadow of a man moving across the garage toward the house. I got up, but a flurry of wind-driven snow swept in front of me, and when it had passed, I could still see the window to Cora's room, but I couldn't see the man. Then I heard him at Ann Connolly's window. He started away from the house, and I started toward him. I met him under the clothesline on a flying tackle. No, no. Oh, let go of me. Merrick. Let me go. Get away from me. Uh Uh-uh, Merrick, but I'll put you away. Well, how do you like that? When an insurance policy enters the picture, you can't even depend on a maniac. Well, just one more, then, to pacify my nerves. They're jumping. That's 
take it easy, Cora. This is a fine time to start falling to pieces. Oh, why doesn't the doctor get here? Now, don't worry, he's coming. I've called for an ambulance. If Miss Connolly kicks off, I will hold him personally responsible. Now, look, Cora, I appreciate your feeling toward your fellow man, but Miss Connolly made a pigeon out of you. She hired you because you looked like her. She had you parade around in front of those windows wearing her clothes. I am aware of all those double dealings. She even had you sleeping in her room where Grafter almost blasted you. Now, what I want to know is why are you so anxious about her recovery? Because she owes me a week's pay. If this sawbones doesn't pull her through, I'll sue the city of Milwaukee for my arrears. <laughs> Expense account, item six, $150 for services rendered while I was on the giving end of a blood transfusion, which Ann Connolly needed before she could be moved. One item, at least, that you shouldn't balk at since she is your policyholder. The doctors give her a 50-50 chance to live, but uh, even if the scales tip the other way, I think your money is safe. Because her beneficiary, Ray Merrick, is guilty, among other things, of attempted fraud, since he planned on having Neil Grafter blamed for the shooting he did. Expense account, uh, item seven, five cents, newspaper, which reported that the police had returned Grafter to the hospital from which he had escaped. He did come back, as Dr. Kildare said he would, but uh, he was a little late and missed the party. Uh, Item eight, fifty-five dollars and ten cents, airfare, Milwaukee to Hartford. Expense account total, oh yeah, Dexter Payne. You know, I never did finish that book. After those cats I'd been jiving with, I couldn't care less about a playful Siamese. Uh, Expense account total, $845.30. Signed, yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Betty Lou Gerson, Sandra Gould, Bill Johnstone, John Daner, Bill Conrad. The special music is written and conducted by Leith Stevens. Your announcer is Bob Stevenson. Be sure to be with us at the same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. A whale of a Christmas present for a few moments brain scratching. Could be there's $54,000 in the Sing It Again jackpot now, $25,000 of it in cold hard cash, and the rest in wonderful prizes. By just listening in to Sing It Again tonight, you get a fine free Christmas present. Lots of amusing riddles, plenty of good music. And maybe you'll get that $54,000 call from Danny Seymour. Singing Again is heard for a full hour every Saturday night on most of these same CBS stations. Stay tuned now for the Vaughn Monroe Caravan, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, meets adventure every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. They say big game hunting is a sport only for the wealthy. Well, it didn't cost me much, except almost my life. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense accounts, he's an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Britannia Underwriters Association, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of the unscheduled performances in Max Million Sandro's Animal Show. Or, all they needed was a clown, and then I showed up. Or, I once thought I'd run away with a circus. This one I wanted to run away from. Expense account, 
Item one, $70.21. Train and cab fare from Hartford to a vacant lot just outside Brunswick, Georgia. The winter quarters of Maximilian Sandro's animal show. The first animal to show was an elephant. Mister, where can I find Maximilian Sandra? Hey, uh, Mister, I want to ask you a question. Please, you're not so loud. You upset the Blanca. I'm going to try to teach you an aria for next season. An aria? Well, that should set opera back ten years. Ah, oh, sweet, Blanca, sweet. That's the only musical elephant in the world. The Pocky Dermachanto. Well, look, I'll stop interrupting rehearsal if you'll tell me where I can find your boss. Maximilian Sandro. My boss? Yeah. <laughs> it is I. I am Maximilian Sandro. Oh, well, good. I'm Johnny Dollar from the insurance company. Oh, ho. Let's make it something else. Blanca, you rest. I'm going to come back when I'm through with Mr. Dollar. Well, as I understand yeah. it, Mr. Sandro. Oh, that's a poor Blanca. She don't like to see me go. You know, she's like a puppy to me. But this is the new black leopard that's uh, the beginning of all of my trouble. I'm going to show you to her. Someone has tried to steal her. And that's what I don't want, Mr. Dodd. Well, since Britannia underwriters insured her for 20000 that is what they don't want, too. You see, that cost me too much to get her from Africa. To lose her, that would ruin my financials. Everything would go. Ah. <laughs> These are my monkeys. Yeah. Hi. Uh, look, Mr. Sandro, how does anybody go about stealing a neat little package like a black leopard? And why? Why? Mm -hmm. Because she's a very special leopard. She's a very big, a very shiny. I'm going to name her Ashanti. She's going to be my prize attraction. There's a lots of animal shows would like to have her. Oh, you uh, suspect your competition? Oh, see. Si. Well, when was the attempt made? One night the last week, they make with the truck. They tried mm -hmm. to pull her cage away, and we saved her just in the time. Oh. This is my finches, the parakeets, and the toucan. And this is my crow. Yeah. Very nice. Colorful. Uh, did you try and trace the truck? Man, no, so no way to trace. They went away. Whoosh! No lights. And this is something else that's not right at all. Oh, yeah? What's that? I'm going to make a big plan. I'm going to get all the money I can put a hands on to buy her from this man at Tex Randall. And now he said the money that was enough before is not enough now. He think he cheat me to surrender. Well, I'd like to help you with that too, Mr. Sandro, but uh, I'm afraid that's your problem. My job is to see that your leopard isn't stolen. I see, I know. You get to pay for your job, but you do it. And that's... Oh, no. There is a shot. There is a my leopard. <laughs> I guess somewhere way down in the tap roots of my family tree, there probably was an ancestor with a low forehead, bearskin overalls, and a club who went into an unpleasant double take when he found himself face to face with a leopard. I know the feeling I had when I saw a shanty was inherited from somebody. My feet wanted to run, but my eyes wouldn't leave her as she paced back and forth in about a 12 by 12 cage. Baleful yellow eyes set in a sable black face, ears laid back, and tail lashing in anger and lips that drew up showing the nastiest set of choppers I've ever seen. She was beautiful, all right, but my vote would have gone oh, to the no, iron bars not. that separated us. So they were downright gorgeous. Don't waste the time of the walk back in a fort. You'll be a good girl. Pretty soon you and me will be good friends. You see, Mr. Dollar, right now, Ashanti, she's a very angry. She's a boil inside. But I'm going to know my animals. So not long, she's going to eat out of my hand. Yeah, well, she looks like she can make a meal out of it right up to the elbow. Oh, hey, slam it. Of course, it was. Oh, you. Who's this hungry? This is Mr. Dollar. He's a come from the insurance company. Well, howdy, Mr. Dollar. I'm Tex Randall. This is the man I tell you about. How are you? You mean you captured this thing? Yeah, I brung her in from the Togo Territory in West Africa. I thought my racket was tough sometimes. What'd you use, catnip? Nope. I dug me a pit, covered her with a mat and some dirt, put me a fresh killed goat in the middle, and when the cat fell in, I got some ropes on her and trussed her up. Well, you make it sound simple. Oh, see, so make it sound simple. And why does it cheat to me? Why you don't stay with the first prize? Hey, now you take a listen to me, Sandro. I told you I'd give you your money back and sell this cat somewhere else. The trip cost more than I thought it would. And I ain't about to lose dough on it just to make you happy. Um, uh, sometimes I'm a think you don't talk straight. I'm going to go back to my elephant now, Mr. Dollar. Okay, Mr. Sandro. I'll check with you later. 
He spent too much time talking to critters. Uh -huh. He don't make no sense out of nothing. Right. I'm glad you're here, Dollar. I ain't been 20 yards away from this cat since I got her here. Been bunking in that sleeping bag every night right close to the cage. Now maybe I can get a break. Well, then you must have been here the night somebody tried to put the snatch on her. Did you spot anybody? Nobody I could be sure of. Except maybe the little blonde guy. He left me something to remember him by. Wait till I pull my shirt up. Look at there. Look at there on my back. Just took the stitches out today. Oh, ouch. Ouch is right. The little runt caught me half in and half out of my sleeping bag. Doc says if that knife blade had gone in another hair's breadth, I'd have been spilled. <laughs> And with that happy thought, Tex Randall, a hard man to kill, left to go into town. I watched a shanty tear into enough raw meat to keep a kennel of Great Danes happy for a week, after which she settled down for what you might call the original catnap. Sandro's elephant settled down to a short vocal lesson, and I settled down for a game of mumbly peg. But before I could get warmed up, I had a visitor. Hello. Wow, the Ava Gardner type with darker hair and olive skin. You look as though you could use some company, Mr. Dollar. Well, who couldn't? I was beginning to think the only females around here walked on all fours. Oh, I've had the same feeling about the males. Then, uh, then he didn't mention me. Who? Pop, the boss. Oh, no, no. Uh, Sandro didn't mention much of anything but his black leopard. Well, I'm Angela, his daughter. Oh, I see. He probably forgot to mention you on purpose, hoping to keep my mind where it belongs, on my work. Oh, that's what I came to talk to you about. What can you do? You can't stay with the Shanti for the rest of her life, can you? Well, before I found out about you, I would have said no. Oh, please be serious. All right. There's only one thing to do. If the leopard isn't safe here, and from what I've seen and heard, I don't think she is, I'll just have to take her someplace else until this is all cleared up. Take her someplace else? Mm -hmm. Well, that would break Dad's heart. It would break the heart of the company that hired me if the Shanti turned up missing. Look, he can't take her on the road until next summer. We'll keep her safe until then. I'm sorry, but it's, it's all I can do. Oh, poor Dad. He's going to hate you for it, you know. Oh, well, that I can stand. But uh, there's no sense you're wasting our time feeling the same way. I didn't say I would, did I? As a matter of fact, I was going to stay right here until you asked me out to dinner. Or something. Oh, well, let's not hurry. Stick around. I'll figure out where to invite you when I know you better. And there, during the waning hours of the Georgia day, I learned that, up to a point, Angela was an easy girl to know. She liked cocktails, dinner, and dancing, so that's the schedule we set up for later. As soon as Tex Randall showed up to temporarily relieve me of my duties as leopard sitter... But at martini time, I was still sitting. And may I say that the cocktail hour spent in the middle of a menagerie is not the restful period it's supposed to be. As soon as the sun dropped, the noise rose. Wild brains in caged bodies reacting to the night, instinctively telling the countryside that whether they were free or not, this was their hunting time. I not only felt like Tarzan of the Apes, I felt uneasy. The shanty complained to me. A light from somewhere behind me glinted in her eye, then disappeared as she started her back and forth pacing again. It sounded like she was trying to tell me something. If she was. I was too stupid to understand it. Oh! Whatever hit me from behind didn't land hard enough. I stayed on my feet, but a pair of strong hands twisted my arms behind my back, and one hand pushed my wrist into a double hammerlock. The point of a knife was jammed into my back and started moving me forward toward the cage. The leopard stopped her pacing as she saw me coming. She reached out between the bars for me, her great paw spread, claws extended. The last thing I saw was her snarling face and the paw reaching. Then there was a lunge behind me and something hit my head again. The cocktail hour was over. I'd passed out without a drink. Thank you. 
In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, last week, Vaughn Monroe's caravan saluted the Rose Bowl team. Tonight, Vaughn will play the favorite songs of Louisiana State and Oklahoma, the Sugar Bowl team. Vaughn's caravan will also bring you the five top tunes of the week as chosen by Variety. And later, Gene Autry will be here with his Western music and cowboy humor. The Vaughn Monroe Caravan and the Gene Autry Show are regular Saturday evening features of most of the same CBS stations. Now with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Well, sir... I don't know how I lived through that one, but as it turned out, I did. When I opened my eyes, I was still in Georgia, but that condition was about all that hadn't changed for the worse. My head was not only aching in the back, but a new lump had been born above the bridge of my nose. But nothing else had been added. When I finally got to my feet, I saw that only a trace was left of a shanty, the Black Leopard. A pair of ruts in the dirt made when her wheeled cage had been hauled away. I started out to find Sandro on a telephone, but one of my feet found something else before I'd taken three steps. I didn't know how he had gotten where I was supposed to be, but he'd made it. Tex Randall, his neck twisted and the marks of claws on the side of his battered head. Police Department, Central Precinct, Sergeant Miller. Hello, my name is Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. I'm calling from the winter quarters of the Maximilian Sandro's animal show from the owner's trailer. I want to report two things. Yeah, well, wait a minute. There's a body out here that your coroner ought to take a look at, either accidental or murder. Well, hey, Lieutenant, get on Who? This, will you? Grand Larceny. Somebody stole a black leopard. Oh, now, listen, this is your idea of a joke, fella. It's you too late to... to joke, Sergeant. Just send some men out. I'll give them the rest of the story when they get here. Joke yet? What passes for humor in Georgia, anyway? Hey, Sandro! Sandro, come home! Nobody answered me but an old Libyan lion. So I shut up. I browsed around Sandro's trailer while I was waiting for the police. I wasn't looking for anything, but I found it. On a table, there was a small Christmas tree that had been transformed into what is commonly known as a friendship tree, meaning that about a half a dozen Christmas cards were hung on with cellophane tape. There was nothing else to read, so I scanned through those. And the third one I opened, opened my eyes. It was inscribed, sorry, I can't be with you. Greetings from San Francisco. Your loving daughter, Angela. Before I could fully digest that tidbit, I heard a shoe scrape on the steps outside. Then the trailer door opened. Here he is, then. I told you we'd find him here. Yes, yes. Very good, my dear. The man with the Angela by whom I had so recently been taken in looked 50-ish, capable, suntanned, and well-armed. Well, 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 Mr. Dollar. You don't appear to be surprised. After what's happened already tonight, I wouldn't be surprised if General Sherman dropped in on his way back from the sea. <laughs> yes, splendid, splendid. I admire a show of courage. A sense of humor at the point of a gun. Oh, think nothing of it. Sometimes my jokes are so funny, they kill people. <laughs> I think we'd better get him out of here, Ben. I don't think it's safe. Yes, you took the words right off the tip of my tongue, my dear. Shall we go, Mr. Dollar? Should I ask where and why? I've taken a small place in town. There is our leisure. We shall discuss a fascinating subject. Mm -hmm. Namely, the whereabouts of a splendid black leopard. <laughs> Right ahead, Mr. Dollar. Oh, my dear, run up to Harold's room. Fetch him down. I may need him. All right, then. Into this room, Mr. Dollar. And uh, please be seated. If you don't mind my asking, Ben, how do you manage... My dear sir, hmm? it just so happens that my full name and title is Sir Bennett Mountford. 
The term of familiarity, Ben, is to be used only by my closest friends. Now, if you will couch your question properly... Oh, it wasn't important. I just wondered, since that gun seems to be so much a part of you, how do you manage without shooting yourself while shaving? <laughs> You've a ready wit, haven't you? I know the proper time and place for a weapon, my boy. I've learned from experience. I chose early in youth as my avocation the hunting of big game. If you had faced the last desperate charge of a wounded lion or a maddened rhino as I faced them, you too would realize that a good weapon properly aimed is man's best friend. Which uh, brings us to the subject of our mutual interest, the Black Leopard. Where have you hidden her? What makes you think I have? No, 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 no. Let's have no deception, sir. The report brought back by my charming accomplice, who so ably posed as the daughter of that stupid showman, Mr. Sandro, proves that you made no secret of your plan to carry off the cat to a place of safety. You will not deny that. Why should I? You wouldn't believe me if I did. Yes. Yeah. An admirable attitude, sir. Now, once more. Where is the leopard? Well, if I told you, it wouldn't be worth much as a hiding place, would it? If you do not tell me, sir, your life will be worth very little. Come now. Perhaps your loyalties are misplaced. What did that market hunter, Mr. Randall, tell you about the cat? Not much. Except that he got a knife in the back, put there by somebody who was trying to steal her. Well then, sir. I'll spin you a tale that'll set your blood to pounding. What would you say, my boy, if I told you that that black leopard is worth a king's ransom? Well, I don't know. I'd probably ask why. Well, she is, sir. And I'll tell you why. She was captured in the Togo Territory, West Africa. I am quite familiar with that section. I've hunted there. A district par excellence for elephant, buffalo, and sijutanga. As a matter of fact, I was there before and shortly after Randall's infamous trapping of that fine beast. Did he tell you that? Well, he did. Didn't make any impression. I hear there are a lot of people in Africa. Well, to continue. The Togo Territory is inhabited by the Awe tribe, a group of long-headed patrilineal people whose most interesting characteristic at this moment is the fact that they are animal worshippers. Now, does the point sink home? Mm, vaguely. That leopard Randall snagged is important to them. Is that it? Yes, yes, precisely. You struck it. And they will pay a veritable fortune for her return. One hundred thousand dollars in gold. And now that I've uh, let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, uh, do you have a price in mind? In return for which you will share with me the hiding place of the animal? Yeah, you go on back to Togo and I'll cable you the address. Ah, it's obvious, sir, that you are not in full command of your senses. Harold! Harold! Soldier I'm coming. Look, if Harold is your violence department, Ben, you can save your breath and his muscles. I'm not having any. Stay where you are, sir. I give you fair warning. Oh, nuts to your fair warning. If you want to find that black leopard, and I'm the only one that knows where she is, you're not going to do it by puncturing me. Come back here, you fool. Come back here. Thank you, easy, Ben. I'll get him from the stairs. That's far enough, Mr. Dollar. You better call off your infantry, Ben. All right, wise guy. Here it comes. Harold, wait. Let him go. What's the matter? You crazy? He's going to steal me. Let him go. Let Randall have the upper hand. Oh, brother. As I went out, I caught a glimpse of the man Mountford had called Harold. The same little blonde runt Randall had talked about. That wrapped up the question of who had played tic-tac-toe with a knife on the Texan. But ten yards of Sir Ben's front walk later, I suddenly remembered Mountford's last words. Lest Randall have the upper hand, he said. It sounded like he didn't know Randall was dead. Which shook my head and in a strictly nonsensical way made sense. Well, there was only one place for me to go, so that's where I went. Back to Maximilian Sandro's animal show. got there, I was awake, but all the smart animals were asleep, except for one. Dollar. Mr. Dollar! Maximilian Sandro hailed me from the lee side of a tent. Come in, Mr. Dollar, into the shadows. The police is by my trailer. Where have you been, Sandro? I was a hiding, 
But I worry so much about you. When I come back, where you are? You're not there. What do you mean by your black leopard's cage? I'd left. That place had unpleasant memories for me. Oh, see, si, see, si, me too. I'm a sad one. You see, when I'm a see that man, Randall, he's a push you to the cage with a knife. I'm a go crazy. I'm a nothing. I'm a run up and a push. So then you fall, you hit your head in the bottom of the cage. And then a shanty. She hit the Randall instead, and I'm so sorry. Oh, uh, uh, don't bother with an apology to me. No, 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 no. You don't understand. Look, I'm going to commit the murder. With these two hands, I'm going to push him on the leopard. Oh, well, there's such a thing as justifiable homicide. You were saving my life. So let's not worry about it until it gets to court, if it does. Where did you take your cat? Oh, you know that... Nobody else has her, so you must. You were at the right place at the right time to haul her away. All right. I tell you true. See, I take her away where she's safe. I keep her where she is until this trouble is no more. Oh, now, listen to me, Sandro. I know how you feel, but I've met the people who were after your leopard. They say they can get $100,000 for her back in Africa. $100,000? Consequential. Mm. For that kind of money, they'll never stop looking for her. The only way to stop them is to let them find her. And then we'll try and wind this thing up. Wind up? Does it mean finish? Yeah. Oh. I'm pretty sure I've been followed here. Now, will you take me to the hideout? Oh, no, so these people, they follow you there. I'm going to like that. I don't either, Sandro. A hundred thousand dollars worth of cheese would even make a mouse. <laughs> Sandro was a hard man to convince. I wasted more words than a Republican campaigner, and then I used blackmail. Then I told him I'd turn him in for Randall's killing and testify against him instead of for him. He saw things my way. The leopard's lair turned out to be an abandoned barn, five miles farther out of town, to which we went in a truck that Sandro had driven into that jungle-type vacant lot. Now, come. This way, please. This way. Okay. It's a little inside the door. A shanty was performing that old dance of hers again, pacing the length of her cage back and forth, her head swinging rhythmically each time she turned. We'd made ourselves easy enough to follow on the way out but my neck was getting stiff from helping my eyes follow the leopard's movements before I heard a sound outside the door. It sounded like a bolt jamming a shell into the chamber of a rifle. And that's what it was, because a rifle was what Sir Bennett Mountford was carrying when the trio came in. Close the door, Harold. I just did. You, my dear, stay here on the pound's way. Yes, dear. I'll be all right. Well, Mr. Dollar... I would say that the long stock is successfully completed. The search ended. You're quite a hunter, Mountford. Somebody should crown you with a coonskin cap, <laughs> with a raccoon still living in it. Yes. I'm glad to see you enjoying yourself, sir. Since the time for levity is on the wing, so to speak. Harold. Yeah, name it. Keep these two in your sights with a ready finger on the trigger. I'll set about putting this vicious cat out of existence. Well, no, no, he's not shoot my Ashanti. Hey, Mountford, are you crazy? Put that rifle down. Shut up, Dollar. You aren't running things. Mountford, if that cat's worth a hundred grand alive, why kill her? Because we shall realize a much greater profit with her death. Namely, a half million of uncut diamonds that are hidden in the floor of her cage. Diamonds? Well, they couldn't have been safer, could they? Precisely Randall's idea when he put them there in Africa. Now stand aside, sir. I don't wish to fire through your head, but I will if I must. No. No, he's in a shoot to my shot. Hey, watch that maniac. He's going to let that cat out. Then stop him. That fast. Don't move. I'll meet her charge. No, I shan't you run. Run for your life. Mountford had a lot of guts, but sometimes luck helps, and that night he didn't have any. Ashanti sprang straight through the little door of her cage. She was still in the air when she went past him, head high, and as she did, one of her fatal front paws reached out for him. It looked almost delicate, 
but the force of the blows sent Mountford clear across the barn. And when he landed, he didn't move. A shanty streaked toward a square of night sky showing through a window, and she was gone. Ashanti! Ashanti! Come back! I turned back, away from the window, to check on the rest of our guests. But they were gone. Apparently, there was something about a leopard on the loose that had made a half a million dollars in diamonds, not as important to Harold and the phony Angela as distance between them and that barn. So, there I was, suddenly left with nothing to worry about. If you can call enough diamonds to stock the Kimberly mines, nothing. Expense account, item two. Uh... Item two? A case like this and I haven't laid up a cent. Oh, well, Christmas is coming. Item two, three dollars. Cab fare from Brunswick Police Headquarters to a hotel. After giving them my statement, which they didn't believe until they saw those diamonds. Then they sent out a three-state alarm to pick up the phony Angela and Montford shiv man, Harold. And expense account, item three, seventy dollars and twenty-one cents. Uh, train and cab fare, Brunswick to Hartford. Oh, and uh, this advice I'll toss in for free. At last report, a shanty was seen headed west toward Okefenokee Swamp, and Sandra was organizing a group to go after her. My advice is this. Don't insure the lives of those men. If you want to throw your money away, throw it to me. Uh, let's see. Uh, expense account total, $152.70. Signed, yours truly... Johnny, uh, Frank Buck, dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar stars Charles Russell. Tonight's script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd was produced and directed by Ralph Rose. Featured in the cast were Lynn Allen, Larry Dobkin, Bill Conrad, and Parley Bear. The special music is written and conducted by Leith Stevens. Your announcer, Bob Stevens. Be sure to be with us at the same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Honey Dollar. Teamwork. That's the American way. Working together to produce more per man, per machine, per hour, so that everybody on the team benefits. The American economic system is geared to benefit all of the people. Under this system, everybody moves together toward the common goal of better living. The better we produce, the better we live. For your free copy of the booklet, The Miracle of America, write Box 10, Times Square Station, New York City. Stay tuned now for Vaughn Monroe's Caravan, which follows immediately on most of the same CBS stations. This is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, meets adventure every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System.